This is Audible. Penguin Random House Audio presents The Battle of Arnhem, the deadliest airborne operation of World War II, by Anthony Beaver. Read for you by Sean Barrett. Chapter One. The chase is on. Sunday, the twenty seventh of August, nineteen forty four, was a day of perfect summer weather in Normandy. The soporific sounds of a cricket match could be heard from a field at saint symphorien les bruyeres southwest of Evreux. In the adjoining pear orchard, Sherman tanks of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry had just been refitted and repaired after the Battle of the Falaise Gap, the culmination of the battle for Normandy. Bats, balls, pads, and stumps had been smuggled ashore on one of their supply trucks. Never let it be said that we invaded the continent unprepared, wrote one of the players. The regiment was supposedly on twenty-four hours' notice to move, but just after lunch the order came to move out in an hour. Its tanks were on the road in seventy minutes, heading for the River Seine, which the first British formation, the 43rd Wessex Division, had crossed at Vernon the day before. British troops were rather jealous that General George Patton's U.S. Third Army had beaten them to a Seine crossing by six days. On the 29th of August, the Allied armies, now nearly a million strong, lunged forward from their bridgeheads east of the Seine, heading for Belgium and the German border. The battle for Normandy had finally been won, and the German army was in chaotic retreat. Along the main supply routes, an American officer wrote in his diary, you see the evidence of our air effort against the enemy. Trucks have been bombed and strafed, rusted and twisted in wild profusion along the roads, occasionally a truckload of gas cans with the cans bulging out like a swollen dead cow, black and charred or a train with mounds of bulging cans, twisted steel frames from the destroyed boxcars. For British cavalry regiments, the chase was on. Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, the commander of 30 Corps, mounted in the turret of a command tank, could not resist joining in. This was the type of warfare I thoroughly enjoyed, he wrote later. Who wouldn't? With more than 600 tanks, Shermans, Churchills, and Cromwells, the Guards Armoured Division, the 11th Armoured Division, and the 8th Armoured Brigade charged forward on a frontage of 80 kilometres, scything passages through the enemy rear areas, he added, like a combine harvester going through a field of corn. The country between the Seine and the Somme was open and rolling with wide fields, no hedges, and good roads. The dangerous Norman bocage of tightly enclosed pasture and sunken roads lay far behind them. The Sherwood Rangers adopted their old desert formation from the North African campaign, with a squadron of Shermans spread out in front, regimental headquarters just behind it, and the other two sabre squadrons on the flanks. To travel at top speed across hard, open country on a lovely morning, a cavalry troop leader wrote, knowing that the Germans were on the run, was exhilarating to say the least, and everyone was in the best possible spirits. It was almost like taking part in a cross-country steeplechase. Church bells pealed at their approach. Almost every house was festooned in the French national colours of red, white, and blue. Villagers, overjoyed to be spared the destruction of Normandy, waited to greet them with bottles of wine and fruit. Unshaven members of the resistance, wearing armbands, tried to mount the leading vehicles to show the way. A staff officer with the Guards' Armoured Division, in a stag-hound armoured car, noticed their odd assortment of weapons, which they brandished with more exuberance than safety. From time to time a tank would run out of fuel. The vehicle then had to sit immobilized by the side of the road until one of the regiment's three-tonners caught up and pulled alongside. Jerry cans would then be swung across to the crew members standing on the engine deck. There were the occasional short, sharp firefights when a German group, overtaken by the advance, refused to surrender. Clearing out such pockets of resistance was called delousing. On the afternoon of the 30th of August, Horrocks felt the advance was still not fast enough. He ordered Major General Pip Roberts to send his 11th Armoured Division through the night to take Amiens and its bridges over the River Somme by dawn. Although the tank drivers were falling asleep from exhaustion, they made it to the bridges, and three-ton trucks brought in a brigade of infantry at first light to secure the town. Horrocks was close behind to congratulate Roberts on the success. After reporting on the operation, Roberts then said to his corps commander, I have a surprise for you, General. 
A German officer in black panzer uniform was brought round. He was unshaven, and his face was scarred from a wound received in the First World War, which had removed most of his nose. Roberts, Horrocks noted, was exactly like a proud farmer leading forward his champion bull. His trophy was General de Panzertruppe Heinrich Eberbach, the commander of the Seventh Army, who had been surprised in his bed. The next day, the 1st of September, was the fifth anniversary of the German invasion of Poland, which had started the war in Europe. By a curious coincidence, both Allied Army Group commanders of the Normandy campaign happened to be sitting for portraits at their respective headquarters. Basking in the glow of victory after General George C. Patton's triumphant charge to the Seine, General Omar N. Bradley, near Chartres, was being painted by Kathleen Mann, who was married to the Marquis of Queensbury. They could at least enjoy cool drinks on that beautiful day. The Supreme Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, had just sent Bradley a refrigerator with the message, God damn it, I'm tired of drinking warm whiskey every time I come to your headquarters. Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery, wearing his trademark outfit of grey polo neck sweater, corduroy trousers, and black double-badged beret, was sitting for the Scottish portraitist James Gunn. His tactical headquarters and caravan were in the park of the Chateau de Dongu, halfway between Rouen and Paris. Despite the messages of congratulation that morning on his promotion to Field Marshal, Montgomery was in such a bad mood that he refused to meet his host, the Duc de Dongu, and members of the local resistance. All Montgomery's hopes of a joint offensive under his leadership into northern Germany had been dashed because Eisenhower was replacing him as commander-in-chief land forces. Bradley was no longer his subordinate, but his equal. In Montgomery's view, Eisenhower was throwing away the victory by a refusal to concentrate his forces. Senior American officers, on the other hand, were far angrier at Montgomery's promotion. It made him a five-star general, while Eisenhower, his superior, still had only four stars. Patton, whose Third Army troops were already close to Verdun in eastern France, wrote to his wife that day, The field marshal thing made us sick, that is, Bradley and me. Even a number of senior British officers thought that Winston Churchill's sop to Monty and the British press to camouflage the implied demotion was a grave mistake. Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsay, the Allied naval commander-in-chief, wrote in his diary, Monty made a field marshal. Astounding thing to do, and I regret it more than I can say. I gather that the PM did it on his own. Damn stupid, and I warrant most offensive to Eisenhower and the Americans. The next day, Saturday the 2nd of September, Patton, Eisenhower, and Lieutenant General Courtney H. Hodges, the commander of the 1st U.S. Army, met at Bradley's 12th Army Group headquarters, where Lady Queensbury had put away her paintbrushes. According to Bradley's aide, Hodges was neat and trim as usual in his battle dress, while Patton was gaudy with brass buttons and the big car. They were there to discuss strategy and the great supply problem. The unexpectedly rapid advance meant that they were outrunning the capacity of even the huge American military transport fleet. Patton begged Bradley that morning, Give me four hundred thousand gallons of gasoline and I'll put you in Germany in two days. Bradley had every sympathy. So keen was he that all available aircraft continued to supply Patton's Third Army that he had opposed the plans for airborne drops ahead to speed the Allied advance. Patton, who longed to go through the Siegfried line like shit through a goose, was already bribing the transport pilots with cases of looted champagne, but that was still insufficient. Eisenhower refused to budge. He was also being badgered by Montgomery, who demanded the bulk of supplies to enable him to mount the main attack in the north. Allied diplomacy required the Supreme Commander to balance the rival demands of the two army groups as far as was humanly possible. This led to Eisenhower adopting a broad front strategy, which satisfied neither commander. Footnote Eisenhower's broad front strategy was greeted with relief by the German high command, the OKW. According to German conceptions, wrote a staff officer, it remained a mystery why the enemy had failed to mass all his troops at one point and force a breakthrough. Instead, the enemy did the German command the favor of distributing his forces in a fan-type manner over the entire front. End of footnote.
Eisenhower's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Walter B. Dell Smith, commented after the war on the problems with Montgomery and Bradley. It is amazing, he said, how good commanders get ruined when they develop a public they have to act up to. They become prima donnas. Even the seemingly modest Bradley developed a public, and we had some trouble with him. Eisenhower's failure to resolve the competing strategies of Montgomery and Bradley was then made worse by an accident. After leaving 12th Army Group headquarters near Chartres that afternoon, he was flown back to his own command post at Granville on the Atlantic coast of Normandy. It was a grave mistake to have chosen a spot so far behind the rapidly developing battlefronts. In fact, as Bradley pointed out, he would have been better placed for communications if he had stayed in London. Towards the end of the flight back to Granville, his light aircraft developed engine trouble, and the pilot had to land on a beach. Eisenhower, who had already damaged one knee, now wrecked the other one when helping to turn the aircraft round on the sand. He was confined to bed with the leg in plaster just before Bradley and Montgomery were due to meet. He stayed immobilized for a whole week, which proved to be a crucial one. That same evening of the 2nd of September, Horrocks arrived at the headquarters of the Guards' Armoured Division in Douai. He felt frustrated by the need to hold back his troops that day to allow an airborne drop on Tournay. It had then been cancelled at the last moment due to bad weather, and because the American 19 Corps had already reached the drop zones. So, with a certain theatrical flourish, Horrocks announced to the assembled Guards officers that their objective for the next day was Brussels, some 110 kilometres further on. There was a gasp of delighted astonishment. Horrocks also ordered Roberts' 11th Armoured Division to charge straight for the great port of Antwerp in Operation Sabo. With the Welsh Guards, preceded by the armoured cars of the 2nd Household Cavalry Regiment on the right and the Grenadier Guards group on the left, the spirit of competition was irresistible and nothing could stop us that day, an officer recorded. The betting on who would reach Brussels first was intense. Les jeux sont faits, rien ne va plus, was apparently the roulette croupier's cry at 0600 hours as both contingents set off. The Irish Guards group, in reserve, followed a few hours later. It was our longest drive, 82 miles in 13 hours, their second armoured battalion noted in the war diary. But for some units, the headlong advance did not turn out to be so sporting. The Grenadiers lost more than 20 men in a vicious engagement with a group of SS. The unexpected appearance of the Guards' Armoured Division in the Belgian capital that evening triggered an even greater jubilation than had been seen during the liberation of Paris. The chief trouble was the mobbing of the crowds, the household cavalry noted, as they were constantly brought to a halt by exultant Belgians packed along the road a dozen deep, singing Tipperary and making V for victory signs. Another universal habit of the liberated is to write messages of welcome all over the vehicles as they slowly nose their way through the crowd, wrote the same officer. If you stop, they swarm over the vehicle, cover it with fruit and flowers, and offer wine. The household cavalry and the Welsh guards won the race by a short head, although it was a hazardous task, because every time one stopped to ask the way, one was hauled from the car and soundly kissed by both sexes. German troops still held the aerodrome outside the capital and fired five rounds of high explosive into the park in front of the royal palace where Major General Alan Adair was establishing his command post under canvas. British troops were greatly helped by the Armée Blanche of the Belgian resistance, which proved of enormous value for rounding up the many stray Germans who were trying to escape. Civilians, when not kissing their liberators, hissed and booed and kicked any German prisoners they saw. Many British soldiers were struck by the contrast with Normandy, where the welcome had often been half-hearted amid the terrible destruction wreaked on their towns and villages. The people dressed better, an officer wrote. Clothes seemed more plentiful, everyone looked clean and healthy, whereas France gave one the impression that everyone was shoddy and tired. But appearances of comparative prosperity could be misleading. The German occupiers had seized food supplies, coal and other resources for themselves, and more than half a million Belgians had been shipped off for forced labour in German factories. Belgium, however, at least benefited from the rapidity of the Allied advance. This saved it from the destruction of battle, 
last-minute looting and the usual scorched-earth tactics of the Wehrmacht. But to the southeast, reckless attacks by the Belgian resistance on retreating groups of German soldiers led to vicious and indiscriminate reprisals by SS units in particular. The Germans were shaken by the rapidity of the Allied advance that day. An NCO described it in his diary as an event that surpasses all expectations and calculations, and even puts our blitzkrieg in the summer of 1940 in the shade. Oberstleutnant Fulrieder noted the conversation of officers in the barracks. The Western Front has had it. The enemy is already in Belgium and on the German border. Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia and Finland are asking for peace. It's just like in 1918. Others blame their first ally most of all. The Italians are the most guilty, Unteroffizier Oskar Siegel wrote home, and some compared Italy's betrayal of Germany to that of Austria in the First World War. In some cases, this produced reactions of bewildered self-pity. We Germans have only enemies in the world, and one has to ask, why are we so hated everywhere? There is no nation which wants to know us. Allied generals also drew parallels with the end of the First World War. The optimism was such that Bradley's 12th Army Group headquarters had already ordered up 25 tons of maps for operations in Germany. And Bradley's aide, Major Chester B. Hansen, remarked that everyone was getting as excited as a sophomore class on the eve before a dance. At 12th Army Group headquarters, everything we talk about now is qualified by the phrase, if the war lasts that long. They had completely misunderstood the consequences of Oberst Klaus Graf Schenk von Stauffenberg's attempted bomb attack against Hitler on the 20th of July. Allied commanders assumed that this event had signaled the start of the German army's disintegration. In fact, its failure and the repression which followed meant the very opposite. The Nazi party and the SS now had total control, and the general staff and all army formations would be forced to fight to the Führer's last breath. On the morning of the 3rd of September, while Allied spearheads advanced on Antwerp, Brussels and Maastricht, Generals Bradley and Hodges flew to the headquarters of Lieutenant General Miles Dempsey's 2nd British Army. The purpose was to discuss future operations towards the Ruhr with Montgomery. Apart from Eisenhower, laid up with his bad leg in Granville, Another absentee from the conference was Lieutenant General Henry Creera, the commander of the 1st Canadian Army, who had insisted on staying in Dieppe to take a memorial parade for all of his countrymen killed in the disastrous raid of August 1942. He would have pointed out the difficulties of seizing the Channel ports and dealing with the German 15th Army, which had retreated from the Pas de Calais to a pocket west of Antwerp on the Scheldt estuary. The port of Antwerp was also vital to any idea of advancing across the Rhine into Germany, yet both Montgomery and Bradley were fixated with their own diverging intentions, the British heading north and the Americans heading east. No proper minutes of this conference were taken, and afterwards Bradley became convinced that Montgomery had deliberately misled him. Bradley said that the airborne drop planned for the next day on the bridges over the River Meuse, or Maas in Dutch, around Liège, should be cancelled. Montgomery apparently agreed. We both consider, the field marshal said afterwards, that all available aircraft should go on transport work so that we can maintain momentum of advance. Yet later that very afternoon, at 1600 hours, Montgomery ordered his chief of staff to ask the first Allied airborne army back in England to start working on another plan, a far more ambitious one. His new idea was to seize the bridges between Wesel and Arnhem to launch his 21st Army Group across the Rhine north of the Ruhr. Montgomery evidently calculated that if he could be the first to establish a bridgehead over the Rhine, Eisenhower would have to give him the bulk of the supplies and support him with American formations. It was a great pity that Eisenhower had not been at the meeting. When Bradley found out that Montgomery had reneged on what had been agreed without telling him, he was furious. Montgomery refused to acknowledge what almost all other senior British officers had understood. Britain was now very much the junior partner in the alliance, because the Americans were providing the bulk of the troops, much of the hardware, and most of the oil. 
The idea that Britain remained a first-rate power was a fantasy which Churchill desperately tried to promote, even though he knew in his heart that it was not the case. In fact, one could argue that September 1944 was the origin of that disastrous cliché which lingers on even today about the country punching above its weight. Chapter 2 Mad Tuesday On Monday the 4th of September, the second day of celebration in Brussels, Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands broadcast a message from London. Compatriots, you know our liberation is coming. I wanted you to know that I have nominated Prince Bernhardt as commander of the Dutch forces under the Supreme Commander General Eisenhower. Prince Bernhard will be the commander of the armed resistance. Until soon, Wilhelmina. The German retreat through the Netherlands towards the Reich had begun on the 1st of September and reached its peak four days later on what became known as Dolle Dienstag, or Mad Tuesday. Rumours spread that Montgomery's armies were already at the border, and a mistaken report by the Dutch service of the BBC radio on the evening of the 4th of September even claimed that the Allies had reached Breda and Roermond. In Amsterdam, people went out the next morning, expecting to see Allied tanks on their way in. Most retreats are sorry sights, but the bedraggled, dejected mass of Wehrmacht stragglers from France and Belgium caused an unusual degree of jubilation, disdain and harsh laughter in the Dutch people, after the humiliations of the arrogant occupation. Never have we enjoyed anything as much as watching the disorderly retreat of this once great army, the woman in Eindhoven wrote. Some in improvised units, such as Kriegsmarine sailors, formed into Schiffstammabteilungen, had trudged most of the way from the Atlantic coast. Others had seized any vehicle they could find along the way. Cars such as old Citroens with running boards and wood-burning trucks with smokestacks. The spectacle, which fascinated and thrilled the Dutch, seemed to confirm the impression of total defeat. They took chairs out onto the side of the street to watch. The formerly invincible and mechanized Wehrmacht, which had crushed their country so easily in the summer of 1940, had now been reduced to stealing every imaginable form of conveyance, especially bicycles. There had been four million bicycles in the Netherlands at the beginning of the war, half as many as the total population. The Wehrmacht had commandeered 50,000 at the beginning of July 1942, and now thousands more were headed for Germany, most of them loaded with soldiers' equipment and booty, as they pushed them along the roads. With no rubber for tires, peddling them on wooden wheels was heavy work. But their loss hit hard. The Dutch underground movement needed them for their couriers, and ordinary families relied on bicycles for seeking out food from farms in the countryside. Most of the motor cars looted in France and Belgium also lacked tyres. Driven on the rims of their wheels, they made a noise which caused everyone to wince. The majority were occupied by German officers, and, as an onlooker in Eindhoven noted, many vehicles had young women sitting in them, the sort that usually fraternised with Germans. These French, Belgian, and Dutch women, who were presumably guilty of collaboration horizontale, clearly wanted to avoid a predictable fate at home. In Arnhem, too, the neurologist, Louis van Erp, saw a number of German officers with women on their laps, partly German, partly French women. And the officers were flourishing bottles of brandy. In some towns the day was called Cognac Tuesday. German soldiers tried to sell some of the bottles and other items they had stolen. Only a few Dutch took advantage of the bargains offered, which included sewing machines, cameras, watches, textiles, and birds in cages unlikely to survive the journey. Some motor cars belonged to Dutch Nazi sympathizers in the NSP, the National Socialistische Beweging. They knew that the southern Netherlands province of Brabant would prove too dangerous for them without German protection. Others fleeing vengeance included collaborators from France and arch-Catholic pro-Nazi Rexist from Belgium. The loyal Dutch called members of the NSB the Wrong Netherlanders, or the Black Kameraden, and saw them as somehow worse than the Germans. The attitude of the Dutch population towards the NSB 
remains totally opposed, a German officer in Utrecht reported. Better ten Germans than one NSPer is the general view, and considering the rejection of everything German, that really means something. Other vehicles included the odd omnibus and Red Cross ambulances packed with soldiers and their weapons contrary to all the rules of war. There were German soldiers on horse-drawn farm carts loaded with chickens, ducks and geese in wooden cages, and trucks with stolen sheep and pigs. Somebody spotted two oxen stumbling about in a bus, and a nun saw a cow in an ambulance. Such sights produced a bitter smile at the shameless theft of food from occupied countries. There was the odd fire engine, and even a hearse with ostrich plumes covered in dust. Wehrmacht vehicles had branches from pine trees tied to the front, in an attempt to sweep away the tacks and nails scattered on roads by members of the underground. The exhausted foot soldiers, the Muffin, as the Dutch called their German occupiers contemptuously, looked disheveled, bearded, and black with dirt. Footnote. The Dutch word Muffin for Germans was the equivalent of Kraut or Bosch in English or French. It dated from the early 17th century when the areas of northern Germany, just east of the Netherlands, were referred to as the Muffe. The much richer and more sophisticated Dutch looked down on their inhabitants as unsophisticated and crude. The term was revived during the German occupation. End of footnote. Their appearance and that of their officers sitting back in cars caused a sensation once the dismal cavalcade crossed the Reich frontier. There were wild rumors and numerous black jokes. A Gefreiter heard from his family. Yesterday evening people were saying that in Kaiserslautern, the Führer himself was inspecting the cars. Civilians also resented the privileges of officers and their treatment of the ordinary soldier, the Lanzer. The gentlemen travelled in their fully loaded automobiles, leaving the Lanzer in the lurch. A marked difference in attitude had developed in Germany towards the Eastern Front soldier and his counterpart, the Westfront Kämpfer. There was a general suspicion that the German army in the West had been softened by its four years of easy occupation in France and the Low Countries. The feeling of the civilian population towards the soldier on the Western Front is not altogether good, a woman wrote to her husband, and I too am convinced that if the soldier of the Eastern Front had been in the West, then the breakthrough would not have happened. A gunner wrote home, rather confirming the impression of collapse in the West, I cannot convey what the sin is like. This isn't a retreat, but a flight. Yet he went on to admit that it was a well-provisioned departure. The cars were laden with schnapps, cigarettes, and hundreds of tins of fats and meat. The German occupation authorities also engaged in last-minute plundering. Having already seized church bells to melt down, they hurriedly shipped raw materials, especially coal and iron ore, to the Reich and held on to the engines and wagons. Such acts were justified on the grounds that they should not leave an economic advantage to the Allies. A certain amount of scorched-earth actions were also carried out. In Eindhoven, a series of enormous explosions could be heard as the Germans destroyed installations on the airfield and blew up munition dumps. A huge pall of smoke blotted out the sun. Transporting all these resources to the Reich was not easy. The Dutch underground carried out acts of sabotage during the first part of September. Yet a German officer observed that the fact that railway traffic is almost at a standstill is not a question of fuel, but can be put down much more to the effects of English fighter pilots who have shot to death the majority of locomotives. To the dismay and even anger of the Dutch government in exile in London, RAF fighter pilots could not resist the thrill of blasting railway engines with cannon fire because it produced such a spectacular explosion of steam. The only satisfaction for civilians was to see how NSP members and their families were made frantic by these delays in their desperation to escape to Germany. In a town southwest of Arnhem, their plight produced intense schadenfreude. It was a wonderful sight, a local called Paul von Veli wrote. The station waiting room looked like a junk store with tramps, crying faces and hanging heads. Around 30,000 NSB members and their families went to Germany, where they were ignored in the disintegration of the last months of the war. As one historian put it, 
Organized fascism in the Netherlands virtually collapsed on the 5th of September. During what appeared to be an interregnum, and with the Dutch police more or less in hiding after their equivocal role during the occupation, underground groups kidnapped members of the NSP and even a few German officials. Some were freed soon afterwards by the German police. On that mad Tuesday, the Reich Commissar, Dr. Arthur Zeiss Infart, declared a state of emergency. Resistance against the occupying forces will be broken with arms in accordance with the orders given to German troops. He went on to threaten death sentences for the slightest opposition. Footnote. Zeiss Inquart's full title of Reich Kommissar für die Besitzen Niederlandischen Gebiete, Reich Kommissar for the Occupied Netherlandish Areas, reflected the earlier Nazi plan of incorporating the Netherlands into the Reich. End of footnote. Many German officers were angry that the Dutch were preparing to welcome their Anglo-Saxon liberators with flowers and flags. This was a typical Nazi confusion of cause and effect. Having treacherously invaded and occupied a neutral country, they still expected the population to remain loyal to them. The Dutch are not just cowardly, but lazy and slow, rode Oberleutnant Helmut Hinsel with bitterness. Many ordinary soldiers did not, however, agree. Those who were sick of the war used to remark ironically, My longing for a heroic death has been fully satisfied. Reich Germans, residing or working in Holland, even the sixty-year-olds, were appalled to be mobilized during this crisis. They wear civilian clothing under their uniforms, hoping to escape, a sympathetic Dutchman observed, but are never left alone. A very wet and stormy day, Admiral Ramsey noted in his diary. British in Brussels and Antwerp. Latter port not badly damaged, but of course it is useless until the estuary and approaches are cleared of the enemy. Ramsey's concern did not register with his colleagues in khaki. They were still glowing with the success of their great advance. The 11th Armoured Division's progress into Antwerp was extremely difficult, owing to the great joy and enthusiasm shown by the enormous crowds. The Germans had been so taken by surprise that only a few of them put up a determined fight. Most important of all, the resistance had managed to secure the port installations and prevent any last-minute destruction by the Germans. Its members had also proved of great assistance in dealing with snipers and prisoners. The prisoners were locked up in empty cages in Antwerp Zoo, one for German officers, NCOs and soldiers, others held traitors and collaborators, and another held their wives and children, as well as young women accused of having slept with Germans. The animals had starved to death or been eaten during the occupation. To protect the narrow Allied corridor to Antwerp, forces were pushed out sideways to defend it. The Sherwood Rangers reached Rennes, south of Ghent, after a 400-kilometre advance from their abandoned game of cricket eight days before. With their Sherman tanks, they surrounded a German regiment, some 1,200 men strong. The German commander, a stout, dapper little man with a bull neck, insisted during protracted negotiations that his honour as an officer required at least an impression of fighting on. Time was wasted, but the Sherwood Rangers knew that this was better than even a one-sided battle, which would take longer. The German commander finally agreed that he and his men would march out that evening, bearing arms, and would surrender on condition that no German soldier was handed over to the resistance. The Oberst insisted on addressing his men for about fifteen minutes, assuring them that they had made an honourable surrender. He then nodded to his Tobs Feldwebel, who shouted an order, and almost as one they smashed the butts of their rifles on the road. Then each man raised his right hand and shouted, Sieg Heil, three times, which seemed rather paradoxical at the moment of giving in. Members of the resistance, deprived of their revenge, watched angrily as their former occupiers were marched off to a holding camp. Oryx's two armoured divisions, having achieved their dramatic dash forward, halted where they were in Antwerp and Brussels to service their vehicles and rest. Oryx, on his way to Brussels, was shot at by a German tank overtaken in the advance. Armoured cars of the Second Household Cavalry were sent back to patrol the road, while their corps commander set up his headquarters in the park of the Palace of Larkin. It was another day of celebration in the city, 
with a triumphal procession through the town. The guard's armoured division was followed by a brigade of Belgian troops brought forward to share in the event. A guard's officer called it a most remarkable sight, with literally the whole of Brussels lining the streets and cheering. Meanwhile, batches of prisoners were being marched about by the members of the Belgian resistance's Armée Blanche, who, from time to time, fired their rifles in the air. Shortly afterwards, the Grenadier Guards Group, one battalion of infantry and one of tanks, moved due east from Brussels to take Louvain, or Leuven in Flemish. For many in the regiment, it brought back memories of an action there during the retreat towards Dunkirk just over four years before. Field Marshal Montgomery also returned to old haunts. He set up his headquarters at the Chateau de Verberg, fifteen kilometres east of Brussels, on the road to Louvain. Montgomery knew the place well. This eighteenth-century building, restyled later, had been the Third Division's headquarters just over four years before, in the late spring of 1940. The Châtelaine, the Princesse de Merode, was not overjoyed to see her visitors, as she apparently remembered how Montgomery's staff officers had depleted the wine cellar on the previous occasion. She could not help feeling that her home was being treated just like a hotel. Only that morning, Luftwaffe fighter pilots from JG-51, the famed Jagdschwader Mulders, had pulled out hurriedly, and three hours later the British arrived to take possession. By the end of the first week in September, the fuel shortage had really started to affect both Montgomery's 21st Army Group and Bradley's 12th Army Group. Bradley's aide Hansen wrote on the 6th of September that even corps commanders were forced to go borrowing cans of gas to keep their cars fueled. With none of the channel ports yet open, supplies had to be brought all the way from western Normandy in a constant shuttle, known as the Red Ball Express, with thousands of trucks driven by African-American soldiers. Huge Red Ball Express convoys, Hansen added, are speeding up the highways with tons and tons of gas, rolling at fifty miles an hour all night long, with their bright lights illuminating the road. The Guards' Armoured Division in Brussels received orders to advance onto the Albert Canal and then onto Leopoldsburg, close to the Dutch frontier, before carrying on to Eindhoven. Only slight opposition was expected, with resistance harder, on the canals and bridges. A large warehouse full of drink reserved for the Wehrmacht had been discovered, so the Irish guards sent a truck and collected twenty-eight cases of champagne, as well as wine and liqueurs, to fuel their triumphant advance. The guards managed to secure a foothold over the Albert Canal at Beringen, despite the Germans blowing the bridge. During the night, their sapper squadron erected a bailey bridge to replace it. By the middle of the next day, the guards armoured realised that we would have to stop thinking in terms of flowers, fruit and kisses, and get down to some steady stuff. Opposition had suddenly strengthened. At one moment, during that very complicated day, it even looked as if the bridge might go when a desperate force of one officer and forty SS troops crept onto the barges nearby after knocking out no less than forty supply vehicles. Both the Welsh and the Coldstream had taken quite a knock, the war diary keeper noted, and added, SS troops should all be either killed or wounded, but preferably the former. Observant Dutch civilians had already started to notice a change in German military activity even while the columns of dispirited troops continued to pass through their town. One bystander in Eindhoven noted, The retreat of the Germans continued on the Monday, but at the same time a counter-movement was seen to develop. A large formation of troops, heavily camouflaged with branches of trees, marched through the city in the direction of the Belgian frontier. The British capture of Antwerp on the 4th of September had created a storm at Führer headquarters in East Prussia, the Wolfschanze. Hitler, on hearing the news, wiped from his mind the circumstances in which he had sacked General Feldmarschall Gerd von Rundstedt at the end of June, and recalled him to duty once again as Commander-in-Chief West. General Oberst, Kurt Student, was in Berlin on the island of Wannsee at the headquarters of the Luftwaffe's Fallschirmjäger, or paratroop arm, when a call came through from the Wolfschanze. Student, the architect of the Fallschirmjäger force, had commanded the airborne operations in the Netherlands in 1940 and in Crete the following year. The order from Hitler was to build a new defence line along the Albert Canal and to hold it indefinitely. 
Student's formation was given the inflated designation of First Fauchium Army. According to one of his more cynical officers, Hitler chose Student because the Führer, the greatest commander of all time, said to himself, Who shall defend Holland? Only he who conquered Holland can do that. So Student came to Holland. Student was to take every paratroop unit he could lay his hands on, starting with Oberstleutnant Friedrich Freiherr von der Heiter's 6th Fallschirmjäger Regiment. He also brought in new formations, those in training establishments, and even Luftwaffe ground crew turned into infantry battalions. Heiter, a veteran of the airborne invasion of Crete in 1941, was scathing about the way untrained Luftwaffe personnel were being designated as Fallschirmjäger. Those new paratroop divisionen are second-rate flak field divisions, he told fellow officers. It's just pure vanity on Goering's part. The point seems to be that he thinks if peace breaks out, I don't see why Himmler should be the only one to have a private army. The 6th Luftwaffe Battalion, for special missions, was in fact a penal battalion brought back from Italy. It consisted of Luftwaffe airmen and ground crew convicted of crimes, and officers sacked for incompetence. Their weaponry was pitiful, and they were still wearing tropical uniforms. Even Heiter's famous regiment was a shadow of its former self after its battles against the American 101st Airborne in Normandy. The fighting strength of the regiment was weak, he reported. The men were not yet welded together, the young replacements made up 75% of the strength, and they were barely trained. Hundreds of members of the regiment had never had a weapon in their hand, and fired the first shots of their lives in their first engagement. Three of the new regiments were formed into the 7th Fallschirm Jäger Division. The student told his chief of staff, General Leutnant Erdmann, to command it. Student was also given the 719th Infantry Division of Coastal Defense, and the 176th Infantry Division, composed mostly of battalions with convalescents and the chronically sick. To command them, he had the headquarters of the 88 Corps under General der Infanterie Hans Wolfgang Reinhardt, a calm and experienced troop leader. Although he received a brigade of assault guns, including some heavy Jagdpanther tank destroyers, his small and barely mobile army had only 25 tanks along a front which stretched for nearly 200 kilometers all the way from the North Sea to Maastricht. Student's parachute army was to come under the command of Army Group B. Having no artillery, Student ordered in flak units from Luftflotte Reich, because their 88mm anti-aircraft guns were also devastatingly effective against tanks. And then, he wrote with only slight exaggeration, one could admire once again the astonishing precision of German organization and of the general staff. All these troops which were strewn all over Germany, from Gustrow in Mecklenburg to Bitsch in Lorraine, were sent as blitz transports to the Albert Canal. Here they arrived on the 6th and 7th of September, 48 to 72 hours after being alerted. The most remarkable aspect was that when the troops arrived at the stations, arms and equipment lay ready for five newly formed Fallschirmjäger regiments, having been brought in from other parts of Germany. There had been also some spontaneous reactions against the headlong retreat. On the 4th of September, General Leutnant Kurt Schill, with the remnants of his 85th Infantry Division, had halted at Turnhout on hearing that the British had entered Antwerp and Brussels. He turned his men around to redeploy along the Albert Canal. Schill's division had been reduced to less than a single regiment in Normandy. It had retreated via Brussels having picked up a battalion of barely armed replacements on the way. Purely by chance, General Reinhardt had come across the 85th Division's signals officer and was thrilled to hear that Schill had begun rounding up stragglers and seizing any artillery units still withdrawing. He was using them to man a defence line along the Albert Canal between Hasselt and Herentals. The 85th Division thus became one of the key building blocks of Student's parachute army. In many places, officers and the hated Feldgendarmerie, known as chain dogs or Kettenhunde, because of the metal gorget worn on a chain round their necks, had seized stragglers at gunpoint and forced them into scratch units. In a retreat, a Kampfkommandant was designated, and as one officer explained, he is an officer who has the right to stop any officer up to and including the rank of Oberst at any time and to force him to go into action immediately, even at pistol point if necessary.
On Tuesday, the 5th of September, Student flew to see Moudel at Verviers, near Liège. He argued that their only hope of obtaining enough troops to hold the line was General Gustav Adolf von Sangen's 15th Army. Thanks to the British decision to halt at Antwerp and not secure the Scheldt estuary, Student did indeed start to receive reinforcements from the 15th Army. Its men and guns were shipped in barges across the Scheldt estuary at night to avoid Allied air attack. This failure to trap such a large force was to have a major influence later in the month when these German troops were able to attack the western flank of the American paratroopers trying to defend the route north towards Arnhem. Student went on to see General Reinhardt of 88 Corps. On the way he passed shire horses pulling the wagons of the 719th Division. This provided a bleak reminder that Germany was now fighting a poor man's war. On the next day, the 6th of September, when General Lieutenant Schill finally had a chance to report to Student, the two men heard that British tanks had crossed the canal at Beningen. Student ordered Schill to supervise a counterattack with Heiter's 6th Fallschirmjäger Regiment and the battalion of the 2nd Fallschirmjäger. They were supported by an army Panzerjäger battalion of tank destroyers. Just north of Beningen, at Bevalu, there was hard fighting in the village, with the Guards' Armoured Division losing a number of tanks to Panzerfaust rocket-propelled grenades. Allied commanders underestimated the energy of General Feldmarschall Walter Model, whom Hitler had brought in to take over Army Group B during the final crisis in Normandy. Model, a short, stocky man with a monocle, was totally unlike the sort of aristocratic staff officer whom Hitler loathed. From a modest background and with a popular touch, Model was unswervingly loyal to Hitler, who in turn had trusted him implicitly as his fireman to resolve a crisis on the Eastern Front. Model provoked mixed reactions among his own officers, while one regimental commander in an SS Panzergrenadier division said that Model is the grave digger of the Western Front. Another from the same division clearly admired him. He is a first-rate artist of improvisation. He's an exceptionally cold-blooded dog, extraordinarily popular with the men, because he has a certain amount of feeling for them and doesn't push himself forward in any theatrical sort of way, but is thoroughly hated by his own headquarters staff because he demands as much from them as from himself. Modell is conceited and exuberant, always has new ideas and at least three solutions to any awkward situation, and is the complete autocrat. He won't stand any contradiction. Another senior officer agreed that Model never let his subordinates get a word in edgeways and was a little Hitler. The retreat of the stragglers from France horrified General der Flieger Friedrich Christiansen, the Wehrmacht commander-in-chief of the Netherlands. He felt that their disheveled appearance demoralized his own troops. At bridges over the main rivers, especially the Waal, men were halted and reformed into scratch groups called Alarmeinheiten. Christiansen, one of the three men who wielded power in the Nazi-controlled Netherlands, had been a seaplane ace in the First World War. He was not known for his intelligence, only for his passionate admiration for the Führer and his total subservience to Reich Marshal Hermann Göring. His second-in-command was General Lieutenant Heinz Helmut von Wüllisch, a gaunt old Prussian warhorse who had gathered a staff of like-minded officers. Christiansen, however, had a deeply suspicious streak. He tried to recruit spies in the wake of the bomb plot against Hitler because he regarded Wulisch as a real or potential traitor. He was guilty, Christiansen insisted after the war. He committed suicide, he added, as if that proved his point. In theory, the leadership of the Nazi administration in the country lay with an Austrian, Reich Commissar Dr. Arthur Zeisinkwart. Zeisinkwart a bespectacled lawyer, had in March 1938 been the organiser of Hitler's Anschluss, turning their mother country into the Ostmark province of Großdeutschland. Zeisinkwart became its governor and promptly ordered the confiscation of Jewish property. After the invasion of Poland, he became deputy to Hans Frank, the notorious Nazi in charge of the General Gouvernement in Poland. Then, following the invasion and occupation of the neutral Netherlands in May 1940, this convinced anti-Semite, instigated the persecution of all Jews in the country. Tragically, 
Dutch officials had failed to destroy the administrative records before the Wehrmacht seized public buildings. The religious affiliation of each person marked in the official rules identified the vast majority of the 140,000 Dutch and foreign Jews. Now, in September 1944, Zeiss inquired, greatly overestimating the strength of the Dutch underground movement, feared a general uprising, so he planned to make Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and The Hague into centres of defence. The third, and in some ways the most powerful member of the Nazi triumvirate in the Netherlands, was another Austrian, SS Obergruppenführer Hans Albin Rauter, the Hörer SS and Polizeiführer. When the main German roundup of Jews took place in June 1942, there were strikes and protests, but apart from demonstrating great bravery, they only increased the repression. Approximately 110,000 Jews out of 140,000 were deported from the Netherlands, and only 6,000 of these survived the war. The other 30,000 were in most cases hidden or smuggled out of the country by ordinary Dutch people. More than 1,500 of Arnhem's 1,700 Jews were deported to concentration camps in Germany and murdered. A number, however, were hidden and saved by the underground, especially by Johannes Penzel and his family. A fugitive from the Germans, whether Jewish or Gentile, who disappeared, was known as an Unterdeiger, or diver. Some areas were better than others in hiding Jews. For example, as many as half of Eindhoven's 500 Jews were concealed as divers and saved. Since armed resistance was almost impossible in a country lacking mountains and large forests, the Dutch underground concentrated on helping those in danger with fake identities and ration books, as well as collecting intelligence for the Allies and passing shot-down pilots along escape lines through Belgium and France to Spain. Rauter was merciless. He proudly reported on the 2nd of March, 1944, The Jewish problem in the Netherlands, properly speaking, can be considered solved. Within the next ten days, the last full Jews will be taken away from Westerbork camp to the east. He also ordered many reprisals for acts of resistance, which were later termed systematic terrorism against the Netherlands people. Prominent Dutchmen were seized as hostages and executed. After a train had been blown up by the Dutch underground, the Germans seized as a hostage Count Otto von limburg Stirum, the uncle of Audrey Hepburn, who was then living just outside Arnhem. He was executed with four others on the 15th of August, 1942. Mostly, the German authorities picked doctors and teachers as hostages. By 1944, their expectation of an Allied invasion made them nervous and cruel, with constant reprisals for sabotage or the killing of German personnel. Mad Tuesday had its own tragic consequences. In the general panic, the SS decided to evacuate the remaining 3,500 prisoners in the concentration camp at Wucht, known to the Germans as Konzentrationslager Herzogenbusch. Few Jews were left in the Netherlands by this stage, so most of the prisoners were Gentiles, Dutch, but also French and Belgian. Some 2,800 men were sent to Sachsenhausen, and more than 650 women to Ravensbrück. Footnote. It has been suggested that, of all nationalities, the Dutch suffered the lowest survival rate in concentration camps because their bodies had been used to a diet of high-fat content from dairy products. The sudden change to an almost total lack of fat in the camp food proved devastating. End of footnote. The occupation of the Netherlands was probably the most brutal of all those in Western Europe. German Nazis had hoped that the Dutch would join their cause as fellow Aryans. Rauter even insisted on referring to the Dutch SS as the Germanic SS. So the German authorities were first astonished, then enraged by the determined opposition from the great majority of the population. All students were ordered to declare their support for the Nazi regime. Any who refused were arrested on the 6th of February 1943 in mass roundups. Those who escaped had to disappear and become divers, too. Almost 400,000 citizens of the Netherlands were conscripted and sent to the Reich for Arbeitseinsatz, which effectively meant slave labor. The country's food supplies were systematically looted. Those living near the coast were forcibly removed, and large areas of farmland were deliberately flooded by breaking dikes. 
This part of Hitler's plan to defend Fortress Europe made further inroads into a food supply already greatly reduced by German depredations. Malnutrition began to have its effect, especially on children. Diphtheria and even typhus spread. In certain secret places, the brutality was far worse. Generalleutnant Walter Dornberger, the inspector of long-range rocket troops, was later recorded secretly in a British prisoner of war camp, speaking of the activities of his colleague, SS Standartenführer Bär. In the Netherlands, he made Dutchmen build the sites for the V-2, Dornberger told fellow officers. Then he had them herded together and killed by machine gun fire. He opened brothels for his soldiers with twenty Dutch girls. When they'd been there for two weeks, they were shot and new ones brought along, so that they couldn't divulge anything they might discover from the soldiers. Unfortunately, the Dutch suffered from their allies as well as from their enemy occupiers. The most unforgivable security lapses in the whole war by the Special Operations Executive in London led to the serial betrayal of Dutch agents parachuted in to help the underground. The Englandspiel operation mounted by the Abwehr, German counterintelligence, hoodwinked the British SOE officers in charge and constituted a huge blow to Anglo-Dutch relations. And on the 22nd of February, 1944, a terrible mistake was made. When part of an American bomber force heading for the Messerschmitt factory at Gotha was recalled, the formation decided to drop their bombs instead on a German town. Not realizing that they had just crossed the border of the Netherlands, the American bomber crews destroyed a large part of the old town in Nijmegen and killed 800 people that day. Sadly, the battles ahead to liberate southern Holland were to lead to even greater suffering. But the Dutch, so desperate to be free, proved not just remarkably brave, but also remarkably forgiving. Chapter 3 The First Allied Airborne Army While the British and the Americans were charging forward from the River Seine towards the German border, the British First Airborne Division back in Britain seethed with frustration as one operation after another was cancelled. Saturday the 2nd of September, Major J. E. Blackwood of the 11th Parachute Battalion wrote in his diary, briefed to drop southeast of Courtrai to stem the Hun retreat across the River Esco. Cancelled because of storm. Damn the storm. Sunday the 3rd of September, briefed to drop near Maastricht, Operation cancelled because Yankee armor advancing too fast. Damn the Yanks! Members of the 1st Airborne Division were the most exasperated because they had been left out of the D-Day operation. Kept in reserve for a follow-up or for an operation of opportunity, they had been stood to and stood down so many times that they were starting to become cynical. On a couple of occasions, the operation had not been cancelled until after they had been loaded into their aircraft and gliders on the runway. The first plan, hatched by Montgomery in the second week of June, was to drop the division around Evresy to create a breakthrough to seize Caen. For a number of reasons, Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mannery opposed the idea with determination. He was almost certainly right to do so, but as he had wrongly predicted total disaster for the airborne drops on D-Day, Montgomery felt confirmed in his opinion that the airman was just a gutless bugger. In August, with Patton's breakout from Normandy, one airborne operation after another was dreamed up, and the transport aircraft were consigned to fuel deliveries to help his advance. Lieutenant General Louis H. Brierton, the Air Force commander of the newly created First Allied Airborne Army, complained to the Supreme Commander, I must emphasize that continued cargo carrying will render the troop carrier command unfit for a successful airborne campaign. He had a point. It was Eisenhower who had insisted, when appointing Brierton, that his chief priority was to improve the navigation training of Nine Troop Carrier Command so that paratroops were no longer dropped in the wrong places, as had happened in the invasion of Sicily in 1943 and then again in Normandy. The next idea was to seize crossings across the River Seine, but General Patton was already there. On the 17th of August, planning started on a drop in the Pas de Calais, east of Boulogne. But then Brierton and Montgomery's chief of staff, Major General Francis de Gangon, known as Freddy, agreed that the effort should be switched to the enemy's main line of retreat. Operation Linnet 
planned for the 3rd of September, would aim for Tournay over the Belgian border, and for a bridgehead over the river Esco. Linnet was cancelled on the 2nd of September, with the possibility of switching to a Linnet II to seize bridgeheads over the River Meuse, with three airborne divisions ahead of the American First Army. That, too, was cancelled at the meeting between Montgomery and Bradley the next day. The First Allied Airborne Army had only been called into being on the 2nd of August 1944 by General Eisenhower. Despite Eisenhower's devotion to balanced Allied relations, General Louis Brierton's staff consisted mainly of American Air Force officers. At their headquarters, Sunny Hill Park, near Ascot, they enjoyed Saturday night dances at their own club and watched movies such as Kansas City Kitty and Louisiana Hayride. The only senior British officer with the 1st Allied Airborne Army was Brierton's deputy, Lieutenant General Frederick Browning. The whole setup, with the USAAF general and staff commanding two major army formations, the American 18 Airborne Corps and the British 1 Airborne Corps, was bound to complicate priorities and roles. Matters were not helped by a strong mutual dislike between Brierton and Boy Browning. The only characteristic the two men had in common was vanity. Brierton, a small, difficult man, was such a compulsive womanizer that his activities provoked a severe rebuke from General George C. Marshall, the American chief of staff, and a man of the strictest moral rectitude. Browning, a hawk-faced grenadier guards officer with the air of a matinee idol, was married to the writer Daphne du Maurier. She had chosen maroon for the paratrooper's beret, as it was one of the general's racing colors. Although undoubtedly brave, Browning was highly strung. He could not help tugging at his moustache when nervous. His barely concealed ambition, combined with an immaculate uniform and a peremptory manner, did not endear him to other senior officers, especially the American paratroop commanders. They regarded the suave and polished boy Browning as a patronizing and manipulative empire builder. Unfortunately, when the tensions came to a head, Browning picked the wrong fight with Brierton, threatening to resign. On the 3rd of September, he wrote to oppose Operation Linnet II, which was intended to help Bradley's advance. Sir, I have the honor to forward my protest in writing. He began in the formal way. He went on to list his reasons for concluding that dropping three airborne divisions, one British and two American, to seize crossings over the River Meuse between Maastricht and Liège would fail. The whole enterprise was to be launched in less than thirty-six hours. The First Allied Airborne Army had no maps of the area to brief troops, no information on enemy dispositions and flak defences, and Allied fighter cover would not include the whole area of operations. Browning was undoubtedly right, but Linnet too was cancelled by Bradley and Montgomery during their meeting that same day, on very different grounds, the greater need for fuel deliveries. As a result, Browning's protest served only to rile Brierton, who seemed much keener to help Bradley's forces than the British. And whatever the circumstances, a threat to resign cannot be repeated with any effect soon afterwards. Browning, who was desperate to command an airborne corps in action before the war came to an end, knew only too well that next time it would be seized upon. His American counterpart, Major General Matthew Bunker Ridgway, the commander of 18 Airborne Corps, longed to take over and was better qualified. Ridgway had led the 82nd Airborne Division into Sicily, into Italy, and into Normandy in June, so he had seen far more airborne combat. Browning had not been in action since the First World War. Immediately after Montgomery's meeting with Bradley on the 3rd of September, where he had disingenuously agreed not to use airborne forces, he promptly signaled his chief of staff, Freddy de Gangon, at 1600 hours, Require airborne operation of one British division and Poles on evening 6th September or morning 7th September to secure bridges over Rhine between Wesel and Arnhem. This was to be called Operation Comet. De Gangon contacted Brierton's headquarters, and at 22.30 hours, Brigadier General Floyd L. Parks, Brierton's chief of staff, telephoned General Browning to pass on the order. You will immediately prepare detailed plans for an airborne operation along the River Rhine between Arnhem and Wesel. Browning did not object this time. As well as his own determination to lead an airborne attack, the morale of the 1st Airborne Division badly needed an end to the dispiriting series of last-minute cancellations. 
Browning was far from alone in his desire to use airborne forces in a dramatic and decisive way. Both Brigadier General James M. Gavin, the commander of the 82nd Airborne, and Major General Maxwell D. Taylor, who commanded the 101st, were keen to prove that airborne troops were critical to winning the war. Churchill also wanted the operation to boost British prestige just as it was flagging, and Montgomery saw it as a chance to seize control of Allied strategy. Both the Americans and the British had invested major resources to create the first Allied airborne army with six and a half divisions. Footnote. The first Allied airborne army consisted of the American 18 Airborne Corps, with the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, and the 17th Airborne Division still in training, and the British 1 Airborne Corps, with the 1st and 6th Airborne Divisions, the Polish 1st Independent Parachute Brigade attached, and the 52nd Lowland Division as an air landing formation to be flown in later to a captured airfield. End of footnote. Although a small army in conventional terms, it was by far the largest and best equipped airborne force ever assembled. General Marshall, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, and General Hap Arnold, head of the U.S. Army Air Force, were impatient to use it in a major strategic operation. The American press was carried away by the idea that airborne operations represented the future of warfare. Time magazine even believed that Peace could be maintained in the post-war world with the establishment of an airborne international army. This was a fantasy which ignored basic limitations, such as the comparatively short range of fully loaded troop-carrying aircraft. It was a mistake often shared by generals who should have known better. On the 4th of September, Browning and de Gangon flew to France, and at 1900 hours a conference began at Dempsey's Second Army Headquarters. We discussed plans for the capture of Nijmegen and Arnhem, Dempsey noted. I will start with 30 corps from Antwerp on the morning of the 7th of September 44. An airborne corps will drop two or three airborne brigades on the morning of the 7th of September to get the bridges. Back in England, British and Polish airborne officers did not share their superiors' enthusiasm for Operation Comet. The plan for a parachute brigade to drop nearly 110 kilometers behind German lines to seize the bridge over the Nieder Rhein, or Lower Rhine, at Arnhem, and for Major General Stanislaw Sosobowski's Polish Independent Brigade and an air landing brigade to take Nijmegen, the Great Bridge, and the high ground to the southeast of the city, prompted ironical remarks about the British and the Poles capturing Holland all by themselves. Sosobowski, who had been a professor at the Polish War College, interrupted Major General Roy Urquhart in the briefing. But the Germans, General, the Germans! He also referred sarcastically to these planning geniuses who had come up with such an idea. Brigadier John Shan Hackett also became restless at the naive assumptions that all would go well on the day. Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, who would command the troops at Arnhem Bridge, was completely frank with his officers. Believe me, it will be some bloodbath, he told them. Encouraged by the heady optimism prevailing in headquarters on the continent, the First Allied Airborne Army also grossly underestimated the determination of the enemy. Large forces of airborne troops, their intelligence chief wrote, having the audacity to drop in daylight may well scare the enemy into a state of complete disorganization. Despite Eisenhower's instruction that the First Allied Airborne Army was to support Montgomery's forces, Britain also favoured using it to help Bradley. On the 5th of September, two days after agreeing to Comet, Britain even approved the preparation of a plan to lift the U.S. Airborne Corps and drop it back of the Siegfried Line in the vicinity of Cologne. This would have led to a terrible disaster if it had gone ahead, because the Germans would have concentrated all available forces to defend the city and the Rhine crossings there. Eisenhower had insisted that something must be done to secure the Scheldt estuary to open the port of Antwerp and trap the German 15th Army. Montgomery's headquarters reacted to this only on the 8th of September, demanding an airborne assault on the island of Bolcherin, despite the fact that planning for Comet was underway. This time Browning and Brierton were united in their opposition. Browning believed that the air forces could achieve almost as much by attacking the shipping by which troops are being evacuated from south of the Scheldt estuary. But this would have been hard since the Germans were moving them only at night. 
Breardon turned the project down because the small size of the island indicates excessive losses due to drowning of troops dropped in the water. The terrain was no good for gliders, and Walcheren had strong flak defences. The almost casual way in which both First Allied Airborne Army and Montgomery's headquarters came up with one airborne plan after another, and in this case two at the same time, almost beggars belief. Brigadier Edgar Bill Williams, Montgomery's chief intelligence officer, admitted later that we didn't work in the serious way we did for D-Day. We were in Brussels, where we had parties and a gay time. Everyone worked, but the psychology was wrong. In addition, Montgomery saw only Browning when discussing airborne operations. He did not want to consult the RAF, even though the War Office and Air Ministry had agreed after the airborne chaos in Sicily that the Air Force side must lead the planning process. And Browning probably did not want to admit to the field marshal that the real decisions would be taken by U.S. AAF officers at Breerton's headquarters. In any case, the lack of liaison between ground and air was pitiful if not scandalous. It was bad even on the air side. Lee Mallory had to write to Breerton to point out that he had failed to invite to planning meetings the RAF commanders of 38 and 46 groups, whose transport aircraft would be an integral part of Operation Comet. On the 9th of September, Sosobovsky, accompanied by Major General Urquhart, the commander of the 1st Airborne Division, met Browning at Cotsmoor Airfield in the Midlands to discuss Comet. Sir, Sosobovsky said to Browning without any preamble, I am very sorry, but this mission cannot possibly succeed. Why? Browning demanded. Sosobovsky replied that it will be suicide with such small forces. Browning then attempted flattery. But my dear Sosobovsky, the Red Devils and the gallant Poles can do anything. Sosobovsky, although distinctly unimpressed by such a facile compliment, restricted himself to the observation Human abilities do have limits, after all. He then told Urquhart that he would have to have all his orders in writing, as he refused to be held responsible for such a disaster. Browning, even though he had obliquely acknowledged that the forces might be insufficient, took deep offence at Sosobovsky's attitude. In Belgium, General Dempsey had just reached similar conclusions to those of Sosobovsky. The day before, he had summoned General Horrocks of 30 Corps to Brussels Aerodrome for a quick conference. As he expected, Horrocks confirmed that their bridgehead over the Albert Canal was being strongly opposed by the enemy. Dempsey expressed his concerns to Montgomery the next day, then flew to see Horrocks again in the afternoon. It is clear, Dempsey wrote in his diary, that the enemy is bringing up all the reinforcements he can lay his hands on for the defence of the Albert Canal— and that he appreciates the importance of the area Arnhem Nijmegen. It looks as though he is going to do all he can to hold it. This being the case, any question of a rapid advance to the northeast seems unlikely. Owing to our maintenance situation, we will not be in a position to fight a real battle for perhaps ten days or a fortnight. Are we right to direct Second Army to Arnhem, or would it be better to hold a left flank along the Albert Canal and strike due east towards Cologne in conjunction with First Army? But this was the last thing that Montgomery wanted. He wanted to go north and force the Americans to support him. Early the next morning, Sunday the 10th of September, Dempsey went to Montgomery's headquarters and managed to persuade him that, in view of increasing German strength on the Second Army Front in the Arnhem-Nijmegen area, the employment of one airborne division in this area will not be sufficient. I got from C&C his agreement to the use of three airborne divisions. Montgomery liked the idea of cancelling Operation Comet and replacing it with a larger one, which brought the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions under his command. But to Dempsey's dismay, Montgomery also brandished a signal at him which had arrived from London the day before. Two V-2 rockets had exploded in England, having apparently been fired from the area of Rotterdam and Amsterdam. The government asked urgently for an estimate of how long it would take his army group to seal off the area. For Montgomery, who wanted to go north via Arnhem and not east via Wesel, as Dempsey and others on his staff preferred, this was just the confirmation he needed to justify his decision. There was only one cloud on the field marshal's horizon, but for him it was a dark one. Eisenhower, he discovered, was allowing Bradley and Patton to advance into the Saar 
southeast of Luxembourg. The Supreme Commander was not according full priority to his northern group of armies, as he thought had been promised. Matters were not improved by communications failures at Eisenhower's tactical headquarters back at Granville, 650 kilometers to the west. At that moment, Montgomery was having typed a long letter to Field Marshal Sir Alan Brooke, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, complaining that Eisenhower was totally out of touch, that there was no grip on operations, and it included the lines, Eisenhower himself does not really know anything about the business of fighting the Germans. He has not got the right sort of chaps on his staff for the job, and no one there understands the matter. Dempsey summoned Browning to his tactical headquarters, where in the next two hours they put together an outline plan. The new operation, which would be called Market Garden, consisted of two parts. Market was the airborne operation in which the American 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions would seize river and canal crossings from Eindhoven to Nijmegen, with the big bridges over the rivers Maas and Waal, the largest in Europe. While further on, the British 1st Airborne Division and the Polish Brigade would drop near Arnhem to capture the great road bridge over the Nieder Rhein. Browning was pleased with his phrase, describing Market as an airborne carpet, as if it simply had to be unrolled in front of the ground troops. Operation Garden would consist principally of Horrocks's 30 Corps, led by tanks, charging north up a single road with Polderland floodplain on either side, broken only by woods and plantations. They would keep going all the way over the bridges secured by the paratroopers. After crossing the bridge at Arnhem, they would occupy the Luftwaffe air base of Dillen. The 52nd Air Landing Division would be flown in, and from there, 30 Corps would carry on all the way to the shore of the Eiselmeer, a total distance of more than 150 kilometers from the start line. The objective for the British 2nd Army was to cut off the German 15th Army and the whole of the Western Netherlands, outflank the Siegfried Line, be across the Rhine, and in a position to encircle the Ruhr from the north, or even charge on towards Berlin. Montgomery, meanwhile, headed for Brussels Aerodrome to see Eisenhower, who had flown in with his deputy, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. This meeting had been arranged some days before, and discussion of the airborne operation was not on the agenda. Eisenhower, still suffering badly from his knee, could not descend from the aircraft, so proceedings took place on board. Montgomery, incensed by the frustration he had been expressing in his letter to Brooke, was in a fractious mood. He refused point-blank to allow Eisenhower's chief supply officer, Lieutenant General Sir Humphrey Gale, to be present, but insisted that his own chief administrative officer, Major General Miles Graham, should remain. Montgomery pulled from his pocket a sheaf of telegrams. "'Did you send me these?' he demanded, waving them. "'Yes, of course,' Eisenhower replied. "'Why?' Well, they're nothing but balls, sheer balls, rubbish. After letting him run on for a short time, Eisenhower leaned forward, put his hand on Montgomery's knee, and said, Maudie, you can't speak to me like that. I'm your boss. Halted in his harangue, Montgomery could only mumble an apology. But he still insisted that Patton must be stopped, that his own army group should be given two American corps from Hodges's first army, and that it should receive absolute priority in supplies, if necessary to the exclusion of all other operations. Eisenhower rejected that interpretation of the word priority, and emphasized that the objective was the Ruhr, not Berlin. He was prepared to give Montgomery priority, but he was not going to halt Patton. Eisenhower reminded him that he already had the support of the First Allied Airborne Army. This led to a very brief discussion of the latest airborne plan. Eisenhower followed standard U.S. Army practice. Having agreed an overall strategy, he did not believe in interfering further. Montgomery was able to use this later to imply that at this meeting Eisenhower had given his blessing to the new Market Garden plan. They discussed only the timing and the problem of supplies, which Montgomery dramatized in order to obtain more. Eisenhower should perhaps have raised the question of aircraft range— he had received a warning from Britain that the Allied airborne divisions and troop carrier formations should move to the continent, otherwise an operation across the Rhine would be too far. He was, however, alarmed at the administrative picture as painted by Monty, and agreed to see if supplies to Dempsey's Second Army could be increased. Graham, 
who should have known the situation, believed that the five hundred tons a day they were receiving was more than enough for Market Garden, but not enough for the deep penetration into the North German plain which Montgomery wanted. Both Eisenhower and Tedder considered it fantastic to talk of marching to Berlin with an army which is still drawing the bulk of its supplies over beaches north of Bayeux. The port of Antwerp had to be opened first. Dempsey, meanwhile, had worked fast. By the time Montgomery returned from Brussels aerodrome to his tactical headquarters, Dempsey had fixed with Browning the outline of the operation, his diary entry stated. He can be ready to carry this out on the 16th of September at the earliest. Horrocks was his next visitor that afternoon. Saw Commander 30 Corps at my headquarters and gave him the plan for the operation to be carried out by Airborne Corps and 30 Corps with the cooperation of 8 Corps on the right and 12 Corps on the left. Montgomery had wanted to present the first Allied Airborne Army with a fait accompli, approved by the Supreme Commander, and this he achieved. He had also decided on Arnhem and not Wesel, a crossing which he would almost certainly have had to share with the American First Army. There have been suggestions that Browning too preferred Wesel, but Browning had strenuously supported Comet, which included Arnhem. Now he was to command three and a half airborne divisions to do the same job, not just one and a half, so he was unlikely to oppose the field marshal on the subject. And the suggestion that on the 10th of September Browning had said to Montgomery that Arnhem might be going a bridge too far is highly improbable, since they do not appear to have met that day. There is no mention in Dempsey's diary of Browning at the early morning meeting with Montgomery, and he had reached Dempsey's headquarters only at midday when Montgomery was with Eisenhower. Browning's excitement was quite palpable at the prospect of the Airborne Corps seeing action at last. He sent the single code word NEW from Dempsey's headquarters back to the 1st Allied Airborne Army at Sunninghill Park. This signified that a planning conference was to be called that evening when he returned. General Brereton, on the other hand, must have felt deeply affronted that Montgomery had made no attempt to consult him in advance. His resentment would have been perfectly justified. Eisenhower's original directive had insisted that planning should be shared. Footnote The Commander-in-Chief Northern Group of Armies, in conjunction with the Commanding General First Allied Airborne Army, will plan and direct the employment of the entire airborne force which is made available to the Northern Group of Armies to expedite the accomplishment of its assigned missions. End of footnote Montgomery had deliberately ignored this. He wrote to Field Marshal Brooke, Airborne Army HQ had refused my demand for airborne troops to help capture Walcheren, and they are now going to be ordered by Ike to do what I ask. Twenty-seven senior officers gathered in the Sunninghill Park conference room at 1800 hours to hear Lieutenant General Browning's account of decisions taken that day in Belgium. Brearden was there, so was his Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Parks, Major General Paul L. Williams of Nine Troop Carrier Command, Brigadier General James Gavin of the 82nd Airborne Division, and Brigadier General Anthony C. McAuliffe of the 101st. Astonishingly, neither Major General Urquhart of the 1st Airborne nor Major General Sosobowski had been invited. The only British officer present from outside Britain's staff was Air Vice Marshal Hollinghurst of 38th Group. It is more than likely that Browning did not want Urquhart present, so that he controlled his planning entirely. Browning presented what he and Dempsey had worked out, using an airlift timetable based on Operation Linnet. Disingenuously, he implied that it had Eisenhower's blessing when the Supreme Commander had not seen it. Brearden and his staff privately dismissed it as just a tentative skeleton plan. Browning finished by declaring that the operation would take place between the 14th and 16th of September, just over three days away. It was a dangerously short time. Brearden raised the first key decision. Was it to be a night or a day operation? German night fighters would be more effective than their day fighters, but flak would be much more accurate by day than by night. Brearden decided on a daylight operation. In the belief that a proper employment of the supporting air forces available could knock out flak positions in advance and beat them down during the airborne operations themselves. His headquarters claimed that 
This was a bold decision, since the flag was known to have increased by 35% in the market area. The troop carrier aircraft were unarmored, were not equipped with leak-proof tanks, and flew at speeds between 120 and 140 miles an hour. But Brigadier General Gavin's chief intelligence officer, who was present, felt they had exaggerated. Britain's estimate of flak differed widely from that given me at 2nd U.S. Bombardment Division just four hours previous. This bombardment division was flying missions daily over the Nijmegen area. Brearden then asked Major General Williams to speak. The troop carrier commander's words must have come as a bombshell to Browning. Most of the key assumptions on which he and Dempsey had worked that day were now thrown in the air. General Williams stated that the lift would have to be modified due to the distance involved, which precluded the use of double-toe lift. Single-toe only could be employed. This meant that with each plane towing one American glider instead of two, as Browning had calculated with Dempsey, only half the number of gliders could be taken on each lift. And since the mid-September days were shorter and the mornings mistier, Williams ruled out two lifts in a day. These changes meant that it would take up to three days to deliver the airborne divisions, and that depended on perfect flying weather. Operation Market, the airborne side of Market Garden, would thus not be landing any more assault troops on the crucial first day than Operation Comet, because half the force would have to be left behind to guard landing and drop zones for the subsequent lifts. And the Germans, having identified Allied intentions, would be able to concentrate troops and anti-aircraft batteries against these areas on subsequent days. Williams's obdurate attitude might be seen to contain an element of revenge after the deliberate refusal to consult the Air Force side in advance, but the fault lay far more with Montgomery and his determination to impose an ill-considered plan. Next morning, the 11th of September, Major General Urquhart attended Browning's briefing. The headquarters of 1st British Airborne Corps was just northwest of London, in the large and elaborate Palladian building of Moor Park, with its great portico of Corinthian columns. Browning drew three large circles on the talc-covered map to show the objectives of the three divisions. As he finished drawing the third one, he fixed Urquhart with a deliberately unsettling stare, saying, Arnhem Bridge, and hold it. Later, a more detailed examination of the terrain revealed that the high ground north of the Nidorain meant that their defence plan would have to include the whole city of Arnhem with a population of nearly 100,000, as well as the drop zones outside. That signified a perimeter many times the size of a usual division frontage. Urquhart could not help wondering whether his first airborne had been given the furthest and most dangerous objective as a complement to its effectiveness or because Allied diplomacy could not survive a disaster to an American formation under British command. He strongly suspected the latter, and he was right. Footnote Eisenhower's Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Walter Beadle Smith, when asked after the war whether Schaeff dictated that the division at Arnhem should be the British one, replied, No, we did not dictate it, but I am damn glad it was. The political fallout in the United States would have been disastrous if an American airborne division had been chewed to pieces in a British plan. End of footnote. A follow-up meeting took place at Nine Troop Carrier Command's headquarters at Eastcote, also on the northwestern edge of London. American Air Force officers more or less dictated the choice of drop and landing zones. Their main priority was to avoid German flak batteries on the way in and on the way out. For simplicity, in the short time available, the air transport chiefs were working from the plans elaborated for earlier operations. Yet Major General Williams rejected the glider-borne coup de main parties to seize the main bridges by surprise attack, which had been a key element in the previous plan. Air Vice Marshal Hollinghurst of the RAF's 38th Group said that he was perfectly happy to go ahead with them. Williams overruled him on the grounds that Normal-sized coup de main parties would not have been strong enough to seize and hold the major bridges. But according to Hollinghurst, in a memo, the decision to mount the whole operation in broad daylight was because the American 8th Air Force cannot operate their fighters at early dawn or dusk, and this was why the coup de main parties were cancelled. The Americans had stricter rules on visibility than the RAF, but it was also true that a company landed before dawn 
like the Pegasus Bridge operation in Normandy, would have attracted all available German forces to the bridge well before the arrival of the main force, and Browning refused to consider a daylight coup de main. Major General Maxwell Taylor, the commander of the 101st Airborne, which was responsible for the first 60 kilometers of the road, refused drop zones in seven separate areas close to the seven bridges he had to seize. He feared too great a dispersal of his division. They were reduced to two, and later, after a meeting with Dempsey, his responsibility for defending the route north was reduced to twenty-five kilometers. Gavin was also unhappy with the dispersion of his dropping zones. Williams flatly refused to change them. The 101st, at least, was to have the greatest number of aircraft, because it was closest to the base of the operation. The 82nd Airborne had the next largest allocation, and the British 1st Airborne the fewest, partly because General Browning appropriated 38 gliders for his own corps headquarters. German officers, when analysing the operation afterwards, came to the opposite conclusion. They believed that the furthest division should have been the strongest. German flak concentrations dominated the planning of the air routes and the drop zones. Troop Carrier Command wanted to stay well away from the key objectives of Arnhem and Nijmegen bridges because of their anti-aircraft defences. At Arnhem, they were also threatened by the Luftwaffe airfield of Dillen, just to the north of the town. As a result, the British division was to be dropped well to the west, with an approach march of between 10 and 13 kilometres to the road bridge through a major town. Surprise! The most vital element in airborne operations was therefore lost before they even took off. One of the greatest difficulties in mounting this operation rested on the inflexible planning of Troop Carrier Command. Gavin's chief intelligence officer, Colonel Norton, recorded. The ground plan became practically secondary to the air plan. Major General Urquhart of 1st Airborne simply did not have the experience to negotiate forcefully with Troop Carrier Command. He accepted the landing and drop zones he had been given. The airmen had the final say, Urquhart wrote later, and we knew it. But those airmen were firmly convinced that there were no alternative sites. Many historians with an if-only approach to the British defeat have focused so much on different aspects of Operation Market Garden which went wrong that they have tended to overlook the central element. It was quite simply a very bad plan right from the start and right from the top. Every other problem stemmed from that. Montgomery had not shown any interest in the practical problems surrounding airborne operations. He had not taken any time to study the often chaotic experiences of North Africa, Sicily, and the drop on the Cotentin Peninsula in Normandy. Montgomery's intelligence chief, Brigadier Bill Williams, also pointed to the way that Arnhem depended on a study of the ground which Monty had not made when he decided on it. In fact, he obstinately refused to listen to the Dutch commander-in-chief, Prince Bernhard, who had warned him about the impossibility of deploying armoured vehicles off the single raised road onto the low-lying Polderland floodplain. Williams also acknowledged that at 21st Army Group, enemy appreciation was very weak. We knew very little about the situation. Yet towering over everything else, and never openly admitted, was the fact that the whole operation depended on everything going right, when it was an unwritten rule of warfare that no plan survives contact with the enemy. This was doubly true of airborne operations. The probability of the Germans blowing the huge road bridge at Nijmegen over the River Val was barely discussed. Had they done so, 30 Corps could not possibly have reached the first airborne at Arnhem in time. The German failure to destroy it was an astonishing and totally uncharacteristic mistake on their part, and one which Allied planners should never have counted on. Also on the 11th of September, Admiral Ramsey flew to Granville, where Eisenhower had returned after the meeting with Montgomery at Brussels Aerodrome. Went on to see Ike and found him in pyjamas with his knee bad again, Ramsey wrote in his diary, stayed to tea, and he let himself go on the subject of Monty, command, his difficulties, future strategy, etc. He is clearly worried, and the cause is undoubtedly Monty, who is behaving badly. Ike does not trust his loyalty, and probably with good reason. He has never let himself go to me like this before. Over the next few days, Ramsay kept trying to have a meeting with Montgomery about the Scheldt estuary to open the great port of Antwerp. The field marshal would not see him. As far as he was concerned, Antwerp had been settled as an objective with the 1st Canadian Army. 
but his obsessively tidy mind had insisted on a geographical progression. The Canadians should continue advancing up the coast to capture and open the much smaller and more damaged channel ports first. In any case, Montgomery clearly believed that if he could get across the Rhine, then Antwerp could be dealt with later. At the same time, Montgomery was trying to extract everything he could. On the 11th of September, the day after their meeting in the aircraft at Brussels Aerodrome, he sent a signal to Eisenhower. Your decision that the northern thrust towards the Ruhr is not to have priority over other operations will have certain repercussions which you should know. Revised Operation Comet cannot, repeat not, take place before the 23rd of September at the earliest. The delay will give the enemy time to organize better defensive arrangements. He claimed that he now found that he lacked sufficient supplies. Eisenhower, horrified that the Allies might fail both to achieve a bridgehead across the Rhine and to secure Antwerp, sent his chief of staff, General Walter Beadle Smith, to sort things out. The next day, Beadle Smith flew to the field marshal's tactical headquarters. He promised an extra five hundred tons of supplies a day, even if that meant depriving three American divisions of their transport, and assured Montgomery that the U.S. First Army would receive priority too, so that his right flank would be protected. This would mean holding back Patton in the Tsar. Montgomery felt he had won a great victory. He boasted to Field Marshal Brooke that his signal to Eisenhower had produced electric results. Ike has given way, and he sent Beadle to see me today. The Tsar thrust is to be stopped. Montgomery, having obtained what he wanted, dispatched another signal to Eisenhower. Thank you for sending Beadle to see me. As a result of the guarantee of one thousand tons a day, and of fact that Hodges will now get all the maintenance he needs, I have investigated my own problem again. I have now fixed D-Day for Operation Market for Sunday the 17th of September. Bradley, meanwhile, was furious that he had never been consulted, and as soon as he heard, he told Eisenhower he objected strenuously to the plan. Patton was sickened. Mardy does what he pleases, he wrote in his diary, and Ike says, yes, sir. In fact, Montgomery received nothing like what he had been promised, and he used this later in an attempt to divert blame for the failure of Operation Market Garden. General Eisenhower, until the very end of his life, could not get over the way Montgomery was never able to admit that he had been responsible for anything going wrong. Chapter 4 Doubts Dismissed Early on the 10th of September, when Dempsey had persuaded Montgomery to cancel Operation Comet, a message with the news reached the British 1st Airborne Division. According to an officer in Frost's 2nd Battalion, the whole brigade went to Nottingham and Lincoln to get tight, as only the 1st Para-Brigade knows how. But on returning with massive hangovers, they heard that they were going after all, but on a new and bigger mission. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Mackenzie, Urquhart's chief of staff, was a small man with a neatly trimmed moustache, an amused look in his eyes, and a dry sense of humour. He and some fellow officers, when they heard of the cancellation, decided to enjoy that day boating on the Thames. When they arrived back in the afternoon, they found General Urquhart excited. Come on, he told them. We're on with the next one, and we've got some work to do. They started to pore over the maps, trying to work out what might have changed. They did not have a clear idea, of course, until after the two briefing sessions the next day. Mackenzie thought the new operation, with more than three divisions, seemed at least more realistic than some of the previous plans. American paratroopers, who had seen their fill of action in Normandy, did not suffer from the same sort of cynicism which had started to build up in the British First Airborne. Their own version was part of the devil-may-care self-image which they cultivated. Frank Brumbaugh, in the 82nd Airborne, had returned to Nottingham from Normandy with a barracks bag of German helmets to sell as souvenirs. But he found his customers wanted the beaten-up ones with bullet holes in, not the shiny new ones, so he began firing at his stock with a looted Volta P-38, and the price went up from one pound to five pounds. We also took every chance we got to comfort the English wives and girls whose husbands and boyfriends were off in the Far East. With the blackout, one had to shovel one's feet walking through the parks so as not to step on the many loving couples entwined on the ground 
while looking for a place for ourselves and our own temporary girlfriends. Losses had been so heavy in Normandy that in some battalions new replacements accounted for up to sixty percent of their strength. The 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment had returned with only 918 men out of 2,055. Training was intensified to get the new arrivals prepared for combat, but the jokes kept coming. American paratroopers claimed that, unlike the British First Airborne, they were not disappointed when operations were cancelled. Combat is a place where a guy could get hurt, and let Patton win the war, became the cry after missions were cancelled at the last moment because the Third Army's rapid advance had overrun the target area. Most of the 101st Airborne felt relief when an operation was cancelled, unlike their commander. Major General Maxwell Taylor was thought to be too much of an eager beaver. He kept telling his men that he would not rest until he had a good mission for us. They preferred to boast of a different sort of combat, that a military police unit would be given a presidential citation if they were on duty when the 101st were in town on leave. It was fortunate that the 82nd Airborne was quartered in the East Midlands, while the 101st was in the south of England, as the two enjoyed coming to blows. The 82nd would provoke the 101st by pointing at their shoulder badge and cry in mock terror, Screaming Eagles! Help! Help! Not all members of the two American Airborne divisions were obsessed with women, drink, gambling, and fighting. The poet Louis Simpson, in the 327th Glider Infantry, with the 101st, reflected on the character of their host nation. The English are a very great race, and take things in their stride without the dramatization Americans love. Any girl will show you a picture of her family, and mention, as though it were funny, that they were blitzed, and that Brother John was killed in Africa last year. Sometimes this apparent coldness makes me shiver. I prefer our overemphasis on the value of life. Polish paratroopers could not have been more different. They were not like the British, who just wanted to make the best of a bad war by joking and referring to any battle as a party, nor were they like the Americans, who wanted to finish it quickly so they could go home. The Poles were exiles, fighting for the very survival of their national identity. An American officer who saw them in training described them as killers under the silk. Polish patriotism was nothing like the rather embarrassed British equivalent. Theirs was a burning spiritual flame. At that moment their countrymen and women were suffering terribly in the Warsaw Uprising against impossible odds. As Poles, we knew we had to die for a lost cause, said Corporal Wojewódka. But as soldiers we wanted to fight, hoping that it would shorten the war. Some of us hoped that the Russians would be stopped before taking Poland, and very naively we were praying for miracles. The British could not really understand what the war meant to Poland. My Scottish girlfriend is crying, wrote one paratrooper. She knows we have to part, maybe forever. She cannot understand that a soldier must carry on the battle for Poland's sake. Their commander, Major General Stanislaw Sosobowski, was a difficult and demanding man. He was not loved by his men, but they respected, feared, and also trusted him, because he would do anything that he asked of them. They referred to him as Stari, the old one in Polish. This violently patriotic and tough fifty-two-year-old had deep-set eyes and a weather-beaten face. He was fiercely obstinate and far from deferential when it came to dealing with senior officers when he thought they were wrong. Sosobowski and his men had one idea which dominated everything. Their brigade motto was the shortest way, and their mission was to spearhead the liberation of their homeland. As early as October 1940, the Polish commander-in-chief, General Władysław Sikorski, issued his order regarding preparations to a national rising in Poland. It was, like many of the papers which followed, a remarkable document, far-sighted about the likely course of the war, and yet also hopelessly optimistic that Polish forces in Britain could come to grips with the enemy on home territory. They even considered the future possibility of flying in armoured divisions. Sikorsky was undeterred by British officialdom. He had insisted that when the first Polish independent parachute brigade was set up under Sosobowski, it would not be deployed under Allied command, but held back to assist an uprising in Poland. The British accepted this stipulation, 
although no doubt with some head-shaking and mutters about the crazy Poles. But on the 17th of May, 1943, Browning approached Sosobolsky with a view to changing the agreement as plans began to be considered for the invasion of France. According to Sosobolsky, four months later, Browning told him that, unless you become part of the British airborne forces, I will take away your equipment and training opportunities. The following year, when planning for D-Day was well advanced, the War Office considered any rising or operation in Poland as nothing more than a diversion to the main effort in Normandy. Montgomery refused to accept any restrictions upon the use of the brigade, so Sobowski's command was to be deployed as part of the British One Airborne Corps. The tragedy for Poland was the unexpectedly rapid advance of the Red Army in Operation Bagration, which brought it almost to the gates of Warsaw by the end of July 1944. Polish plans had never intended the great uprising to take place until the defeat of Germany becomes inevitable. But desperate to forestall a Soviet occupation of the Polish capital, the Home Army, or Armia Krajowa, started the Warsaw Uprising on the 1st of August. Just over two weeks later, as Warsaw burned in the vicious battle, the Polish commander-in-chief wrote half apologetically to Sosobowski, I made every effort about which you will hear at the right time, for at least part of the brigade to be used where your hearts and dreams have driven you for the past years. Unfortunately, obstacles prove more powerful than my will or yours. But we shall bite the bullet and carry on along our straight and honest road. Keep a cheerful spirit, and show the world the grand Polish soldierly flair which challenges fate and breaks through all obstacles. Beat the Germans and fight well, thus helping Warsaw, at least indirectly. We, for our part, will not cease in efforts to organize sufficient help for her in weapons and ammunition. But resupply by air was almost as difficult for the insurgents in Warsaw as it would prove to be for paratroopers at Arnhem. Despite a recent training accident, in which thirty-six of their comrades had been killed when two Dakota C-47s collided, Sosobowski's men had lost none of their determination. They still tried to comfort themselves with the idea that if they were not dropping on Warsaw, they would at least be close to walking into Germany through the kitchen. But as the uprising approached its terrible climax, they were boiling with rage not to be dropped there. That was where they should be, and that was what they had trained for. The fact that the C-47 simply lacked the capacity to deliver a full load of paratroopers over Poland and return to British bases did not diminish the intensity of their emotions. On the 12th of September, at Moor Park, Sosobowski had another meeting with Urquhart, who told him that the Polish brigade group had been allocated only 114 aircraft and 45 horse gliders. Sosobowski was not pleased. It meant that he would have to leave behind his artillery, while his anti-tank detachment could take just their guns and jeeps and a crew of only two men each. They were to be landed with the 1st Airborne Division, north of the Neder Rhein, while the bulk of the Polish brigade was to land on the south side. Flaws in the plan became even more evident day by day. On the 14th of September, at 1600 hours, Sosobowski met Urquhart at Wittering Airfield near Stamford in Lincolnshire. He pointed out that his brigade would be able to cross the Nidorain at Arnhem only if the British had already secured the bridges. In his minute of the meeting, the Polish commander wrote in his stilted way, Sosobowski permitted himself the liberty of pointing out that the bridgehead to be held by the 1st Airborne Division's 1st Brigade is more than ten miles away, and before the Polish brigade arrives it might not even have reached the area and might be surrounded in an even smaller area. In that case, the Polish brigade would have to wait for them before they can take up positions. He also pointed out that the bridgehead to be held by 1st Airborne Division and 1st Polish Parachute Brigade Group extends for over ten miles in difficult terrain, and there is always the possibility that until the Polish brigade group arrives on D plus two, its defensive positions might be seized and held by the enemy, as 1st Airborne Division might be unable to establish and hold such a large perimeter. In this case, the Polish brigade group will have to attack in order to reach the allotted positions to the east of Arnhem. Urquhart apparently agreed that such a situation might occur, but he did not expect any strong enemy opposition. Sosobowski emphasized that 
In order to enable the brigade group to cross the river Niederrhein, the 1st Airborne Division should hold the bridge or should possess some other means of crossing the river. Apparently Urquhart assured him that 1st Airborne Division would be able to do that and protect the drop zone of the Polish brigade group. Events would prove Sosobowski's concerns to be abundantly justified. The British brigade commanders were not nearly so critical of the plan, mainly because the 1st Airborne simply could not face another cancellation. They just wanted to get on with it, and, in the view of Brigadier Philip Hicks, who commanded the 1st Air Landing Brigade, Market Garden at least seemed to stand a better chance of success than several of the previous plans. Some of them were absolutely insane, he said. Another factor could not be ignored. Officers and men alike knew that if they were not dropped in an operation, then they would either be forced to serve as an ordinary infantry division in the field, or the whole formation would be split up as replacements for other units. Brigadier General Jim Gavin of the 82nd Airborne was appalled that Urquhart should have accepted drop and landing zone so far from his main objective. Yet Gavin himself had been told by Browning that his first priority was to secure the Hrosbeck Heights, southeast of Nijmegen. They overlooked the Reichswald, a great forest just across the German border, which was thought to conceal tanks. Browning's argument was that if the Germans occupied the Hrosbeck Heights, then their artillery could stop 30 Corps reaching Nijmegen. Its great road bridge thus slipped down to become a lower priority, partly because the first Allied airborne army refused to land coup de main glider parties. General Brierton, meanwhile, complained to General Arnold in Washington that the ground force planners persist in presenting a multitude of objectives. That, of course, was hardly surprising when Montgomery's plan involved crossing no fewer than three major and countless lesser water obstacles. Nobody, Britain included, dared to say that it was a thoroughly bad plan based purely on the assumption that the German army was collapsing. Even though the British were over the Albert Canal at Beningen on the 6th of September, General Student was comforted by the idea that they would find the terrain ahead far from easy. The general consensus of opinion, he wrote later, was that the enemy would now enter the maze of the Dutch canal system, a terrain most favourable for defence, and in which the enemy would be unable to use his masses of tanks to the same extent. On the 7th of September, while the battle continued at Beningen and Hechtel, Dempsey ordered the 50th Northumbrian Division to cross the Albert Canal south of Geel. This sector was defended by the Kampftrupper Dreyer, led by General Lieutenant Schill's most energetic regimental commander. The 6th Green Howards managed to establish a bridgehead. Oberst Lieutenant Georg Dreyer, no doubt furious that his men had been surprised, counterattacked again and again. The 50th Division commander, seeing that this was developing into a serious battle, called for support from another brigade near Brussels. The following morning, the 9th of September, the tanks of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry rattled over a prefabricated bailey bridge erected by Royal Engineers the night before. They were to support the 6th Durham Light Infantry, and together they captured the town of Kiel on the 10th of September. As a troop leader in the Sherwood Rangers wrote later, I ought to have known enough about the German army from my time in Normandy to realize that wounded and cornered tigers have to be treated with the greatest caution and respect. This lesson I was soon to learn in Kiel. General Reinhardt lost little time. He ordered in a company of the heavy Panzerjäger Battalion 559 and a battalion of Heiter's 6th Falschemjäger Regiment to help Dreyer's Kampftrupper retake the place. After the first day of fighting, C Squadron of the Sherwood Rangers in Kiel were well satisfied with their capture of the town and the pleasure it seemed to give many of its inhabitants. But towards the end of the day the tank crews began to feel apprehensive. They noticed that the locals were hurriedly taking down their Belgian and Allied flags, the squadron was very short of ammunition, and the Durhams were already short of men after all their casualties in Normandy. The Germans, still left in positions around the town, were shouting defiance as night fell. Over the radio, Reports came in of German tanks or Panzerjäger self-propelled guns in the area. Fortunately, a courageous sergeant from headquarters squadron drove a truck stacked with ammunition through the German positions to get to them. German infantry made probing attacks. A troop leader was shot through the head as he peered out of the turret of his Sherman. Then the tank itself was hit and burst into flames, 
burning the rest of the crew to death. Stuart Hills, another troop leader, spotted a Panzerjäger just in time. His gunner knocked it out just as it was aiming at their Sherman. Another tank in the troop, a Firefly, with the immensely powerful seventeen-pounder gun, managed to ambush a heavy Jagdpanther at a range of ten meters as it came round a corner. The blast from the explosion could be felt at some distance. By dawn, the Sherwood Rangers were concerned that the Durhams, exhausted by all their battles, were starting to abandon positions. It soon became clear that they had no infantry left in front to protect them from being stalked by German lancers with Panzerfaust rocket-propelled grenades. By late morning the squadron was down to six tanks, and by the time the order to withdraw came, eleven of the Sherwood Rangers' tanks had been destroyed and too badly damaged. It was a bloodier engagement than any they had experienced in Normandy. They were not facing a defeated army. Chapter 5 The Day of the Hatchet Although the British Second Army was starting to receive a bloody nose as it approached the Dutch frontier from the south, German occupation forces in the Netherlands were distinctly nervous and Dutch collaborators in the NSB were again fleeing the country. On the 8th of September, Paymaster Heinrich Kluglein, in Utrecht, described another wave of chaotic withdrawal. When news arrived of the offensive with British tanks towards the southern Netherlands border, he wrote, an almost completely unplanned retreat of military and civil establishments led to some random looting of transport. Trains and vehicles occupied by those fleeing caused jams, and were shot up by Allied ground-attack aircraft and satellite. In short, a very regrettable image, which unfortunately showed a lack of leadership and discipline. His own department had summoned all their female staff from Rotterdam and Amsterdam to Utrecht, and trains were waiting ready if needed to take people to Germany or the northern Netherlands. The Dutch have behaved themselves in a comparatively calm fashion, he went on. Top Nazi officials in the Netherlands were clearly a good deal more anxious than Paymaster Kluglein. They greatly overestimated the strength of the Dutch underground, whose members in some places had started blowing trees down across the road. They feared a Beltjestag, or Day of the Hatchet, when the underground would rise up and kill them. Zeiss Inquart feared being torn limb from limb by the populace, yet he knew that to escape back to Germany risked a tribunal and hanging on Hitler's orders. His plan was to make Amsterdam, The Hague, and Rotterdam the colonel of the German defence, and withdraw there with what forces remained. SS Obergruppenführer Rauter was furiously opposed to such a defensive response. Despite their shared Austrian background, the two men did not get on. Zeiss Inquart once remarked, in a striking understatement, that the Hura SS and Polizeiführer, proud of his mass murder of Dutch Jews, was simply a big child with a child's cruelty. To calm Zeiss Inquart, General von Wüllisch announced that he would issue a proclamation threatening that in any case of sabotage the Germans would set fire to houses in the neighborhood and seize their inhabitants as hostages. Zeiss Inquart was impressed by such ruthlessness, but Walter, who disliked and distrusted Wüllisch as well, decided to issue his own order the next day, which would go much further. Thus the leadership of both the Wehrmacht and the SS in Holland were vying with each other to see who could display the most violence to deter the Dutch underground. The next day, Rauter issued his secret order, Bekämpfung von Terroristen und Saboteuren, to the Gestapo and SD, Sicherheitsdienst, stating that any illegal assemblies must be blown up mercilessly, and the houses smoked out using English explosives and hand grenades. Footnote the explosive was from supplies dropped by SOE with the unfortunate Dutch agents captured on arrival as a result of British incompetence. End footnote. Three days later, Rauter received an order by teleprinter from Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, saying, Model is in your area. Contact him immediately. Rauter discovered that Army Group B's headquarters had been withdrawn to Osterbeek. He went to the Hotel Tafelberg, where he had a discussion with Model and his chief of staff, General Lieutenant Hans Krebs. Rauter later claimed that at this meeting he had predicted the Allied airborne operation, 
to capture the bridges over the Maas, Val, and Nidarain. But Modell and Krebs had dismissed his idea. They argued that the bridge at Arnhem was far too distant from the troops who would have to come to relieve the parachute formation entrusted with its capture. That the English will come to Arnhem is not possible, Modell apparently said. He considered the whole plan far too reckless for a commander as cautious as Montgomery. In any case, airborne divisions were too valuable to be thrown away. England only has two, as has America. The Allies would therefore hold on to them until they really were in a position to cross the Rhine. Christiansen and his headquarters, known as WBN for Wehrmacht Befehl Haber der Niederlande, did expect airborne landings, but only if combined with an amphibious invasion on the Dutch coast. The Luftwaffe 3rd Fighter Division, based at Dillen, just north of Arnhem, was more prescient. It had recorded in its war diary a few days before that a parachute landing in our area is expected. Footnote. A myth arose just after the war that the plan for Market Garden had been betrayed to the Germans by a traitor in the Dutch underground called Christian Antonius Lindemans. Known as King Kong because of his size, Lindemans, born in Rotterdam, worked in his father's garage. During the war, he helped an escape line of the Dutch underground. In March 1944, he was recruited by Major Hermann Giskes, the Abwehr counterintelligence chief in the Netherlands. The suggestion that the whole plan had been betrayed was never convincing, because all German sources admit that they were taken completely unawares. Sentenced to death by a Dutch court, Lindemans committed suicide in prison in 1946. According to the End of War report by Hugh Trevor Roper, the historian and wartime intelligence officer, SS Brigade Führer Walter Schellenberg, the head of the ST Foreign Intelligence Department, received information in mid-September 1944 predicting an Allied airborne landing in Holland to seize a Rhine bridge, but he took no action in response. End footnote. Himmler had told Rauter that he was responsible for the demolition of the key bridges should the Allies invade southeast Holland, so on this visit to Osterbeek, Rauter raised the question with Modell. Modell insisted that the decision on blowing the bridges was entirely his to make. He said later that his intention had always been to keep the Nijmegen Bridge intact so that he could counterattack any spearhead and cut it off. He had even ordered that the explosive charges already laid should be removed in case they were set off by artillery fire. SS Obergruppenführer Rauter, satisfied with his savage record in the Netherlands, was now longing to assume an active military role. The airborne landings a week later would give him the opportunity to command what he called Kampfgruppe Rauter. This would consist of the SS Guard or Wachbataillon Nordwest from Amersfoort concentration camp, a regiment of Ordnungspolizei, and the so-called 34th SS Grenadier Division, Landstorm Nederland, in fact just a couple of battalions of Dutch volunteers who had already been mauled on the Albert Canal by the Princess Irina Brigade of the Royal Netherlands Army. Bradley's troops, on the other hand, reported a very tough battle with Dutch SS just to the southeast. Nineteen Corps on the 14th was fighting a brigade of Dutch SS troops who continued to fight stubbornly, Bradley's aide wrote. They were mercenaries with little to look forward to, and had to be killed almost mercilessly. We compared their fighting to that of the Japs in their refusal to surrender. Rauter was proud of his Dutch, Germanic SS, yet many in its ranks were not even members of the NSB. Most were simply weak-willed or opportunistic youngsters who wanted to avoid being sent to Germany as forced laborers. They were promised that all they had to do on joining the SS— was to guard Jews and political prisoners in the concentration camp at Amersfoort. They would not be in danger, and their families would benefit with extra rations of food and fuel. Since there were insufficient volunteers even then, numbers were made up through recruitment in prisons and corrective schools. These volunteers were forced to sign a contract in German, which most of them could not read. Their officers and senior NCOs were German, and the battalion commander, Sturmbeinführer Paul Hiller, was an Austrian from the Tyrol. Hiller was a shamelessly corrupt opportunist. Although he had wife and children in Germany, wrote the Dutch historian of the battle, Colonel Theodor Bure, he had a very intimate lady friend, 
She was rather brown, as her cradle had been in Java, and the whole battalion grinned when Heller held his usual lecture about the superiority of the Nordic race with their fair hair and blue eyes. Heller's subordinates loathed him because he fawned on his superiors and treated his juniors with arrogance. Neither Heller nor his men expected that they would ever have to do more than bully the prisoners in their charge, certainly not fight British paratroopers. A very different force north of the Niederrhein was the two SS Panzerkorps. Commanded by SS Obergruppenführer Wilhelm Bittrich, it consisted of the 9th SS Panzerdivision Hohenstaufen and the 10th SS Panzerdivision Frunzburg. Constant air attacks and fatigue, as well as the loss of almost all its tanks in the retreat from Normandy, had reduced what he called its feeling of combat superiority. Even its manpower was down to less than 20% of full strength. On the 3rd of September, the 10th SS Panzerdivision Frunzberg had been ordered to Maastricht, where it was told to re-equip itself by requisitioning motor vehicles and ammunition from the supplies of retreating Luftwaffe elements. The 9th SS Panzerdivision Hohenstaufen and Corps Headquarters staff were directed to Hasselt in Belgium, 35 kilometers to the west. The very next day, Bittrich received orders to withdraw his two divisions north of the Niederrhein to the area of Appeldorn and Arnhem to refit, but to remain combat ready. He took his staff, as well as some corps units, to Duttinschum, with its fine, moated castle thirty kilometers east of Arnhem. Bittrich was just about the only Waffen-SS general respected and liked by his counterparts in the army. Tall and erect, he was intelligent, cultivated, and thoughtful and had a good sense of humour. He had originally wanted to be a musician and conductor, having studied at the Conservatoire in Leipzig. Although officially a Nazi, he had nothing but contempt for senior party members and Hitler's entourage. In a conversation with General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel on the 16th of July in Normandy, he was so critical of Führer headquarters and its refusal to acknowledge the developing disaster in the West that he indicated his agreement to Rommel's plan to enter secret negotiations with the Allies. Petrick's fierce objection to the hanging of General Oberst Erich Hopner, who had been implicated in the 20th of July plot against Hitler, was reported back to Berlin by one of his officers. He was ordered to surrender his command, but as the situation in Normandy became catastrophic, he could not be spared. General Feldmarschall Model then thwarted further attempts to discipline him during the retreat to the Netherlands. Beatrix's priority was to restore the fighting strength of his two divisions. Apart from eight antiquated Renault tanks brought back by the 9th SS Hohenstaufen, there were just three serviceable Mark V Panther tanks left in the Frunzberg 10th Panzer Division, with another two in workshops. In addition, the two divisions had a combined total of twenty assault guns, self-propelled artillery, and heavy mortars. In those desperate days, Petrick had to weaken his command still further. He was told to send the Kampfgrupper Segler of the 9th SS Hohenstaufen and the Kampfgrupper Henker from 10th SS Frunzberg to strengthen the very mixed force under Oberst Walter facing the newly won British bridgehead across the Maas Schilt Canal, almost on the Dutch border. On the other hand, the reconnaissance battalion of the Hohenstaufen and three Panzergrenadier battalions remained formidable fighting units. There has been much debate about the strength of the two SS Panzer Corps when Market Garden was being planned. Its presence in the Arnhem area had been known to Allied intelligence through the Dutch underground and from ultra-signals intercepts, even while Comet was being prepared. But partly because of a belief that it had been virtually destroyed in the retreat from France, and partly in a misguided attempt to avoid dismaying the troops, little mention of its presence was made in briefings. When Beadle Smith went to see Montgomery on the 12th of September to promise him the extra supplies demanded, he took the chief intelligence officer at Chief, Major General Kenneth Strong. The operation was conceived at 21st Army Group, Beadle Smith said after the war. We were always a bit dubious about it. Strong thought there might be parts of three panzer divisions in and around where the first airborne was to drop. Beadle Smith also thought that the British force being sent to Arnhem was too weak. Montgomery's headquarters, on the other hand, had passed on their view to the first Allied airborne army that, 
The only reinforcements known to be arriving in Holland are the demoralized and disorganized remnants of the 15th Army, now escaping from Belgium by way of the Dutch islands. Montgomery refused even to allow Strong into his presence, with the retort, I have my own intelligence, and he waved Beadle Smith's objections airily aside. The rivalry and mutual dislike between intelligence chiefs was sometimes even greater than that between their respective commanders. Brigadier Bill Williams, Montgomery's brilliant but also erratic intelligence chief, was vitriolic about Eisenhower's Major General Strong. He worried about everything, Williams told Forrest Pogue, the American official historian after the war, and called Strong the headless horror and the faceless wonder. He even considered him a coward, saying that he wouldn't go near the front. Leaving aside the clash of personalities, they were all wrong in their different ways. The Hornstaufen and the Frunsberg were indeed in the area, and were not the entirely spent force which Montgomery and Williams imagined. But with only three serviceable panther tanks, and fewer than six thousand men between them, they could hardly be counted as proper SS panzer divisions. In point of fact, one of their commanders said, they had scarcely the strength of regiments. What all those involved in the argument on the Allied side failed to grasp was the extraordinary ability of the German military machine to react with speed and determination. And the two panzer divisions, even in their weakened state, were able to form a nucleus onto which other, less experienced units could be grafted. Browning's intelligence officer, Major Brian Urquhart, on the other hand, became increasingly nervous at his chief's complacency. He was so convinced that there were German tanks in the Arnhem area that he requested a photo-reconnaissance mission. The shots revealed Mark III and Mark IV tanks used for driver training, which belonged to the training and replacement battalion of the Hermann Göring Division. They were not part of the two SS Panzer Corps, as Urquhart thought. The vast majority of the tanks which Allied troops faced in Market Garden were not present at the start of the operation, but were brought in from Germany with astonishing speed on blitz transport trains. Whatever the strengths or weaknesses of the two SS Panzer Corps, the survival of the British 1st Airborne Division entirely depended on the speed with which Horrocks's 30 Corps could advance up a single road all the way to Arnhem for 103 kilometres. The original distance had been reduced because the Guards' Armoured Division now occupied a bridgehead over the Mars Shell Canal at Neerpilt. Lieutenant Cresswell's troop of the 2nd Household Cavalry Regiment had managed to outflank the Germans in front of the canal, as the division reported, with their uncanny knack of finding a way round. They concealed their armoured and scout cars in a wood well to the rear of German lines. Cresswell and Corporal of Horse Cutler stole bicycles for their reconnaissance, and finally climbed up onto a factory roof from where they could survey the German positions from behind. They reported that the bridge at the De Grota barrier was intact, but although it was strongly held, they could identify the positions on the map. We reached the area of the bridge as light was falling, the war diary of the 3rd Battalion Irish Guards recorded on the 10th of September, and the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel J.O.E. Vandeleur, after a rapid recce, decided to try and rush it. Number 2 Company and one squadron of tanks were detailed for the job. The tanks put down a hail of fire on the area of the bridge itself and succeeded in knocking out several 88mm guns. Lieutenant Stanley Clark's platoon, preceded by a troop of tanks, then charged the bridge and succeeded in reaching the other side. The remainder of Number 2 and Number 3 companies were quickly pushed across to join them, and the position was rapidly consolidated. The Royal Engineers officer with the battalion succeeded in disconnecting all the charges which were in position to blow the bridge. This remarkable coup de main was achieved at the cost of only one man killed and five wounded. The Irish guards, intensely proud of their exploit, called their prize Joe's Bridge, after Lieutenant Colonel J.O.E. Vandeleur. Our success had saved the whole of Second Army days in its advance, the war diary of their companion armoured battalion boasted. Next day at 0900 hours, the Germans counterattacked with self-propelled assault guns and infantry. One of the assault guns got within a hundred metres of battalion headquarters, but the Germans were thrown back with heavy losses. The Irish Guards' infantry battalion suffered fourteen casualties, including a captain killed 
while stalking an assault gun with a Piat anti-tank launcher. The divisional commander, Major General Alan Adair, asked the household cavalry to scout out the road leading north to Eindhoven. He wanted to know whether the bridge over the river Dommel, near Valkensvard, was strong enough to take tanks. With the nascent Kampfgruppe Walter reinforcing the sector rapidly, it was a formidable mission. Lieutenant Rupert Buchanan Jardine, a German speaker, took just two scout cars. In the morning, before the mist gave way to sun, they charged through German lines, passing virtually unchallenged. They drove almost to Valkensvard, some ten kilometers behind German lines. Buchanan Jardine asked locals about the bridge, and having had a good look himself, he returned to the vehicles. They closed their hatches and charged back through the German positions, deafened by the machine gun and rifle fire peppering their armor. They were exceedingly fortunate that the Germans along the road had had no time to swing round anti-tank weapons. Their little sortie caused a great commotion well behind German lines. The police in Eindhoven, using loudspeakers, ordered all civilians to clear the streets immediately. At first light on the 13th of September, the Germans launched a small counterattack on the near pelt bridgehead. The guards automatically on Dawn Stand 2 were not taken by surprise. Their supporting artillery, having registered the likely forming up points, reacted immediately, and the attack was over almost before it began. In Eindhoven, a woman diarist recorded that morning, We hear artillery fire. The latest news is that the Allies have come closer by fifteen kilometers. They must be in Valkensvard. Will Eindhoven be the first liberated city in Holland? Will the liberation come without too much bloodshed? We pray to God that our country will be saved too much agony. That same day, Obesh Leutnant, full reader of the Hermann Göring Division, passed down the road up which thirty corps would advance less than a week later. He considered the major bridges at Nijmegen and Grave to be guarded by totally insufficient forces, and in his view they had not been properly prepared for demolition. That is a crime, he added in his diary. The Guards' Armoured Division settled into several days' respite as its battalions prepared for Operation Garden and received replacement tanks to bring them up to strength. The Irish Guards described the Thirty Corps order on the subject as top up, tidy up, tails up, and no move for several days. For officers, tails up seems to have meant slipping away to Brussels to visit newly acquired girlfriends and enjoy the restaurant Le Filet de Soul where payment was refused. Guardsmen were not so fortunate. Their NCOs kept them hard at work on the vehicles. Liaison between the first Allied airborne army and the British commanders in Belgium, who had thought up the plan, did not improve. Brereton and his staff only discovered several days after planning had started that 30 Corps' advance was going to be 30 feet wide and 70 miles deep. Nobody had worked out exactly when the Airborne Corps' main reinforcement, the British 52nd Air Landing Division, was to land. There was a general assumption that it might be flown into the Luftwaffe airfield of Dillon once that was taken. On the 12th of September, the 1st Allied Airborne Army held a conference to discuss air support, principally the bombing targets of German barracks and flak defences. This was followed by a larger meeting three days later, with representatives from the U.S. 8th Air Force, the U.S. 9th Air Force, Bomber Command, Air Defense of Great Britain, which would provide the RAF fighter escorts, Coastal Command, and the Allied navies. Nobody came from 2nd Army, 30 Corps, or even the RAF's 2nd Tactical Air Force on the continent. Only the American 101st Airborne made an effort to liaise with 30 Corps. Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, the Deputy Commander, flew to Brussels on the 12th of September with Lieutenant Colonel C.D. Renfro, who was to be its liaison officer with Horrocks's staff. They went to Dempsey's headquarters and then to see Horrocks south of Hichtel, where Renfro stayed on, politely ignored. Also on Tuesday the 12th of September, Major General Urquhart called an orders group to brief his brigade and some unit commanders. Robert Urquhart, known as Roy, was a large, heavy man with a thick black moustache. A brave infantry brigadier in Italy, he had been astonished when told that he was to command the 1st Airborne Division. 
I had no idea at all how these chaps functioned, he confessed. He had never parachuted in his life, knew nothing of airborne operations, and suffered from terrible air sickness. Yet he could hardly refuse such a promotion. At the beginning of January 1944, Urquhart had reported to Browning, still dressed in the tartan truths of his old regiment, the Highland Light Infantry. Browning observed briskly, You had better go and get yourself properly dressed. Urquhart suggested that, considering his inexperience, he had better do some practice parachute jumps. Browning glanced at his bulk and replied, I shouldn't worry about learning to parachute. Your job is to prepare this division for the invasion of Europe. Not only are you too big for parachuting, you are also getting on. Urquhart was forty-two. Browning explained that he had done two jumps and had injured himself both times. That is why he had decided to train instead as a glider pilot. Well aware that he would be seen as an outsider, even a curiosity, by the airborne fraternity, Urquhart knew that officers and soldiers alike would be sizing him up. Nobody disliked him, and most came to admire him for his courage, good humour, and fairness. But perhaps the biggest disadvantage of his conventional military background was the simplistic assumption that an airborne division was a force of highly trained infantry with the usual gunner and sapper support, and once it had descended from the sky, it resorted to normal ground fighting. This was not exactly the case. As soon as an airborne division landed, it had to exploit the element of surprise immediately to make up for the fact that it lacked the transport and the bulk of the artillery and heavy weapons of its conventional counterpart. Urquhart had three brigadiers under him. The oldest, Pip Hicks, commanded the 1st Air Landing Brigade with three glider-borne infantry battalions. Hicks, a reserved and unexciting commander, had nearly drowned in a glider which had crash-landed in the sea during the invasion of Sicily. Gerald Lathbury, the tall and elegant leader of the 1st Parachute Brigade, was rather different. According to Urquhart, he spoke in a languid drawl, but had a very good brain. Lathbury had the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Battalions of the Parachute Regiment, many of whose officers and men had endured trial by fire in Tunisia and Sicily. The youngest and most intelligent brigadier of all was Shan Hackett, a small yet supremely confident cavalryman from the 8th King's Royal Irish Hussars. Hackett, who did not suffer fools gladly, commanded the 4th Parachute Brigade. His three battalions, however, could not quite match the experience and professionalism of Lathbury's men. Urquhart had wanted part of the first lift to be dropped on the Polderland south of the Niederrhein, but the RAF refused point-blank because of the German flag positions close to the Arnhem Bridge. The aircraft bringing the first airborne would constitute the northern and left-hand stream coming out from England, so after dropping their paratroopers or releasing their gliders, they had to turn left to avoid clashing with those dropping the 82nd Airborne at Nijmegen. If they went as far as Arnhem, south of the river, then they would be turning over the flag positions and circling back right by the Luftwaffe airfield at Dillon. With all the restrictions imposed by Nine Troop Carrier Command, Urquhart had little choice but to go for dropping and landing zones short of the arnhem dillon area. Sosobowski's Polish Parachute Brigade was due to be dropped on the southern side of the Arnhem Road Bridge, but only on the third day, by which time Nine Troop Carrier Command assumed the bridge and all the flag positions would be secured. Anyone with any experience of airborne operations could see that the British landing and dropping zones, up to thirteen kilometres to the west of Arnhem, were too far away to achieve surprise. Major General Richard Gale, who had commanded the 6th Airborne Division on D-Day, warned Browning that the lack of coup de main parties was likely to be disastrous, and that he would have resigned rather than accept the plan. Browning refused to agree, and asked Gale not to mention it to anyone else, as it might damage morale. Urquhart, all too conscious of this fundamental handicap, planned to use the reconnaissance squadron, mounted in jeeps armed with machine guns, to race on ahead. It was perhaps not a good augury that Freddy Goff, the cheerful, red-faced, silver-haired major who commanded the reconnaissance squadron, turned up late for the orders group and was thoroughly reprimanded. There was little Urquhart could do about the other basic flaw in the forthcoming operation. While Lathbury's 1st Parachute Brigade was to march off towards the bridge, Hicks's 1st Air Landing Brigade would have to remain behind 
to guard the drop and landing zones ready for Hackett's 4th Brigade to land on the second day. This meant that Urquhart would have just a single brigade to secure his chief objective. Right from the start, his division would be split in two with a wide gap in between. To make matters worse, one of his signals officers became concerned that the standard 22-set radio might not work over that distance with the town of Arnhem and the woods in between. Chapter 6 Final Touches In the Netherlands, tensions between occupiers and occupied had suddenly increased. On Sunday the 10th of September, in Nijmegen, all males between the ages of 17 and 55 were ordered to report for digging defences. A warning was proclaimed that those who failed to turn up would have their houses destroyed by fire, their possessions seized, and their wives and children arrested. The German-appointed Burgemeister, a hated member of the NSB, summoned school teachers to a meeting to order them to police their students. The teachers stayed away. Next day a woman recorded in her diary, The houses of teachers not attending are being plundered by the Germans as a reprisal, and passers-by are forced to help. According to the Germans, the furniture was being confiscated and given instead to families in the Reich who had been bombed out. The teachers had to disappear into hiding as divers. On the 13th of September, the able-bodied young men of Nijmegen still refused to turn up with spades ready to dig defences. The next day, when Radio Orange announced that Maastricht had been liberated, heavily armed members of the SS appeared on the streets. Few male civilians dared venture out for fear of being seized. A German proclamation announced that any form of sabotage would also be dealt with by executions and the burning of houses. Students' first Fauxchion army reported nine terrorists shot and another five arrested for espionage. On the 15th of September, SS Obergruppenführer Rauter sent a message to the headquarters of Modell's Army Group B in Osterbeek to express his fear of an imminent uprising and to suggest that every Dutch policeman should be disarmed in case he were a camouflaged terrorist. That day, at Molenbeke, on the edge of Arnhem, a group of boys tried to set fire to a munitions dump. Three people, one of them a headmaster, were executed as a reprisal. Many older boys at this time were cutting telephone lines and slashing the tires of Wehrmacht vehicles. As one of them said later, we did not know what danger was. Dr. von der Beek, the neurologist at the clinic of Wolfhisse to the west of Arnhem, recorded a warning that another three people would be executed if a member of the NSP who had been kidnapped two days before was not handed over. An anonymous telephone call revealed that he was alive and he was found unhurt. The small village of Wolfhesa, which contained both an institute for the blind and an asylum for the mentally handicapped, lay in the woods by a small railway station. This made it an ideal place for the Germans to hide troops and munitions. On the 11th of September, 40 105 mm howitzers had been delivered brand new from the factory, and 600 artillerymen, a mixture of youngsters and older men, arrived by rail to camp under the trees. Their commander, Hauptmann Bredemann, claimed to have had a hard task restoring order, because some of the buildings were used to house female Luftwaffe signals personnel, known as Blitzmädel. The lunatic asylum had long since been occupied by a great number of German sluts, Bledemann recounted. They worked at the aerodrome of Dillen, partly as Blitzmädel, which was a new name for whores, because of the exceedingly short pleasure they gave the soldiers, sometimes waiting in queues, in that moment of intimate teamwork. On Friday, the 15th of September, the ammunition for the guns arrived, and a large dump was established nearby in the woods. A dozen of the guns, drawn by requisitioned horses, were taken to Duisburg, northeast of Arnhem, as part of the plan to defend the line of the River Esel. Purely by chance, Wolf Heser was targeted in an airstrike two days later, at Urquhart's request, because it was right next to the first airborne's drop zone and assembly area. Apparently the U.S. Army Air Force demanded an assurance that there were German troops in and around the Institute, rather than just inmates. Colonel Mackenzie, Urquhart's chief of staff, gave it, even though he could not be sure. The consequences would be tragic, but mainly because of a direct hit on the concealed ammunition dump. 
Landelijke Knokploen Resistance Network, LKP or KP, in the area of Arnhem, was extremely well organized under the leadership of Piet Cruyff. Cruyff, an engineer with rayon manufacturers, AKU, ran a tight ship with good security. He set up different groups, with each leader picking its own members secretly. Weapons and explosives had been parachuted to them by SOE in August in the Velove, the high ground north of Arnhem. Greif's main associates included Albert Horstmann, a colleague from work, Lieutenant Charles Dow von der Krupp, a naval officer who received the highest Dutch decoration for bravery, the Willems Order, Harry Monfroy, who looked after the explosives, and Johannes Penzel, who was in charge of communications. The group had carried out various acts of sabotage, such as blowing up a train in Elst. On the 15th of September, Cruyff's group blasted part of a key viaduct. Although the damage was not as great as they had hoped, the Germans issued a proclamation the next day, saying that unless the perpetrators gave themselves up, they would start shooting twelve hostages at midday on Sunday the 17th of September. Doctors, teachers, and other prominent citizens immediately went into hiding to avoid the inevitable round-up. Several of Greif's colleagues argued that they should give themselves up, rather than let innocent people die. Greif was firm. They were at war. Nobody was to surrender themselves. Fortunately, intense Allied air attacks on the Sunday morning solved the dilemma. The Germans had more urgent matters to consider. Greif's network in Arnhem and others, especially in Nijmegen, had recognized the importance of telecommunications. They either recruited telephone operators or infiltrated some of their own people. Nicolas de Bode, an engineer with the Dutch telephone organization PTT, helped set up a secret system whereby the underground, using special numbers with twenty-nine digits, could link up the north and south of the country with automatic dialing. The Germans were none the wiser, even though they had installed their own nationals in every exchange to keep an eye on suspicious activity and handle Wehrmacht calls. They also did not know that the PGEM electricity company in the region had its own private telephone network between Arnhem and Nijmegen, which the underground used. Unfortunately, the British Army did not really trust any resistance group, purely as a result of a few bad experiences elsewhere. Major General Urquhart, who had received unreliable information from Italian partisans, tended to think that all such sources simply offered patriotic little fairy tales and Field Marshal Montgomery made it clear to Prince Bernhardt that he did not think the resistance people would be of much use. Some intelligence briefings before Market Garden even suggested that the Dutch population close to the border, particularly around Nijmegen, might well turn out to be pro-German. On the 14th of September, one of Piet Cruyff's colleagues, Walter von der Kratz, noticed an unusual amount of German military traffic in Oosterbeek, five kilometers west of Arnhem. This quiet and peaceful village consisted mainly of large villas and houses set back in well-tended gardens. The mixture of architectural styles included immaculately thatched roofs, almost a Dutch equivalent of arts and crafts, and birthday cake stucco villas with pink tiled roofs. Osterbeek spread out along the north bank of the Nidderrhein, on rising ground, with trees and beautiful views over the river and the polar land of the bit of her beyond, had for many years appealed to senior officials and prosperous merchants from the Dutch East Indies as an ideal place to retire. Without warning, large signs were erected in Osterbeek, saying, Deutsche Wehrmacht, Eintritt verboten, German Wehrmacht, entry forbidden. Anti-aircraft guns and even an anti-tank gun guarded one road in particular, the Petersbergsweg. Walter van der Kratz saw that the activity focused on the Hotel Tafelberg, Pretending that he lived nearby, he persuaded the first sentry to let him pass. A second, more officious guard further on leveled his rifle and ordered him to leave the area immediately. Walter von der Kratz was happy to comply. He had seen all that he needed. The checkered metal pennant outside the hotel signified an army group headquarters, and that could mean only one person. The restlessly energetic model did not waste any time after a rapid glance over his new headquarters. He immediately set off to see the most important formation commander in the area, SS Obergruppenführer Bittrich, who had established his own command post in the moated castle of Slangenburg at Duttenschem, twenty-five kilometers east of Arnhem. 
Modell reached Castel Slangenburg well before dusk on the 14th of September. Unaccompanied this time by his chief of staff, General Lieutenant Krebs, he strode in wearing his grey leather greatcoat and with his monocle firmly screwed in place. Beatrich towered over his short army group commander. He came up only to my ear, he said later. Beatrich had summoned his two divisional commanders, Brigadefuhrer Heinz Hamel of the 10th SS Panzerdivision Frunsberg and Standardenführer Walter Harzer of the 9th SS Hohenstaufen. Modell never sat down. He spent the whole time firing questions. What do you have left? How quickly can you get back on your feet? Beatrich replied that his front-line combat strength was little more than fifteen hundred men in each division, although the total manpower was double that. They went on to discuss rearming. A decision had been made back in the Reich by Waffen-SS headquarters that one of the two divisions was to be returned for complete re-equipment. The other should stay where it was in the Netherlands and regroup there. Beatrich, favouring his old division, the 9th SS Hohenstaufen, had selected it to return to Germany. Modell then ordered its officers to hand over their armoured vehicles and heavy weapons to the sister division before they left, as well as a number of men. Harmel cannot have been pleased. He felt that since his division was the weaker of the two, it should be the one sent back to reform. "'Any other questions, gentlemen?' Modell asked, barely looking around at them. "'Anything else? No? Goodbye, then.' Although Modell had protected Beatrich in Normandy and during the retreat, there were some things which the commander of two SS Panzer Corps did not want his superior to know. Beatrich's campaign books may have been Goethe's Faust and Plato's Republic, but his favourite diversion was less elevated. He had a little dancer in Berlin. Standartenführer Harzer, who had been his chief of staff, had always covered up for him when Modell demanded to know where he was. Beatrich had now made Harzer take over command of the 9th SS Panzerdivision, while its commander, SS Brigadefuhrer Stadler, remained in hospital, recovering from wounds received in Normandy. Armel, who commanded the 10th SS Frunsberg, was slightly jealous of the preference Beatrich showed for Harzer, especially after all he, Harmel, had been doing to reanimate his own division. During the chaotic retreat, the Frunsberg had come across an abandoned German train loaded with field guns. Harmel had ordered his men to seize them and take them with them, and as soon as they reached the Netherlands, he had started an intense training program, also with emphasis on physical fitness. He had even established a Frunsberg slogan, Keiner über Achsen, which meant that every soldier had to be as agile as a boy under eighteen. As soon as Modell had departed, Petrick observed that since reinforcements and replacement vehicles were allocated by the Waffen-SS Führungshauptamt, headquarters near Berlin, everything would be achieved more rapidly if one of them went in person. He decided to send Harmel, who was more senior in rank, as that would count for something. Harmel should go in two days' time, on the 16th of September. They would not mention anything to Modell. After Harmel had left to return to his division, Harzer told Beatrich that as a precaution he was planning to hold on to all of the Hohenstaufen Reconnaissance Battalion's vehicles until the very last moment by removing their tracks and dismounting the guns. This would qualify them as unserviceable. "'I haven't heard a thing,' Petrick replied quietly. General Feldmarschall Modell held his first conference at the Tafelberg the next evening with SS Obergruppenführer Rauter and General Leutnant von Fulisch. The whole hotel had been searched in the greatest detail to make sure that no microphones or explosives had been hidden, and yet Russian heavies— Former prisoners of war, forcefully recruited as menial labour, were peeling potatoes in the kitchen. They were no doubt carefully watched by members of Modell's defence detachment of 250 Felchendomery. The happiest people at the Tafelberg appeared to be Modell's staff officers. They felt that they could at last settle down for a bit in one place. Leutnant Gustav Jedelhauser wrote in his diary that Osterbeck looked like a paradise. Everything was so clean and pretty. There was also the chance, after the last few weeks of constant movement, of having their laundry done. They were told it would be ready on the 19th of September, in four days' time. Officers on the staff also decided to organise a party that evening to celebrate the promotions from Normandy, which had eventually been confirmed. Unlike some members of his staff, Modell had not started to relax in the deceptive calm of Osterbeck.
Each day we await the enemy's major offensive, Oberst Leutnant Fulrida wrote in his diary on the 15th of September. Modell's immediate superior, General Feldmarschall von Rundstedt, whom Hitler had brought back as Commander-in-Chief West, sent a warning that day to General Oberst Jodl at Führer headquarters. The situation facing Army Group B has further worsened in the last week. It is fighting on a front around 400 kilometers long, with a battle strength of some 12 divisions, and, at the moment, 84 serviceable tanks, assault guns, and light tank destroyers, against a fully mobile enemy with at least 20 divisions and approximately 1,700 serviceable tanks. He then went on to ask whether it would be possible to transfer individual panzer divisions, or at least more assault gun brigades, from the Eastern Front to the West. Both Modell and Rundstedt had their eye on the counterattack to be launched that day against the Neerpelt bridgehead across the Maas-Scheldt Canal. The Kampfgruppe Walter, with its command post at Valkensvard, just to the north, came under General Student's first Fallschirm army. Yet Walter lacked staff officers, signals personnel, and even supply personnel. The German command was as bad as can be imagined. Oberstleutnant von der Heiter of the 6th Fallschirmjäger Regiment remarked, Heiter thought it ridiculous that the main road up which the enemy was clearly going to charge should be the boundary between his regiment and the two battalions of Panzergrenadiers from the 10th SS Frunsberg. He warned Walter's senior operations officer that nobody was directly responsible for the defence of the road, but it did little good. Once again the German attack, which had no artillery support, was rapidly broken up by the accuracy of British gunnery. In that flat countryside, Heiter believed in blasting church towers with anti-tank guns to deal with forward observation officers. As soon as Heiter arrived at his command post, the British batteries put down a rapid barrage on the house. Lieutenant Volz described the scene as the shells landed. With an elegant leap, Heiter disappeared through the ground-floor window. I with splinters flying around, covered in plaster and dust, got further under the table. The insanely jangling telephone slowly got on my nerves. I could not reach the receiver, which in this storm of buzzing splinters would have meant suicide. During a short fire pause, Major Schacht, on the staff of 1st Parachute, Fallschirm Army, explained he was not used to be made to wait on the telephone without at least some information on the immediate situation, as military protocol demanded. Heiter was furious. His regiment's losses were considerable, and an angry full reader wrote in his diary that evening, Some of the barely trained recruits, once their officers are out of action, lose their heads and run into the tank fire. The only good thing is that their relatives in Germany have no idea of the pointless, irresponsible way that their boys are being sacrificed here. Students' headquarters ordered more attacks, but Oberst Walter did not want to lose more men to no purpose. He simply launched token feints. German soldiers in the West were often terrorized by Allied air power, which dwarfed anything they had seen in the East. The fireworks at the front, remarked a soldier in a rear area security battalion, are not as dangerous as the low-level strafing attacks. In England, the final touches were being put to the air plan, which in two days' time would unleash the first lift of 1,500 transport aircraft and 500 gliders, to say nothing of the hundreds of bombers, fighter bombers, and fighters, whose mission was to destroy airfields, barracks, and flak positions in advance. In the early hours of the 17th of September, 200 Lancasters from Bomber Command and 23 Mosquitoes would attack the German airfields at Leewarden, Steenweig Hafelter, Hopsten, and Salzbergen, dropping 890 tons of bombs. Soon after dawn, another 85 Lancasters and 15 Mosquitoes escorted by fifty-three Spitfires, would attack the coastal defence flak batteries of Walcheren with five hundred and thirty-five tons of bombs. As a comparison, the heaviest Luftwaffe raid on London during the Battle of Britain dropped only three hundred and fifty tons. Flying fortresses of the U.S. 8th Air Force would bomb Eindhoven Airfield, while the main force, escorted by one hundred and sixty-one P-51 Mustangs, would attack 117 flak positions along the troop carrier routes and around the dropping and landing zones. While Britain's first Allied Airborne Army exuded confidence in its plans, a number of officers in the airborne divisions became increasingly uneasy as various details emerged. The Americans had allocated only one pilot per glider, which meant that if he were killed or wounded, 
one of the soldiers would have to take over, having never flown a glider before. Gliders bringing in senior officers were, however, allowed two pilots. Although horrified by the plan of the British First Airborne at Arnhem, Brigadier General Jim Gavin of the 82nd Airborne never challenged General Browning's argument that the Grosbeck high ground was of far greater importance to the success of this and subsequent operations than the Nijmegen bridges. Browning had emphasized to Gavin that German counterattacks would come from the Reichswald just over the border to the southeast of Nijmegen. If the Germans managed to secure the high ground, then they could shell some of the bridges and the road up which 30 Corps and its supplies would be advancing. Yet Gavin still felt it was strange not to go straight for the main objective, the great Nijmegen road bridge, which was presumably prepared for demolition. In any case, Gavin had not forgotten how in Sicily his 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment had found itself up against the Hermann Göring Panzer Division. This time he intended to bring in his own glider-borne artillery as soon as possible. Major General Urquhart also had good reasons to be apprehensive. His command caravan was parked under a large elm facing the fairway of the golf course at Moor Park, so on Friday the 15th of September he took a little time off to play a few holes. He looked up to see his chief of staff waiting to speak to him. Colonel Mackenzie looked grave. They had just heard that the number of gliders had been reduced. Urquhart thought hard, and then said that whatever they had to cut— it must not be the anti-tank guns, especially the seventeen-pounders. Urquhart was in a difficult position. Officers at all levels were reluctant to criticize a plan passed down to them, since it might suggest they were faint-hearted. He clearly did not think that Operation Market was going to be plain sailing, otherwise he would not have laid such emphasis on keeping their anti-tank guns. At the same time, he had to conceal his fears from all those under his command. There is no hint in any of Urquhart's reports— or in his book written after the war, that he opposed the plan he was ordered to carry out? But then he was not a man to seek controversy, and he certainly would not have wanted to contradict the subsequent version of events that the Battle of Arnhem had been a heroic, worthwhile gamble. Yet according to General Browning's aide, Captain Eddie Newbury, on the 15th of September, Urquhart appeared in Browning's office on the second floor at Moor Park, and strode over to his desk. "'Sir,' he said, You've ordered me to plan this operation, and I have done it, and now I wish to inform you that I think it is a suicide operation. He apparently then turned and walked out of Browning's office. Chapter 7 Eve of Battle, Saturday the 16th of September Leopoldsburg was a rather dismal garrison town, southwest of the Neerpelt bridgehead. On the morning of Saturday, the 16th of September, its streets became crowded with jeeps bringing unit and formation commanders of 30 Corps to the cinema opposite the railway station, where Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks was going to brief them. Red-capped military police with white gauntlets tried to direct the traffic, but many senior officers ignored their instructions and simply parked where they liked. The lobby of the cinema buzzed as more than a hundred colonels, brigadiers, and major generals in a variety of coloured berries and khaki forage caps chatted away, catching up with friends. After showing their identity cards to more military policemen, they filed into the cinema and took their places. At eleven-fifteen hours, Horrocks made his entrance. Keeping to the Eighth Army's insouciant attitude to uniform since the Desert War, he wore a polo-neck jersey under a battle-dress blouse and a camouflage pattern airborne smock. A popular commander of great charm, Horrocks was greeted with cheers on all sides as he made his way down the central aisle to the stage, where a huge map of the southwestern Netherlands awaited him. The excited hubbub finally quietened as Horrocks turned to face them. This next operation, he declared, will give you enough to bore your grandchildren for the rest of your lives. The release of tension produced a roar of laughter. He then proceeded, in the standard format, to outline the current situation, enemy strength and own troops, before coming on to the object of Operation Garden. He described the airborne carpet stretching ahead of 30 Corps from Eindhoven to Arnhem. The Guards Armoured Division, supported by 14 regiments of artillery and squadrons of rocket-firing typhoons, would break the German line to their north. Then they would follow the single road, 
what Horrocks called the club route, but which the Americans would soon dub Hell's Highway, over 103 kilometers to Arnhem. There were seven major water obstacles to cross, but the 43rd Division, right behind the guards, would be equipped with boats and bridging equipment in case of German demolitions. There would be 20,000 vehicles on the road, and the strictest traffic controls would be enforced. The low polder land on either side of the banktop road meant that only infantry could deploy out to the flanks because it was too soggy for heavy armoured vehicles. After Arnhem, their ultimate objective was the Eiselmeer, also known as the Zeidersee, to cut off the remnants of the German 15th Army to the west and then attack the Ruhr and its industries to the east. As the ambitious scope of the operation became clear, reactions differed between those who were inspired by its daring and those who feared the consequences of such rashness advancing on a one-tank front. Horrocks spoke for an hour, hardly ever referring to his notes. Colonel Renfro, the 101st Airborne Liaison Officer with 30 Corps, was impressed with his enthusiasm and his confidence in the operation but he remained deeply sceptical of the idea that the Guards' Armoured Division would be in Eindhoven in two to three hours and in Arnhem in sixty. Several Dutch officers present from the Princess Arena Brigade did not think much of Horrocks's joke that the operation should be called Gold Rush because the Netherlands was such a rich country. More to the point, they felt that the British were taking far too much for granted. First we'll take this bridge, then that one, hop this river, and so on. The terrain and its difficulties were well known to them, as this very route constituted one of the key questions in their staff college exams. Any candidate who planned to advance from Nijmegen straight up the main road to Arnhem was failed on the spot, and this was exactly what the British were planning to do. Unfortunately, the British planners had failed to consult them. Their brigade major, who was also present, reminded the brigade commander, Colonel de Reuter von Stevenink, of the Napoleonic maxim, never fight unless you're at least seventy-five percent certain of success. The other twenty-five percent you can leave to chance. Horrocks's plan, they agreed, appeared to reverse the proportions. Horrocks, with his prematurely white hair and beguiling smile, made some people think he looked more like a bishop than a general. He never revealed how much pain he was in a lot of the time. This did not come from the severe stomach wound he had received in the First World War, but from a German fighter strafing run in Italy the year before. One bullet went through his leg, while another punctured his lungs and hit his spine on exit. He was extraordinarily lucky not to have died or been paralyzed. Surgery followed surgery, and the general medical opinion was that he would never return to active service. But Montgomery, who had a very soft spot for Jorrocks, as he called him, had summoned him back in August to take over command of thirty corps. This was premature. Horrocks still suffered from severe bouts of sickness which, with high temperature and intense pain, could last for up to a week. His most recent collapse had taken place just as his divisions were about to cross the Seine. Montgomery, who had guessed what was happening, turned up unannounced at his command post and reassured him that he would not send him home. He moved Horrocks's caravan to his own tactical headquarters where he would bring in the army's top medical specialists to care for him. It is impossible to assess how much Horrocks's judgment might have been affected by these attacks that autumn. All one can say is that in December, during the great German offensive in the Ardennes, he came up with such a mad idea, he wanted to let the Germans cross the Meuse and then defeat them on the field of Waterloo, that even Montgomery insisted on sending him back to England on sick leave. In any case, Horrocks's plan for Operation Garden was the obvious one, given the orders he had received from Montgomery and Dempsey. He has, however, been criticized for choosing the Guards' Armoured Division to lead the charge north, rather than Roberts's 11th Armoured Division. Horrocks said later that he chose them for the breakout because I was sure they could do it, no matter what the cost. They had the better infantry, with officers prepared to give their lives without qualm or question. The Guards' Armoured Division had been set up in England in June 1941 to make up for the shortage of tank formations in the event of a German invasion. When Hitler attacked the Soviet Union later that month, a German cross-channel assault became an even more unlikely event, but the transformation went ahead anyway because the Foot Guards had so many spare battalions. The Guards, 
benefiting from their close relationship with the royal family, had long wielded enormous influence and to a large degree were a law unto themselves. Even their recruiting system remained independent, and as a result the so-called Brigade of Guards was able to expand to a total of twenty-six battalions. But it struck many people as strange that an organization which deliberately selected tall men for their parade ground presence should then force them into the restricted space of a tank. Perhaps a rather more pertinent paradox, however, was their excessive respect for the chain of command, which led to a suppression of initiative, that vital element in fast-moving armoured warfare. Professor Sir Michael Howard, a cold streamer himself, always felt that setting up the Guards' Armoured Division had been a big mistake. Guards' regiments, he argued, were very good on defence, but never very good at offensive operations. They were taught to die, but never taught to kill. We lacked the killer instinct. In his view, only the Irish Guards had it. Sir Horrocks, or Major General Alan Adair, the divisional commander, at least picked the right regiment to lead the attack. Lieutenant Colonel Vandeleur, who commanded the 3rd Motorised Battalion of the Irish Guards, was a tall, solid, red-faced figure of good fighting stock. His ancestors had fought at many battles, including Waterloo, yet his reaction on hearing from Horrocks that the Irish Guards were to lead the attack north was, Oh, Christ! That evening, Brigadier Norman Gwatkin briefed the officers of the Irish Guards Group at his 5th Brigade command post. Orders were issued for a breakout from the bridgehead on the following day and an advance north to the side of Zay, Isselmeer. Vandeleur could not have been surprised to hear a half-moan go up when his officers heard that they were to be the spearhead once again. They felt they had deserved a break after seizing Joe's Bridge. We have forty-eight hours to reach the first airborne at Arnhem, Gwatkin announced. Several shook their heads in disbelief. They knew how much tougher German resistance had become in the last ten days, and the Isselmeer was more than 145 kilometres away. Back in England, briefings that day prompted a variety of reactions, ranging from overconfidence to outright scepticism. Most paratroopers were told that Market Garden would bring the war to a speedy end. Some officers even said that they should be home by Christmas if all went well. Browning suggested at his final briefing at Moor Park that the strike north would cut off so many German troops that the shock would bring about a surrender within a matter of weeks. Almost everyone was relieved to hear that the operation was going to take place in daylight. Normandy veterans could not forget the chaos of the night drop there, with sticks of paratroopers scattered all over the Cotentin Peninsula. A platoon commander in the 82nd Airborne described their briefing with officers from Troop Carrier Command. Once Colonel Frank Krebs of the Air Force had finished speaking, Lieutenant Colonel Louis G. Mendes, a battalion commander of the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment, stood up and looked around slowly. After a heavy silence, he addressed the pilots. Channel men, my officers know this map by heart, and we are ready to go. When I brought my battalion to the briefing prior to Normandy, I had the finest combat-ready force of its size that will ever be known. Gentlemen, by the time I had gathered them together in Normandy, half of them were gone. Apparently, tears were rolling down his cheeks by this point. I charge you all. Put us down in Holland, or put us down in hell. But put us all down in one place, or I will hound you to your graves. He then turned and walked out. A few paratroopers were slightly dismayed by the code name Operation Market Garden, which made it sound like we were going to be picking apples or tiptoeing through the tulips. We thought it should have been called something a little more rugged-sounding. Veterans of Normandy tended to dismiss the encouraging intelligence reports on enemy strength as the usual old men too weak to pull the trigger and ulcer battalion stories, but they also preferred to believe that the planners would not send them into a disaster. We were damn sure General Breerton wasn't going to let his brand-new Allied Airborne Army get the hell kicked out of it, the captain in the 82nd Airborne recorded. Several American Airborne briefings revealed reservations about their British ally. Colonel Reuben H. Tucker of the 504th announced to his officers, I'm supposed to tell you, and I'll quote, We will have the world's greatest concentration of armor with us on this operation. 
Then, to great laughter, he muttered, One brand gun carrier might turn up. The 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, under Colonel Tucker, had dropped in Sicily, then was held back in Italy to fight in the Apennines as infantry, and even took part in the Anzio landings. As a result of the hardships it had undergone, the regiment was spared the D-Day operation with the 82nd Airborne. For some reason, this seems to have contributed to some bad blood between Tucker and Jim Gavin, the 82nd Airborne's divisional commander, but it did not last. For the Poles, the point of the war was to close with the enemy and kill Germans, and now the moment had come. Everyone is serious, aware that we are going, wrote a Polish paratrooper. To a keen eye, the men's faces speak of longing for vengeance and even fear. A wholly natural feeling, for we are not going to exercise, but to face the enemy eye to eye. In spite of everything, there is a spirit of joy. When he wrote, in spite of everything, he referred, of course, to the Warsaw Uprising, where they all longed to be, fighting alongside the home army. As they were shown maps and aerial pictures of their objective in the Netherlands, Stanley Nasetsky visualized with his eyes closed the Poniatowski Bridge, the Column of Zygmunt, the King's Castle, and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. He wondered, are they still fighting in Warsaw on those famous streets of Novi Sviat and Tamka? Is the Holy Cross Church still there, where I used to serve as an altar boy every other Sunday? British briefings usually took place around sand models. Sergeant Robert Jones of Frost's 2nd Battalion that worked for hours from air reconnaissance photographs to create a seven-metre square reproduction of the road bridge at Arnhem and its approaches. This was on the floor of the library at Stoke Rochford Hall, a Victorian country house near Grantham in the East Midlands. Some thought that the briefing sounded uncomfortably like the one less than two weeks earlier for Operation Comet, although this time there were the two American airborne divisions to beef it up. They assumed that Market Garden would also be cancelled at the last moment, and once again they would be stood down as soon as they were loaded and ready to take off. The more experienced paratroopers in the 1st Parachute Brigade, who had seen service in North Africa and Sicily, were unconvinced by assurances that German resistance would be light, but they said nothing. One officer in the 1st Battalion claimed that he and several others objected strongly to the dropping zone so far from the bridge, and volunteered en masse to jump on, or a bit to the south of, the objective. This request, and the reason for it, was passed on to higher command and refused, because the vicinity of Dalen Airfield to the north and the wetness of the polders to the south might cause unacceptable casualties. As it proved, the safe DZ cost us infinitely more casualties. Whatever the concerns officers still held about the plan, they knew they had to get on with it and set a good example. In the British Army, that usually meant falling back on the old jokes. In the Airborne, when drawing parachutes, it also meant the storeman saying, Bring it back if it doesn't work and we'll exchange it. In the Netherlands, the Dutch tried to stick with their weekend routine, but fear and expectation dominated everything. Martin Louis Denham, the director of the great De Vereniging Concert Hall in Nijmegen, wrote in his diary that the whole city felt very tense. Something was going to happen. In Osterbeek, next to Arnhem, the young Hendrika van der Vliest smuggled some breakfast out to her brother, who was in hiding. Their father owned the Hotel Schonort, which had been taken over by the Germans. They left a terrible mess and picked all the flowers they could find to decorate their rooms. German soldiers still tried to believe that they would win the war. One of them said to her, You just wait until the new weapons arrive. SS Obergruppenführer Rauter issued orders that morning forbidding the civil population to halt on or near bridges, any sort of bridge approach and underpasses at any German command post or establishment. Yet General Feldmarschall von Winstedt's headquarters at that moment was far more preoccupied with the American First Army's advance on the city of Aachen. He was ordering in the 12th Infanterie Division and the 116th Panzer Division, as well as the 107th Panzer Brigade and the 280th Assault Gun Brigade from Denmark. It was a momentous day in the Wolfschanze in East Prussia. Hitler, who had recently risen from his sickbed after an attack of jaundice, astonished the assembled generals after the morning situation conference. He cut General Oberst Jodl short 
to announce his determination to launch a major counterattack from the Ardennes with Antwerp as its objective. He had dreamed this up in his drug-fueled fantasy during the illness. Their surprise was even greater when he talked of an offensive with more than thirty divisions at a time when they did not have enough to defend Aachen. Jodl tried to bring in an air of reality when he pointed to Allied air superiority and the fact that they expected parachute landings any day in Denmark, Holland, or even northern Germany. Hitler's attention was brought back to the imminent threat to Aachen, but he had no intention of abandoning his new idea. That evening a Führer order was transmitted. The battle in the West has spread in wide sectors to the German homeland. German towns and villages are becoming battle zones. These facts must make our war leadership fanatical, and, with every man able to carry a gun, the fight must be escalated with the hardest of hearts. Every bunker, each housing block in a German town, each German village must become a fortress, so that the enemy is either bled to death or its garrison is buried within it in man-to-man combat. A scorched-earth policy had already been declared for the Netherlands and the besieged Channel ports. The chief of staff of the 15th Army reported that in Ostend Harbour eighteen ships have been sunk. Discussions continued about destroying the ports of Rotterdam and Amsterdam. General von Sangen, meanwhile, continued to bring back troops and field guns at night across the Scheldt estuary. SS Brigadefuhrer Hamel of the Frunsberg, left that afternoon by car for Berlin, to discuss the re-equipment of Bittrich's Panzer Corps. But because of the state of the roads, with many cratered by bombing, he did not reach Berlin until the middle of the following morning. For Harmel, the timing could not have been worse. Unlike Harmel in Berlin, SS Sturmbannführer Sepp Kraft was going to be right on the spot when the landings took place west of Arnhem the next day. Kraft, who was thirty-seven years old, had been an officer of the security police on the Eastern Front and had transferred to the Waffen-SS only the year before. A tall man with dark blue eyes, he was very ambitious, even though he commanded nothing more than the 16th SS Panzergrenadier Training and Reserve Battalion. He may not have seen himself as a man of destiny before the airborne landings, but there can be little doubt that he did soon afterwards. He was also slightly paranoid, claiming later that Obergruppenführer Bittrich regarded me as a police spy for Himmler. After the Battle of Arnhem was over, Kraft seems to have believed that Bittrich should have recommended him for the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, and was angry not to have received it. Bittrich, with a certain hauteur, insisted, I simply cannot remember the man at all. Kraft's battalion of three companies was spread between Arnhem and the area of Osterbeek. The thousand recruits he had been promised for training had not yet arrived. He had been there for only a few days, when a major on the staff arrived to say that he must leave, because General Feldmarschall Model's headquarters was moving to Osterbeek. As a result, Kraft positioned part of his force out in the woods, just to the northeast of the town. One detachment, close to Wolfheser, was almost on the edge of the landing and drop zones chosen for the 1st Airborne Division. On the evening of the 16th of September, Kraft was on his way into Arnhem, when he encountered General Walter Grabmann, a veteran of the Condor Legion, the Luftwaffe force in the Spanish Civil War supporting General Franco. Grabmann now commanded the Luftwaffe 3rd Fighter Division at Dalen. He invited Kraft to dinner to see his new command bunker. During dinner, Grabmann remarked that he felt on edge. The weather remained clear, and yet Allied air activity had virtually ceased. The English cannot afford to let one single day go by, now more than ever before. In his view, this suggested that they might be preparing something big, perhaps even an airborne operation. He had been to Modell's headquarters and expressed his fears to the chief of staff, General Leutnant Hans Krebs, but Krebs had laughed at the suggestion and said that he would make himself look ridiculous if he repeated such things. Graft decided to post a lookout in the tower of the grandiose villa he occupied, the Waldfrieder. That Saturday night, Kraft's men were celebrating their luck at being quartered in such pleasant surroundings. Life there was as if in the lap of peace, observed SS Sturm und Bangard. Each man had received a bottle of Danziger Goldwasser liqueur. Someone played an accordion, they sang favorite songs, and many of them did not go to bed until three in the morning. The same evening in England, paratroopers in the 82nd Airborne listened to a band playing. Some troopers were dancing on their own, 
and others clapped their hands in time to the music. Dwayne T. Burns recorded. Some were playing ball, while others lay on their cots, dead to the world and oblivious to worry or to noise. It was going to be a day jump, and we knew this had to be better than the night drop into Normandy. The hard court of compulsive gamblers played on. Others sharpened their jump knives, made jokes about the crowds suffering from lead poisoning, or discussed their weapons, a passionate and deeply personal subject. Some paratroopers even had a pet name for their rifle or Thompson submachine gun. In many cases, they adapted their Tommy guns by removing the bud or made other illegal modifications. Quite a few, however, hated the weapon with a passion. We were disenchanted with that gun, said Staff Sergeant Neil Boyle. When mine jammed on me, I wouldn't carry one again. Lieutenant Ed Wierzbowski, a platoon commander in the 101st Airborne, had a troubling conversation that night. His sergeant approached him between the pyramidal tents in the marshalling area where they had been locked down. Lieutenant, I've got a feeling I'm not coming back from this one, Staff Sergeant John J. White said to him. Weird Spassky tried to snap him out of it with a joke, but to no avail. The sergeant was calm while his eyes revealed that he remained totally convinced of his fate. He then parted with a smile and said, See you in the morning, Lieutenant. Wirtzbarski found it very hard to sleep. The look in White's eyes stayed with him. Chapter 8 Airborne Invasion, Sunday morning, the 17th of September Soon after first light, on what was to be a very busy day, a total of 84 Mosquito fighter bombers as well as Boston and Mitchell medium bombers of the 2nd Tactical Air Force, took off to attack German barracks at Nijmegen, Clever, Arnhem, and Edda. This followed the raids on Luftwaffe airfields during the night by Bomber Command and the U.S. 8th Air Force. At the same time, another 872 B-17 flying fortresses, loaded with fragmentation bombs, were heading out in groups to smash identified flak and troop positions in the Netherlands. They were escorted by 147 P-51 Mustangs, flying flank and top cover. The escorts had little to do. Luftwaffe reaction was hesitant, was the verdict that day. Only 15 Fokker Wolf 190s were seen, and seven were shot down for the loss of one U.S. fighter. While the Allied aircraft were on the way to their targets, American and British paratroopers queued for breakfast. The Americans had hot cakes and syrup, fried chicken with all the trimmings, and apple pie. British paratroopers in John Frost's 2nd Battalion piled their mess tins with smoked haddock, quite a lot of which ended up on the floor of the aircraft, a sergeant remarked. Frost himself had eggs and bacon. He was in a good mood. Having been dismayed by Operation Comet, he thought that this time the arrangements at least seemed much better. Frost, who had led the highly successful Brunneval raid in February 1942, seizing a German radar set in northern France, had also known disasters in Tunisia and Sicily. He did not expect the coming battle to be easy, but he still ordered his batman, Wicks, to pack his dinner jacket, golf clubs, and shotgun, ready to come over with the staff car later. He then checked his own equipment, including a 48-hour ration pack, his Colt 45 automatic, and the hunting horn with which he rallied the battalion. Frost, a religious man of firm convictions, was admired by his men. There's old Johnny Frost, they would say, a Bible in one hand and a forty-five in the other. By the time the three divisions deployed to their respective airfields, eight for the British and seventeen for the Americans, the sun was starting to burn through the morning mist to make a beautiful early autumn day. Altogether, a total of 1,544 transport aircraft and 478 gliders stood ready for the first lift of more than 20,000 troops. The runways provided an impressive sight, with each tug aircraft and glider lined up perfectly for takeoff. The troop carrier command C-47 Dakotas were also carefully aligned, ready to become airborne at 20-second intervals. General Boy Browning was at Swindon Airfield in excellent spirits. He was finally taking an airborne corps to war. His glider, which was to be flown by Colonel George Chatterton, who commanded the glider pilot regiment, 
would carry the general's entourage, including his batman, cook and doctor, as well as his tent, jeep and luggage. According to his biographer, Browning had also packed three teddy bears. The fact that he had appropriated no fewer than thirty-eight gliders for his corps headquarters in the first lift, especially when the first airborne's allocation had been cut back, struck a number of people as an act of pure vanity. The three divisions would be operating independently of each other, so there would be very little a corps headquarters could usefully do, above all on the vital first day. At the airfield, Urquhart suddenly realized that he had not clarified which of the brigade commanders should take over if he became hors de combat. So he drew his chief of staff aside and said, Look, Charles, if anything happens to me, the succession is to be Lathbury, Higgs, Hackett, in that order. All right, sir, Mackenzie replied, not imagining that it would ever come to that. They would both regret later that Urquhart had not made it clear in advance to the brigadiers concerned. As the first airborne lined up for tea and sandwiches before boarding, some paratroopers seemed to display an ostentatious optimism. A sergeant had brought a deflated football ready for a game once they had captured the bridge. Another soldier, when asked why he had a dartboard with him, replied that a game of darts always helped to pass away dull evenings. And a captain with the 1st Parachute Brigade headquarters insisted on taking a bottle of sherry to celebrate the taking of the bridge. Those going by glider competed in the ribald messages they chalked up on the fuselage of camouflage canvas. General Urquhart noted an up with the Fräulein skirts scrawled on a hawser. Gallo's humour abounded. The chaps are just the same, a glider pilot recorded in his diary. One fellow is taking bets as to how many of us will get the chop. I wonder if he will come back to collect his debts, or maybe pay out. American optimism appeared to consist mostly of fantasies about yet another foreign country. A young lieutenant remembered wondering what all those blonde girls really looked like, with wooden shoes on their feet and windmills in their eyes. A number of paratroopers had heard that the Netherlands was the country of diamonds, and they dreamed of returning home with enough loot to set themselves up in style. On the other hand, the possibility of imminent death revived religious thoughts. Catholics especially took the opportunity of spiritual consolation. The American airborne divisions included a rich ethnic mix from Catholic cultures, including men of Spanish, German, Polish, Irish, and Italian descent. As there was no time for individual conversion, Father Sampson of the 101st Airborne gave a general absolution to the group of bareheaded men kneeling at the edge of the airfield. The gold and white vestments of the Catholic priest looked incongruous against the olive drab around, wrote an onlooker. Far from feeling optimistic, a few young paratroopers were in a state of mortal dread. The day before, two had gone absent without leave after the briefing. Then, just before the hundred and first climbed onto trucks to be taken to the airfield, another had shot himself through the foot with his M1 rifle. Next to the runway, yet another one had slipped behind a C-47, where he did the same. Some men went AWOL, and quite a few parachutes, accidentally on purpose, came out of their packets in the aircraft, Brigadier General McAuliffe acknowledged later. A parachute spilled in that way meant that the man could not jump, but if it was deliberate, then he faced a court-martial for cowardice. Many were afraid of losing their nerve in the aircraft at the last moment and refusing to jump. Paratroopers were so heavily loaded that they could hardly move and needed to be pushed or pulled up the steps into the aircraft. They had helmets covered with camouflage netting and strapped under the chin, webbing equipment, musette bags with personal items such as shaving kit and cigarettes, three days of K-rations, extra ammunition in beige cloth bandoliers, hand grenades and a gammon grenade of plastic explosive for use against tanks their own M1 rifle or Thompson submachine gun, as well as mortar rounds, machine gun belts, or an anti-tank mine for general use, and, of course, every man carried his parachute behind. Bazooka men, mortar men, machine gunners, and signalers shouldered all or part of their own weapon or radio. On average, each man carried the equivalent of his own weight. Since few of them could reach their cigarettes, a sergeant moved down the aisle of the aircraft, handing them out and lighting them. Before boarding his plane, Brigadier General Jim Gavin was talking to his attached Dutch officer, Captain Ari Bestebreche, 
who revealed that he had never jumped from the door of a C-47. He had only dropped through a hole in the floor from British aircraft, so Gavin gave him a lesson on the spot. Just step out, like stepping out of a bus, he said. Bester Brecher, who at six foot three was taller than Gavin, wore a commando green beret and British battle dress, with a shoulder patch showing an orange lion and Nederlands written underneath. He was a member of a Jedburgh team, one of which was attached to each airborne division and another to corps headquarters. These teams, formed by the British Special Operations Executive in cooperation with the American Office of Strategic Services, trained small multinational groups to parachute in to join up with the local resistance and create mayhem behind German lines. Their main task in the Netherlands was to liaise with the underground and organise their activities in support of the Allied forces. The first aircraft to take off carried each division's pathfinders. They would land on their drop and landing zones, fight off any Germans, set up Eureka homing beacons to guide in the waves of troop carriers, and set off coloured smoke grenades on their approach. Twelve RAF Sterlings from Fairford and Gloucestershire took the 21st Independent Parachute Company to mark the first airborne drop and landing zones. At least twenty of its members were German and Austrian Jews who were transferred from the Pioneer Corps. In case of capture, their dog tags and identity papers carried Scottish or English names, usually with Church of England marked under religion, so that they could not be identified as Jews. They would fight ferociously, taunting the enemy in his own language. Next to leave with the tug planes and their 320 gliders carrying the 1st Air Landing Brigade, divisional headquarters and the field ambulances. As well as troops, supplies and ammunition, the horse gliders carried jeeps, trailers, motorcycles and six-pounder anti-tank guns, while the larger Hamel cars took Bren gun carriers and the 17-pounders. The tug plane advanced slowly until the tow rope tightened and then finally the glider began to move down the runway. The glider pilot would shout back over his shoulder, Hook your safety belts, the tow line is fastened, they're taking up the slack, hold on! Then with a lurch, a second lieutenant recounted, The tail comes up, the nose goes down, the plywood creaks, and we are barreling down the runway. Long before the tow plane leaves the ground, the speed sends the flimsy glider skywards. Finally, it was the turn of the C-47 troop carriers. With a deafening roar, their engines suddenly speeded up, the propeller blast flattening the grass beside the runway. Then the heavily laden aircraft accelerated away. Inside the strutted metal cave of the fuselage, the paratroopers sat wedged in their aluminium bucket seats, facing each other across the narrow aisle, mostly avoiding eye contact, until they reached cruising height. In Belgium, General Horrocks asked Colonel Renfro, the liaison officer of the 101st Airborne, to brief him again on the airborne plan. How many days' rations will they jump with? he asked. How long can they hold out? These questions slightly surprised Renfro, after Horrocks had declared at the briefing that the Guards' armoured division would be in Eindhoven in a few hours. Horrocks and his chief of staff, Brigadier Harold Pyman, then asked Renfro what he thought of their plan. It's all right, he replied without any warmth. Horrocks, aware of his hesitation, laughed. Renfro could not tell whether this was a nervous laugh or bluff. While they were speaking, the corps and divisional artillery near the canal carried on with their preparations to support the guards' armoured attack. One heavy, three medium and ten field artillery regiments were ready in their gun lines to provide a rolling barrage which would advance at two hundred yards a minute. They had been ordered to avoid cratering the road ahead at all costs. Fortunately, the road was quite straight. The massive convoy of vehicles which would follow the Guards' armoured division was being sorted out in the rear by movement officers and military police. The bombers and fighter bombers attacked flak positions in Nijmegen and Arnhem just before 10.30. Electricity for the whole area was cut off almost immediately because the PGEM generating plant on the banks of the Val had been hit. The wise began filling baths and pails immediately, in case the pumps would not come back on. Those who had binoculars or old telescopes climbed onto roofs and tried to watch the action. They had to be quick. Mosquito fighter bombers screamed in at low level over Arnhem to attack the main barracks, the Willemskaserne, 
but they also hit the restaurant Royale opposite. An antiquarian bookseller nearby saw Germans tumbling from the blasted rubble of the Willems barracks with blood pouring from their noses and ears from the concussion. By mistake, Allied bombers hit an old people's home, the St. Katharina Gasthaus, next to a German warehouse, which the Wehrmacht had in fact abandoned. A number of residents were buried under the rubble. Strafing fighters came in low. Sister Christine van Dijk saw German soldiers ducking round tree trunks to avoid their machine gun fire. The Dutch used to joke that the safest place to go in an air raid was the railway station, as the RAF never managed to hit it. But in parts of Arnhem there was little cause for laughter. A large number of houses round the barracks caught fire, and nothing could be done to help. Fire engines are unable to work as Germans are shooting at them, an anonymous diarist recorded, in this first example of revenge against the Dutch for supporting the Allied attack, even though some two hundred civilians were killed in the raid. The RAF's key targets were the anti-aircraft batteries around the Arnhem Road Bridge, yet Model's headquarters instinctively assumed that the air raids on flight positions near Arnhem were believed to be made in an effort to destroy the bridge. Ton Healing, a young keeper at the Arnhem Zoo, was on his way home on that Sunday morning when the Allied bombing raid started. German soldiers were lying dead and wounded in front of a cafe in the Blumstrad. Then, to his surprise, a badly burnt rabbit dashed across the road in front of me and disappeared. Further on, he found a gravely wounded man being helped onto a stretcher. Keeling, who was strong, grabbed one end, and they hurried the injured man to the St. Elizabeth Hospital, only to find that he had died on the way. Keeling, like many others, stayed at the hospital to help as a Red Cross volunteer. West of Arnhem, the town of Eda, which contained just 180 German soldiers, was smashed by air attack. Wolf Heser was also heavily hit at 11.40, having been targeted at General Urquhart's request. Unfortunately, one of the bombs caught a direct hit on the artillery ammunition dump under the trees, and the massive explosion caused great damage and killed a number of people. After the Wolfheser Institute for the Blind had been hit, the matron organized a well-disciplined evacuation to a shelter prepared in the woods. But many of the eleven hundred mentally infirm patients at the next-door institute were traumatized by the bombing. The nurses began laying out white sheets on the ground in the shape of a huge cross in case more aircraft came to attack. Dr. Marius van der Beek and other doctors began operating on some eighty wounded and the eighty-one dead were buried on the following Friday. On this Sunday morning, both Catholic and Dutch Reformed churches were not as full as usual, as the congregations were made up almost exclusively of women and children. The men had dived to avoid being taken hostage or shot in reprisal for the attack on the viaduct. Explosions made windows rattle, and the sudden cut in the electricity supply brought church organs to a groaning halt as the lights went out. In some churches, the priest blessed the congregation, and everyone filed out quickly. The Dutch Reformed congregation in Osterbeek guessed that the attacks signified imminent liberation. Spontaneously, they burst into the national anthem, Het Wilhelmus, which dated back to the 16th century revolt against the Spanish occupation of the Netherlands. In the Betuva, the low-lying land between Arnhem and Nijmegen, People hurried to climb the dikes for a better view of the columns of smoke rising from both towns. In the city of Nijmegen itself, people were understandably anxious after the disastrous American bombing of the 22nd of February mentioned earlier, but soon relaxed when they saw that the main targets for the typhoons and mosquitoes were the flak batteries by the bridges on the north side and German positions on the Hasen Komsweg to the southwest. As soon as the hissing whoosh of the rockets had died away, and the aircraft disappeared into the distance, people poured out into the streets. There was an air of expectancy, after all the premature rumors of the Allied advance. General Oberst Student and his first Fallschirm Army headquarters were south of Wucht, not far from the notorious concentration camp. Student was struggling under a mountain of paperwork in a villa taken over by his staff. Annoying red tape followed us even here on the battlefield, he complained. I had opened wide the windows of my room. 
In the late afternoon, enemy air activity suddenly became very lively. Columns of fighter planes and formations of small bombers flew over constantly. In the distance, one could hear bombs dropping, aircraft machine guns, and anti-aircraft fire. He did not regard it as particularly significant at the time. In Arnhem Railway Station, Panzer Grenadiers from the 9th Panzer Division, Hohenstaufen, continued loading weapons and equipment onto trains to return to Germany, where the formation was to be rebuilt. A certain amount had already been handed over to the 10th SS Panzer Division, Frunsberg, and although part of the Hohenstaufen had departed over the last two days, there was still quite a force left in the area. It included tank crews from the 9th SS Panzer Regiment, which had no tanks, two battalions of Panzer Grenadiers, an artillery battalion, and the 9th SS Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion, next to Dalen Airfield, an engineer company, the Divisional Escort Company, and a couple of half-tracks with quadruple 20mm flak guns. At 10.30, just as the bombing attack started, Dundartenführer Harzer, accompanied by two of his officers from the Hohenstaufen, drove to the reconnaissance battalion space at Hundelu, on the northern edge of Dalen Aerodrome. The battalion of around 500 men, commanded by SS Sturmbahnführer Viktor Gribner, was drawn up in an open square on parade, flanked by several eight-wheeler armoured cars and half-tracks. Harzer addressed them, and then presented Grebner with the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his bravery and leadership in Normandy. When the ceremony was over, Harzer accompanied Grebner and his officers to lunch. Harzer was well aware that Grebner, reluctant to transfer his vehicles to the 10th SS Panzer Division Frunsberg, had had his men remove many of their guns, tracks, and wheels so that he could declare them not ready for use. With the nearest enemy forces at least ninety kilometres to the south, there appeared to be no reason why their armoured fighting vehicles needed to be ready to move at short notice. The Irish Guards group moved across Joe's Bridge and took up position in the bridgehead a thousand metres south of the frontier. They could just see the border post through their binoculars. Many had that strange feeling of imminent danger in the pit of the stomach. Joe Vandeleur who had been a keen horseman before he severely damaged a leg, thought that it felt like the start of a race. We were lining up at the start line, and the finish was the Zuiderzee, ninety miles away. He had been partially reassured by the promise of the rolling barrage and rocket-firing typhoons swooping down to attack enemy gun positions ahead. He had a forward air controller from the RAF in the next vehicle and a direct radio link to the artillery. Vandeleur wore his usual parachute smock, the mix emerald green cravat around his throat, and a pair of corduroys. Horrocks, who was hardly in a position to criticize, liked to tease him on his unguardsmanlike turnout. Mounted in a scout car, Vandeleur took up position behind the second squadron of tanks. His infantry were riding on the Sherman tanks of the second armored battalion of the Irish Guards, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Giles Vandeleur. The two cousins were closer than brothers. As the C-47 troop carriers circled, waiting for their formations to assemble, a number of men began to suffer from air sickness. A lieutenant in the 82nd was entranced when he looked down from the open door and saw a convent below, with a group of nuns in the courtyard staring up at them in amazement. Others gazed at the tiny checkerbox fields of the English countryside. The glider, because it was so light, always tended to fly higher than the tow plane which gave their occupants a chance to see the sky full of other aircraft. But their flimsy construction made them dangerous. To the horror of the crew in one sterling, the wings broke off the horsehead glider they were towing, and the fuselage crashed to the ground, killing everyone inside. In a very different case, a soldier in one of the 101st Airborne's Waco gliders over East Anglia was suddenly overtaken by panic. He jumped up and released the control that connected the glider to the tow ship. The glider went down in England. He faced a general court-martial and a long prison sentence. A British glider pilot, on glancing over his shoulder, saw to his disbelief that a group of the King's own Scottish borderers were brewing up a mess tin full of tea on the plywood floor. He shouted back, furious at such recklessness, but they just asked if he wanted a cup too. Another example of obtuseness was demonstrated by a newly arrived second lieutenant in the 82nd Airborne. He wore a white silk scarf, 
which he evidently considered rather dashing. He was advised to take it off, since anything white made an easy aiming mark, but he did not, and received a serious head wound soon after landing. The coastline slipped by a thousand feet below. They were now over the North Sea, what American pilots called Blitz Creek. After all the earlier aborted operations, someone joked, They're leaving the cancellation a bit late this time. Looking down at the shadows of the aircraft on the sea, pilots spotted a couple of horse gliders and a C-47, which had crash-landed on the water. Men were standing on the wings, waiting for the RAF air-sea rescue tender, which was racing towards them. One glider stayed afloat for two and a half hours and had to be sunk by naval fire. The record, established a few days later, was a glider remaining afloat for seventeen hours. From time to time they spotted the odd warship, but the most impressive spectacle was the vast Air Armada, escorted by squadrons of Thunderbolts, Mustangs, Spitfires, and Typhoons. Wow, said a paratrooper from Ohio. What Cleveland wouldn't give for this air show? During the crossing, a parachute regiment private observed of his companions. Some were cocky and confident, some quiet and thoughtful, and some scared and on edge. Strangely enough, the latter were mostly the veterans of the savage North African fighting. They knew what lay ahead. Another paratrooper remarked, We tried to fake a smile at each other occasionally, but not much was said. On some planes, paratroopers, usually the replacements, tried to get an airborne song going. A universal favorite, sung to the tune of John Brown's body, was Gory, gory, what a hell of a way to die. They picked him off the tarmac like a pot of strawberry jam. American paratroopers also sang to a similar tune. I ain't gonna jump no more, no more. Some slept, or at least pretended to, by shutting their eyes. Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Cassidy, who was in the same aircraft as Major General Maxwell Taylor of the 101st, recorded that their divisional commander slept most of the distance. He awakened once to eat a K-ration, then dozed off again. Not surprisingly, there was no singing in his aircraft. Most of the men also slept, and there was little conversation. Pilots were nervous. The Netherlands was known as Flak Alley because of the massive enemy aircraft defences guarding the shortest route for Allied bombers heading to Germany. Glider pilots, with so little control over their flimsy craft, felt especially vulnerable when tracer bullets curved lazily up at them. The idea of shrapnel coming up from below made many sit on their flak jackets to give added protection to their private parts. A few pilots even brought a sandbag to sit on. Not that it would have done much good. They were not allowed parachutes, simply because their passengers did not have them. The imminence of danger tended to prompt premonitions of death and superstition. A number read different passages in the Bible to find an indication of their likely fate. P.F.C. Belcher, a bazooka man in the 82nd, seemed convinced that he was going to die. He asked his teammate, Patrick O'Hagan, to make sure his girlfriend got his ring and Bible. He was shot in the air as he descended, O'Hagan recorded. On the other hand, most of those who had predicted their own death and survived tended to forget about it afterwards. Yet there was a certain logic among the veterans of North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, who had started to believe that their ration of luck was running low. One staff sergeant described himself as a fugitive from the law of averages. As they reached the Dutch coast, they also reached the line of anchored barges with flak batteries mounted on them. We could see the tracers, wrote Chaplain Cool with the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, and knew that between each visible bullet there were many more rounds. We saw troopers jumping out of one of our wing planes and were shocked to look down and see only water below. Then we noticed the plane was on fire. One paratrooper described the apparently curving machine-gun fire as looking like golf balls of red tracer. Much of the land in from the coast had been deliberately flooded by the Germans breaching the dikes. Those who had dropped in June on the base of the Cotentin Peninsula in Normandy were painfully reminded of comrades drowned there in similar circumstances. The sight of inundated villages, with just the roofs of houses, a church spire, or the odd tree appearing out of this desolation, was most depressing. Only after they were over dry land 
did paratroopers discard their May Wests. Captain Bestabrocher, the Dutch officer attached to 82nd Airborne Headquarters, was deeply moved as he looked at the familiar, flat terrain of the enemy-occupied country, which he had not seen for four years. It was a feeling of warmth for the land, he explained later. I saw the fields and farmhouses, and I could even see a windmill turning. I remember distinctly thinking to myself, here is my poor old Netherlands, and we have come to liberate you. Taking a more southerly route, the 101st Airborne passed over Belgium. As an aircraft carrying a stick of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment flew low over Ghent, exultant civilians in the street started giving the V for Victory salute. A cynic remarked to an excited private, Look, they're giving you two to one, we don't come back. A BBC correspondent in a scout plane over Belgium sighted the air armada. The sky was black with transport aircraft flying in perfect formation, he recorded. They were completely surrounded by typhoons, spitfires, mustangs, thunderbolts and lightning fighters. It was an aerial layer cake. As my pilot shouted to me, no room up here for Jerry. Some in that armada had never seen flag before. The C-47, with Major General Maxwell Taylor on board, also carried a USAAF colonel who had come along as an observer. "'What's that stuff?' he asked, pointing at the black puffs of smoke. "'Colonel,' the co-pilot replied, "'you can rest assured it ain't fluff.' Paratroopers hated flak because they felt helpless. There is no way to fight back. Paratroopers wounded by flak in a plane and unable to jump were pushed to the rear and taken back to England for treatment. Some officers had their sticks stand up and hook up as soon as the flak started, so that they were ready to jump if the plane caught fire. Those in gliders felt even more vulnerable. As a group from the 326 Airborne Engineer Battalion crossed the coast, flak shrapnel came through the floor, wounding the glider pilot in one leg, his chest, and an arm. There was no co-pilot, so an airborne engineer called Melton E. Stevens climbed into the empty seat, and the pilot was just able to give him some instructions for flying and landing the glider before he passed out. They carried on all the way to their LZ and somehow survived the landing, even though dirt was piled against the nose of the glider up above the windshield. Stevens and his companions were then able to load the wounded pilot onto their hand-drawn ammunition cart and carry him off to find a medic. British airborne sappers, strapped in a glider, spent most of the flight nervously eyeing the jeep right in front of them, which was loaded with explosive. Even a near miss from a flag shell could set off the whole lot. The only consolation was that death would be instantaneous. There was no alternative to sweating out the flag. Their only hope were their escorts. As soon as a German flag position opened fire, Spitfires, rocket-firing typhoons, and Thunderbolt P-47s would roll and dive steeply with all guns blazing. The men in one glider suddenly saw a P-51 Mustang come alongside them. The pilot waggled his wings in greeting, then dived on the offending flag position, knocked it out, then came up again to waggle his wings once more, before charging off again. The redoubtable Colonel Robert Sink, who commanded the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, was standing by the door of his C-47, watching the flag strike other aircraft in their formation. Suddenly his own plane lurched, and he saw that part of the wing had been blown off. "'Well, there goes the wing,' he said to the rest of the stick. Evidently the pilot performed miracles, because he got them to the drop zone just northwest of the bridge at Sun, their first objective. In several cases, the transport carrier pilots displayed self-sacrificial courage when their plane was on fire by holding her steady to give all the paratroopers on board a chance to jump. Lieutenant Colonel Cassidy watched flames start to consume a neighboring plane. The pilot courageously kept it on the level to allow the paratroopers to jump, while knowing that he and his crew would crash to their deaths. Distracted by this drama, he failed to see that the green light had come. Cassidy, General Maxwell Taylor said calmly, the green light is on. Yes, sir, he said, and with his eyes still on the burning plane, he jumped, followed by his divisional commander. Bizarrely, General Taylor, later chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Kennedy, was then followed by his bodyguard, Stefan Dedeger, a Princeton graduate of Yugoslav origin, who claims to have shouted, 
Long live Stalin, as he threw himself out. Inevitably, there were one or two paratroopers who panicked. According to Lieutenant Colonel Hank Hanna, the operations officer of the 101st, a paratrooper on his plane suddenly chickened out and, pulling the ripcord of his reserve chute, said, See, I can't jump now. Anna bawled him out and told him he'd have to jump anyway. Then the plane was hit, and the nervous paratrooper was glad to bail out, using his emergency parachute. Another paratrooper, purely by accident, caught his ripcord on some projection, and his chute opened. In furious embarrassment, he had to return with the aircraft to England. As they approached their designated drop zones, officers searched around trying to find landmarks to orientate themselves. Captain Bestebrecher, with a pang of excitement, sighted the wooded ridge from Nijmegen to Grusbeek, where Gavin and his headquarters were to jump. After Colonel Mendes's famous outburst about being dropped in Holland or in Hell, some officers teased their pilot about how far they had been dropped from their DZs in Normandy. Lieutenant Colonel Warren R. Williams of the 504th had to eat his words. Their pilot put them down within two hundred meters of the school which had been selected back in England as the regimental command post. The broadcaster, Edward R. Morrow, on one of the troop carrier planes, recorded for radio what he saw as it happened. By now, we're getting towards the dropping area, and I sit looking down the length of the fuselage. The crew chief is on his knees back in the very rear, speaking into his intercom, talking with the pilots. We see the first flag. I think it's coming from that little village just beside the canal. More tracer coming up now, just cutting across in front of our nose. They're just queued up on the door now, waiting to jump. You can probably hear the snap as they check the lashing on the static line. Do you hear them shout? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. There they go. Every man out. Fortunately for Morrow's listeners, all went according to plan. But two paratroopers from the 506th died in a terrible way. Their own aircraft had disgorged the whole stick of paratroopers correctly, but then a falling plane whose occupants had already bailed out struck against them and the prop cut them to pieces. A jump master in the 501st stood in the door of his plane and waved back to the Dutch, jumping up and down in excitement a few hundred feet below. Some paratroopers were almost surprised to find that the countryside beneath them was exactly what they had expected, dikes, windmills, and lush green grass. The senior officer present usually jumped first, with the next most senior acting as pushmaster, bringing up the rear and shoving out anyone who hesitated. Captain Ferguson, in the 82nd, stood ready in the open doorway, waiting for the green light, with the plane throttling down, the wind screeching and tingling against my face as I looked down and out. The plane lurched with the blast from each shell burst, so it was a relief when the green light finally came on. In their eagerness to get out, the stick of paratroopers waddled forward in a line as rapidly as they could, without slipping on the vomit and urine slopping around on the floor. The pilot also had to remember to pull the lever to release the parapacks with heavy loads fastened under the plane's belly. One load of anti-tank mines dropped like a stone when its parachute failed to open and caused a huge explosion. Get ready! We're cutting loose! A Waco glider pilot shouted back as he dropped the nylon tow rope. The glider then banked round and round to reduce speed but it would still hit the ground at sixty miles an hour, with dirt flying up all around as it ploughed across the landing field. Let's go! came the cry when they finally came to a halt, and everyone piled out of the side. Landing in a ploughed field was fine for the paratroopers, as the freshly turned earth was soft, but it could be disastrous for gliders which did not land along the line of the furrows. They often ended up on their nose. The medics, wrote a doctor from the 101st, had a busy time trying to extricate the broken and bloody bodies from the chewed-up wreckage. The worst accident happened when two gliders of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment collided in mid-air, killing several of those on board and leaving the landing zone a mad crash site of smashed plywood. As it was happening, a jeep came flying out, making everyone scatter, a trooper remembered 
Among the hundreds of gliders in the awkwardest positions, wrote an officer in the 82nd, one was jammed into a windmill with his tail jutting into the air at an angle of about 65 degrees. The British first airborne, which had followed the northern route, came in over the orchards and polar land of the Bidova, between the River Val and the Nida Rhein. Tension mounted as they came close to the drop zone. The transparent insincerity of their smiles, wrote Colonel Frost, and the furious last-minute pulling at their cigarettes, reminded me that the flight and the prospect of jumping far behind the enemy's lines was no small test for anyone's nervous system. Starting from the back, the stick lined up along the aisle, with each man placing his left hand on the shoulder of the man in front. The C-47, bringing Captain Eric Mackay and men of the 1st Para Squadron Royal Engineers, was hit on the approach when a shell, almost certainly a twenty millimetre, took out the red and green lights over the door. As a result, Mackay had to watch from the open door for when the paratroopers in the other aircraft jumped and simply follow suit. A glider's chance of survival was slim if hit by anything larger than a machine gun. Not far from the landing zone, the crew of a Sterling tug plane felt a sudden jolt. Flack had taken off the tail of the horse they were towing. Then a wing sheared off and the tow rope broke. They heard later from the pilot of a neighboring aircraft that he had seen bodies falling out as the glider disintegrated. One glider pilot recorded their approach over the Nida Rhein. We were almost at the release point now, and the scene below looked exactly as it had appeared on the photographs at briefing the previous day. To starboard, I could see the main reason for our trip, the bridge across the Rhine. There was chaos ahead as scores of gliders tried to land at the same time on the heathland northwest of Wolfheser. There was no air traffic control, so the co-pilot, if they had one, kept looking in all directions, watching for other gliders, while the pilot focused on landing. The other problem was cows. Sergeant Roy Hatch became desperate when a cow kept running ahead madly rather than escaping to the side. Even once the glider came to a rest, the men were still not safe. There was always the chance of another glider, out of control, crashing into it. Since it was safer in the open and doors often jammed, soldiers slashed or smashed their way out of the side of the fuselage. General Horrocks climbed an iron ladder and took up position on the factory roof near Joe's Bridge. Once the formations of troop carriers and gliders with the 101st Airborne had passed over their heads, he passed the order to his signaller that H.R. would be 1435 hours. The 350 guns of the Royal Artillery behind opened fire at exactly 1400 hours, and under cover of the bombardment, the Irish Guards' battle group moved into their final positions on the start line. The clock ticked away until H.R., while the gunners continued to pound the forward German positions. Then, with the order, Driver advance! The lead tank, commanded by Lieutenant Keith Heathcote, set off. For the first few minutes, everything seemed to go well, but as they passed the border post into the Netherlands, one tank after another was hit. Soon nine were blazing. Vandeleur called in the RAF. It was the first time I had ever seen typhoons in action he recorded later, and, Jesus, I was amazed at the guts of those pilots. They came in, one at a time, head to tail, and flew right through our own barrage. I saw one disintegrate right above me. The noise was unimaginable. Guns firing, the screams of planes overhead, and the shouts and curses of the men. I had to scream into the microphone to be heard. In the middle of all this mayhem, divisional headquarters radioed to ask how the battle was going. My second-in-command, Dennis Fitzgerald, just held up the microphone and said, Listen. In the cacophony of explosions and shouting all around, one officer found the noise of wireless mush in his earphones rather comforting. Just behind Vandeleur's scout car came two RAF vehicles with the forward air controllers, squadron leader Max Sutherland and flight lieutenant Donald Love. Love saw cows, maddened with fear, galloping in circles in the fields on either side as the battle raged. At the border post, one of those little striped boxes, he also spotted a severed head with a headless German body lying several yards away. Love found, to his dismay, that some of the typhoon pilots did not have the right gridded map, so when squadron leader Sutherland gave them their targets, 
they could do little. Instead, they had to use the tanks burning up front as a landmark to show the positions of forward troops. The typhoons were coming in so close that Sutherland wanted to use yellow smoke grenades to mark their own troops, but that was dangerous as German gunners would immediately use them as an aiming mark. Vandeleur thought the typhoons were attacking his Irish guards by mistake with cannon fire, then he admitted his mistake. What tank crews had thought to be rounds striking their turrets turned out to be the cannon shell cases ejected from typhoons flying low overhead. Lieutenant John Quinnan who had abandoned his blazing Sherman, was standing by a man who was shot through the heart by a sniper. As he fell, he very clearly said, Oh, God, Quinnan reminisced later. I've often thought it a nice theological speculation whether he spoke before or after death. As soon as the Shermans of the Second Company had been set ablaze, Major Edward Tyler took his tanks down off the road onto the polder, which was fortunately dry, and swung round to the right. Lance Sergeant Cowan, famous for his eagle eye, spotted a camouflaged, self-propelled assault gun and knocked it out with his Firefly's seventeen-pounder. The crew commander surrendered to him, so Cowan told him to jump up on the back of his tank. He then continued his advance, only to find that his prisoner tapped him on the shoulder and pointed out another assault gun which he had not spotted. This, too, was destroyed. And this extraordinary combination of ex-enemy self-propelled gun commander and Irish guard sergeant went on to deal with the third. The German spoke reasonable English and was delighted with the Firefly's straight shooting. His explanation for this bizarre behavior was that he was a professional soldier and he could not bear to see anyone adopting the wrong tactics, as he thought Cowan had. Accompanying infantry from the 3rd Battalion brought back prisoners. The guardsmen were very rough with snipers, whom they forced to trot down the road at the double while prodding them with bayonets. One prisoner, perhaps out of panic, tried to break away and run. Frankly, he was dead the second the thought entered his mind. Everyone seemed to take a shot at him. He only got about fifteen to twenty yards before he was shot to pieces. As the German prisoners came back, with their hands on their heads, past the line of vehicles, I caught a movement out of the corner of my eye, Vandeleur recorded. One of the bastards had taken a grenade he had concealed and lobbed it into one of our gun carriers. I saw one of our sergeants lying in the road with his leg blown off. The German, who was gunned down in an instant, belonged to the Falschimjäger Regiment von Hoffmann in Kampfgruppe Walter. Because of the dirty fighting methods of Hoffmann's men, the Irish guards took it for granted that they were to kill as many as possible. The wild reconnaissance ride of Lieutenant Buchanan Jardine a few days before had revealed that the Germans had forced locals to dig an anti-tank ditch outside Valkensvard. As a result, Vandeleur had ordered a bulldozer tank to take position close to the head of the column. This was fortunate, since it was badly needed to clear the road of the nine shot-up tanks before those coming up behind could continue. After the nasty shock of the ambush destroying so many of their tanks, Vandeleur was concerned at what else lay ahead. Chapter 9 The German Reaction, Sunday the 17th of September On that Sunday morning of early autumn sunshine, members of Kraft's 16th SS Training and Replacement Battalion, who were not on duty, rose late after their drinking the night before. In the distance, SS Sturmann Bangard noted, we heard the streetcar rumbling from Osterbeck to Arnhem. Kraft himself was engaged in paperwork in his command post by the railway halt Osterbeck Hook. When the mosquitoes flew in to attack Arnhem and the B-17s bombed Wolfhesser, he was perplexed. They were hardly major military targets. A little later, when fighter bombers attacked the anti-aircraft batteries in the area, he ordered his own twenty-millimeter flak crews into action. What a wonderful sound, like the beat of a drum, Kraft enthused as soon as he heard them in action. It warms our hearts. Near Wucht, General Oberst Student had carried on with his own paperwork. I was suddenly startled at my desk, he wrote, by a rushing sound which became louder and louder. I stepped out onto the balcony. Everywhere I looked I saw aircraft, troop transporters and gliders, which flew past in loose formation and very low. Student, the old paratrooper warhorse, 
found himself thinking back nostalgically to his own airborne assaults, both the Netherlands in 1940 and Crete in 1941. I was deeply impressed by this mighty spectacle so suddenly presented to me. At that moment I didn't think of the danger to our position, but I thought instead, filled with reflection and longing, of our own earlier operations. When his new chief of staff, Oberst I.G. Reinhardt, rushed out to join him on the balcony, Student said, If only I had had such mighty means at my disposal. The two men then climbed up to the flat roof of the house. Down below, drivers and clerks from the headquarters had appeared with their rifles and were shooting at the aircraft, flying so low overhead. General Feldmarschall Model had stood for a short time outside the Hotel Tafelberg, watching the B-17 flying fortresses overhead. He assumed that they were heading for Germany. Later, during lunch, Oberst I.G. Hans-Georg von Tempelhof was summoned to the telephone and told to look out of the window. Tempelhof saw paratroopers and gliders. He alerted Model and Krebs, who joined him. Both men wore monocles which apparently fell out as their eyebrows shot up in astonishment. Krebs said, This will be the decisive battle of the war. Don't be so dramatic, Model reproved him. It's obvious enough. Tempelhof, get to work. As operations officer, Tempelhof dashed back to the telephone to ring all formations in the area, the two SS Panzer Corps first of all. After contacting as many as possible, he rang General Feldmarschall von Rundstedt's headquarters. Tempelhof was rather taken aback by their unperturbed reaction, which he described as almost callously normal. Accounts vary of the departure from the Hotel Tafelberg. Some say it was panic-stricken. According to Obergruppenführer Bittrich, who was not there, Model ran to his bedroom, he crammed his belongings in his suitcase, he hastened downstairs, crossed the street, and the suitcase burst open, all his toilet articles lay scattered all over the street. Helped by his men, he gathered them up a second time, and off he went. Another said that Krebs forgot his cap and pistol belt, and the entire set of operations maps, which showed German dispositions along the whole front from the Netherlands to Switzerland. Other, more convincing versions imply that, although hurried, they set off in an orderly manner. There were, of course, inconveniences. A staff officer, who remembered that he had left his cigars in his room at the Tafelberg, was furious that some enemy officer would enjoy them instead. More, like Leutnant Jedelhauser, regretted the loss of their laundry, having departed with no more than the uniform they were wearing. All agree on one thing, however. Model and his staff were convinced that the airborne landings were part of a plan to capture the head of Army Group B. They assumed that their presence in Osterbeck must have been betrayed by the Dutch. Model's convoy of vehicles drove fast towards Arnhem. They stopped briefly at the headquarters of General Major Cousin, the town commandant. Model told him to find out exactly what was happening. The convoy, with its Feldgendarmerie escort in motorcycle combinations, carried on first to Model's rear headquarters at Terborg, and then to Bittrich's headquarters in the castle of Slangenberg at Duttingham, only a few kilometers away. In Osterbeck, following the rapid departure of Army Group B headquarters, wild scenes took place at the Schonort Hotel, just up the road. German officers ran around madly, throwing their luggage into cars and trucks, while German women auxiliaries, known as Grey Mice because of their uniforms, were hurrying back to their billet on the Utrechtsweg to retrieve their things and escape. A panic flight of the rear services located at Arnhem started, a Dr. Gerhardt recorded. Passenger cars with officers, paymasters and female military helpers, packed high with suitcases and other baggage, trucks with men, cyclists, soldiers marching in groups or alone, all were striving to leave the endangered city as quickly as possible. Dutch civilians, standing outside their doors and by their garden gates, were eager to find out what was happening. Since the electricity had failed, the wireless was no help. Panic appears to have overcome the headquarters of the Luftwaffe's 3rd Fighter Division at Dahlen. Expecting to be captured by paratroopers, their chief operations officer ordered the destruction of their war diary for the last six months. They sent a signal. Command post attacked by fighter bombers. 
It was impossible to leave their bunkers, they claimed, with landings to the west, southwest, south, and northwest of the divisional command post. They received orders from one fighter corps to blow up their bunker and retreat to Duisburg in the northern Ruhr. In contrast, a hastily assembled force of their ground crew was marched south to block any British paratroopers advancing down the Amsterdamsevig. For Kraft's battalion, things had seemed to have calmed down again by midday. It was Sunday, and we therefore got a good meal, Vanguard recorded. We received a wonderful chop per person and had a large plateful of pudding for dessert. At thirteen forty hours, according to Vanguard, we heard the cry, Paratroopers. At first they thought it must be a mistake. Kraft himself heard the spine-chilling cry of gliders. Over the tops of the trees to the west he could make our tug aircraft releasing gliders. I felt sick to my stomach. Kraft subsequently recounted with Germanic frankness in such matters. I unbuckled my belt and went behind the bushes. Clearly feeling better as a result, he pulled up his pants, went back into his command post, and issued the order, Battalion, prepare to march. Kraft's men, while they listened to his instructions, loaded extra ammunition and grenades into pouches and pockets. In a feverish hurry, the last things were packed, Vanguard said, steel helmet on, weapon in hand, and rouse. Kraft had now worked out that the enemy operation must have the Arnhem Road Bridge as its principal objective. It was too big for a raid on Model's headquarters, and the bridge was the only strategic target in the area. It was up to me to stop them, he wrote in his report. He decided to establish a defensive line extending across the two main roads into Arnhem from the west and the railway line, but I didn't have enough men to extend to the Rhine. Kraut's battalion comprised thirteen officers, seventy-three NCOs, and three hundred and forty-nine men, a total of only four hundred and thirty-five. As far as he knew, there were few other military organizations nearby, except Army Group B, whose assistance we can probably not depend upon. It would indeed have been unusual to see officers with the broad burgundy stripes of the general staff on their breeches wearing helmets and carrying machine pistols into battle. My soldiers were young and raw, but I had good NCOs and officers, Kraft recorded, although one lieutenant deserted and was later court-martialed. Less convincingly, since there were no reports of armed Dutch civilians at this stage, he also boasted, We did have trouble with Dutch terrorists. They were suitably dealt with. Kraft claims that he sent a motorcycle and sidecar with a runner to the heavy machine gun group and number two company near the Hotel Wolfheser with the order, Attack immediately. Send accurate intelligence of enemy's positions. But British reports do not reflect the impression of an immediate counterattack. Kraft also claims to have ordered his mortar battery into action. It was equipped with a Raketenwerfer multiple rocket launcher, which made a terrifying noise and therefore would give the impression of far greater firepower than the battalion really possessed. In fact, the fighting did not really start until at least an hour or more later, when the first British forces moving towards Arnhem ran into the initial blocking line which he set up west of the Bilderberg woods. Kraft, in his bombastic way, later claimed to have reasoned that, although it was often argued that a small force should not attack a far greater one, in this present fight for existence by the German people, there are occasions every day when only a virile offensive spirit can lead to success. His men certainly fought effectively, but in defence, not in attack, as he pretended. Just after fifteen hundred hours, General Major Kusin, the town commandant for Arnhem, appeared at the Hotel Wolfheser to say that he had called General de Flieger Christiansen, the Wehrmacht commander-in-chief Netherlands. Reinforcements should arrive by dusk. Kraft warned Kusin not to return by the Utrechtsweg, but Kusin, who was accompanied by two officers and a driver, was convinced that they would be all right. Within minutes they were all dead, having driven straight into a point platoon of British paratroopers. At thirteen forty hours, towards the end of lunch with the Hohenstaufen Reconnaissance Battalion, Standartenführer Harzer received an urgent call from his command post. The Luftwaffe communications network had just informed Obergruppenführer Bittrich of the first parachute drops and glider landings. His message to Harzer read, Paratroopers have landed near Arnhem. Immediate alarm. Orders will follow. 
Hartzer could only yell to Grebner and tell him to get his men to work. He needed to know how long it would take them to put their half-tracks back together again and remount their guns. There was no point cursing about bad luck. Without Grebner's little trick of making them temporarily unserviceable, they would not have managed to hold on to the vehicles at all. After conferring with his head mechanic, Grebner promised that they would be ready to move in three hours. Hartzer tried rapidly to work out what troops he had available. Some had already left for Siegen in Germany and would have to be called back. The Hohenstaufen Panzer Regiment did not have a single tank in an operational state, so the crews would act as infantry. His greatest regret was to have been forced to send two Panzergrenadier battalions to the Kampfgruppe Walter south of Eindhoven and hand the excellent Euling battalion over to their sister division, the Funsberg. Much would therefore depend on the other divisional elements, pioneers, artillery, and flak detachments. In Brummen, northeast of Arnhem, on the road to Zutphen, SS Hauptsturmführer Hans Müller of the Hohenstaufen Pioneer Battalion was outside enjoying the beautiful day with his adjutant, Untersturmführer Grupp. A collection of tiny white spots far away in the sky suddenly caught his attention. Pseudocumulus, he suggested to his companion, then contradicted himself. No, black bursts. No, there are too many for that. He noticed that Dutch civilians nearby had stopped to look too. Good grief, Grupp. Those are parachutes. They ran to sound the alarm. Unlike the British Army, German officers did not wait for orders from above, so it was not just the Kraft Battalion which mobilized on its own initiative. Both Müller's understrength pioneer battalion and the Hohenstaufen artillery regiment, which was several kilometers closer at Dieren, moved as fast as they could towards the enemy. Müller sent off his reconnaissance platoon under Oberschaffführer Wiener immediately. The rest followed over the next two hours. The old Prussian army dictum of march towards the sound of gunfire was followed by other units, too. By dusk, the commander of the artillery regiment, SS Obersturmbahnführer Spindler, would be leading a combined force of odd Hohenstaufen units designated the Kampfgruppe Spindler. Soon any rear unit capable of firing a weapon was being mobilized in the Netherlands and in Wehrkreis 6, the neighboring military district in the Reich. They included police battalions and even Reichsarbeitsdienst teenagers on labor service in their brown uniforms, which made the Dutch think they were simply Hitler youth. A corporal noted in his diary when they received the call, We learn that paratroop forces have landed in the area of Arnhem and Nijmegen. We have been ordered out. Weapons, ammunition, and iron rations are being issued. Exact details are not known. Herbert Stelzenmüller, a Kriegsmarine cadet, was out on a Sunday stroll in the ancient city of Kleve, just over the German border, when sirens sounded. Members of the Feldgendarmery drove through the streets, ordering all service personnel back to barracks. The cadets were issued with Dutch or Belgian rifles captured in 1940 and driven to Nemegen. Stelzen Müller and his companions saw a Reichsarbeitsdienst officer with two Dutch teenagers who had been captured wearing orange armbands. The R.A.D. commander took out his pistol and shot the two unarmed Dutch boys in cold blood. Both fell dead in the roadway. S.S. Brigadefuhrer Hamel of the Funsberg had not reached Berlin until the middle of that Sunday morning. Only then did he discover that the Waffen-S.S. Führungshauptamt had just moved out to Bad Saro, east of the capital, to avoid the bombing. He reached Bad Saro at midday. He had to wait before his meeting started with SS Obergruppenführer Hans Jutner, who, with his white hair, smooth pale skin, and rimless glasses, looked more like a prosperous dentist than the head of the Waffen SS. It was clear that the move and the desperate circumstances of the retreat from France had left the headquarters in a state of some confusion. During the meeting, an aide brought in a teleprinter message and laid it in front of Jutner. He read it out to Harmel. It was from Bittrich. Harmel, return immediately. Airborne landings in Arnhem area. With the briefest of goodbyes, Harmel raced for his car and told his driver to go like the devil. It would be a nine-hour journey at least, largely because of the bombing of the Ruhr and the need to proceed with screened headlights once night fell. Harmel was desperate to be back with his men. He knew that they could rely only on rapid action.
SS Obergruppenführer Hans Rauter was in The Hague when he received news of the airborne landing. His first telephone call was to Sturmbannführer Heller of the Dutch SS Wachtbataillon Nordwest at Amersfoort concentration camp. Heller, however, was ensconced with his Javanese mistress. He had given his adjutant, Obersturmführer Naumann, the strictest orders that he was not to be disturbed. Following his instructions, Naumann had done nothing when the town major rang to say that large numbers of paratroopers had dropped to the east. But when the telephone rang once more, and he found Obergruppenführer Rauter himself on the line, Naumann leaped to his feet. The battalion was to be ready to march immediately, Rauter told him. Sturmbannführer Heller was to report at once to General von Tetau. This time, Naumann did disturb his commanding officer. General Leutnant Hans von Tetau's headquarters were at Greberberg, near Wagenichen, to the west of Arnhem. Christensen had billeted most of the dejected and weaponless troops who had escaped from Normandy along the north bank of the Nieder Rhein. He had not wanted them to lower the morale of his own troops in the Netherlands, so he kept them apart. Tetau's command had been responsible for rounding up these stragglers crossing the Nieder Rhein, bringing them back to discipline, and incorporating them into scratch units. But Tetau, with his tired, gaunt face, was hardly an inspiring leader, and like a number of senior officers, he assumed at first that the British had landed at Dillon Airfield. Our commanders are simply pitiful, Oberst Fullreader ranted in his diary. Tetau and his staff give the impression of an old gentleman's club. Rauter then called General Leutnant von Wulisch, the deputy to General Christiansen. He told him about the orders he had given to Heller's battalion at Amersfoort. Rauter claimed that Wulisch, afraid that the day of the hatchet had finally arrived, then said, Yes, but can you weaken your position in such a way? Right now our front line is Arnhem, Rauter retorted. I want every available soldier fit to fight there. If there is a revolt behind the front, then we'll fight it with orderlies, clerks, and telephone operators. My reserves are on the march already. Considering that Heller was probably not yet dressed by then, the idea of his reserves being on the march was optimistic. Good luck, then, Willish replied coldly and hung up. According to his own account, Rauter also telephoned Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler in Berlin to warn him of the invasion. What are you going to do? Himmler asked. I am going to Arnhem at once. I have already thrown in my entire reserves. I hope that the resistance will leave me alone at this critical moment. I wish you strength, Rauter, Himmler replied. Rauter left immediately afterwards and was not ambushed by terrorists. I had soldier's luck, he claimed. Chapter 10 The British Landings, Sunday the 17th of September the first members of the British First Airborne to land were the pathfinders of the 21st Independent Parachute Company. They jumped right on time from the twelve Sterling bombers at 12.40 hours. An unfortunate corporal dropped his ten-gun, a notoriously unsafe weapon, as he landed and it went off, killing him. A platoon each secured landing zones S and Z and drop zone X. They then set up the Eureka homing devices. A German motorcyclist rode up to ask if they had seen any Tommies. It was a rather fatal mistake, as one of the pathfinders observed. At thirteen hundred hours, the first of three hundred gliders began to land, having had their toe cast off about a kilometre and a half before. The air landing brigade came in just north of the railway line on landing zone S. Medical teams were soon treating the casualties from crashed gliders. Sixteen of the brigade's gliders had failed to appear, half of them with men from the 7th Battalion, King's Own Scottish Borderers. A piper began playing blue bonnets over the border to signal that they should form up in their companies. A rapid roll call indicated that, even with the missing gliders, the KOSB still mustered forty officers and seven hundred men. Their task was to defend the drop and landing zones, together with part of the 2nd Battalion, the South Staffordshire Regiment, and the 1st Battalion, the Border Regiment. Over the next forty minutes, divisional troops in horses and some of the large Hamel cars came in on landing zone Z. They carried the 75mm pack howitzers of the light regiment, as well as anti-tank guns, jeeps, Bren gun carriers, the airborne squadron of the Royal Engineers, the field ambulances, and the reconnaissance squadron. One Hamel car 
Made a bad landing, the senior medical officer reported. It appeared to have come down very fast in a potato field, collected a lot of earth under its bows, which acted as a stop and turned it arse over tip. One pilot was killed and the other injured and pinned down by the load inside. Among the gliders, which failed to arrive, one bringing a Bren gun carrier had apparently been shot down by a detachment belonging to a battalion of Moors from the SS Regiment, Götz Behrens von Rautenfeld. Footnote. The presence in the Netherlands of Muslims from the 13th SS Division Hantschar, which was then still fighting partisans in Yugoslavia, is surprising but not impossible, as they may have been attached to the 12th SS Armee Corps. End of footnote. Ordered to defend an intersection on the Breda-Tilburg Road, they had managed to bring the glider down with small arms fire. And their commander, a Lieutenant Martin, recorded in his diary that on the glider was written in chalk, Is this journey absolutely necessary? This fragment of British humour, sending up the government slogan to reduce domestic travel, seems to have left the young officer totally mystified. A postman called Jan Donderwinkel, wearing his uniform and carrying a first aid kit, turned up on landing zone S to help. He was astonished to see soldiers pulling the tail off a glider and a jeep being driven out. He found a soldier lying on the ground whose feet had been crushed in the glider landing. Are you a postman? the soldier asked. Yes, replied Don de Winkle. Well then, have you a letter for me? No, he said. But do you have a cigarette for me? The injured soldier laughed and handed him a packet of players. Don de Winkle carried the soldier to the Wolfheser Asylum close by, where the 131st Parachute Field Ambulance had already established a casualty clearing station. Patients from the asylum, wandering in the woods, were still in shock from the explosion when the ammunition dump had been hit. It was very hard to persuade them to return. An idea arose that Major Freddy Goff's reconnaissance squadron had lost a large number of its thirty-two armed jeeps in the crossing, when in fact only four failed to arrive. But another six jeeps were trapped in crash-landed gliders because they could be driven out only when the tail section had been removed. Our glider had a rough landing, a young reconnaissance officer recounted, and finished with her tail in the air. It took us four and a half hours to unload. The reconnaissance squadron was supposed to be the force that would carry out the lightning dash to the bridge. The delay was made worse by Goff's insistence on parachuting because he hated gliders. Most of his men felt the same and chose to parachute too. As a result, they did not arrive with their jeeps, which had twin Vickers K machine guns mounted. Goff was angry that they had not been given the same task as in the planning for Operation Comet, where his squadron was to have been dropped near Elst, south of the Nieder Rhine, between Arnhem and Nijmegen. In the end, the first troop of the reconnaissance squadron did not set off until just after 1540 hours, two hours after all gliders had landed. At 1350 hours, formations of 145 C-47 Dakotas appeared and began to drop some 2,700 men, mostly from the 1st Parachute Brigade, commanded by Brigadier Gerald Lathbury. Lieutenant Patrick Barnett, who commanded the defence platoon for brigade headquarters, jumped first from his aircraft, and he could not understand on landing what had happened to the rest of the stick. Only later did he find that his Batman had lost his nerve at the last moment and just sat down, preventing everyone else from jumping. The pilot had been forced to come round again. Local farmers and their wives had by then appeared, and they helped cut rigging lines, if only to carry off the valuable silk canopies to be refashioned as dresses and underwear. Within little more than ten minutes, all paratroopers had landed, with remarkably few broken bones. Corporal Terry Brace, a medic, was combing his hair just after landing. His sergeant major, on seeing this, shouted at him, Brace, there is no point in worrying about your hair if you're going to lose your bloody head. Once on the ground, members of the second parachute battalion were summoned to the familiar braying of Lieutenant Colonel John Frost's hunting horn. Frost did not waste time. His battalion group set off at 1,500 hours south towards Hilsum. They then swung east through the Dorwerzer woods along his route, codenamed Lion, which was the closest to the river. Their main objective was the great steel road bridge over the Rhine, 600 metres long, 
with its ramps on both sides. Proving that speed counted for everything that day, the fastest group to move off had been the military police detachment of eleven men. They marched straight into Arnhem, encountering no opposition, and headed for their objective, which was police headquarters. They remained there in splendid isolation, until the building was stormed by SS troops nearly forty-eight hours later. The 3rd Battalion, meanwhile, which was also ordered to head for Arnhem, took the central route along the Utrechtsweg, codenamed Tiger. Deciding that all was going well, Lathbury ordered the 1st Battalion, his reserve, to take the northern route into Arnhem, the Amsterdamsweg, codenamed Leopard. He then heard the misleading report about the reconnaissance squadron, so he sent a message to Frost to push on as fast as he could. At this stage, radio communications seemed to work quite well, but soon the woods and buildings made messages break up. The twenty-two set were simply not powerful enough, as signals officers had warned. The Germans were also operating a powerful jamming station on the divisional net. Regrettably, clear instructions on switching frequencies had not been distributed in advance. Finally, at 17.30 hours, a dispatch rider was sent off by motorcycle to 1st Parachute Brigade with a message bearing the new frequency. He returned a few hours later, having failed to find them. Communications were little better for a large American air support party led by Lieutenant Paul B. Johnson from the 101st Airborne. They had flown in by glider with the British. They made a smooth landing, and within five minutes they had unloaded their jeeps and driven to the assembly point. One of their other gliders, however, had dug its nose into the soft field, and the men in it were a bit shaken up. As soon as Johnson's team reached the temporary divisional command post on the edge of the landing zone, they tuned their wireless set, but found it would not transmit. The other team had the same problem. During the afternoon we made contact with the station several times, who would not answer our authenticator, but instead asked for his signal strength and asked to send him a series of Vs. This led them to believe that it was a German Y-service set intent on mischief. The signalers kept trying all night, but without any luck. At 15.30, just as the 1st Battalion moved out, so did the jeeps of the 1st Parachute Squadron Royal Engineers. To raise morale, somebody had wired in a radio, which was playing Tiger Rag as they set off. When the jeeps towing the howitzers of the Light Regiment moved out, Lance Bombardier Jones instinctively drove on the left side of the road. His battery sergeant major cursed him for giving away the fact that they were British. It seemed all too easy. Paratroopers were amazed at how well this daytime drop had gone in comparison to the chaotic night landings in Sicily and the 6th Airborne's drop on Normandy. Casualties had been lighter than anticipated, as there was virtually no enemy opposition during the flight or on landing. Colonel Graham Warwick, the Deputy Director of Medical Services, noted. Their first impression was of individual German soldiers surrendering. A few were even encountered in the woods, including one with a Dutch girlfriend, who appeared far more embarrassed than her Lanzer lover, who surrendered willingly. Everything then changed rather quickly. The first real clashes with craftsmen happened— when Lieutenant Bucknell's troop of the reconnaissance squadron crossed the railway line at Wolfhizer and set off towards Arnhem along a track beside the high railway embankment. In a defile, less than a kilometre down this track, the jeeps came under heavy fire from Kraft's No. 2 Company in well-sighted positions. Bucknell and six others were dead, with four more wounded and taken prisoner. Goff, who was following, had heard the firing ahead. He knew his jeeps were involved, because he could distinguish the sound of their Vickers K machine guns. He turned back to warn the 1st Parachute Battalion under Lieutenant Colonel David Doby that the way was blocked. Doby decided to go further north to follow the Amsterdamsweg into Arnhem. It was about this time that General Urquhart, impatient at the lack of information on the advance, went to the command post of Hicks's 1st Air Landing Brigade at the Wolfhesser level crossing to find out what he knew. Hicks's main concern at that time was the absence of the commanding officer of the border regiment, whose glider had not turned up. He was, however, amused when a very young German Luftwaffe female auxiliary was brought to him as their first prisoner. The poor girl was absolutely terrified, and refused both a cup of tea and some chocolate, 
no doubt afraid that they contained some fearful substance. This is when Urquhart heard the inaccurate report about the reconnaissance squadron jeeps failing to arrive. He sent a message to Goff, who was in fact very close by, telling him to report in as soon as possible. He wanted to change the reconnaissance squadron's role from being a coup de main force at the bridge to one of reconnoitering the three main routes in front of the battalions. Goff set off for the divisional command post back at the edge of the landing zone, but in the meantime Urquhart had gone off to find Lathbury and the headquarters of the 1st Parachute Brigade. So Goff began a wild goose chase, while Urquhart made the great mistake, compounded, of course, by the collapse in wireless communications, of losing touch with his own headquarters. Almost everything was now starting to go wrong. The 1st Battalion, advancing north through the woods to the Amsterdam Savig, ran straight into the scratch Luftwaffe unit from Dillon and suffered a number of casualties. This Luftwaffe Alarmeinheit was soon reinforced by some of the first armoured cars from Grebner's Hohenstaufen Reconnaissance Battalion, effectively blocking the northern Leopard route. Around dusk, Doby heard a message over the radio, one of the very few times it worked that day, saying that Frost's 2nd Battalion was getting through to the bridge. So Doby decided to abandon his task of sealing off North Arnhem. He turned his battalion around and headed south again to help Frost. The 3rd Battalion, whose lead platoon had gunned down General Major Kusin, followed the Utrechtsweg, the center route. Short of Osterbeek, they were attacked by a German self-propelled assault gun charging at them down the road. It managed to destroy a jeep and a six-pounder anti-tank gun. Eventually it pulled back under heavy small arms fire. Lieutenant Colonel John Fitch, concerned that the road ahead might be blocked, sent off C Company under Major Peter Lewis to try another route. Lewis took his men up to the railway line, and they followed the track all the way into Arnhem, fighting successful little skirmishes. They would manage to reach the road bridge before midnight, an impressive achievement. It was probably one of their little skirmishes with part of Kraft's battalion, which convinced the SS Sturmbahnführer that he was in danger of being cut off. He decided to abandon any further attempt to maintain his positions, and pulled his men back to the northeast as darkness fell. They encountered part of the Kampfgruppe Spindler, which was starting to set up its own Speerlinie, or blocking line. Spindler, who had no idea of Kraft's existence until then, was told by Bittrich to include the battalion as part of his own force. Major General Urquhart, by now deeply concerned at the slowness of the advance, was still in search of Brigadier Lathbury. He found Lathbury's brigade major, Tony Hibbert. The general drove up, Hibbert recorded, and I could see that he was angry. He said that we were moving too bloody slowly. Urquhart drove off again to find Lathbury. Hibbert warned Frost of Urquhart's concerns. The rest of Fitch's 3rd Battalion, on reaching Osterbeek with its red brick roads, began to experience embarrassing scenes of joy and generosity. The people were shouting and pointing in the streets, wrote Jan Voskoil, laughing and clapping. Small boys jumped up and down. Because the paratroop helmet was round, and unlike the usual British soup plate shape, Jan Ekelhoff asked if they were American. Not bloody likely, came the offended reply. We are British. Pretty Dutch girls kissed the soldiers, sweaty from the heat and the march. Everywhere the Churchill V sign was used as a currency of friendship and greeting. Cheering civilians, women and old men, offered fruit and drinks, including gin. Officers shouted orders that nobody was to drink alcohol or stop. Younger men emerged from hiding and begged to be allowed to accompany them and fight, too. Some Dutch, nevertheless, felt that the British advance was overcautious, even hesitant. The British soldiers arrive, a woman wrote. We wave at them with white handkerchiefs and orange ribbons to encourage them to come on, and that it is safe. But then they heard the sound of German motorbikes approaching. Like a film in slow motion, the British take their guns, which had been slung over their shoulders. The Dutch slipped back into their houses, and the more nervous went down into their cellars. Freddy Garf, meanwhile, had driven back to the divisional command post to find Urquhart. Charles Mackenzie, the chief of staff, had told him that the general was with Lathbury, so he finally found the 1st Parachute Brigade headquarters in Osterbeek, but Tony Hibbert had no idea where Urquhart and Lathbury were. Hibbert shrugged. They're together someplace, but they've both gone off. 
In fact, matters were far worse. Just as Urquhart recognized that he was dangerously out of touch, he found that a German mortar shell had exploded by his jeep in his absence, and his signaller was badly wounded. Private Sims, a mortarman himself with the 2nd Battalion, had a healthy respect for the accuracy of his German counterparts. Hold the mess tin out half a mile away, and the bastards will put the third bomb in it. On the southern route, Frost's 2nd Battalion was led by A Company, commanded by the eccentric and fearless Major Digby Tatham Water. They were all fit, because Frost had trained his paratroopers to a basic of thirty miles a day with sixty pounds of equipment on their backs. Once they had passed the rectory and church in Osterbeek, watched by Kate de Horst and her five young children, C Company, under Major Victor Dover, struck off to the right to capture the railway bridge. They advanced rapidly across the polder, where a number of cows lay dead. Dover told Lieutenant Peter Barry to take his platoon onto the bridge with some sappers to deal with any charges. They were quite close to the bridge when they saw a German soldier run onto it from the southern side. He got to the middle, and I saw him kneel down and start doing something. I put one section down and told them to open fire. The range I gave the Bren gunner was five hundred yards. With another section, I ordered a rush on the bridge to get across. They were already on the bridge, with water beneath them, when the central span blew up in their faces. The rest of Frost's battalion carried on towards Arnhem, followed by part of Lathbury's brigade headquarters, Captain Mackay and his sappers, 16th Parachute Field Ambulance, and part of the Jedburgh team, Claude, in the form of the Dutch Captain Jacobus Kronewout and the American Lieutenant Harvey Todd. Their task was to advance with the leading elements of the 1st Parachute Brigade into Arnhem. There they were to contact the ex burgemeester and ex-Chief of Police and get them to administer Arnhem until the military government officers arrived with 30 Corps. As soon as they had landed, Kronowart had gone straight into Osterbeek to get help and transport to clear supplies off the landing zone. He had returned with three wagons and a German Opel Blitz truck. He had shot down the two German soldiers standing by the truck. They might have surrendered, he told Todd, but no time for POWs here. One of Tatham Waters' platoon commanders thought that their advance had been almost like a triumphal procession, until they were surprised by a German arc an eight-wheeler armoured car firing its machine-gun and twenty-millimetre cannon. The closer Frost's force came to Arnhem, the greater the resistance became. Tatham Water led his men over one garden fence or wall after another to outflank German machine-gun positions. It was not Frost's hunting horn, which could be heard now, but Tatham Water's bugler sounding the charge. Tatham Water, who did not trust radios in battle to communicate orders, had trained his men with the old light infantry bugle calls. The toughest opposition came soon after they had gone under the railway line from Nijmegen. Up to their left stood a wooded bluff called Den Brink. This commanding feature had been occupied by an advance group of Kampftrupper Spindler. Frost ordered B Company under Major Douglas Crawley to clear them out, while A Company pushed on. But it all took time and cost several casualties, including a sergeant badly shot through both legs. Corporal Terry Brace, the medic, placed a lighted cigarette between his lips to calm him down. The sergeant had lost a great deal of blood. He grasped both of Brace's wrists. Am I going to be all right? he asked. Sure you are, said Brace. Please try to do something for me, he pleaded. I've got two children at home. Please. Don't worry, Brace reassured him. You'll be fine but he knew that the sergeant would be dead very soon. A terrible moment occurred when a little Dutch girl, thrilled to see British soldiers, ran out into the street crying, Chocolada! Two paratroopers yelled at her to go back, but she was cut down in the crossfire. Somebody dashed out and collected her body and carried it across the road. The Dutch, in spite of the heavy firing, pulled the wounded into their houses to care for them. When they reached the Y junction, just short of the St. Elizabeth Hospital, the main column forked right down towards the bridge. The doctors and orderlies of sixteen para field ambulance went straight to the hospital entrance, where casualties were almost waiting on the doorstep. Inside they found that the Dutch doctors had rightly placed the British wounded on one side of the hospital and the Germans on the other. The officers and men of the field ambulance, carrying most of their equipment on their backs, received the warmest possible welcome. When the first news of the airborne landing had arrived, 
Dozens of nurses and doctors poured out into the street, and they formed a circle, joined hands, and whirled around, delirious with joy. The forty German Catholic nuns, who were also working there, became very nervous at the unexpected turn of events. All the Dutch medical personnel gathered round a piano to sing the Wilhelmus, many with tears running down their cheeks. Then they sang, God Save the King. While they were singing, a British soldier appeared with his rifle in the back of a German officer. It turned out that the German was a surgeon, and he stood to attention until the anthem drew to a close. The German doctor was pressed into service in the hospital. The staff now included Dutch, British, and German doctors, German nuns, Dutch nurses, British orderlies, Dutch volunteers from the underground, and Red Cross assistants. Sister Van Dyck said proudly to the captured German doctor, Now we are free. He shook his head. Don't say that. It is just the beginning. One of the wounded German prisoners asked her if she knew where he would be going. Probably to England, she replied confidently. Thank God, he said. The St. Elizabeth Hospital neurologist asked one of the British officers what he thought would happen. Well, we'll have two days of terrible fighting, and then Monty will arrive. That night, some thirty Austrian Luftwaffe personnel, who had been forced to act as infantry, came to the hospital, making a great deal of noise about their wounds, which were superficial. They were all armed, so the hospital staff had to take their weapons and lock them in a secure room. These Austrians were happy to give up their weapons, since, as they made very clear, they did not want to fight for the Germans. General Feldmarschall Model and his staff reached Petrich's command post by 1500 hours. I'm looking for a new headquarters, he announced. They almost got me. Petrich probably had to conceal a smile at his superior's vanity in believing himself to have been the prime target. Petrich had at first assumed that the Allied plan was to cut off General von Zangen's 15th Army. Now the point of the operation was quite clear. General Oberst Student became very excited that evening when a patrol returned with detailed Allied orders found on a crashed Waco glider near Wucht. But as soon as the German command linked the assault on the bridges to the attack of 30 Corps, Allied intentions became self-evident. The real importance of these papers, however, was to reveal details of subsequent lifts which enabled the Germans to concentrate their anti-aircraft guns against the landing zones. Petrich had already issued his orders to the two SS Panzerkorps. The division will reconnoiter in the direction of Arnhem and Nijmegen, he instructed Standartenführer Harzer of the Ninth Hohenstaufen. Quick action is imperative. The taking and securing of Arnhem Bridge is of decisive importance. Since Petrich was planning to give the Tenth Frunsberg the responsibility for securing Nijmegen, it was a mistake to mention the city to Harzer, because he allowed his reconnaissance battalion under Victor Gribner to go charging off too far from the key objective. Modell was much clearer in his ideas. He wanted Harzer's Hohenstaufen to stop the British from taking Arnhem, while Harmel's Frunsberg was to cross the Neder Rhein and ensure that the British Second Army could not get through to the paratroopers. The polderland of the Betuwe, with the single main road via Elst, would be the perfect place to stop them. Modell ruled out any suggestion of blowing up the road bridges at Arnhem and Nijmegen. They had to be held to allow a full counterattack. Beatrick agreed that the Arnhem Bridge should be kept, but he was dismayed that the Val Bridge at Nijmegen could not be touched. Although Modell's Army Group B had lost contact with Rundstedt's headquarters, it could still transmit via Luftwaffe West. A stream of orders and instructions poured forth, including the code word Neisenau, which prompted the immediate mobilization of all designated Kampfgruppen. Corps Feld, with the 406th Landerschützen Division, was ordered to attack the 82nd Airborne southeast of Nijmegen from Kleve and Goch. The two Falschium Corps, commanded by General der Falschium Trooper Eugen Meindl in Cologne, was ordered to Kleve, taking every man who could just carry a gun. Their mission was to drive back the 82nd Airborne and join up with the troops defending Nijmegen even though neither Mandel nor Model at that stage had any idea who they were. The General Felt Marshal demanded from Rundstedt's headquarters the fastest possible provision of reinforcements with heavy mobile anti-tank weapons. Lack of close-range anti-tank weapons, Panzerfausts, and fuel is delaying all countermeasures. 
Model also demanded the diversion of the 107th Panzer Brigade and the Assault Gun Brigade heading to Aachen from Denmark. In addition, he wanted a heavy Panzer Battalion of Mark VI Royal Tiger tanks, 88mm flak batteries, and just about every unit available to be sent to prevent an Allied breakthrough. Model was ferocious in his criticism of the Luftwaffe. The almost complete lack of counterattack from air and ground was of decisive significance. It is absolutely essential that we have fighters in the sky day and night. Apparently he yelled his complaints down the telephone at General Lieutenant Bolovius of the Second Fighter Corps. Bolovius tried to claim that his pilots had shot down ninety Mustangs, a futile and preposterous lie. Things did not bode well for General de Flieger Werner Kreiper, the Luftwaffe chief of staff at Führer headquarters in East Prussia. During the afternoon, the first reports came in of landings and parachute jumps over Holland, he recorded in his diary. The Wolfschanzer was engulfed by a frenzy of telephone calls and instructions for countermeasures. In the panic, the Oberkommando de Wehrmacht, OKW, even informed Rundstedt's headquarters that an American airborne division had landed in Warsaw. Kreiper noted, quite an excitement as he was summoned to a meeting with the Führer and Jodl. Hitler was furious that the Luftwaffe had not attacked the air armada. He said the Luftwaffe was inefficient, cowardly, and has failed to support him. Kreiper had become used to such outbursts. He asked the Führer to give examples. I decline any further conversations with you, Hitler retorted. I want to see the Reichsmarschall, Göring, tomorrow. I hope that you will at least be able to arrange that. Hitler was powerfully affected when informed of Model's narrow escape from British airborne troops. He decided that the defences of the Wolfschanzer should be massively increased to prevent the Red Army from launching a similar coup against him. His greatest terror was to be captured by the Soviets and taken to Moscow as a trophy prisoner. Here I sit with my whole supreme command. Here sits the Reich Marshal, the OKW, the Reichsführer SS, the Reich Foreign Minister. Well, then, this is the most valuable catch, that is obvious. I would not hesitate to risk two parachute divisions here if, with one blow, I could get my hands on the whole German command. Chapter 11 The American Landings, Sunday the 17th of September General Reinhardt, the commander of 88 Corps, was returning at lunchtime to his headquarters at Moorchistel, just east of Tilburg, when he sighted the air armada. He had already been forced to abandon his staff car on five occasions to throw himself in the ditch as strafing fighters came in low. In order not to offer too large a target to the enemy Yabuz, fighter bombers, I continued the journey in the sidecar of one of the motorcycles in my escort. When he finally reached his headquarters in the Villa Zonavinde, his staff told him of the parachute landings at Son but they had also received a false report of another landing at Udenhout, just north of Tilburg. Reinhardt assembled about a thousand men in scratch units and sent one force to Sohn, the other to Udenhout, and two companies from the 245th Infantry Division to Best. His only reserve was a police battalion at Tilburg, whose entire personnel consisted of old men. In Eindhoven, the Knuckbluen, the military wing of the underground, seized the telephone exchange. They found that the Germans had not damaged the system on their departure, and they could even ring Amsterdam and The Hague. Peter Zalt, the nom de guerre of Johannes Burkhardt's, called his wife in Osterbeck. He broke down in tears on hearing her voice, having not spoken to her during all his time in hiding. In Nijmegen, the heavy roar of aircraft engines and a mass of black silhouettes approaching from the southwest caused great excitement. People shouted, The Tommies are coming! And some started to climb onto the roofs of houses to get a better view. They were to be disappointed when no paratroops appeared within their view. One of them suddenly spotted on the roof of a neighboring house a helmeted German machine gunner. He had an MG-42, which the Allies called a Spandau, and belts of ammunition wrapped diagonally around his torso, like a Mexican bandit. Many of the German troops started to leave Nijmegen most to counter-attack the paratroopers, a few to flee over the border to Germany. The troops remaining were nervous as they set up machine-gun posts and began to barricade streets with barbed-wire chevaux-de-frise barriers. 
If they saw civilians out on the street, they shouted, Go away, or you'll be shot. Reinforcements also began to appear. A group of arrogant young Falschimjäger arrived by truck to defend Hanna Park and the great traffic circle of Kesa Lodewijk Plain, leading to the main bridge. One of them claimed to civilians that the Falschimjäger pushed back the Americans immediately. Shopkeepers rapidly boarded up their windows, not that that would do much good once the fighting started. At the same time, leaders of the local underground began to issue orders from the Bonte Os restaurant in Mullenstrat. They divided the town into four, for the O.D., or Order Service, to maintain security, even though they possessed only seven rifles between them. The Knoklo and combat groups were much better armed. Further down the Mullenstrad, trunks were being hurriedly loaded into a grey military truck outside Gestapo headquarters. Those people watching from behind curtains were convinced that they were filled with loot. One Gestapo man stopped by the O.D., was found to have his pockets filled with watches and jewellery. Collaborating officials and any remaining NSB members slipped away that afternoon, usually saying that they needed to fetch something from home. Yet several German policemen made no attempt to leave, and neither did the hated Inspector Verstappen, an arch-collaborationist who surrendered a little later at the Frunestrat police station. Out in the countryside, people hurried to the drop and landing zones, offering to help. Everyone wanted to shake hands with the Liberator, and after enduring the near sawdust of Conci's cigarettes during the occupation, the prospect of being offered a lucky strike seemed an unimaginable treat to dedicated Dutch smokers. The taste of their first American cigarette provided the most intense experience for many people, and they boasted about it to friends who had not yet undergone this rite of passage. For the majority of American paratroopers, the operation was most unlike the wild scattering they had experienced in Normandy. In fact, they descended in such a tight pattern that they were almost coming down on top of each other. One or two even became snagged in each other's rigging or were hit by weapon containers. Father Samson, a Catholic padre with a hundred and first airborne, nearly made the shoot of a man descending below him collapse. He called his post-war memoir, Look Out Below. When there was firing from the ground, Almost every paratrooper in the sky felt that the Germans were targeting them and nobody else. Lieutenant James Coyle descended, shooting at distant Germans with a forty-five automatic pistol. He never expected to hit any of them, but it alleviated the sense of helplessness. After hitting the ground, they struggled out of their parachute harnesses. One man enmeshed in his lines looked up in terror to see a civilian standing over him with a large knife, but he had come over to help. One Dutchman, who had proudly put on his army tunic and helmet from 1940 to bicycle out to greet the paratroopers, came very close to being shot because of the strange uniform he was wearing. He proved to be extremely useful, however, as he spoke both English and German. Lieutenant Colonel Cassidy landed on a barbed wire fence and took some five minutes to free himself. In a couple of cases, gammon grenades, the individual paratroopers' anti-tank weapon, exploded when leg bags came adrift and plummeted to the ground. The first task was to locate and open up the bundles which had been dropped from under the plane. A sergeant in the 101st was moved to find that a Dutch woman, whose husband had been killed only two days before by Allied planes attacking flag positions, still helped them retrieve parachute bundles from the fields near Son. Paratroopers were touched by the help offered by locals. The Dutch, a corporal reported, in contrast to the scenes near Wolfhäser, even gathered our chutes and placed them by the road for salvage, rather than scurrying off with them as the French so often did. American officers, on the other hand, were once again dismayed by the wasteful habits of many of their soldiers. When a man landed with one piece of heavy equipment, a member of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment observed, and did not find anyone immediately who had the corresponding pieces, he tended to throw his away. The second battalion found that night that it had only two mortars which were complete. With greater haste than the British to the north, the American paratroopers set off towards their first objective, a column on each side of the road. Dutch onlookers watched in amazement as they chewed gum on the march. They were also intrigued by the practical informality of their uniforms. Supply officers tried to find civilian vehicles to transport ammunition and rations from the drop zone, but many Dutch farmers 
having guessed immediately what was needed, turned up to help with large carts drawn by a couple of horses. They refused the mimeographed forms, which would have enabled them to claim payment later. Several paratroopers even used cows as ammunition carriers, much to the amusement of their comrades. A few gliders crash-landed in enemy territory. The Dutch used hollowed-out haystacks to hide those on board, and then provided bicycles and guides to get them back to their own forces. One glider came under heavy fire from German soldiers just before it landed, two kilometers southeast of Buxtel. Dutch civilians ran up to help and started to carry away a gunner called James Siebold, who had broken his leg in the crash. They and the Americans came under fire again. A few moments later, a beautiful Dutch girl arrived with a wheelbarrow. Siebold was placed in it, and they trundled him off. He was in such pain that his comrades had to leave him in a barn in the care of the girl. They gave him a morphine shot and handed him a pistol, which seemed an unsafe combination, but they and Siebold were all returned to American lines over the next week, thanks to their helpers. The 101st Airborne Division dropped north of Eindhoven in four different places, round Wechel and Son. American paratroopers of its 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, heading for Wechel, asked for directions to what they called the Double A Bridge. Dr. Leo Schreivers was rather perplexed, until he realized they meant the bridge over the river Ah. The 502nd, dropping further south, had to split its forces, with one battalion going for St. Udenrode on the river Dommel and best to the southwest, while the first objective of Colonel Sink's 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment was the bridge at Son over the Wilhelmina Canal. General Oberst Student claimed to have taken personal charge of the battle against the 101st. Better than anyone else, I knew that airborne troops are at their weakest during the first few hours, and thus rapid and decisive action on our part was called for. He had no reserves to hand, but there were several thousand replacements for Fallschirmjäger units at Hertogenbusch, also known as Denbusch. One hastily assembled march battalion was sent against St. Odenrode, and another against Wechel. He ordered General Leutnant Walter Poppers, 59th Infanterie Division the first of the fifteenth army formations, to head for Boxdale at once. Its advance units, however, were to make for Son, where the bridge was held by part of the training battalion of the Hermann Göring Division, which had rapidly learned its battlecraft in the fighting at Bevelo a few days before. As the 506th was dropping northwest of Son, the paratroopers were alarmed to see five, some say eight, enemy tanks, these tanks were from Oberstleutnant Fullreader's Training and Replacement Battalion of the Hermann Göring Division, which Major Urquhart's photo-reconnaissance sortie had picked up. Fortunately for the paratroopers, the fighter bombers attacked, destroying two and driving the rest away. The 506th landed on a soft, ploughed field, and Sink's first impression was that his regiment was in good shape. As the first troops reached the wood where they were to assemble, Sink sent off part of the 1st Battalion towards the bridge at Son. It would have been too much to hope to achieve total surprise. Within sight of the first objective, a lieutenant reported, three German officers were encountered in a Volkswagen. They were immediately neutralized with Tommy guns. We killed two of the officers and severely wounded the other. As the 101st Commander, Major General Taylor, advanced towards the firing, his bodyguard claimed that his only comment was, you are supposed to go ahead of me. An unsuspecting German soldier on a bicycle rode right into the point platoon as it reached the edge of Son, shouting, Kamerad, as he tried to raise his arms in surrender, he fell off. A moment later, an 88 millimeter positioned on the town's main street opened fire. Luckily for the 1st Battalion, the round struck a house, causing no casualties. The lead company immediately deployed to deal with the gun. Lacking infantry support, the 88mm had no flank protection, so a bazooka team managed to creep round and PFC Thomas G. Lindsay knocked it out. The surviving gunners turned to run, but Sergeant Rice brought them down with his Thompson submachine gun. Everything so far had gone well for the Americans, but although the German troops in Son had been taken by surprise, they reacted quickly, especially those from the Hermann Göring training battalion, which had been split up to defend key bridges. They dismantled the firing mechanism for the explosive charges 
and reinstalled it in the cellar of Kooning's garage on the south side of the canal. As D Company advanced towards the bridge, German soldiers in a house across the canal opened up with machine guns and rifles. Other 88 mm guns by the canal began firing at the rest of the battalion, attacking from the woods. The tree bursts caused fearful wounds. Altogether a dozen paratroopers were killed or crippled by the flying splinters. The Germans ceased firing, allowing other paratroopers to approach. The silence was oppressive. Then there was a huge explosion as the bridge went up in their faces. Debris rained down everywhere on the soldiers, stunned by the surprise of the blast. Major Dick Winters, of Easy Company, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, threw himself to the side of the road as the chunks of concrete rained down. He thought, God damn, what an awful way to die in the war, being hit by a rock. Colonel Sink was dejected by the failure to seize the bridge undamaged. His regiment was supposed to be in Einhoven, ready to welcome Thirty Corps. But he noted that at least the central pillar was intact, so it could be repaired. Major James Laprade and two others jumped into the canal and swam across. Winters claimed that they ripped off some wooden garage doors and threw them in the canal in an attempt to cross without getting their feet wet. Others found boats, and soon part of the battalion was across. In less than two hours, airborne engineers had improvised a footbridge. The men from the 326th Airborne Engineer Battalion, who had carted off their glider pilot to be treated by the medics, arrived to build a float of barrels and timbers large enough to handle light traffic across the canal by a hand-drawn cable. The engineers and paratroopers enjoyed every possible assistance from the town's population, as Lieutenant Colonel Hanna recorded. We received ovations, cheers, offers of food, smiles, and an acceptance so wholehearted and unrestrained, so unlike our reception in Normandy, that it nearly brought tears to my eyes. The whole village turned out and the young Dutch officer who jumped with me was overwhelmed with welcomes. It was undoubtedly the greatest day in his life. Dr. Schrevers, of the St. Joseph Hospital, helped deal with jaw and ankle fractures from the jump. He was fascinated to encounter penicillin for the first time, liberally supplied to the American medical services. The 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, which dropped just north of Sink's regiment, faced the dreaded task of splitting its strength. The first battalion set off north towards St. Woodenrode. The march was terribly hard, and the men were suffering greatly from too much clothing. They came to an old bridge unmarked on their maps. Just beyond lay a church, and Germans concealed in the graveyard began firing mortars at them. The first battalion's mortar platoon fired back with their sixty-millimeter mortars, but the Germans were too well protected among the tombstones. Eventually the firefight was won when some paratroopers sprinted across the bridge and forced the Germans to pull out. There was little resistance along the rest of the way. A number of Germans rose very cautiously from the ditches with their hands held high in surrender as the lead platoon approached. By dusk, St. Woodenrode was secured, and the battalion sent a patrol northeast up the road to link up with the 501st Regiment in Wechel. A far more dangerous task awaited Company H, sent in the opposite direction to secure Best and the bridge beyond. General Taylor had recognized the risk of losing the bridge at Son, so he had decided to secure the crossing southeast of Best as a backup. According to the intelligence available, the mission did not appear to require more than a company and a platoon of engineers. This small force, under Captain Robert Jones, set out from the drop zone following the edge of the forest between Son and Best. His overloaded men also suffered in the heat. Several of the replacements quietly dumped some of the machine-gun ammunition along the way. The scouts ahead lost their bearings in the woods, so the company emerged out of the trees too close to the village of Best, rather than five hundred meters further south from where they could charge the bridge. The company immediately came under small arms fire. Lieutenant Wiersbarski's platoon deployed to outflank the German positions, but then came under accurate rifle fire from some other buildings. Wiersbarski recounted how Staff Sergeant White, his platoon sergeant, who had predicted his own death the night before, stepped out from the cover of a corner of one of the buildings as he was sighting his rifle toward a second-story window. The sniper hiding there beat him to it and caught him right between the eyes. As he was falling, 
my thoughts went back to his predictions of the night before. White was their very first casualty. Soon afterwards, H Company's position became even more precarious. Coming down the road was a motorized German column of twelve trucks with German infantry and three half-tracks with twenty-millimeter light flag guns, the German equivalent of what the Americans called their meat choppers. The convoy was led by a lone German motorcycle escort. Captain Jones, seeing the opportunity for a good ambush, yelled the command to hold all fire. He hoped to riddle the column as it passed in front of them, but some of the headquarters men, not hearing the command, opened fire at the motorcyclist. His body seemed to halt in mid-air as the motorcycle continued on. The trucks braked hard and the troops inside jumped down to deploy into a skirmish line. The failed ambush had drawn into the battle for best the reinforcements that General Reinhardt was sending to Son. Jones's company now faced nearly a thousand men with six 88mm guns and the three half-tracks with 20mm flak. Hiding behind a hedgerow, Wierzbowski and his platoon attempted to outflank the new force, but Captain Jones called him back. The Americans were losing too many men, mainly from tree bursts fired by the 88s, and Jones had just received an order from Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cole, their battalion commander, to reach the bridge, whatever the cost. The company withdrew into the woods, from where they could make their way to the canal. Wierzbowski's own command, which was given the task of taking the bridge, had been reduced to eighteen men in his platoon and twenty-six engineers. They made their way cautiously through the forest and plantations of young pine trees, crossing the firebreaks in small groups at a run. Rain began to fall, and dusk came early with the black clouds. Proceeding mainly at a crawl, with two scouts ahead, they reached the dike of the canal bank unseen. Dreading a flare that might reveal them at any moment, they halted short of the bridge, which they could just see in silhouette against the night sky. Wierzbowski and one of the scouts slithered forward on their bellies for a closer look, but while they hid almost under the feet of the sentries, the paratroopers left behind became restless and started muttering. The German guards heard them and began throwing grenades, then a machine gun opened up. Several of the paratroopers panicked in their exposed position on the canal side of the dike and ran away. Wierzbowski had to race back to lead the remainder back behind the dike where he ordered them to dig in on the reverse slope. By then he was down to a combined total of eighteen men. He tried to call Captain Jones on the radio to warn him of their position, but found a piece of shrapnel had wrecked the set. The search patrols which Captain Jones sent out failed to find them, even though firing continued intermittently into the night. Wierzbowski did not know whether to long for dawn or dread it. The small town of Wechel was taken by Colonel Howard Johnson's 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment. The 1st Battalion, commanded by a young Texan, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Kennard, came from the northwest. The rest of the regiment arrived from their drop zone to the south, securing the bridge over the River Ah on the way. Kennard, on hearing that the NSB mayor had fled, some sources insist that he was lynched, picked a prominent citizen, Cornelis de Visser, and said, Your mayor. The local Catholic priest, a leading figure in the local underground, arrived to offer men as scouts or guards for prisoners. Yet Kennard was worried that if the Dutch demonstrated their patriotism too openly, and the Germans then retook the town, there would be terrible reprisals. Soon after his arrival, Colonel Johnson was standing on the bridge, looking extremely martial, with leafy twigs in the camouflage net on his helmet, according to Cornelis de Visse. A car containing two German soldiers approached and came to a sudden halt when the driver saw they were Americans. Johnson shouted, Hände hoch! Raus! Hands up! Get out! The two men tried to escape down the slope of the raised road, but a Polish-American paratrooper shot them both with his service pistol. Johnson set up his command post in the house of Dr. Kersemakers in the center of Wechel and gave it the code name of Klondike. The town was rapidly bedecked with orange bunting and the Dutch flag in horizontal stripes of red, white, and blue, and all the locals celebrated. Padre Samson, who had nearly collapsed the chute of a paratrooper below him, as he jumped with Kennard's battalion, landed in the wide moat of Castile Heathwick. With the battalion doctor, Samson decided to set up their aid station in this eleventh-century fortress. 
The Padre then discovered that it had been made into a museum with torture racks, implements for mutilation, scourges, iron masks, he wrote. Not the ideal place to inspire patients with confidence in an army doctor. Once the casualties from the drop had been moved there, Samson went off after Kinnard to see about moving them all into Vickel, but by the time he returned, German troops had seized the castle and the aid post. All their injured were now prisoners. The C-47 Dakotas bringing the 82nd Airborne encountered quite a bit of flak on approaching the drop zone near Hrospik. Five of the aircraft were hit. One was burning from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. Men were bailing out of the burning ship. An Air Force officer recounted their experience. All of the eighteen paratroopers jumped. Our radio operator bailed out at five hundred feet, and he got to the ground with a strained back. Our crew chief also bailed out, but he was killed by small arms fire or flak on the way down. The first pilot, First Lieutenant Robert S. Stoddard, stayed in the plane, and he was burned to death as it hit the ground. I bailed out at two hundred feet. I fractured my ankle. The Dutch dragged me and some of the wounded into their houses. Later they helped us get to a field hospital. Ari Bestebrecher, the Dutch liaison officer with the 82nd Airborne, may have been thrilled to recognize the contours ahead round Grosbeek, but the pilot failed to gain height to compensate for the rising ground. As a result, Brigadier General Jim Gavin had a hell of a landing from only about 400 feet. It seemed I hardly got out of the plane before I landed. I really bumped my ass like it had never been hit before. In fact, he cracked his spine in two places. I'm so excited. The Germans were in the woods nearby shooting at us, so I got my pistol out and laid it on the ground to grab it quick if I needed it, while I was trying to get out of my harness, and I had my rifle. Gavin was famous among his men for always carrying his M1 rifle like an ordinary trooper. Born in Brooklyn, he had joined the U.S. Army as an orphan. His intelligence and military qualities were so evident that he was selected for West Point and rose rapidly to become the youngest general of his generation. His film star good looks, intelligence, and charm attracted Marlena Dietrich and Martha Gellhorn, and he had affairs with both of them. Although in great pain, Gavin set off with an engineer officer and best of Brecher up a sunken track which led to a plantation of pine trees. A machine gun suddenly opened fire on them, but either the engineer officer or Besta Brecher, depending on different sources, managed to hit the gunner in the forehead with a single shot. This small group of officers was soon joined by Gavin's divisional artillery commander. He had broken an ankle in the drop, so one of his men had to ferry him around in a wheelbarrow. This enabled him to report in person to Gavin. All guns ready to fire, on call. Gavin had insisted on having this battalion of parachute artillery in the first wave because he had never forgotten facing the tiger tanks of the Panzerdivision Hermann Göring with just a bazooka. Whatever the rules of warfare, American paratroopers did not take kindly to Germans who had just been trying to kill them. We got out of our chutes and headed for where we had seen the twenty-millimeter gun battery, one of them recounted. Four Germans stood by their guns, hands held high, shouting, Kamerad! Kamerad, hell! They were cut to ribbons by Tommy guns and rifle slugs. This took place near the Hotel Bergendal, close to Beek and right on the border with Germany. Paratroopers from the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment discovered a couple of German officers in bedrooms who had changed into civilian clothes. Later that afternoon, Bester Brecher found one of the local resistance leaders near the Hotel Bergendal, which was just three kilometers from the center of Nijmegen, then set up his headquarters in the Hotel Sionshof on the Hrusbeek Road. From there he began telephoning into the city to discover German strength and positions. Gavin refused to set up his command post in the Hotel Bergendal. He preferred a tented camp in the woods a few hundred meters away. General Browning had also selected the sector for his command post and set up camp in the woods close to Gavin. After his glider had landed, Browning proudly produced a Pegasus pennant in silk to fly from the aerial on his jeep. The winged horse symbol had been another suggestion from his wife, Daphne du Maurier. Soldiers in his headquarters then had to prepare the general's sleeping arrangements. This meant digging a deep, grave-like hole in the ground to take his camp bed, with a tent erected over the top. One company in the 508th 
had two plane loads of paratroopers who, instead of bailing out over the Hrosbeck Heights, were dropped eight kilometers too far east and landed in Germany. We joke and laugh as we move out, recorded Dwayne T. Burns. It's hard to believe that we are in German territory, miles from our own front lines. I keep waiting for something to happen. Lieutenant Coombs, who had been wounded by flak before jumping, managed, with the aid of a Ukrainian deserter from the German army, to bring his twenty-two men back to rejoin their battalion. According to the official report, they killed some twenty Germans on the way and brought in forty-nine prisoners. Close to the southern end of the Hosbeck landing zone was a company of convalescents from Erzatz Battalion 39. They had been sent from Cleaver to round up stragglers retreating from France and Belgium. They were led by a young lieutenant who had never seen combat, so Hauptfeldfebel Jakob Moll, a veteran of the French campaign and the Eastern Front, assured the youth that he would take over command if they had to fight. The company was on patrol in the woods when the 82nd Airborne began to land. Reaching the edge of the trees, they peered out and were amazed by the sight. The field was covered with gliders, and paratroopers were dashing about, getting equipment together and unloading cargo gliders. The Germans were awed by the organization and the quantity of material, and they saw Dutch civilians arriving to help. The young lieutenant wanted to attack immediately, but Moll persuaded him that it would be suicide using ill-armed men. The company had some old machine guns, but no tripods. To fire them, they would have to rest the barrel on somebody's shoulder, which was a deafening experience for the man concerned. At Bredeweg, a hamlet just south of Krosbeck, the local priest recorded that German officers jumped into cars and drove off while one young soldier was so frightened out of his wits by the airborne landings that he shot himself. In Krosbeck, captured Germans, their hands held high, were marched to the school. Others were made to face the wall of the local shoe factory. The town's inhabitants cheered the Americans who were running along the road. They hardly noticed us, a young woman recorded in her diary. Our liberators look strange and lugubrious with their blackened faces from camouflage cream where the white of the eyes stood out. Their clothing looked more like an overall than a uniform, with pockets in the most unusual places. As soon as they started to dig foxholes, smiling kids turned up begging to be allowed to take over the small picks and shovels. Members of the Dutch underground had immediately appeared on the streets to help. They were solidly built men in their blue overalls, which looked like a primitive uniform, and they all carry guns, the same diarist noted. They rounded up members of the NSB, exciting the admiration of their fellow citizens. The people who have been terrorizing the village for the last couple of years are now lying on the verge of the road in a sad little troop, with many passers-by making nasty remarks and insults, in which they can express their bottled-up hate and fear. These prisoners would be held in the camp with a munitions dump in the Wolfsberg forest, just to the west of Krosbeck. A local recounted that one German soldier was not locked up with the others. One of the Americans had hurt his ankle on landing and had taken a German prisoner in full uniform who pulled him around the country lanes on a child's cart. He reclined like Madame Recamier, smoking a cigarette with a smirk on his face. Further to the south, in Mook, the villagers raised the Dutch flag over the school and danced around singing Cowboy Joe, the only American song they knew. While the 508th and the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiments secured the Hrosbeck Heights facing the Reichswald, the 504th had the tricky task of capturing the large bridge over the river Maas at Rave and five bridges over the Maasval Canal. Only the southernmost bridge of the five at Hermann was taken completely intact. Three were blown by the Germans and a fourth badly damaged. The C-47s approached the drop zone for the Rave bridge at 600 feet. As a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun began firing, Sergeant Johnson shook his fist and shouted, You dirty krauts! You wait a minute and we'll be down there to get you! Colonel Reuben Tucker, the redoubtable commander of the 504th, considered their drop a parade ground jump. Out of 1,936 men in his regiment, one of his soldiers was killed when his parachute failed to open, and 44 men suffered injuries. One of them, Tucker's regimental adjutant, smashed through a tiled roof.
while two companies of the 2nd Battalion of the 504th jumped on the north side of the Maas near Grave, Easy Company dropped to the south. Part of the company had jumped too soon, but the platoon which was closest did not wait. It assembled on the road in very brief order. As the men approached the huge bridge, wading along drainage ditches, they came under small arms fire. Then a machine gun opened up from a camouflaged flak tower. Two German trucks arrived, and they engaged them too. Fortunately, the soldiers they contained did not have much stomach for the fight, and they soon slipped away. This allowed the platoon to storm a building some fifty meters from the bridge, and then to knock out the crew of a light flak gun mounted on a pillbox. The twenty-millimeter gun itself was undamaged, and they turned it to take on the corresponding pillbox at the northern end. The bridge was theirs. The rest of the battalion, which had dropped on the north side of the mass, made contact. They began to prepare a night attack on the town of Krave. Just about this time, up the road from the south, there came a tank. It pulled up within about twenty-five yards of our landmines and stopped. We had three bazooka teams covering the tank, but before they could open fire, somebody hollered, Don't fire! Don't fire! It's British armor! We'd been told to expect the British within six to twenty-four hours. By the time this unknown person was through shouting British armor, the German tank had opened up with a seventy-five millimeter gun. After firing about six rounds into and around our positions, the tank pulled out. One officer was killed and about fifteen men wounded. Their only consolation was that a German scout car and two motorcycles with sidecars blew themselves up on the mines they had laid. As dusk began to fall, the tension in Nijmegen was unbearable. People were nervous, and so were the Germans, wrote Martin Louis Denham, the director of the great concert hall, in his diary. Firing could be heard in the distance. The Allies had landed somewhere outside, but nobody in the city really knew what was going on. The Germans, afraid of losing control, sent troops goose-stepping through the streets, guns at the ready. Another diarist wrote that the sound of hobnailed jackboots marching rapidly in step was the most unpleasant sound imaginable at the moment. The mixture of fear, anticipation, and excitement meant that few would sleep that night. A crowd stormed the warehouse of the Turmach plant because that was where the Wehrmacht had stored all its looted alcohol. Doors were smashed in, and people emerged triumphant with crates or armfuls of bottles. Some people were appalled at the risks other civilians took, plundering a goods train in the station while the Germans still had heavily armed troops nearby. Men, women, and children are lugging parcels, crates, and barrels, and it would seem that they do not even bother to inspect exactly what they have laid their hands on. I see a small girl carrying a pile of wooden shoes, a young woman with an armful of broom handles, and all of them are wildly excited, swearing at each other for good measure. Mr. Brocher was frustrated by Gavin's insistence on securing the Hrusbeck Heights before making a serious attempt to seize the bridge. We are not interested in the bridge at this moment, the divisional commander told him, because he still expected a hell of a German reaction from the Reichswald. Gavin reluctantly allowed Mr. Brocher to go into the city to reconnoitre. He had, however, ordered Colonel Roy E. Lindquist of the 508th to send a battalion into Nijmegen, on the off chance of taking the bridge once the area north of Crossbeck had been secured. Gavin later admitted that he did not rate Lindquist nearly as highly as his other two regimental commanders, because he lacked a killer instinct and did not go for the jugular. Gavin told Lindquist not to send his battalion through the town. They should skirt it to the east and approach the bridge from the flat land of the river bank. Yet Lindquist and the commander of his first battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Shields Warren, ignored this instruction. Following the advice of a local member of the underground, the 1st Battalion advanced straight into Nijmegen, up the main road from Frusbeck. Word of their presence spread instantly. Crowds assembled to cheer them, to shake hands, to admire their brown paratrooper boots, which were so quiet with their rubber soles. These soldiers were so relaxed, so unlike the Germans with their shouting and stamping. Assuming that the moment of liberation had come, with German troops withdrawn to the north of the town to defend the bridge, two youths climbed the facade of the infantry barracks to chip away at the great stone Nazi eagle until it came crashing down, 
and the crowd surged forward to smash up the larger fragments. Firing broke out at around 2200 hours, the director of the concert hall noted. We heard the first death cry of a human being, ghastly. There were cries of medic as paratroopers were hit, but the Dutch were quick to pull the wounded into their houses and care for them there. Chaotic fighting in the darkness followed, sometimes close combat with trench knives. Although one company pushed forward far enough to have a view of the bridge, the battalion as a whole never managed to advance further than the large traffic circle, the Kaiser Karlplein, which German reinforcements had started to defend. Bester Blöcher and his fellow member of the Jedburgh Clarence team, George Verhager, were shot out in their jeep. Verhager was badly wounded in the thigh, and Bester Blöcher less seriously in the hand and arm. A great opportunity had been missed. The Nijmegen Road Bridge at the start of that evening had been defended by just nineteen SS troopers from the Frunsberg, a dozen from the Hermann Göring training battalion, and a handful of reluctant Landsturm militia. Explosives were in place, nine hundred and fifty kilograms on the southern side and the same on the northern end, but not wired up for demolition. Warren's battalion had clashed with German reinforcements, which had literally just arrived. For paratroopers dropped just a few hours before in a foreign country far behind enemy lines, that first night was disorientating. Just east of Grosbeek, a lieutenant with the 505th recorded, we were around a hundred yards from a railroad track. As some of us sat talking, a railroad train manned by the enemy approached from our rear and passed through our position. We were taken so completely by surprise we just watched the train go by. Brigadier General Gavin, trying to sleep under a tree, was instantly awake when he heard it, and demanded to know why it had not been stopped. That night, on Tree Row, the front line on the Frusbeck Heights facing the Reichswald, a nervous sentry in the dark shot an inquisitive cow. On the landing grounds, some battalion personnel quite shamelessly stole supplies from the gliders belonging to other units. Out to the east of Nijmegen, and also west of Utrecht, RAF Bomber Command dropped parachute puppets to confuse the enemy. General Eisenhower made a broadcast to the people of the Netherlands, urging them not to rise en masse, but to use any covert action to dismantle the enemy's transport. In northern Belgium, at 30 Corps headquarters near Hechtel, Lieutenant Colonel Renfro, the 101st Airborne Liaison Officer, was uneasy. The battering which the Sherman tanks of the Irish Guards had received that afternoon meant that the quick ride into the blue, which had been expected, did not materialize. His confidence was not helped by the pretense of Horrocks's chief of staff, Brigadier Pyman, that everything was going well. Colonel Joe Vandeleur had halted the Irish Guards in Valkensvard on the orders of Brigadier Norman Gwatkin, the commander of the 5th Guards Brigade, who joined him there. While they enjoyed a glass of champagne together from their captured supplies, Gwatkin told him to take his time getting to Eindhoven, that there was no hurry because the song bridge had been blown and they would have to wait for the bridging to be brought up. This decision was clearly approved by Horrocks, who wrote later, In my opinion, it was the act of an experienced commander to halt, rest his troops, etc., while the bridge was being repaired. But this makes no sense. Son was north of Eindhoven, and work could not start until the engineers accompanying the guards' armoured division arrived to construct a Bailey Bridge. If Horrocks seriously imagined that the 101st Airborne's engineers were capable of constructing a bridge to take tanks, then he should have checked with Colonel Renfro. That Gwadkin, presumably with Horrocks's approval, could have told Vandeleur to take his time, beggars belief. Chapter 12 Night and day, Arnhem, the 17th to the 18th of September. A Dutch diarist, whose house overlooked the approaches to the great Arnhem Road Bridge, guessed that the British must be close when a flare went up. A German sentry could be heard calling out in panic, Ich bin ganz allein! I am all alone. The leading platoon of Frost's 2nd Battalion reached the Arnhem Road Bridge at about twenty hundred hours, soon after night had fallen. Major Digby Tatham Water kept his men of A Company hidden under it, allowing German traffic to continue. He sent two platoons out to the sides to prepare some of the nearby houses for defence. Sergeants and corporals knocked respectfully on doors, explained what they had to do, 
and recommended that the family sought shelter elsewhere to avoid the coming battle. Not surprisingly, most were very upset. Their spotless houses were rapidly transformed for fighting. Baths and basins were filled to ensure a supply of water, because the electricity was bound to go off again. Curtains, blinds, and anything flammable were ripped down, furniture moved to make firing positions, and windows smashed out to reduce casualties from flying glass. The battalion padre, Father Bernard Egan, who was helping these paratroopers, confessed to deriving somewhat of an unholy glee from pitching a chair through a window, knowing full well there were no police around to reprimand me. As darkness fell, Lieutenant Colonel Frost remembered the German army saying that night is the friend of no man, yet it certainly seemed to be helping his paratroopers. He caught up with the rest of A Company, lying quietly on the embankment of the bridge, while Germans still passed back and forth. Frost probably arrived about an hour after most of Gribner's reconnaissance battalion of the 9th SS Hohenstaufen stormed south over it towards Nijmegen on Bittrich's order. Yet Standartenführer Hartzer, the Hohenstaufen divisional commander, had overlooked the second part of Bittrich's instructions, to secure the bridge itself. Only a handful of men from the original guard detachment remained on the bridge. Frost had been disappointed to find that the pontoon bridge they had passed a kilometre back had been dismantled. After the loss of the railway bridge in the explosion, it was now impossible to send men across to seize the south end of the road bridge except in boats, but groups sent off in search of them had no luck. Tatham Water had been waiting until they could rush both ends at the same time, but they could delay no longer. Lieutenant John Greyburn's platoon was chosen for the task. Greyburn, who won the Victoria Cross for this action, seems to have been determined to display conspicuous gallantry. He led his men up the steps onto the roadway. Sticking close to the massive steel girders on each side, his platoon charged against the fire of an armoured car and twenty-millimetre twin flak guns. Greyburn was hit in the shoulder, and other men were wounded, so they had to withdraw. During this first attempt to secure the bridge, more and more houses overlooking the ramp and the approaches were occupied. The jeeps and the six-pounder anti-tank guns were at first parked in a space concealed by houses west of the bridge. The headquarters and defence platoon of the 1st Parachute Brigade, minus Brigadier Lathbury, who was still with General Urquhart and the 3rd Battalion on the far side of Oosterbeek, took over buildings on the west side of the ramp next to Frost's headquarters. Major Freddy Goff of the Reconnaissance Squadron arrived with his headquarters in three jeeps and reported to Frost just as a second attempt was made to seize the bridge. To deal with a pillbox on the side of the bridge, another platoon and an airborne engineer with a flamethrower got into position. But the operator's number two tapped him on the shoulder just as he was about to fire, and he jerked back in surprise. As a result, the spurt of flame went over the top of the pillbox and hit a pair of wooden shacks just behind. They must have contained ammunition, fuel, and dynamite, because an almighty explosion and fireball followed. It looked as if they had set the whole bridge on fire, which produced some sarcastic comments about capturing the bridge and not destroying it. There was one advantage. Three trucks full of German troops approached over the bridge, and as their drivers tried to manoeuvre past the fires, Frost's paratroopers began shooting. Soon all three vehicles were blazing, as well as several of the unfortunate soldiers, who were cut down. Remembering how the Germans had blown up the railway bridge in front of their noses, Frost was still concerned that the great road bridge could also be brought down, but a royal engineer officer assured him that the heat from the fires would have destroyed the wires leading to any explosive charges. Even so, Frost spent a restless night. The big attack would come in the morning, and despite the urgent efforts of the signalers, they were not yet in touch with divisional headquarters or the other battalions. The reasons for the 1st Airborne Division's disastrous communications have still not yet been fully explained, and perhaps never will be. They include a problem of terrain with woods and buildings, insufficiently powerful sets, run-down batteries, and, in the case of some sets, the wrong crystals being issued. Assessing the perimeter they needed to hold around the northern end of the road bridge, Frost wished he still had C Company under Major Dover, but his signaller could not make radio contact to recall them. After the railway bridge had blown up, 
C Company had set off for its secondary objective, the German headquarters in New Plain. As it passed the St. Elizabeth Hospital, Dover's company surprised thirty German soldiers climbing down from two buses. They killed most of them in a one-sided firefight and captured five. But as they proceeded, they started to come up against soldiers and vehicles of what soon became the Kampfgruppe Brinkmann, based on the reconnaissance battalion of the SS Frunsberg. Even though C Company managed to knock out an armoured car with a Piat anti-tank launcher, they were forced to pull back. They were eventually surrounded, yet managed to hold out for another sixteen hours until their ammunition was exhausted. As if to balance the loss of Frost's C Company, an unexpected reinforcement arrived in the form of Major Lewis's C Company of the 3rd Battalion, the one which had made its way into Arnhem along the railway track. As they crept down towards the road bridge through the centre of the city, they had a chaotic and murderous encounter in the dark streets. A unit of Reichsarbeitsdienst teenagers from a heavy flag detachment had been waiting in Arnhem Station to return to Germany. Late that afternoon, on learning of the airborne landings, their commander, Hauptmann Rudolf Meyer, had gone to the town commandant's office to find out what they should do. He returned to announce that they would be armed and that they would be coming under SS command. The boys were marched to a nearby barracks where they were issued with old carbines. The bolts did not work properly, and the only way to open the chamber was to knock them against something hard. Their morale was not high, but it really hit the bottom when they saw these old guns, one of their officers recorded. That evening they had still received no orders and no food. In fact, they had not eaten for nearly forty-eight hours because of the delay at the station. As dusk fell, SS Obersturmführer Harder appeared and announced that they were now part of Kampfgruppe Brinkmann from the 10th SS Panzerdivision Frunsberg. They would attack from the town centre towards the Rhine. In the pitch dark, they became aware of other soldiers, who they assumed were also part of the same Kampfgruppe. Suddenly a British paratrooper yelled, Germans! Everyone began firing in panic. The wild scene was illuminated for odd moments by flashes or explosions. At close quarters, British Sten guns killed more efficiently than the antiquated bolt-action rifles issued to the RAD teenagers. Almost half of Meyer's boys were killed, and the rest must have been traumatized. Yet Lewis's company also lost a platoon commander and a sergeant, and a third of his men were captured by SS Panzer Grenadiers. The remnants of this 3rd Battalion company joined the engineer troop led by Captain Mackay in two buildings of the Van Limburg Steerum School, on the east side of the bridge ramp. Not long afterwards, Panzer Grenadiers, either from the Kampfgruppe Brinkmann or the SS Battalion Euling, crept up and tossed grenades through the windows of the house furthest from the bridge. We fought hand to hand in the rooms, Mackay wrote. One of them brought a Spandau, MG 42, and poked it right through the window, spraying the room. I was standing there with my 45 and just pushed it in his mouth and pulled the trigger. It blew his head off, all that was not held on by his chin strap. I grabbed the Spandau and turned it on the Germans outside. In other parts of the building, there was fighting with fists, boots, rifle butts, and bayonets before the Germans were dislodged. Mackay recognized that the smaller of the two buildings on the north side was far too vulnerable with bushes in which German attackers could hide, so he decided to abandon the house. They pulled out their wounded, whom they had to haul over a two-meter wall, with Mackay straddling it as each man was handed up to him. Altogether, Frost's force was probably more than seven hundred strong, with all of the attached arms and services ranging from the Royal Engineers to the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. In brigade headquarters, the signalers installed themselves in the roof, having removed a few tiles for their antennae. They spent the night trying to make contact with divisional headquarters and the other two battalions, sending messages that the second battalion was at the bridge and urgently needed reinforcements. Major Dennis Munford of the Light Regiment Royal Artillery knew that without a working radio set he could not direct fire support from their pack howitzers taking position around Osterbeck Church. He and another officer therefore decided to drive back that night through German lines in jeeps to Wolfhäuser. They retuned their number 22 sets there, collected more batteries, reported on the situation at the bridge, and drove back once more through German lines. Only Munford's jeep got through. 
the other officer received a serious stomach wound and was captured. At dawn, Munford would range in the 75mm howitzers on the enemy's likely avenues of approach, both from the south end and around the northern perimeter. One of the inhabitants in a house very close to the church and the gun line recounted how a British gunner knocked politely at their door, urging them not to be frightened when the guns began firing. When you hear a boom and a whistle, it is ours, he explained. When you hear a whistle and bang, it is one of theirs. Lieutenant Colonel Doby, with his first battalion, having abandoned the attempt to follow the northern route into Arnhem, was determined to get to the bridge to support Frost after his radio operator had picked up one of the messages. They made their way south during that first night until Derby decided to take the Utrechtsweg in the middle as a shorter route. But when his lead company reached the railway embankment east of Osterbeek, they came up against Meller's 9th SS Pioneer Battalion. Meller himself wrote melodramatically, With the coming of the dawn, the dance began. It was a battle man against man, the red devils against the men in black, elite against elite. The first battalion could not get through, still missing one company after the clash with the Luftwaffe Alarmeinheit, and now weakened by further casualties, the battalion zigzagged down to follow the southern road close to the river. Doby's men were tired, having had very little rest. Lieutenant Colonel Fitch's 3rd Battalion, which had halted for much of the night near the Hotel Hartenstein on the western side of Osterbeek, set off again at 0430 hours. Fitch also chose the southern route. Both Brigadier Lathbury and Major General Urquhart carried on forward with the lead company, an unwise surfeit of senior officers so close to the front. The battalion had to pass through a wooded area where German riflemen had climbed trees. These harassing attacks delayed the rear half of the two-kilometre-long column. An inhabitant of Osterbeek was thrilled to see a British soldier kill a sniper, just like shooting a crow. Further delays occurred as they advanced cautiously at dawn through Osterbeek. Locals would throw open their windows and call, Good morning! across the street. Good morning to you, came the unenthusiastic reply to their presence being revealed. Soon families were pouring out into the street, some wearing a coat thrown over their pyjamas or nightdress, to offer tomatoes, pears and apples from their gardens, and cups of coffee or tea. These distractions, after the shooting, delayed the rear of the battalion, and they lost touch with the vanguard, which by then had passed under the railway bridge a kilometre east of Osterbeek Church. To confuse matters even more, Doby's 1st Battalion also joined the southern road, mixing in with the rear part of the 3rd Battalion, which did not follow the route taken by the leading company with Lathbury and Urquhart. This vanguard had wasted precious time waiting for the other companies to catch up. On continuing the advance, they came up against the southern end of Spindler's second Sperlini, around the St. Elizabeth Hospital, some two kilometres short of the road bridge. By now, Spindler's blocking force was being strengthened with self-propelled assault guns, often misleadingly described as tanks in British accounts. The 1st Battalion, meanwhile, soon found itself under fire from the high ground of Tin Brink. The planners back in England had failed to see the danger on the map. The two roads from the west reached western Arnhem on the side of a hill between the railway line and the river. This provided an ideal choke point to slow or halt the British advance. The Germans, of course, suffered from confusion, too, presumably as the result of a radio message from Grebner's reconnaissance force charging south the previous evening. Modell's Army Group B had reported at twenty hundred hours, Arnhem Nijmegen Road free of enemy. Arnhem Nijmegen bridges in German hands. But not long afterwards, two German women telephonists in the Arnhem Exchange warned Bittrich that British paratroopers had secured the northern end of the road bridge, and they proceeded to pass information throughout the night. Bittrich awarded them both the Iron Cross after the battle. He went to Hartz's command post in the early morning in an angry mood because Grebner had ignored his order that the bridge be taken and firmly held. Footnote the headquarters of the Wehrmacht Commander-in-Chief Netherlands were still so obsessed by an uprising of the Dutch underground that it stated in a signal on the morning of the 18th of September, Arnhem Road Bridge Occupied by Terrorists. End of footnote. 
Model also appeared at Hartz's command post, set up in General Mayor Kusin's headquarters in North Arnhem. There was low cloud that day, he observed, which should at least frustrate the Allied air forces. He told Hartzer that the heavy Panzer Battalion 503 with Mark VI Royal Tigers was being brought across Germany by Blitz transport from Königsbruck near Dresden. This meant that the Reichsbahn had to clear every line and every train short of the Führer's personal Sonderzug out of the way. Another fourteen Tiger Mark VI tanks from heavy Panzer Battalion 506 at Paderborn were already on their way. Their crews had been wakened at oh thirty hours in their barracks at Sinalaga, and by oh eight hundred hours every tank had been loaded onto railway flat cars. Modell also announced that he would have the water supplies cut off to Osterbeek, as that was where the bulk of the British would be forced to withdraw. Although Modell still refused Bittrich's request to blow the bridge at Nijmegen, he sent a curt order by teleprinter later in the morning, destruction of Rotterdam and Amsterdam harbours to proceed. This was one of the first stages of German retaliation for the rail strike to help the Allies. All through the night, Modell's staff had been ordering in reinforcements towards Arnhem, using the town of Bocholt as railhead. The 280th Assault Gun Brigade, en route from Denmark to Aachen, was diverted to Arnhem. Other units included three battalions of around 600 men each, nine Alarm Einheiten of scratch units totaling 1,400 men, two Panzerjäger companies of tank destroyers from Herford, six motorized Luftwaffe companies totaling 1,500 men, and a flak Kampfgruppe made up of ten batteries with a total of 36 88mm guns and 39 20mm guns. They were temporarily motorized, which meant that civilian tractors and trucks were used to tow them. The 20mm light flak guns were sent forward to the landing zones to take on any more airborne lifts or drops. As these units reached the Arnhem area, Bittrich distributed them between the two divisions. To Hartzer he allocated a police battalion from Upper Dorn, a veteran reserve battalion from Huchovain, and a flak brigade due to arrive a little later. These additions would bring Hartzer's Hohenstaufen up to nearly 5,000 men. Hamel's Funsberg would receive the company of Tiger Mark VI tanks from Paderborn, although because of breakdowns only three would arrive an SS Werfer Abteilung, a heavy mortar battalion, an engineer battalion with flamethrowers brought in from Glogau, and a Panzergrenadier training and replacement battalion arriving from Emmerich. This last unit did not sound very promising. Many of its men had suffered amputations, while its commander, Major Hans-Peter Knaust, led his battalion on crutches. But Knaust, who had lost a leg in the battle for Moscow when with the 6th Panzerdivision, was a formidable leader. Without bothering to consult the local authorities, he ordered his men to seize the fuel reserves at the town of Bocholt to fill their tanks. Going ahead of his men, in the only half-track his Kampfgruppe had been allowed, he reported to Bittrich's headquarters at 0200 that morning. Bittrich's SS aide announced Naust rather disparagingly as someone from the army. Bittrich, who in any case enjoyed good relations with the regular army, was certainly pleased to see him. He needed every unit possible, and Knaust, with his four Panzergrenadier companies, would also receive a platoon of assault guns and a company of seven Mark III and eight Mark IV tanks from a driver training school in Bielefeld. Modell's plan was not just to block the rest of the 1st Airborne Division from reaching the Arnhem Road Bridge, it was to crush it between two forces. He had sent instructions during the night by teleprinter to General Christiansen, the Wehrmacht Commander-in-Chief, Netherlands. His forces, under General von Tittau, were to attack the air-landed enemy from the west and northwest and link up with two SS Panzer Corps on the northern side. Tittau had done little on the 17th of September, apart from telling Sturmbahnführer Heller to take his SS Wach Battalion from Amersfoort concentration camp to Eda. Heller, no doubt regretting the abrupt farewell to his mistress, somehow imagined that the British were advancing west towards him when they were pushing east to Arnhem. His guard battalion, which had been promised it would never have to fight, was starting to dwindle even before a shot was fired. A third of them deserted on the way, or soon after their first taste of combat. A far more reliable unit was the SS Unteroffizier Schule, 
commanded by Obersturmbahnführer Hans Lippert. While Lippert waited at Greberberg for his own men to arrive, he was given a naval contingent, Schiffsstammabteilung 10, whose commander warned him that his men had no infantry training, and a so-called Fliegerhorst-Bataillon of Luftwaffe ground crew, whose military experience had been limited to rolling fuel drums. Lippert's growing but very mixed force was designated the Westgruppe, supposedly the counterpart to the far more powerful Ostgruppe, based on the Hohenstaufen division. Beatrich rashly predicted that, with a counterattack from both east and west, the enemy forces would be destroyed on the 19th of September. Aware that only a small proportion of the airborne division had reached the bridge, Beatrich ordered Harzer's Hohenstaufen to concentrate all available forces on building two blocking lines to ensure that no more British troops got through. Müller's pioneer battalion of the Hohenstaufen had already taken up position on the eastern edge of Osterbeek along the railway line which ran south to Nijmegen. His was the force which had repulsed Dobie's first battalion in the night. Around us frightened people in houses looked at us with hostile expressions, he wrote. We dug in amid this jungle of gardens and villas, like imitation chateau, of hedges and fences and outhouses. They were soon reinforced with the divisional flak detachment. Beyond them, Müller had positioned another company commanded by Obersturmführer Voss, in and around a large house on the corner of the Utrichsweg, partly concealed by thick rhododendron bushes. So while Harzer's Hohenstaufen faced west to block the rest of the first airborne, the bulk of Harmel's Frunsberg division was ordered to destroy resistance at the bridge as soon as possible, so that reinforcements could be sent south to ensure the defence of Nijmegen. The only alternative route was round to the east, and then to ferry troops and vehicles across the Niederrhein at Panaden, two kilometres north of the River Val. The 1st Battalion of the 21st SS Panzergrenadier Regiment was ordered to secure key buildings just to the north of the bridge. One company had a single half-track, which Panzergrenadiers usually called a rolling coffin. A British six-pounder armour-piercing round went through one side and out the other, leaving little damage except for two round holes. Amazed at their luck, they pulled back rapidly. We all acted like heroes for each other's benefit, a Panzergrenadier called Horst Weber admitted, when actually inside we were quivering with fear. Their company was ordered to occupy the imposing courthouse, the Palais von Justitie. Convinced that British paratroopers had occupied it, they wheeled up their anti-tank gun and simply blasted a side wall at point-blank range until they had a breach large enough to enter. A soldier from the Panzer Regiment in the company, who was simply known as Panzerman because he still wore his black uniform, was the first through the hole. It was a large building with marble columns in the hall and many cellars, but no British. They set up their machine guns to cover the Walburgstraat and the marketplace. Another member of his battalion saw some Dutch civilians during the fighting. They came out on the street to bandage the wounded. We used to try and avoid shooting them, although this was not always possible. At the northern end of the road bridge, Frost's force stood to before dawn on that Monday morning. With spare magazines to hand and grenades ready primed, they waited to see what daylight would bring. A cold mist rising off the Rhine almost obscured the bridge, wrote a member of the mortar platoon. His lieutenant decided to set up his observation post on the top of the warehouse facing the bridge where the battalion's vicar's machine guns were installed. Their ugly snouts were a little back from the windows in the shadows, but they still had a very fine field of fire. While awaiting the inevitable German counterattack, the machine-gun crews busied themselves on needless little tasks in the tense atmosphere. But when the mortar platoon commander checked the line they had just laid down to the field telephone in one of the mortar pits, he found that the handset they had brought with them did not work. He flung it against the wall with fearful swearing. They had to try another method, with a paratrooper taking down the range he estimated from the map and then shouting it down to the back of the building to the mortar pits dug in on the grass islands either side of the main road. Several German trucks, whose drivers seemed unaware of recent developments around the bridge, were shot to pieces with rapid fire from Bren guns, rifles and stens. The soldiers on board who were not killed were taken prisoner. 
Several of them came from the V-2 rocket group, but naturally did not admit that to their captors. The Piat teams and the crews of six-pounder anti-tank guns held back. They knew better than to waste ammunition on soft-skinned vehicles. The American OSS officer, Lieutenant Harvey Todd, with the Jedburgh team, was installed in the attic of Brigade Headquarters, as he recounted in his after-battle report. I had a good observation post, and sniper position in the rafters of a building near a small window in the roof, overlooking the road and the bridge. I killed three Germans here as they tried to cross the road. One badly wounded German, noted a mortarman, pulled himself with his hands to within a couple of yards of safety, and then was dispatched by one of our own snipers, who had been following his progress with detached interest. At 0900, just out of sight of the southern part of the bridge, a column of some twenty vehicles was forming up from Sturm von Führer's Grebner's reconnaissance battalion of the Hohenstaufen. Grebner had briefly halted on the bridge just out of view. Round his neck he wore the Ritterkreuz, which he had received the day before. Grebner was known to despise half-measures. Evidently convinced that a sudden attack at full speed would do the trick, he raised his arm. All the drivers began revving their engines. Grebner gave the signal, and all the vehicles accelerated forward. Puma armoured cars, the latest version of the eight-wheeler, led the way, followed by open half-tracks, and finally Opel Blitz trucks, with only sandbags as protection for the soldiers on board. A signaller up in an attic shouted, Armoured cars coming across the bridge! Frost experienced an irrational surge of hope that this might be the vanguard of thirty corps arriving ahead of time, but he was swiftly disabused. He and his men watched in fascination as the column had to slow down to weave its way through the burned-out trucks on the northern ramp. The paratroopers expected the leading vehicles to blow up on the necklace of anti-tank mines they had laid across the bridge, but the first four pumas, firing their fifty-millimeter guns and machine guns, accelerated away past them into the town. Determined to make up for their slow start, Frost's paratroopers finally reacted with every rifle, Bren, and Sten gun available. The mortar platoon and the Vickers machine guns also opened up with devastating effect. The anti-tank gunners from the light regiment found their range, and the next seven vehicles were hit and set ablaze. Grebner's men, having never experienced a battle in such a confined space, tried to escape, but vehicles crashed into each other. A half-track backed into the one behind, and they became locked. The open half-tracks proved to be death-traps. Their ambushers were able to fire down and lob grenades into both the driver and panzer grenadier compartments. One tried to escape down the side bank of the ramp and smashed into the school building. Another crashed through a barrier and fell to the riverside road, which ran under the bridge. Some of those trapped on the bridge jumped from the parapet into the Nieder Rhine. Grebner himself is said to have been killed when he climbed out of his captured Humber armoured car to try to sort out the chaos. The smell of roasted flesh permeated the air for hours afterwards, mixed with the stench of the oily black smoke from the blazing vehicles. Grebner's body was never identified among all the other carbonized corpses. Lieutenant Todd up in the roof shouted down targets to the six-pounder anti-tank crew below. Several German infantrymen tried to cross the bridge, but from my OP I couldn't miss, he reported killed six as they tried to cross the roadblock along the banister of the bridge. Then someone spotted me. A sniper's bullet came through the window and glanced off my helmet, but glass and splinters from the window were in my eyes and face. Todd was taken down to the aid station in the cellar. The paratrooper who took over his position in the roof was wearing his maroon beret instead of a helmet. A German sniper saw it and killed him. Mackay's sappers in the school building had no anti-tank weapons, so they could do no more than fire their personal weapons and throw grenades down into the backs of half-tracks. At one point, mortar shells began to fall on the school, but Mackay quickly realized that they were being fired at by one of their own teams. "'Cease fire, you stupid bastards!' he yelled. "'We're over here!' Major Lewis in the same building recorded that they could hear a badly wounded German soldier, who must have crawled from one of the burning half-tracks, calling for his mother. They could not see him, but the calls went on for most of the day and half the night, until he fell silent. It was a ghostly feeling, Lewis recalled. Once the furious firing had died down, a defiant, Whoa, Mohammed!" rang out. 
This was the first parachute brigade's war cry from North Africa. Soon it was reverberating all around that bridge, Mackay recorded. It would follow almost every engagement from then on, because it was also a good way of establishing which buildings the defenders still held. When the cheering ended, all that could be heard was a siren howling away. "'Will we be getting overtime for this, sir?' called a platoon joker. "'The whistle's just gone.' After only a short pause, the Germans launched another attack from the opposite direction, with infantry, several half-tracks, and intense mortar fire. The Piat teams and anti-tank gun crews accounted for another four armoured vehicles, but the desperate calls for stretcher-bearers indicated a heavy toll of British casualties, too. When there were not enough stretchers, the wounded were carried on doors, ripped from their hinges to the cellar under brigade headquarters. It began to fill rapidly. The two doctors, Captains Logan and Wright, and their orderlies were overwhelmed with work, but there was no hope of evacuating any wounded to sixteen para-field ambulance in the St. Elizabeth Hospital. The dead were stacked in a yard behind brigade headquarters. Colonel Frost wondered how on earth they were going to feed their increasing bag of prisoners. One of them, held in the cellars of the government building, was identified as a Hauptsturmführer in the 9th Panzerdivision, Hohenstaufen. Frost went down to ask him what the SS Panzer Divisions were doing in Arnhem. "'I thought you were supposed to be finished after the Falaise Gap,' Frost said. The SS officer replied that they might have received a good beating there. they had been refitting around Appledorn. We are the first instalment, he told Frost confidently, and you can expect more. Although firing died away from time to time, any movement between houses could be dangerous, with German riflemen constantly waiting for targets. British paratroopers noted that German marksmanship was very bad in the initial engagements, perhaps because they were so tense. The Malta platoon commander at the top of the building with the Vickers machine guns was able to work out the ranges easily from a map. He soon had his three-inch mortars below in the weapon pits, dropping their bombs on the German vehicles gathered at the south end of the bridge. Through his binoculars he could watch several direct hits with fierce satisfaction at such a successful stonk. But by the afternoon, Knaus Kampfgruppe, including the Panzer Company from Bielefeld, had assembled just to the east of the bridge ramp, in a dairy on the west of Wurzedeich. Using that street and the one parallel running along the line, they attacked houses held by Digby Tatham Mortar's A Company. Although they seized two buildings and penetrated onto the bridge, Naust was clearly shaken on losing three out of his four company commanders in the savage battle. What with the fighting at the bridge, several British groups besieged close to the centre, 
and a major battle developing west of the St. Elizabeth Hospital, the city of Arnhem had become even more of a battleground than many of its inhabitants realized. Those in the northern part of Arnhem had no idea of what was happening in the center and towards the bridge. They assumed that the fighting that they could hear was south of the Niederrhein. Those who went off to try to buy bread returned rapidly, looking as white as death because of the shooting in the streets. Many buildings, including the two barracks, the Wilhelmskaserne and the Sachsen Weimarkaserne, as well as the big Wehrmacht depot, were still on fire. Much of the town centre was also blazing. What sounded like heavy rain turned out to be the crackle of flames, one man wrote. The Germans, convinced that enemy spotters or snipers were in the huge tower of St. Eusebius, known as the Grotekirk, kept shooting at it. The company of the 21st Panzergrenadiers even began firing at the tower with their 75mm anti-tank gun. The noise it made in these narrow streets was deafening. The reverberations seemed to go on endlessly. Several people saw the hands of the large clock on the church spin round crazily, as if time were racing by. From Den Brink round to the grim façade of the St. Elizabeth Hospital and beyond, the Germans had the advantage of the high ground. The first and third parachute battalions struggled in vain to depose them. To make matters worse, as they tried to attack north around the Y junction, they were exposed to the fire of German flak batteries positioned on the south bank of the Niederrhein. And ahead of them, a German Mark IV panzer, an assault gun or an armoured car would emerge to shell them, then pull back quickly as soon as they saw a six-pounder anti-tank gun deployed. A platoon commander in the 1st Battalion was at first encouraged by their progress. Advancing on high ground, he jotted in his diary, ordered to capture the hill in front, with houses and a wool factory with high chimneys. Got to houses. Had a good shoot from a house, still occupied by screaming Dutch. What a row. Little girl about ten years of age from another house, hit, shot in thigh. My medics attended to her, but we had to hold the mother off as she went berserk. Huns running. But then the attack flagged, and the reinforced Germans came back. Hit by a sniper, and then by a machine gun. Platoon commanders were suffering a terrible attrition rate. Under fire from across the river, wrote another. Cut off. German grenade in the arm and in the eye. It was just like being stabbed with a red-hot needle. I was very frightened because I thought I was blind. There were many grisly sights. Smoke and fire darkened the streets. Broken glass and broken vehicles and debris littered the road. A paratrooper with the 1st Battalion described the smouldering body of a lieutenant ahead of them. A tracer bullet had ignited the phosphorus bomb in one of his pouches, and he had burned to death. A distraught father was seen pushing a handcart with the body of a child. A dead civilian in blue overalls lay in the gutter, the water from a burst main lapping gently around his body. There were also bizarre moments in the middle of this battle. A Dutchman stepped out of his house and asked two British soldiers in English if they would like a cup of tea. A little further back along the route they had come, the bodies of British paratroopers lay everywhere, many of them behind trees or poles, Albert Horseman of the Arnhem Underground recorded. He then saw a man about middle-aged who wore a hat. This man went to every dead soldier, lifted his hat, and stood in silence for a few seconds. There was something terribly Chaplinesque about the scene, Horseman concluded. The confused fighting meant that there were many stragglers from both the 1st and 3rd para-battalions. Regimental Sergeant Major John C. Lord, an imposing mustachioed grenadier recruited by Boy Browning and known as Lord Jesus Christ by the paratroopers, was trying to get a grip on the situation round the St. Elizabeth Hospital when struck by a German bullet. It felt exactly like I had been hit in the arm by a hammer, he recorded. The impact spun him round, and he landed flat on his back. My arm was paralysed and bleeding badly, but strangely enough it did not hurt. Lord was carried into the hospital, where he soon acquired a deep admiration for the professionalism and good humour of the nurses. None of them had opted to leave, even while the battle raged round the hospital, and the building was hit by heavy flak shells from across the river. One of the German nuns was spoon-feeding a ninety-year-old man when his head was literally severed by a shell, 
which must have passed within millimeters of the nun. Frozen in horrified disbelief, she sat there staring with the plate still in her hand. Because of the heavy firing, Dutch doctors began transferring their civilian patients to the Diakonissen House, a clinic outside the battleground. To identify themselves, they wore sheets and helmets painted white with a red cross. Sister van Dijk thought they looked like crusaders. Soon after midday, a still optimistic Petrick estimated that Frost's force at the bridge was only around 120 strong. The British may have suffered a lot of casualties that morning, but the Frunsberg was not going to destroy them as quickly as he had hoped. At the road bridge, Tony Hibbert, the brigade major, suggested that in Lathbury's absence, Lieutenant Colonel Frost should become acting brigade commander, while his second-in-command should take over the battalion. They hoped that this would be a very temporary measure. One of Frost's radio operators picked up the net of thirty corps. The signal sounded so strong that they assumed they could not be very far off. Frost and his officers imagined that the arrival of the Guard's armoured division was only a matter of hours away. Chapter 13 Arnhem, the Second Lift, Monday the 18th of September Divisional headquarters had spent the night by the landing ground beyond Wolfhäser, with little idea of what was happening. At dawn there was still no sign of General Urquhart, nor any report about where he might be, so his chief of staff, Colonel Mackenzie, and his fellow officers decided to move towards Arnhem. They assumed that Urquhart had spent the night with the 1st Parachute Brigade headquarters. Mackenzie was not too concerned, but the lack of radio contact and information troubled him. Mackenzie and the chief artillery officer, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Loder Simmons, went in search of Brigadier Hicks, whom they found just after 0600 hours in a house on the Utrechtsweg. They persuaded him to take over command of the division until Urquhart or Lathbury reappeared. Hicks also agreed to their recommendation that he should push another battalion through to reinforce Frost's second battalion at the bridge. They suggested sending the 2nd Battalion, the South Staffordshire Regiment, forward, even though it lacked two companies. The rest could follow on as soon as they landed by glider. A further reinforcement in the push to break through to the bridge could be the 11th Parachute Battalion from Hackett's 4th Parachute Brigade, which was due to drop at ten hundred hours. The 11th Battalion was chosen because its dropping zone was the closest to Arnhem. Well aware of Brigadier Hackett's volatile temperament, Mackenzie knew that he would not take this well, nor the news that Hicks, to whom Hackett was senior, had taken command of the division. Hicks himself did not welcome his temporary promotion. It was a bad moment, because the officer in line to replace him at the head of First Air Landing Brigade had fallen to pieces, simply lost his nerve. Another colonel had to be found from divisional headquarters. Hicks found the situation at divisional headquarters somewhat confusing with missing commanders, bad communications, and a lack of clarity about the situation. The only certainty was that the German reaction had been quick and fierce. It was one of the worst few hours I have ever spent in my life, Hicks admitted later. The Staffords did not set off until 0930 hours. There seemed to have been no great sense of urgency, because they followed the standard routine of fifty minutes marching to ten minutes rest. They lost several men from strafing Messerschmitts on their way through Osterbeek, and later, when they reached the railway embankment defended by Miller's Pioneer Battalion, they suffered rather more casualties. Then, just like their predecessors, they had to switch to the lower road close to the Neder Rhein, and they also came under heavy German fire from Den Brink. They were not to make contact with the 1st and 3rd Parachute Battalions near the St. Elizabeth Hospital until nearly 1900 hours that evening. Moving that morning with divisional headquarters towards Osterbeek was the USAAF officer, Lieutenant Bruce E. Davis, of the 306th Fighter Control Squadron. His role was to task Allied aircraft in support of ground troops. About 10.30 we spotted some 60 planes flying quite high, he reported later. Thinking they were typhoons, we tried to contact them by VHF to have them make a recce for us. We were a bit humiliated, or rather prostrated, when instead they suddenly dove and came in strafing, turning out to be ME-109s. 
and the other two battalions still defending the landing and drop zones for the arrival of the second lift, the King's Own Scottish Borderers and the Border Regiment, were already under attack by dawn. Since they were spread over a large area and surrounded by woods, they found it almost impossible to defend the zones effectively. A company of the Border Regiment at Rinkum had to withdraw into a brickworks when surrounded by the Schiffstamm Abteilung 10. The commander, Fregatten Kapitän Ferdinand Kaiser, complained that his men were armed with old Mauser rifles and a French Hotchkiss machine gun from the First World War. Their Kampfgruppe leader, Obersturmbahn Führer Lippert, came to see him during this engagement when a mortar shell exploded close to them. I flew into a bush hit in the thigh by a piece of shrapnel. An SS man, who received a whole splinter salad in the face, screamed loudly that he couldn't see anything. Everyone else was unscathed. Kaiser was evacuated to the German military hospital in Appledorn, where surgeons were operating for twenty-four hours at a stretch. It was atrocious, he recounted. The border company, heavily outnumbered, had to escape later, having lost six jeeps and both its anti-tank guns. To their north ran Ginkel Heath. A company of the Scottish borderers was attacked at dawn by a company of Heller's SS Wachbataillon Nordwest. An isolated platoon, out of radio contact, was cut off and forced to surrender. As a result, these Dutch SS were in position to fire directly at Hackett's 4th Parachute Brigade when it dropped later in the day. Another company of the borderers fared better, knocking out a half-track with the first round from one of their six-pounder anti-tank guns. By mid-morning, even battalion headquarters staff were taking part in bayonet charges to push back German marauders. Adrian Beckmeyer, a Dutch commando officer attached to their intelligence section, found himself in heavy fighting. One of Beckmeyer's tasks was to interrogate enemy captives. He was ashamed to discover that there were many Dutchmen. He identified them as Heller's SS Wachbataillon from Amersfoort. One of the prisoners was a Hauptsturmführer Fernau, who had been a servant of the former Kaiser at Dorn. Around eleven hundred hours, both battalions survived strafing attacks from Jagdeschwader II fighters, but tracer rounds started dangerous fires on the heathland where the paratroopers and gliders were to land. The Luftwaffe's belated entry into battle that morning had been accelerated by Hitler's fury at its unimpressive performance the day before. Footnote. The Luftwaffe chief of staff described another Hitlerian rant that morning. The Führer becomes violent with rage about the failure of the Luftwaffe, wants to know immediately how many and what fighter forces are committed for the defense of Holland. My telephone call to Luftwaffe Reich revealed that only minor forces were committed. The Führer used my report as an excuse for the severest reprimands. The entire Luftwaffe, which is incompetent and cowardly, had deserted him. End of footnote. Some three hundred Messerschmitt ME-109s and Focke-Wulf 190s were allocated. Most of them, however, were held back, with pilots sitting strapped in their cockpits, waiting for a radio signal from the besieged garrison in Dunkirk to warn them of another airborne armada approaching. The weather was clear, but because there was no radio contact with Browning's headquarters, Brigadier Hicks had no idea that bad visibility in England had delayed their departure. General Brereton had warned Eisenhower that, Weather in the United Kingdom is often different from weather on the continent, which was another reason why the airborne bases should have been moved to France. The hours literally dragged by, Hicks recorded. The wait was made even more intolerable by the lack of clear information on the situation at the bridge and the fighting round the St. Elizabeth Hospital. But a clear account would have been hard to come by in the confusion of the fighting. The hospital was taken by the Germans, who marched off most of the 16th Parachute Field Ambulance as prisoners, leaving only the surgical teams in place. The British reoccupied it in the evening, but failed to hold it for long. While the vanguard of the 3rd Parachute Battalion waited close to the St. Elizabeth Hospital for its other companies to catch up, the flag guns across the river, as well as mortar and small arms fire from the high ground above, forced them to take shelter. When pinned down in houses on the north side of the Utrechtsweg, the only response to the self-propelled assault guns trundling down the road was to hurl a gammon grenade from a window. Both Brigadier Lathbury and General Urquhart were also unable to move. 
They were in a house in the Alexanderstraat, which ran parallel to the Utrechtsweg, right up to the side of the St. Elizabeth Hospital. Only at fifteen hundred hours did the rest of the battalion catch up, bringing a Bren gun carrier full of much-needed ammunition. Major Peter Waddy was killed as he insisted on helping to unload it. The officer casualty rate was alarming and contributed greatly to the confusion later. Colonel Fitch, still determined to reach the bridge, decided that the only chance was to attack to the north and move along the railway line, but the intensity of German firepower forced back any attempt. With reckless bravery, Lathbury and Urquhart appeared in the open, hoping to find a way forward. A burst of machine-gun fire caught Lathbury in the thigh. Urquhart and two other officers dragged him to a small house where a courageous local couple took them in. A German appeared in the doorway a moment later. Urquhart managed to draw his service pistol rapidly and fired two rounds into him. They carried Lathbury down into the cellar of the house, then Urquhart and the two other officers slipped out of the back entrance. Their escape did not take them away from the Germans. In fact, it had trapped them. The commander of the 1st Airborne Division, burning with impatience and frustration, would have to spend the second night of the battle hiding in an attic. Even though 16 Para Field Ambulance was still operating in the St. Elizabeth Hospital, the fighting all around made it almost impossible to evacuate any more wounded there. A solution had to be found further back in Osterbeek. Hendrika van der Vlist, whose father owned the Hotel Schonort, described how a British doctor arrived in a jeep. He asked straight out, Can you turn this hotel into a hospital within an hour? She explained that it was in a terrible mess from the Germans using it as a billet. He told her to recruit people off the street if necessary. When they heard, neighbors hurried to help clean the place. An hour later, patients began to be brought in on stretchers. Straw and mattresses were put down in the small salon, and rows of beds erected in the large salon. The Hotel Schonort was a long, low building of two stories, facing the Arnhem Road. On either side of the main entrance were large glass-fronted rooms, normally in use as dining room and bar lounge. The 181st Air Landing Field Ambulance from Hicks's Brigade took over both the Schonort and the Hotel Tafelberg, which Modell had abandoned the day before. The Tafelberg became the surgical annex, with portable operating tables set up in offices. The Schonort was only three hundred meters from divisional headquarters in the Hotel Hartenstein, but its prominent position beside the Utrechtsvig would render it very vulnerable later. Other young Dutch women helped in any way they could, even though some of the patients were so disfigured by their wounds that it was hard to look at them. They lit cigarettes for them, which was usually their first request while the second was to take down a letter for their families as best they could in English. The letter-writers could not help crying when it became clear that the most gravely hit were dictating their farewell. Among the first casualties brought in were those from an improvised aid centre in a warehouse down by the river, which had been hit by a strike from a Nebelwerfer battery of multi-barreled mortars on the southern bank. While Urquhart remained absent from his division, SS Brigadefuhrer Hamel had returned that morning from Berlin to the Frunsberg Forward Command Post at Velp on the eastern edge of Arnhem. Thank God you're back, was how he claims his acting chief of staff greeted him. Bittrich had been giving orders to the Frunsberg in Hamel's absence. Hamel rang Bittrich, then went to see Standartenfuhrer Harzer at the Hohenstaufen Command Post in North Arnhem. Pulling rank over the more junior Harzer, who was briefing him on the situation, Hamel suddenly said, I'm ordered to go down to Nijmegen with my division. Do you have the bridge open yet? Get rid of those Tommies, Hartzer. Me? Hartzer claims to have replied. I'm seeing to it that the paratroopers don't get into Arnhem. I don't have time to take care of the bridge at the same time. Hartzer was clearly taken aback to find that Hamel still did not have a clear idea of their respective responsibilities and had to explain the situation clearly again. Hamel was particularly angry at Grebner's wild goose chase with the Hohenstaufen Reconnaissance Battalion towards Nijmegen, because after it had been totally shot to pieces on the bridge, Bittrich then told his division to hand over its Reconnaissance Battalion to the 9th Hohenstaufen. He found Grebner's conduct utterly inexplicable, and now the burning half-tracks are distributed the whole length of the bridge and are blocking the width of the carriageway. 
He went off in an armoured vehicle to have a look at the fighting for the north end of the bridge. I could see a dead soldier lying there, whom we had not been able to remove because he was in the English line of fire. There were a lot of snipers. I decided that the only way to take care of them was by using heavy guns on the houses. There was artillery there, and I ordered them to fire, starting right under the gables and shooting metre by metre until the house collapsed. German artillery at that moment in central Arnhem consisted of a single 150 millimetre gun. Its crew started against the buildings on the west side of the wide Eusebius Binnensingel, which led to the bridge. It was the best and the most effective artillery fire I have ever seen, the young Panzergrenadier Horst Weber recorded. They shot metre by metre, starting from the top. Buildings would finally collapse like dolls' houses. Frost started thinking of ways to mount a sudden raid to knock the gun out, when a lucky shot from either a howitzer or a mortar killed the crew and rendered the gun unserviceable. Another threat was the arrival of German 40 mm flag guns south of the river. They proceeded to destroy the roofs of the building from where the Vickers machine guns controlled the bridge. It was not long before the building itself caught fire, and the machine gun platoon had to escape to find new positions. Yet the 75 mm howitzers of the light regiment were still being directed onto their targets by Major Munford, acting as a forward observation officer. He had been careful when ranging in to keep their fire on the approaches and away from the bridge itself, which they needed intact for 30 corps. After a long wait out by the landing and drop zones, aero engines could finally be heard just before 1400 hours. A cry of relief went up. They're here! The 127 C-47 Dakotas carrying Hackett's 4th Parachute Brigade were heading for Hinkle Heath, which the King's Own Scottish Borderers were struggling to defend. Another 261 gliders, having dropped their tow ropes, headed for the landing zones. They were bringing the rest of the divisional headquarters and its personnel, together with vehicles, the rest of the Light Regiment Royal Artillery, part of the Polish Anti-Tank Squadron, and the remainder of the Air Landing Brigade, including the last companies of the South Staffords. They were followed by another thirty-one RAF Sterlings to drop supplies. The greatly increased Luftwaffe presence kept the RAF's 259 Spitfires, Tempest, Mustangs and Mosquitoes busy, even though there were fewer flak batteries to knock out on the second day. The 8th Air Force clashed with 90 Messerschmitt 109s, losing 18 aircraft, while the RAF lost six. Airborne casualties in the crossing had been comparatively light, but the drop and the landing operation received a much warmer reception than we did on the preceding day, Lieutenant Davis noted. His American team was still trying to contact Allied aircraft on VHF, but without any success. Having worked out where the follow-up drop zones would be, the Germans had redeployed all available flak guns. The paratroopers preparing to jump felt a sickening lurch every time a flag shell exploded nearby. Captain Frank King, in the 11th Parachute Battalion, recounted how, as they approached in their C-47, he noticed that the American crew chief had fallen asleep, slumped back with his chin on his chest. He moved over to shake him and found the man was dead. There was a hole in the fuselage behind him. King stood in the doorway and noticed that the other aircraft in their formation were gaining altitude while theirs was not. Then he saw that one of the engines was on fire. He turned and shouted to Company Sergeant Major Gatland at the other end of the stick, We're on fire! Check with the pilot! As Gatland opened the door to the cockpit, a blast of flame came through and he slammed it shut. King ordered the stick to jump immediately and led the way. They were in a shallow dive only some two hundred feet up, which meant that their chutes hardly had time to open. Most of them suffered severe jarring as they hit the ground at speed. One man's chute did not open at all. Major Blackwood, also with the 11th Battalion, kept a detailed diary. At 13.55 the pilot gave me the red light, and I ordered action stations. I had a good but not comforting view from my position at the door. Black was now dangerously close. We passed over a wood at some fifteen hundred feet, and the whole edge of that wood erupted into flame. Holes appeared in the port wing, but with no material effect. Two of our battalion planes were hit about now, and went down in flames. Even though they flew into a barrage of fire, the pilots were flying magnificently in formation. 
I got my green light at fourteen ten hours. I gave my stick a final hidey high and heard their yelp as I jumped. But the jerk of the chute opening tore Lucy's weapon bundle, and he lost his sten gun, magazines, two twenty-four hour ration packs, and toilet kit. I watched it crash to earth. Footnote. Each twenty-four hour ration pack contained meat cubes, concentrated oatmeal, boiled sweets, plain chocolate, cigarettes, benzedrine tablets, and a powder of tea leaves, sugar, and dried milk, ready mixed for the addition of hot water. End footnote. He then noticed that his parachute contained a modicum of bullet holes. They were under fire from a German machine gun at the edge of the wood, and mortar shells were falling. Men were coming down dead in the harness, and others were hit before they could extricate themselves. Blackwood sent his men into action as soon as they were on their feet to attack the Dutch SS. Young Morris gleefully brought in a sniper about twice his size, he noted. German fire also caused casualties on landing zone X, two kilometers west of Wolfhise. Several gliders were set ablaze, confirming their nickname of Matchboxes. The glider pilot Padre, the Reverend G. A. Pear, seized a Red Cross flag and ran out into the open accompanied by stretcher-bearers. Five of the gliders were just ashes. Bodies could be seen on the grass. The first man was dead. Another groaned in thankfulness. I moved to the next body. I waved my hand, and the jeep came out of the wood with the other bearers. The casualties had all been shot in the bag as they tried to get to shelter. None of the gliders had been unloaded. The last man I came to was beside a dead body. I found to my astonishment that he was not wounded, but prostrate with grief at the death of his pal, and was unwilling to leave him. I spoke rather sharply to him, and a bearer assisted him off. On the heath, with its sandy tracks, Staff Sergeant Les Freter saw a burned-out jeep, and next to it what looked like a charred sack of flour. He prodded it with his foot, and then recoiled in horror when he saw it was a human torso. One glider had tipped onto its nose, and the vehicle inside crushed the pilot and co-pilot, who were still alive but completely trapped. They could be given shots of morphine, but later it was said that since nothing could be done to release them, there was no alternative. Someone shot one or both of them to put them out of their misery. Apparently a major in the South Staffords was also found lying with his legs shredded in a glider crash, and he too begged to be shot. There were similar gruesome episodes on the drop zone. A platoon commander in the 156th Battalion had been hit by 20 millimeter tracer bullets, and by the time his soldiers reached him, smoke was coming from his chest wounds. He was in such terrible pain that he begged them to shoot him, so he handed him his cocked pistol, one of them recounted, and he shot himself. Thanks to that morning's fires on the heathland and German mortar fire, ammunition canisters were exploding just after they landed. At the battalion rendezvous point, Major John Waddy was told by his company sergeant major that one of his platoon commanders, Lieutenant John Davidson, had not arrived. It appeared that Davidson, who broke his leg very badly when landing on a patch of the heather which was ablaze, had shot himself before the fire ignited the phosphorus grenades he was carrying. A number of paratroopers whose shoots had caught in the tops of trees on the far side of the heath became helpless targets for Hiller's Dutch SS. The five Polish anti-tank gun crews who landed by glider were determined to get into action as soon as possible. They had not even been distracted at the airfield near Salisbury when young waffs had smiled at them when handing out rations. They are young and pretty, a Polish paratrooper wrote in his diary. We are young too but our only thoughts are focused on the fact that we have had no report on the first contingent landing. Pathfinders from the 21st Independent Parachute Company remained at the landing grounds to help the new arrivals and to kill Germans. A British member of the company was struck by the hatred of one of our German Jews as he emptied a whole Sten magazine into a German. There were reasons for harshness round Kinkel Heath. Sergeant Stanley Sullivan found three young boys between the ages of twelve and fourteen, all dead, lying spread-eagled on the ground wearing orange armbands, probably victims of the SS Guard Battalion from Amersfoort in their own civil war. A Dutch officer attached to Hackett's headquarters was angry to see British soldiers giving cigarettes to some Dutch SS, traitors all, whom they were guarding. 
A Polish liaison officer was equally irritated. When one of the prisoners complained loudly about something, he strode over and threatened him into instant silence. The Pathfinder commander, the middle-aged but extremely tough Major Bob Wilson, described how his men heard Germans shouting from the adjoining wood, calling on them to surrender. They shouted back that they were too frightened, and would they come and get them? Sixty Germans came out, and they were mowed down by two Brens firing from a distance of about one hundred and fifty yards. They died screaming. A German loudspeaker van moved up and started playing music. A voice announced that a panzer division was advancing towards them, that their commanding general had been captured, and that they would be treated well if they surrendered. Somebody managed to silence it with a piat bomb. There were lighter moments. Major John Waddy recounted how they captured a soldier in German uniform just after landing. We were interrogating them in painful schoolboy German, and after five minutes he asked in perfect English, Do you speak English? He was a Pole. Colonel Mackenzie, Urquhart's chief of staff, found Hackett on the landing zone and told him straight out that Hicks had taken over. Look here, Charles, Hackett replied. I am senior to Hicks and should therefore assume command of the division. I quite understand, sir, Mackenzie replied, but the general did give me the order of succession, and furthermore Brigadier Hicks has been here twenty-four hours and is much more familiar with the situation. Urquhart's failure before leaving England to inform the brigadiers of his designated successor now proved an unnecessary distraction. He had given priority to Hicks because he had more experience handling infantry battalions on the ground than Hackett, the dashing young cavalryman. Hackett was also unhappy that he had not been consulted in advance about the transfer of the 11th Battalion, but seemed to accept the arrangement. Mackenzie then went to the Hotel Hartenstein and went upstairs to get some rest. Half an hour later he was told that he had better come downstairs, because the two brigadiers, Hicks and Hackett, were having a flaming row. Mackenzie, prepared to support Hicks entirely, found that the storm was over. Hackett had vented his irritation and accepted the new status quo. The 11th Parachute Battalion did not set off quite as smartly as it might have done towards Arnhem along the Amstertamsavik. Stuart Mawson, the battalion doctor, was called to tend to Major Richard Lonsdale, the second-in-command and a formidable warrior. But Lonsdale, who had been badly wounded in the hand while still in the aircraft, was more interested in looking at the map. Mawson warned him that he might lose the use of his hand if it were not treated properly, but Lonsdale told him to stop flapping around like a wet hen, and showed no interest. To try to persuade him to regard his wound from a medical point of view, Mawson wrote, was as useless as passing a bottle of milk round the sergeant's mess. According to Major Blackwood, the 11th Battalion did not move off towards Arnhem until dusk, picking up en route our transport and anti-tank guns, which had landed very successfully by glider. We had little opposition in this phase, bar snipers, and could appreciate the Esquire nude by Vargas, which some cheerful idiot had pinned to a tree with a couple of bayonets. Other sources indicate an earlier departure at around 1,700 hours, but that was still nearly three hours after landing. The rest of Hackett's brigade, the 156th and the 10th battalions, were no quicker departing, partly due to the chaos of the landing ground on Rencom Heath, where it was proving very difficult to extricate jeeps from smashed gliders. Casualties needed to be treated, and the field ambulance escorted eastwards. Mawson noted that his patients seemed more surprised about their wounds than hurt. Hackett pointed out that he had lost two hundred men, either in the air or on landing, which represented a tenth of his brigade strength before the battle had even started. Yet Urquhart's absence and the row between the two brigadiers was presumably also a factor in the delay. The tenth battalion soon followed the 156th along the railway tracks towards Arnhem. The plan was to force their way forward between the railway line and the Amsterdamsovich to the north, seizing the high ground at Kuppel. Things were no better ahead. The first and third parachute battalions had suffered significant losses and were tied down just west of the St. Elizabeth Hospital. Those who had not been there, including the two brigadiers back at the Hotel Hartenstein in Osterbeck, had no idea what a choke point the area offered for the Germans to trap troops trying to fight their way into Arnhem. 
On the far side of the Arnhem Road bridge, German troops began searching houses in this southern extension of the town. They were clearly on edge, and this made them dangerous. Most of the German infantry were no older than seventeen or eighteen, smoking heavily with great bravado, one of the inhabitants stated. Some looked nervously around. An older soldier came walking up with about five of these children, pale and upset. They followed him like dogs. You could really see that these boys were totally dependent on this older man. Five German soldiers and a Feldwebel came into the garden of a neighbor and ordered me and four other men up against a wall. They told us we would be shot, as they had been fired on from the direction of our houses. A neighbor of mine, who was rather german orientated started talking to the Feldwebel. He raised two fingers and claimed under oath that nobody had been shooting from our block. The soldiers left, and we were deeply relieved. Around the British perimeter at the north end of the bridge, the morale of the young Panzer Grenadiers was high, even if they were still frightened underneath. We were raring to fight, Horst Weber recorded. The Panzer Grenadiers were helmeted, heavily armed with their MP-40 submachine guns and grenades, and wearing their Waffen-SS camouflage smocks, similar to the British airborne ones, but more leopardy-looking, as an English sergeant put it. They had been encouraged by the dejected expressions of the locals as they marched in. A short while before, the Dutch had greeted the British like victors, Weber said proudly. Now they scurried away as we approached. But in retrospect, he had to confess, we were only little boys playing at being soldiers. We were idiots. But we were absolutely convinced that we would win. In the late afternoon, the 10th SS Reconnaissance Battalion, a far weaker force than Gribner's, arrived to join the battle at the bridge. The fighting in this part of the city increased in severity every hour, SS Brigade Führer Hamel wrote. The enemy appeared to be excellently trained in street and house-to-house -house fighting, and defended his rapidly established pockets of resistance with great determination. Nightfall brought only a temporary relief to the British defenders. Colonel Frost went round, visiting the different houses. He told the men that they could expect thirty corps to arrive the next day. Some considered it our most enjoyable battle, as they recounted to each other how many Germans they had killed that day. But there was little opportunity for rest. The Germans managed to set fire to the school on the east side of the ramp that night. Mackay's sappers and Lewis's men fought it with fire extinguishers, and even had to beat at the flames with their parachute smocks. It took them until the early hours to bring the blaze under control. For the rest of the night, the flickering light from other fires made sentries jumpy. Chapter 14 The American Divisions and Thirty Corps, Monday the 18th of September Frost's assurance to his men that Thirty Corps would be with them by Tuesday was sadly far off the mark. The Irish Guards group, convinced by Brigadier Guatkin's mistaken notion that they need not hurry until the bridge at Son was rebuilt, moved out of Valkensvard at what Joe Vandeleur himself described as a leisurely pace. The Germans, on the other hand, were still rushing in reinforcements. General Oberst Kurzstudent claimed credit for concentrating against the 101st Airborne on the Enhoven sector. The first major formation to be brought in, General Lieutenant Walter Popper's 59th Infantry Division, arrived by rail at Boxtel. This was just ten kilometers northwest of Best, where Lieutenant Wierzbowski's platoon was so dangerously isolated on the bank of the Wilhelmina Canal. The 59th was very far from a full-strength division. The advance guard had five battalions of fewer than two hundred men each. Their horse-drawn artillery was following on behind by night marches to avoid Allied aircraft. The division's rear guard was still being brought across the Scheldt, and most of their ammunition had been left behind in the Breskin's pocket south of the Scheldt estuary. The whole division had no more than a hundred rounds of 105 mm ammunition. Montgomery's failure to secure the north side of the estuary had allowed the Germans to extricate almost all of the 15th Army for use against the left flank of Operation Market Garden. During the night, Captain Jones, the commander of Company H, had sent out several patrols to contact Wierzbowski, but each one came up against heavy resistance. Lieutenant Colonel Cole, the commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion, was convinced that Wierzbowski's platoon and the engineers had all been wiped out. 
They've been annihilated without a doubt, he told his executive officer. The coming of dawn allowed Wierzbowski a glimpse of their surroundings. They were very close to the concrete road bridge, and they could just see the railroad bridge some three hundred meters beyond. Close to the road bridge was a German barracks, surrounded by trenches and gun pits. The moment any of Wierzbowski's men raised his head, a fusillade followed immediately. They spotted some Germans trying to steal up on them from some trees. Wierzbowski told his men to hold their fire until the last moment, and then they caused carnage. At about ten hundred hours, a German officer arrived in a car. He issued some orders, then left. Soon afterwards, there was a massive explosion. The Germans had now blown the bridge at best. The American paratroopers had to duck down in their foxholes as chunks of concrete rained down. With the radio out of action, Wirtzbowski could not warn either Captain Jones or battalion headquarters. By then, many of his men were wounded, and though they could be patched up by their medic, there was no prospect of evacuating them. To make matters worse, they were then strafed by their own P-47 Thunderbolts, whose pilots ignored the orange smoke grenade they set off to identify themselves. Yet in the course of the day, Wirtzbowski and his men managed to inflict far more casualties on the Germans than they had suffered themselves. His bazooka team even managed to knock out one of the 88mm guns along the canal. In the afternoon they heard vehicle engines and assumed they were German reinforcements. Instead, they were thrilled to see on the other side of the canal a British armoured car and a scout car from the Household Cavalry Regiment. This half-troop scared off the nearest Germans with machine gun fire. Shouting across the canal, Wirtzbowski asked them to contact the 101st Airborne by radio to warn them that the bridge had been destroyed, but the armored car radio operator could not raise them. Instead, the corporal of horse in charge reported back to his own squadron, asking the message to be relayed to the Americans. Unable to evacuate Wirtzbowski's wounded, the household cavalry troop gave them all their medical supplies and spare ammunition, and these were ferried across in a dilapidated rowboat. Later, another platoon from Captain Jones's company appeared, and its commander, Lieutenant Nick Matala, agreed to dig in on the left flank of Wierzbowski's position. The British reconnaissance troop, assuming that the embattled platoon was now safe, moved on. But Wierzbowski's experience of encircled combat was far from over. Fortunately, three of his men made a prowl, during which they captured a German officer and two medics. They were put to work looking after the wounded, but there was still no plasma for those who had lost a lot of blood. The commander of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, Colonel John Michaelis, faced a major problem that day on his western flank round best, which went well beyond the suspected destruction of Wierzbowski's platoon. Wierzbowski's battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cole, had won the Medal of Honor in the fighting for Carentan in Normandy, against the 17th SS Panzergrenadier Division and Oberstleutnant von der Heiter's 6th Falschemjöcke Regiment. Famous for his temper as well as his kindness and bravery, Cole was known as the Cussing Colonel of Carentan. Cole's battalion was tied down in the Sonsia Forest between Son and Best, so Michaelis sent the 2nd Battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Steve Chapuis to help extricate it. The Germans at this point had caught us in some open ground one of Chapuis' company commanders wrote, and pulled a brilliant strategic move, practically pinning the two battalions down. The second battalion was in regimental reserve, and we pulled out to attempt to outflank the Germans. But Chapuis soon found that advancing across such open and flat countryside was hard going without tank or artillery support. The Dutch had been haymaking, and the fields ahead were covered by these small piles of uncollected hay. That was the only cover, his report stated. They attacked by dashing from heap to heap, which offered minimal protection. Tracer bullets set the hay on fire, and many men were hit. The platoon leaders urged them on. Those who kept going usually managed to survive. Those who held back were killed. Chapuis eventually had to call it off, at least for the time being, because they were losing too many men. In a day and a half, fifty percent of our battalion were casualties, the battalion doctor recorded with a certain exaggeration. The true figure was close to half that. I had to put wounded men in zigzag trenches and give them plasma. The fighting was very nasty. 
He claimed that the Germans shot down a medic trying to carry a wounded man, and when they tried to evacuate patients by jeep with four litters, they fired at that too, even though the Red Cross was plainly marked on that jeep. Cole's force in the woods, meanwhile, was under heavy artillery fire, and Germans were starting to infiltrate their positions, despite the risk of being hit by their own guns. Cole needed air support, but a shell had just hit his radio operator in the head and blown his brains out. Cole went to the radio and wiped the blood and brains from it. It was still working. A strike of P-47 Thunderbolts was called in. Cole decided to check the recognition panels put out at the edge of the wood to identify their own position. He stepped out from the trees, put a hand up to shield his eyes as he searched the sky, and a single shot rang out from a house some two hundred meters away. The bullet, hitting him in the temple, went right through his head. A German was seen soon afterwards running from a corner of the house. He was gunned down, and Cole's men convinced themselves that they had at least got his killer. His men placed his body in a foxhole and covered it with an equipment chute. Chapuis's men had been forced to dig in where they were. We were in a slit trench in an open field, and I was on the machine gun when the Germans started attacking across the field. One fellow lost all his nerve and started to bang his head on the side of the trench and cry like a baby. The casualties mounted again. The battalion doctor established his aid station in a depression in the ground. When we had a patient needing plasma, we put him in the lowest part of the depression, because he could stand up there, holding the plasma bag, without being in the line of machine gun bullets that whipped through the trees from north and west. After such a battering, all the battalions could hope to do was hold on until the next morning and pray for relief. The detached 1st Battalion of the 502nd at St. Udenrode suspected that German forces were gathering to their west around Schindel, ready to attack. So Lieutenant Colonel Cassidy was furious that morning when seven jeeps charged through St. Udenrode, moving like bats out of hell. They were heading for Schindel and had not bothered to stop to inquire about the situation. The Germans were even closer than Cassidy imagined. The column of jeeps ran straight into an ambush just a couple of kilometers along the road. Only the last jeep of this party of war tourists managed to turn round in time and escape. It contained Colonel Cartwright of the 1st Allied Airborne Army, who ran back to tell Cassidy to send men immediately. They had to save the occupants of the other jeeps, who had thrown themselves into ditches beside the road and were tied down by machine-gun fire. Cassidy was outraged that their pure bull-headedness meant that he would have to sacrifice some of his men to get them out. Why in hell did you go up that road? he demanded. Cartwright replied that a guide had thought it was safe. Fortunately, one of Cassidy's platoons, commanded by Lieutenant Mewborn, had sighted the jeeps, two of which were blazing. They eventually managed to fight off the Germans in the ambush, and even drove two of the jeeps back. General Taylor, on a tour of inspection from Sohn, with his communist bodyguard from Princeton, had meanwhile reached St. Odenroda. When he heard what had happened, he told Cassidy, Don't send another man out on such a mission. Your assignment is to hold the town. Completely unaware of the desperate battle the 502nd was fighting round Best, Colonel Sink had left only a platoon and an engineer detail in Sohn, as the 506th marched fast due south to Eindhoven. Most of his regiment had crossed by the improvised footbridge, and several jeeps had been brought across by the raft made with oil drums. The 3rd Battalion, in the lead, came up against artillery, mortar, and rifle fire at Wunzel, on the northern edge of Eindhoven. Captain John W. Kiley was killed by a sniper in a church tower. A bazooka rocket then hit the tower and silenced the sniper. A Dutch policeman, who insisted on accompanying the 3rd Battalion, saw that people were cowering in the houses along the Wunzelsestraat. To the dismay of the paratroopers, he began shouting, These men are not Germans, but Americans, liberators! The last thing the advancing paratroopers wanted was people hurrying out of their houses to welcome them and shake their hands and kiss them, especially when they were involved in sporadic clashes with retreating Germans. The streets cleared only when a German 88mm gun in the Klosterdreif began firing. At 12.15 hours, a troop of the Household Cavalry Regiment, which had circumvented Alst and Eindhoven, met up with Colonel Sink in Wunzel. 
to pass back the news that they had met up with the Screaming Eagles, the patrol commander reported by radio, using his own regiment's nickname in the Guards' Armoured Division, Stable boys have contacted feathered friends. Footnote. British officers believed that their veiled speech, mostly using nicknames, cricketing metaphors and schoolboy slang, was impenetrable to German listening stations. All too often this was not the case. End footnote. Part of this troop then carried on along the southern bank of the Wilhelmina Canal towards Best, and they were the ones who helped Wietzbarski's platoon. Soon afterwards, thanks to the Dutch telephone service through German lines, an American major at Son provided all the bridge's dimensions for the Royal Engineers. Colonel Sink then ordered his 2nd Battalion round to the east, towards the city centre, to seize the bridges, but diverted one company to deal with the 88mm gun which was causing trouble. There turned out to be two. The company of paratroopers were guided by a local man who knew exactly where the guns were positioned. Just as the Americans were about to attack the first gun from two sides, Sergeant Taylor saw a woman gesturing to him urgently from a first-floor window. She signaled that three Germans were coming. Taylor, deeply relieved that they had not charged out at that moment, pulled back until they had gone past, and then took them prisoner from behind. A squad with rifle grenades, led by Lieutenant Hall, stalked the battery. They had no clear line of sight, but one of the rifle grenades struck home. Then a sixty-millimeter mortar, brought up without its base plate and just held steady between a paratrooper's legs, knocked out the second gun. Even before the wounded gun crews had been captured in a house just behind the battery, people were dancing in the Wunzelse marketplace. One inhabitant described how the crowd goes crazy and the boys, who are tired and sweaty, can hardly get through. They have to shake everyone's hand. One of Sink's officers wrote, Dutch civilians crowded round the troops, offering them apples, bottles of jam, and an occasional nib of gin. The reception was terrific. The air seemed to reek with hatred for the Germans. There were more running firefights, as American paratroopers continued to clear the town, which made celebrating civilians dive for cover. Members of the PAN, Partisan in Aci, Nederland, rapidly emerged, ready to help. People were amazed by their sudden appearance. Everywhere you look, you see men in blue overalls with armbands saying P.A.N. They carry a gun over their shoulders and charge around on motorcycles and in cars with flags. Any remaining German soldiers and NSB men were flushed out of houses and made to lie face down in the street. Soldiers from the Dutch army, forced to surrender in 1940, reappeared in their old uniforms, ready to guard prisoners. After four years... Four months and six days, we are liberated, an inhabitant wrote thankfully. The fact that they had been woken that morning to find there was no gas or electricity seemed petty in comparison. Colonel Sink had been deeply concerned that they might not have the city cleared in time for the guards' armoured division. Then at thirteen hundred hours, just before General Taylor arrived, he heard from Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Strayer of the 2nd Battalion that they had secured all four bridges over the Dommel and checked them for demolition charges. Taylor climbed a church steeple to get a better view of the city. He spoke to Colonel Strayer by radio. Where did you say you are? the divisional commander asked. Back came the triumphant reply. I'm sitting on all the bridges, General. Strayer's men had also captured the police station. The flags are out everywhere, a diarist recorded. A jubilant crowd, with orange scarves, paper hats, etc., a dancing in the road. Young men tore down the Wehrmacht signposts and levered off street names which had been changed by the occupiers. It was not long before a huge portrait of Princess Juliana hung outside the Hotel Royal, and photographs of the Dutch royal family appeared in windows. There were still odd nervous moments. Two paratroopers, who were enjoying the attention of several girls, while they kept a sharp lookout on the Augustina Drift, jerked into action on sighting a black uniformed figure approaching on a bicycle. Dr. J. P. Boyans, who was present, saw them raise their submachine guns and cried, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! That's a Dutch policeman! The paratroopers looked surprised for a moment. Okay, one of them said. I thought it was an SS. Boyans asked him what would have happened if he had not warned him. Oh, nothing much just a little hole between the eyes. 
He grinned. I'm a very good shot. After the long occupation, revenge was in the air. Major Dick Winters suddenly heard booing. He turned and saw a prostitute approaching them in a very suggestive way. And the people grabbed her, he recounted. And the last we saw of her, she was, I guess, setting for a haircut. Inhabitants of the city were amused to hear that earlier in the day the NSP Buchermeister had become terrified that he might be lynched. He and his wife went and asked for shelter at the Marichaussee Caserne, gendarmerie barracks. But on the way his bicycle was seized by a fleeing German soldier. At three o'clock, another diarist recorded, with screaming and shouting from the crowds, a whole group of NSP are collected and locked up in the school near the Jewish cemetery. More and more young men begged officers of the 101st to give them the weapons and uniforms of the dead and wounded so that they could continue the fight. The Americans were much less bureaucratic than the British in this way, and even though it was strictly against regulations, a number of civilians joined their ranks, a few even served with them right up to the end of the war. At 15.30 on that eventful afternoon, the second lift came in on the landing zone northeast of Son. The poet, Louis Simpson, serving in the 327th Leider Infantry Regiment, described their arrival. When we are over the landing area, the Leider pilot pulls the lever that releases the cable. For the first time, the kite has a character of its own. It soars like a bird. Then it travels on the air currents in silence. All that we hear is the creaking of struts. Then it slams down, tilting on one wing. Your life is in the hands of the pilots. There was a palpable sense of relief as the glider bumped along the field, then ground to a stop. The land is flat, and everywhere gliders are strewn, pointing in every direction, he wrote. Companies marched off hurriedly in open formation. On the horizon, a windmill, like a Dutch painting. Somewhere guns are rumbling. The sun is warm. Under your woolen shirt you begin to sweat. At dusk we entered a village. At the entrance a German tank had been blown apart. On it and under it were the blackened forms of the crew. They appeared vulcanized, melted. Through the crust of black gleamed streaks of ruby-red flesh. Simpson was intrigued by the mentality of the German soldier. I skirted a pit shaped like a grave. At the end of the pit stood a cross, from which hung an American helmet with a bullet hole through it. On the cross was written in Gothic lettering, Welcome, 101st Airborne Division. Crowds are strange. Imagine, in the press of battle, thinking up a trick like that and putting it into execution. Out of the 450 gliders which had taken off, towed by C-47 Dakotas, 428 reached the 101st landing zone. They did not just deliver the 327th Glider Infantry, but also two parachute field artillery battalions, an engineer battalion, and even a surgical team bringing in an X-ray machine. The 327th reported that, in some places, German soldiers could be seen lined up in columns firing at the gliders. Generally, their aim was poor, as they did not give enough lead but a number of light streaks began to filter through the rear of Colonel Harper's craft. Colonel Joseph H. Harper, the regimental commander, did not intend to take enemy fire sitting down, so he and his jeep driver fired back with their personal weapons from the glider. Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, Taylor's deputy commander, and the chief artilleryman of the 101st Airborne, came in with the 377th Parachute Field Artillery Battalion. He also had a young Walter Cronkite of United Press in his glider. Our helmets came flying off on impact, Cronkite wrote later with a touch of journalistic license, and were worse than the incoming shells. I grabbed a helmet, the trusty Musette bag with the typewriter inside, and began crawling toward the canal, which was the rendezvous point. When I looked back, I had half a dozen guys crawling after me. Seems I was wearing the lieutenant's helmet with that neat stripe down the back. Soon after all the gliders were on the ground, B-24 Liberators flew over the landing zone, dropping supplies. 
The 327th Glider Infantry regretted letting their guard down that night. Seventy-five percent of all supplies lashed in gliders were removed by other troops and Dutch civilians, they reported. From then on, they had armed sentries in jeeps patrolling to prevent further thefts. The 101st Airborne realized that they had been very fortunate. The German garrison defending Eindhoven had consisted of little more than a hundred men. Brigadier General Jim Gavin, on the other hand, knew that the Germans would reinforce Nijmegen as rapidly as they could. They had also been concentrating their troops in the center and north of the city. Following the landings on Sunday, and the initial probes of Lieutenant Colonel Warren's battalion into the city from the south, the Germans had blown up their ammunition dumps in a series of massive explosions in the early hours, waking the city's population. According to Hamel of the 10th SS Frunsberg, who was now responsible for the defense of Nijmegen, the garrison at the time of the airborne landings consisted of Germany's worst soldiers, and had been less than 750 strong. Apart from the arrogant 1st Fallschirmjäger training regiment, under Oberst Friedrich Henke, which arrived soon afterwards, the city had been defended with railway security guards, a few local militia, members of a police band, a few scattered SS men, and other units. Many of them were armed with rifles from the First World War, and even, Hamel claimed, from the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. They had been issued five round clips, which they simply stuffed in their pockets, as they had no ammunition pouches. Their only anti-tank weapons were the surviving flak guns from the road bridge. To prevent the British 30 Corps from joining up with the 1st Airborne at Arnhem, Obergruppenführer Bittrich wanted to blow both the railway bridge and the great road bridge at Nijmegen. But for that task to be accomplished, they had to be properly defended first. He had therefore issued his orders to Hamel just after midnight, during the first hour of the 18th of September. 10th SS Panzer Division will go southeastwards from Arnhem to cross the Lower Rhine by ferry and hold a bridgehead on the south bank of the Val. The bridges are to be prepared for demolition. The obvious way to prevent the Allied link-up was to blow the bridge at Nijmegen, but General Feldmarschall Model again overruled Bittrick later that morning. We still need the bridges, he insisted. We need them to counter-attack. Bittrick was unconvinced, certain that they lacked sufficient forces for an effective counter-attack. Frustrated and annoyed, he doubted that Model had a special plan, but at least he, Bittrick, was in the clear now that he had formally made the request. A company of Harmel's 10th SS Pioneer Battalion had left on requisition bicycles in the early hours for Panaden on the Nida Rhine, just north of where it split from the Val. One advantage of bicycle transport was the ability to dismount rapidly and throw yourself in a ditch in the event of enemy fighters. These troops were followed by advanced elements of what was to be the Kampfgruppe Reinhold. Reinhold, the commander of the Funsberg Panzer Regiment, brought his dismounted tank crews, the Euling Panzer Grenadier Battalion, only two hundred strong, and a battery of guns. SS Hauptsturmführer Karl Heinz Euling, who commanded the 2nd Battalion of the 21st SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment, was, according to Hamel, a fantastic fellow and a good soldier. Despite the delays of ferrying Panzer Grenadiers across the Nader Rhine in rubber dinghies tied together, Euling's battalion reached the road bridge by midday. Reinhold wasted no time in taking command of the defense of the city and preparing his forces to repel any Allied attack with great vigor. Ferrying field guns and half-tracks, however, was to prove intensely frustrating. Because of Allied air power, they could only cross at night, and they could not use lights, so the commanders, walking backwards, had to signal to their drivers, waving a white handkerchief in the dark, to pull left or right as they maneuvered them onto the ferry. As soon as Reinhold arrived, he ordered that all forces should be concentrated in the north of the city, round the approaches to the two bridges. The ancient fortress of the Valkov, which dated back to Charlemagne, would become the core of their defense. He also brought into the defended perimeter the youths of the Reich Arbeitsdienst. Reinhold had a special task for them, as he intended to defend the Nijmegen Bridge by fire. General Browning had emphasized to Gavin that the main threat would come from tanks in the Reichswald. Although this turned out not to be true, 
almost every unit imaginable in northwest Germany was being mobilized to counterattack the 82nd Airborne on its eastern flank. An optimistically named Korfeld, under General de Cavalerie Kurtfeld, based north of Krefeld, had already been gathering. It included the 406th Division, under General Leutnant Gerd Schwabening, which Feld described as entirely a makeshift formation. It included a non-commissioned officer training school and replacement units, as well as ear and stomach battalions, convalescents who could hardly hear, and gastric cases who needed special diets. This was just a temporary solution. Model and Student intended to bring in the rather more professional two Fallschirmjäger Corps, under General der Fallschirmtruppen Eugen Meindl, as soon as it could be assembled. General Feld admitted, I had no confidence in this attack, since it was almost an impossible task for the 406th Division to attack picked troops with its motley collection. Apart from Army Group B's insistence on an immediate advance, Felt thought the only justification for it was to forestall an American advance to the east and try to give an impression of strength. Units of the 406th Division panicked southeast of Mook. It was with the greatest difficulty that General Scherbening and I succeeded in halting our troops in the jump-off positions. On this occasion I just managed to avoid being taken prisoner myself in the area of Papen Hill. At midday, Feld heard that the advanced detachments of the 3rd and 5th Fallschirmjäger divisions had reached Emmerich. He immediately went there, but was taken aback to find that they consisted of a weak battalion of each division, mostly organized from service troops who had survived the Battle of Normandy. They had practically no heavy weapons. Feld, on returning to his command post, found Modell and General Meindl already there. Felt expressed his astonishment at the condition of the two Fallschirmjäger divisions. He said they must amalgamate the two into a Kampfgruppe under Major Karl Heinz Becker. Having slept under the tree where he heard the train, Brigadier General Gavin was barely able to move at first with his cracked spine. Ignoring the pain, he still picked up his M1 rifle and trudged off to check on positions. One of the key tasks that day was to clear the landing zones as 454 gliders for the 82nd Airborne were due to land that afternoon. But first he met up with Captain Bestebrecce at the Hotel Sionshof. Bestebrecce had assembled nearly 600 members of the resistance wearing orange armbands. Gavin warned them that the Germans would kill them if they captured them. We don't care, they replied. Give us the weapons from your dead and wounded and we'll fight with you. Gavin agreed and told them that their main mission was to make sure that the Germans did not blow the bridge. According to Martin Louis Denham, the director of the Devrenichen Concert Hall, a small group of American paratroopers from the failed attempt to reach the bridge had stayed on all night to fight the Germans on their own. Three grim-looking and filthy young parachutists came in with their machine guns and started shooting from the windows. We went to the cellar. No electricity. Denham wondered whether they were drunk. One of them said to him, The Germans are such rotten shots. What Denham did not grasp was that Lieutenant Colonel Warren's battalion, which had failed to get to the bridge, was still fighting in Nijmegen against the Kampfgruppe Henker. In other parts of the town, American paratroopers were invited into houses to wash and brush their teeth and shave. Some brushed their teeth three times a day, Mevrau Wismann was surprised to find. They don't like being compared to the Tommies, British, she added. They think of them as a little bit slow, and they, the Americans, are the ones who have to go in first. After his meeting at the Sionshof, Gavin went to the command post of the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment to discover exactly what had happened to Warren's battalion. Early reports of his success in taking the bridge turned out to be false. Gavin was furious that Warren had not followed the river bank as ordered, and instead had gone straight into the city, thinking that this would be all right. Warren's battalion was still tied down in the center of Nijmegen, just when the 508th outside the city was coming under pressure from the east. Around the middle of the morning, Gavin received reports that the Germans were moving close to the glider landing zone. This was part of Corps Feldt's attempt at a counteroffensive. There was an attack on Hrusbeck, spotted by American observers in the church spire. Father Hook, 
the parish priest, insisted on going from house to house checking on his flock, despite the firing and occasional shelling. Paratroopers became used to this, and he recounted that when things became dangerous, a head would appear out of a foxhole and shout, Father, cover! and he would throw himself flat. During the first night, when manning the tree line overlooking the Reichswald, the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment was very conscious of being right on the frontier of Germany. Men were ordered not to challenge anyone to their front, but just shoot them, as everyone would be enemy. Inevitably, there was the odd tragic mistake, including a platoon commander shot by his own men. A lieutenant in the regiment also admitted that their men were not very careful about the way they cleaned out a town. As an example, they would locate a German in a house, they would go up to the door and say, Come and see here. As soon as someone stirred inside the house, they would spray the interior with their Tommy guns. The Dutch, however, seemed able to forgive their liberators almost anything. The people came out of their homes, Duane Burns with the 508th that Bake recorded, to find deep holes dug into their front yards and the heads of troopers sticking up from them. They were very friendly and glad to see us, offering us both food and drinks, but mostly they wanted to talk and give us what information they could. One of Burns' squad had been killed during the night. We buried him on the corner of the vacant lot across from the roadblock. A trooper, whose father was a minister, read some verses from his Bible and said a prayer. Then we, his buddies, covered him and smoothed over the dirt, placing his helmet and one dog tag on the grave as a marker. The Dutch people in the area came later and put flowers from their gardens on the grave. In Mook, some ten kilometers to the south, a paratrooper moving under fire from house to house was startled when a door suddenly opened. I pulled my forty-five and was about to fire, he wrote. Standing in the doorway was an elderly Dutch woman, holding in her hand a cup containing coffee with a piece of cake between two slices of bread. The paratrooper, a little shaken, thanked her for her hospitality, but begged her to stay inside for her own safety. The German attacks that morning against roadblocks and villages were as ill-coordinated as General Felt described, but some still presented a real threat to the landing zones. Captain Antony Stefanich's C Company of the 505th, southeast of Krosbeck, had been fired at by some Germans concealed in haystacks. Stefanich, a devout Catholic and a legend in the regiment, was worshipped by his men. He gave the order and the company advanced in extended line to chase the Germans off the field, just as the gliders were coming into land. The C Company troopers were firing, wrote one of his officers, and the Germans were running away from us. It looked like a line of hunters in a rabbit drive. All of a sudden, one lone German soldier running down a small gully about seventy-five to a hundred yards in front of us stopped, turned round and fired one shot in the direction of Captain Stefanisch and me. The bullet struck Steph near the heart, and he fell at my feet. Another account says that Stefanich was trying to rescue a glider pilot under fire when he was hit, but the outcome was the same. Two of his lieutenants remained with him as he was dying, and Stefanich urged them repeatedly to see that C Company does a good job. His soldiers cried unashamedly for the leader they had lost, and they covered his body with a parachute for a shroud. Altogether, 385 gliders landed safely out of the 454 which had taken off. Nineteen of them overflew into German territory, to the anguish of those watching from the ground. Some gliders plied across a beet field, hurling the beets high into the air. Many crashed, but their passengers or contents survived. Gavin was greatly relieved to hear that the newly arrived battalion of artillery had lost only six out of thirty-six pack howitzers. The glider pilots had managed to do the best expected of them, but unlike the British glider pilot regiment, which had trained its men to fight alongside the airborne soldiers once they landed, their American counterparts belonged to the USAAF and had no infantry skills. In fact, they expected to be protected as soon as they had landed their men and cargoes. According to one USAAF officer, as soon as 30 Corps reached the 101st Airborne, their glider pilots began to hitchhike back via Brussels. A few of the most enterprising had worn their Class A uniform under their flying overalls and hitched rides to Paris instead of returning to England. One apparently even made it to the Riviera. Gavin found the situation intolerable. He preferred the British system of glider pilots fighting on as infantry, 
but inter-service demarcation disputes were just as bad on both sides of the Atlantic. Gavin had little option but to accede to the orders of his immediate superior, Lieutenant General Browning, but he was keen to put the exact circumstances on record in the operations log. At 15.30, 18th September, General Gavin had a conference with General Browning at which General Browning asked for the plans for the ensuing twenty-four hours. General Gavin stated that his plan for the night of the 18th, 19th September was to seize the bridge north of Nijmegen, using one battalion of 504, and in conjunction with 508, envelop the bridgehead from the east and west. General Browning approved the plan in general, but on giving it more thought, in view of the situation in the Thirty Corps, he felt that the retention of the high ground south of Nijmegen was of greater importance, and directed that the primary mission should be to hold the high ground and retain its position west of the Mas Wal Canal. Therefore, General Gavin assembled the regimental commanders and issued an order for the defense of the position. With their command posts so close together, Browning could not resist looking over Gavin's shoulder. Yet it is rather strange, as Gavin's record shows, that Browning should still have put so much emphasis on defending the flank and so little on securing the Nijmegen Bridge, which was absolutely essential if his own first airborne division was to be saved from destruction. Browning had clearly become frustrated. He spent much of the time driving fast all over the place in his jeep, the Pegasus pennant fluttering proudly from a wireless aerial. He still expected any passenger to be able to map-read while being thrown around as the vehicle lurched and bounced over the rutted tracks. He drove at a furious rate of speed, and was completely unmindful of danger, his aide recounted. He did it as a matter of course. He was the commander, and it was the right thing to do. This self-dramatizing behavior revealed his exasperation that the battle was being fought individually by the airborne divisions until Horrocks arrived to take over. Browning still could not admit that both he and his heavily manned corps headquarters were utterly redundant. Horrocks's thirty corps led by the Irish Guards Group, was more than twenty-four hours behind schedule, largely due to the halt at Valkensvard for a quiet night and a late start on the advice of Brigadier Gwatkin. They did not set off until ten hundred hours, although the two battalion war diaries gave different reasons for the delay. The third battalion claimed they were waiting to be replaced by an infantry battalion from the 50th Division, while the second armoured battalion said that they were delayed until ten hundred hours by a report of one Jagd Panther and two self-propelled guns at Alst. An armoured car troop from the Household Cavalry Regiment led the way up the club route towards Alst, just six kilometres south of Eindhoven. Colonel Joe Vandeleur gave the accompanying RAF air controller, Flight Lieutenant Love, the target ahead for the Typhoon squadrons to attack. After the heavy losses of the day before, nine Sherman tanks, twenty-three dead and thirty-seven wounded, the Irish guards were reluctant to charge straight up an open road again. While they waited for the typhoons, Vandeleur halted the column for lunch. He and his cousin Giles found a villa by the road with its own swimming pool. They had a swim and revived themselves with more champagne afterwards when a young woman war correspondent joined them. Finally, two hours after the initial request, Love heard that the strike had been cancelled due to poor flying conditions. Vandeleur was livid. What's the matter? he demanded sarcastically. Is the RAF afraid of the sunshine? The only assistance they received that day was a tactical reconnaissance mission which confirmed that the bridge at Son really had been destroyed. A senior member of the Great Phillips Electrical Company at Eindhoven crossed through the lines with a map showing the position of all the German guns. This was a great help, but a series of delays still dogged the advance. There was another hold-up later, when four 88mm guns, supported by infantry, were found to be defending a line north of Alst. While No. 2 Squadron engaged the German gun crews to keep them occupied, No. 1 Squadron and a company of infantry tried to outflank their positions, but wide ditches defeated cross-country movement. Artillery was brought up and opened fire. At 1700 hours, Major General Adair and Brigadier Gwatkin arrived to see what was causing the delay, and soon afterwards the household cavalry troop reported that the Germans had departed. The column was on the move again up the Alsterweg by 1730, 
and half an hour later the armoured cars were racing through Eindhoven. Their crews drove with hatches closed down, thinking the town was still held by the Germans. As a result, they missed out on the rioters' welcome. At about 1930, people in Eindhoven heard shouting in the streets, The English are coming on the Ulster Road! Abandoning dinners on the table, they bustled out of their houses, and soon there were just the cries of joy, laughter, and the jumping up and down from young and old. Guardsmen in tanks and other vehicles made V for victory signs back to the crowds as the column was brought almost to a halt by cheering civilians. Miraculously, nobody was crushed under the tank tracks as people of all ages chalked slogans and messages of thanks on the hulls of Shermans as they passed. According to one woman in Eindhoven, British soldiers observed that whatever the Dutch and Belgians were in want of, they were certainly not in want of chalk. One Irish guards officer, astonished by the patriotic displays of the national colour in every direction, observed that all those orange flags made it very like Ulster. He also suspected that the American paratroopers had already managed to kiss all the girls who wanted to be kissed. While the Irish guards pushed their tanks through the crowds, Joe and Giles Vandeleur slipped away in a scout car through the city and onto the canal at Son. They found a rowing boat and crossed to the other bank, where they encountered some paratroopers from the 101st Airborne. They were drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. You would never have thought there was a war on. They were so completely relaxed, Joe Vandeleur noted, perhaps forgetting his own swim earlier in the day. We said hello, and they shuffled to their feet and gave us a few half-hearted salutes. Neither the citizens of Eindhoven, cheering themselves hoarse, nor the 101st Airborne had any idea that the 107th Panzerbrigade was close by. Commanded by Major Bernd Joachim Freiherr von Marzahn, its Mark V Panther tanks had reached Venlo on railway flat cars early that morning. By the time the Vandeleurs reached the canal by Son, the brigade had halted at the Sutterbeek Bridge over the River Dommel on the northeast edge of Eindhoven. As the Germans had no reconnaissance aircraft, Maltzahn had little idea of where the Allied forces were. According to local legend, Maltzahn was told by a quick-thinking gardener called Wilhelm Hicksbors that the bridge ahead was not strong enough to take his tanks. Maltzahn apparently decided not to take the risk and turned his column round. Gavin had been exasperated the previous evening when that German train had escaped Nijmegen, puffing its way right through the lines of his division. It was, however, a trick which could not be pulled twice. A train approached heading for Germany, a paratrooper recounted. Several bazooka rounds in the engine halted the train. It had a number of passenger cars containing all sorts of artworks. According to Lieutenant Jack P. Carroll of the 505th, there were quite a few people on the train, all loaded down with loot, which they intended to take back to Germany. The loot consisted of cigars, hosiery, and clothing, which had been taken from the Dutch. One of the cars was loaded with woolen socks, another was filled with new handkerchiefs. We killed five soldiers on the train and captured forty. One paratrooper was greatly impressed by a group of people in fine-looking uniforms, black-trimmed with red, highly polished boots and belts. He asked one of the Americans guarding them if they belonged to the German general staff. The guard laughed and replied, No, this is the train crew. A dozen kilometers to the north in Nijmegen, there was nothing to laugh about. The arrival of the Kampfgruppe Reinhold marked the start of a pitiless battle wedged largely against the citizens of Nijmegen. To strike fear into the people, SS patrols cleared civilians from the streets. On Smitstraat, one detachment halted in front of a house where they heard children crying. One of them shouted a command for them to be quiet, but the noise continued. He pulled out a grenade but fortunately his companion persuaded him not to throw it into the cellar. While the Kampfgruppe Reinhold prepared to defend the Valkov, the Belvedere, the Kaiser Lodewig Plain, and Hunau Park on the southern approach to the Great Road Bridge, German artillery deployed ready in the Kaiser Karl Plain, the huge traffic circle in the centre of the city. As dusk fell, Reinhold sent parties of marauding troops and the RAD youth as fire raisers into the town. They banged on doors and shouted, Anybody still here? You must leave the house at once. It's going to be set on fire. They burst into the Carmelite monastery on Dodendal, 
claiming that they had been fired upon from it. While the prior was trying to convince them that their allegations were all wrong, Father Wilhelmus Peterser recorded, soldiers were already busy throwing wood kindling drenched in gasoline into the rooms. According to some accounts, the Germans were attempting to bolster their courage with looted gin. There was a good deal of general plundering. Two German soldiers in the Molenstraat smashed in the plate glass window of a shop with their rifle butts, then climbed in to snatch what they could. The KP underground group also took advantage of the confusion. In the St. Anastrad, an abandoned German truck is raided by the resistance, a diarist recorded. They take a large number of rifles, ammunition, and grenades, load them on a handcart, and trundle them back rapidly to their headquarters. Members of an air raid precaution group had been round warning householders in the north of the city to open their windows to save them being shattered if the great bridge over the Val was blown up. But once the fires started consuming whole houses, the chief sound was of glass panes exploding in the heat. The fires are taking on fantastic dimensions, noted Albertus Oyen. Whole blocks were ablaze as the battle went on with German and American machine guns firing. Flames leap up to great heights, walls cave in, rafters crash down, and in between are the cries of fleeing people and the sharp crack of rifles and machine gun fire. It is a stampede. Nobody remains in the danger zone. A few have salvaged the barest necessities, such as clothing and blankets, and in fear haul these along to a safer place. Mothers hold their crying tots close to them. Desperate fathers carry the bigger children, as well as hastily packed suitcases. The anxieties they have been through can clearly be read on their faces. Only the very impressive civil defense organizations and the Red Cross just managed to prevent total panic. The evacuation of the Protestant hospital went smoothly and just in time, using cars and handcarts to transfer the patients elsewhere. As soon as the fire brigade put out one blaze, the Germans would start it again. They apparently shot a fireman who went to their headquarters to plead with them, and in an effort to block the Nijmegen fire brigade completely, they ordered them to drive over the border to Tleber. The firemen drove off in the right direction, but once out of sight, they turned round and concealed their vehicles in a factory. It looks as if the whole of Nijmegen will be reduced to ashes, a shocked Albertus Eyen concluded in his diary that night. Chapter 15 Arnhem, Tuesday the 19th of September after the confused fighting on the Monday, with the 3rd and 1st Battalions trying to break through to the bridge, their last hope was another push that evening. In the end, it did not take place until the early hours of Tuesday. At a candle-lit council of war in a ruined house, Lieutenant Colonel Doby of the 1st Parachute Battalion took the lead in the absence of any formation commander. They were close to the Rhine Pavilion, a waterside building below the St. Elizabeth Hospital. A mistaken report that the Germans had recaptured the north end of the bridge prompted divisional headquarters to tell them to cancel the attack, but then it was on again. Doby was joined by Lieutenant Colonel Derek McCarty of the South Staffords and Lieutenant Colonel George Lee of the 11th Parachute Battalion. There was no contact with Fitch of the 3rd Parachute Battalion, even though he could not have been far away. Doby was still utterly determined to support Frost at the bridge despite the fact they would again suffer from machine-gun fire from the left, assault guns ahead, and flak guns firing across the river into their right flank. The idea was to attack in the dark and fight through to the bridge before first light. The Germans had pulled back their blocking line. This allowed the British to reoccupy the St. Elizabeth Hospital and Major General Urquhart to escape from his attic hideout. But Standartenfuhrer Hartz's decision to withdraw to a new line on the far side of some open ground, some five hundred metres east of the Rhine Pavilion and two hundred metres beyond Arnhem's municipal museum, was to create a better killing field. Soon after 0300, Toby's battalion advanced rapidly along the riverfront, only to encounter Fitch's 3rd battalion withdrawing after their own bruising battle to get through. Fitch had little more than fifty men standing out of the whole battalion. Doby refused to believe they could not break through and marched on. 
Fitch turned his exhausted men around and agreed to support Doby's attack. On Utrechtsavik, up the hill, the South Staffords, followed by the 11th Parachute Battalion, skirted the museum and then ran into the assault guns of Hartz's blocking line. They, too, suffered fusillades and machine-gun bursts from the embankment beyond the railway line to their left and heavier-caliber flak firing from across the river where the Germans had occupied a brickworks. The 88-millimeter shells exploded with devastating effect, while the rounds from the dual 20-millimeter flak guns blasted off limbs with such force that the shock alone could kill. A parachute regiment lieutenant, identifiable only as David, wrote down some impressions while in hiding after the battle. I was obsessed by recurring scenes of the nightmare past, of Mervyn with his arm hanging off, of Pete lying in his grotesque attitude, quite unrecognizable, of Angus lying in the dark, clinging to the grass in his agony, of the private shouting vainly for a medical orderly. There were none left. Of the man running gaily across an opening, the quick crack and his surprised look as he clutched the back of his neck, of his jumps so convulsive as more bullets hit him. How stupid all this war game is. I only hope the sacrifice that was ours in those days will have achieved something. Yet even at this moment, I feel that it hasn't. It will remain a gesture. Muller's Ninth SS pioneers, well concealed back on the eastern edge of Osterbeek, ambushed British troops coming on behind. The pioneers fired, he recounted. Panzerfaust literally blew groups of paratroopers apart, and flamethrowers sprayed fire at the enemy. Utrechtsavig was a channel of death. The rest of Kampfgruppe Spindler, to the north, between the railway line and the Amsterdamsavig, was fighting the 10th and the 156th Parachute Battalions. They were also harassing the King's own Scottish borderers, preparing to defend Landing Zone L, north of the Bilderberg Woods, where the third lift was due later in the day. And with General von Tetau's forces pushing in from the west, the 1st Airborne Division was nearly surrounded. Further to the east, on Utrechtsavich, near the hospital, Major Robert Kane, with the 2nd South Staffords, saw a man beckon him over. He then handed Kane a rifle and pack. He was caring for a wounded British soldier inside, and did not want to suffer the consequences of having a weapon in the house. Germans, he said apologetically, and to emphasize the point, he put two fingers to his temple to represent a pistol. Soon afterwards, Kane and his company took up another position to fight back against a German sally from the center of Arnhem. Kane grabbed the Bren gun and fired off a whole magazine. Realizing that he was standing on a pile of flat stones, he looked down and saw that they were gravestones with Hebrew inscriptions. They were standing in a Jewish graveyard, which had presumably been smashed by the Germans or Dutch Nazis. With German reinforcements arriving with heavy weapons, the British did not stand a chance against intense fire from three sides. After the near destruction of Fitch's 3rd Battalion, Doby's 1st Battalion was broken in semi-suicidal attacks against German positions. Hardly a man was left unwounded. The only escape was to seek shelter in nearby houses, but the Panzer Grenadiers, supported by assault guns, had them trapped and took most of them prisoner little more than an hour later. A couple of hundred meters to the north, the South Staffords were running low on anti-tank piat rounds. The museum, which the British called the Monastery, had been their aid post. It now had to be evacuated, but the doctor there, Basha Brownscombe, remained with those who could not be moved. He was murdered several days later in hospital by a Danish member of the SS, who was later tried and hanged for the crime. A defensive position in the dell behind the museum was also abandoned, due to concentrated mortar fire. Major Blackwood, arriving with the 11th Battalion, saw signs of the previous day's fighting. Wires and cables down, an occasional barricade of burned-out vehicles, some dead Germans cluttering the streets. We moved under fire to a position on the hill near the big hospital, and dug in there, while a battalion put in an attack on the lower level. The noise was terrific. Somewhere behind the hospital was a large caliber gun popping off, but an attempt to find out more about it only brought a shower of Spandau bullets about my ears. So for the most part we lay on the Kiev, looking at the horribly stiff bodies of an officer and men of the 1st Brigade, 
which blocked the gateway on our flank. At around 0900, German Mark IV tanks appeared, as well as assault guns. They were held off at first by the last few Piats, as a member of the South Staffords recorded. But at about 1100, all Piat ammunition was exhausted, and tanks overran the position, inflicting heavy casualties and splitting the battalion into pockets. They had no anti-tank guns forward, because the convex curve of the hill shielded enemy armoured vehicles until they were almost on top of them. As the Staffords pulled back near the St. Elizabeth Hospital, the same private saw a British soldier jump from a first-floor window of a house onto the back of a tank in an attempt to drop a grenade into the turret, but he was shot down before he had a chance. Behind the South Staffords, the 11th Parachute Battalion tried to advance on the railway line and embankment up to the left, but the attack never got off the ground. Between the Utrechtsevich and the river, survivors from the 1st and 3rd Parachute Battalions pulled back to the Rhine Pavilion. Colonel Fitch was not among them. He had been killed by a mortar bomb. With hardly any medics or stretcher-bearers left, the wounded were told to try to make their way as best they could to the St. Elizabeth Hospital, even though it was now back under German control. At 10.30, Colonel Warwick, the deputy head of medical services, managed to contact the 16th Parachute Field Ambulance in the St. Elizabeth Hospital. He was using the telephone of a civilian in Osterbeek, whose son was in the Dutch SS. Warwick heard that, although the Germans had taken away the head of 16 Field Ambulance and many of the orderlies, two surgical teams were still operating. They had nearly a hundred casualties, many of them serious cases. Warwick could hear the sound of battle in the background, with machine guns and an assault gun firing constantly as he conversed with the field ambulance's dental officer. Later in the morning, Brigadier Lathbury was brought into the St. Elizabeth Hospital from his hiding place with the bad wound in his thigh. He had removed all badges of rank and pretended to be Corporal Lathbury. Bizarrely, in the circumstances of such a British disaster, a German SS Panzergrenadier with only a flesh wound, was crying in the hospital. One of the remaining British doctors told him to shut up because he was not dying. A Dutch nurse explained that the man was crying not from pain, but because the Führer had decreed that the Allies must never cross the Rhine, and they had done so. Even the 11th Parachute Battalion behind the South Staffords found itself forced to retreat, as Major Blackwood recounted. Thirteen hundred hours— Message to say that our attack on the Arnhem Bridge had been beaten back, and the German tanks had outflanked and surrounded us. B Company took up positions in houses overlooking a main crossroads. Our orders were brief. Wait for the tanks, give them everything we had in the way of grenades, shoot up as many infantry as we could before we died. With Scott I entered one of the corner houses, said good morning to the worried-looking tenant, and went upstairs to the room with the most commanding view. It was a remarkably fine room to die in. A plaster cast of a Madonna in the corner, two crucifixes, three ornately framed texts, and a picture of the Pope. We removed all glass and china to a remote corner, laid out our grenades, ammunition, and weapons on the bed, and had a drink of water. Scott, who is an R.C., made furtive use of some of the religious adornments, and I put in a wee word or two of my own. Just outside the hospital, Major Kane was taking shelter in a long air-raid trench on the east side of the St. Elizabeth Hospital. He told his men to stay down as they could hear a German assault gun approaching. It was little more than fifty metres away. Peering over the rim of the trench, Kane could see the commander standing with head and shoulders exposed. He wore black gloves and held some binoculars. Kane, who had nothing more than his service revolver, was horrified to hear a burst of fire from along the trench. One of his men had tried and failed to kill the commander, who dropped inside and closed the hatch with a clang, and then the assault gun turned towards them. Three of Kane's men panicked. They scrambled from the trench and were cut down by machine gun fire. Kane pulled himself out of the trench as the assault gun manoeuvred, and then rolled down the reverse slope behind, which led to a steep drop into the courtyard of the hospital. Just beyond the hospital, he came across men from the 11th Battalion. He wanted to get his revenge on the assault gun, but they had no Piat ammunition left. Instead, Kane was told to round up as many men as he could and seize the high ground at Denbrink. The plan was for Kane's force on Denbrink 
to act as a pivot for the 11th Parachute Battalion to attack another hill to the north of the railway line called Heonord Diependal. Kane and his men passed the round Panopticon prison with its shallow dome and then rushed Denbrink from the side. To Kane's relief, there was little resistance when they put in their attack and took the feature, but a tangle of tree roots made digging trenches difficult. He urged his men to hurry. He knew how fast the Germans would range in with their mortars, and they did, with tree bursts. In a short time, two-thirds of his force had suffered shrapnel wounds. Soon after 1400, Kane felt there was no alternative but to pull back. Not only was the attempt to get through to Frost's force at the bridge defeated, but four battalions had been savaged in the attempt. With most officers killed or wounded, a chaotic retreat was underway. Men appeared out of the smoke of battle, running back in ones and twos, like animals escaping from a forest fire. Once released from hiding early in the morning, General Urquhart and his two companions found a jeep and drove to the Hartenstein. As I came down the steps, wrote the padre of the Glida Pilot Regiment, who should be descending but the general? Several saw him, but nobody said a word. We were completely taken aback. His return was the signal for a great resurgence of confidence. Confidence was needed badly, as Urquhart's chief of staff, Charles Mackenzie, had just found. On a check of the divisional area, he was disturbed to find a machine gun nest and a brain gun carrier abandoned. He then came across a group of about twenty soldiers in a panic, with some of them shouting, The Germans are coming! The Germans are coming! He and Loda Simmons calmed them down, and Mackenzie drove the carrier back to the Hartenstein. He found Urquhart standing on the steps, about to explode, no doubt because on his return he had found that nothing was going to plan. We assume, sir, that you were gone for good, Charles Mackenzie said to him. Around the Hartenstein, armed members of the LKP underground group were forcing the NSB collaborators they had rounded up to dig trenches. Other Dutch volunteers were collecting corpses to move them to burial places. The glider pilot Padre, meanwhile, set off in a jeep with two young SS trooper prisoners, still in their tiger camouflage smocks, sitting on the front. They were going to bury General Kusin and his companions. Early that morning, staff officers at the Hartenstein suddenly discovered that a BBC set, brought in to send news releases back to London, had communication with its base set, so we received permission to send our messages over it. Arrangements were made by BBC in London to get personnel from Shafe to receive the messages and relay them to British Airborne Headquarters at Moor Park. For the next two days, this was the only reliable radio contact we had in the division to the outside world. Just north of Osterbeck, while the other four battalions tried and failed to get through to the bridge, Hackett's 4th Parachute Brigade had been fighting its own battle. During the night, the 156th Parachute Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Sir Richard de Vaux, had continued its advance between the railway line and the Amsterdam Savig towards Arnhem. Hackett's plan was to seize the high ground at Kuppel, beyond a north-south road through the woods called the Dreensevig, which ran down to Osterbeek, but this was the blocking line of the Kampfgruppe Spindler. It was a strongly held position, with steeply rising wooded ground on the eastern side of the road, where Spindler's force of panzergrenadiers and gunners was dug in, supported by eight-wheeler armoured cars, half-tracks and assault guns. At around midnight, the 156th Battalion had run into outposts west of the road. Colonel Devaux decided to back off and wait until first light to get a better idea of what they were up against. Expecting a dawn attack, the Germans pulled in their outposts. First, one company of the 156th attacked, and, as soon as it had crossed the road, suffered devastating losses from the concentration of German firepower. It was virtually wiped out. Another company was sent in, supposedly to turn the German flank, but it was a continuous line. They, too, could not spot the well-camouflaged trenches and gun pits in the woods. Major John Waddy sighted a German half-track with twenty-millimeter double-flat guns and began to stalk it. High in one of the trees, however, was a sniper who shot him in the groin before he could fire the piat. One of Waddy's sergeants, a huge Rhodesian, picked him up in his arms like a child, saying to him, "'Come on, sir, this is no place for us,' and carried him back to the battalion aid post. 
Wadi's travails were not over. As a patient in the Hotel Tafelberg, he was wounded twice more, first by German mortar fire, and towards the end of the battle by shell fragments from British artillery firing from south of the river. In the course of the morning, the 156th Battalion lost almost half its strength. Brigadier Hackett had to pull it back. To the north, the 10th Parachute Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Ken Smith, advanced past the discouraging sight of casualties brought back on a procession of jeeps. Smith's lead company encountered a similar volume of fire to the 156th and went to ground. Reluctant to destroy another company, Smith asked Hackett's permission to try to outflank the end of the blocking line by sending a company round north of the Amsterdamsevich. Soon the 10th Battalion was pinned down by the much stronger and better munitioned Kampfgruppe Spindler. Hackett's brigade needed to hold that line, even if no further advance was possible, because less than a kilometre to the west of the Dreensevich lay landing zone L, where part of the third lift was due to arrive that afternoon. Already the King's Own Scottish borderers were having a hard time trying to defend its perimeter. Meanwhile, General von Tettau's forces were advancing on Wolfheser to their rear, while the very high railway embankment along their southern flank risked trapping them in a desperately vulnerable position. Both Urquhart and Hackett now suddenly recognized the danger the 4th Parachute Brigade was in. When the order to fall back reached the 156th Battalion, Major Geoffrey Powell was furious. They were given just fifteen minutes' warning, and to withdraw quite openly in daylight invited disaster. It was ludicrous, insane. We were ordered to just break off and fall back. The move was chaotic. Under constant attack by the Germans, the battalion was split and then fragmented. Captain Lionel Querepel had taken over command of the 10th Battalion Company north of the Amsterdamsevich. With his slightly whimsical expression, Querepel did not seem to be a man likely to win the Victoria Cross for a whole series of actions. His men referred to him as Captain Q, and thought he looked more like a country parson than a soldier. Yet bravery can never be judged by appearances. Although himself wounded in the face, he first carried a crippled sergeant out of danger. He then stormed a German position which had two machine guns and a captured British six-pounder anti-tank gun, killing the crews. He was hit again. Then, as Germans threw stick grenades, he picked them up and threw them back. Finally, as the German counterattack increased greatly in strength, he ordered his men to pull back while he held off the Germans with hand grenades and a Sten gun. Querepel's self-sacrifice could end only in death. Sergeant Fitzpatrick, the man he had carried out of danger, was tended to by their medical officer, Captain G. F. Drayson, kneeling beside him. A mortar bomb came down. It exploded and almost decapitated the doctor, who fell across Fitzpatrick's body, pinning the weakened man to the ground. Sergeant Fitzpatrick began to sob, appalled that Drayson should have died trying to help him. The broken battalion reached the landing zone as the gliders carrying the Polish anti-tank squadron began to approach. Back at the Hotel Hartenstein, the American fighter control team, led by Lieutenant Davis, were trying to contact Allied fighters to protect the incoming lift. Davis managed no more than one brief exchange with a Spitfire pilot, who then could not hear anything because of the flak explosions all around him. All through the operation the Luftwaffe was active, but it was a very peculiar activity, Davis reported after the battle. The FW-190s and the ME-109s were over every day except two, and their tactics were always the same. They would sweep back and forth about 4,000 feet, drop to 2,000, and then peel off as if to strafe us. But I doubt whether they fired over 500 rounds in all the passes they made at us. It looked as if they were afraid to use their ammunition and then be unarmed in case our fighters would come and were merely trying to bolster German morale. On the ground, the withdrawal of the 10th and 156th battalions enabled the Germans to start attacking the landing zone from the woods. The King's own Scottish borderers found themselves under heavy fire. See my first live Jerry and put a bullet through him, one of them recorded. He went down on his knees, so I rolled out of Tony Morgan's way and he put a burst into him. More Jerry's coming out of the woods under cover of MG-34 and Schmeisser fire, which we return. I got another cert. At about four, the cry went up. 
Third lift here, the chaplain of the glider pilot regiment recorded. All we could do was gaze in stupefaction at our friends going to inevitable death. We watched in agony the terrible drama. It was heroic in the extreme. We saw more than one machine blazing, yet continuing on its course. It now became borne in on us that we faced terrible opposition. While the departure of the Polish Parachute Brigade had been cancelled from airfields in the Midlands because of bad visibility, the second glider group, bringing the rest of the anti-tank squadron, managed to lift off in thirty-five gliders from the airfields of Salisbury Plain, well to the south. But only twenty-six arrived together with British gliders on landing zone L. The landing took place in the midst of the fiercest battle and sustained enormous losses, a Polish account stated. Gliders were literally shot to pieces in the air, during landing and on the ground. Many were injured on landing. The British could not help, as they had their own problems. The Germans were even firing with Nebelwerfer multi-barreled mortars onto the landing ground. The confusion was such that Polish soldiers opened fire on 10th Battalion paratroopers retreating across the landing zone, thinking they were Germans. They killed several of them, including Lieutenant Paddy Radcliffe, the commander of the machine gun platoon. Absolute hell, wrote Major Francis Lindley of the 10th Battalion. Germans had the open ground surrounded with flag guns and machine guns. Gliders landing all round us. C-47 flew over with flames shooting out of it. Sterling crashed near the road. Poles just started firing at everything. Finally, the Poles realized from the yellow triangles being waved at them that they were firing at the British. Lieutenant Colonel Smith of the 10th Battalion apparently had tears in his eyes when looking at the sad remnants of his command. Later in the afternoon, the resupply ships, Stirlings and Dakotas, came over and ran into terrific Akak barrages, one report stated. Too many of them get hit and go down flaming, and too much of the supply drop goes to the Germans. It had been expected that we would control the area where the supplies were dropped. Evidently no message had got through, changing the DZ. We tried, while the planes were overhead, to contact them with VHF on the three frequencies, but got no reply. Yellow ground panels and smoke pots were set out, but only a few of the planes were able to see them because of the tall trees and the low altitude of the planes. Another posthumous Victoria Cross was awarded for bravery that afternoon. Flight Lieutenant David Lord had brought in his C-47 Dakota down below cloud cover just north of Nemegen. A German flak battery opened fire and set his starboard engine ablaze. Lord asked how much longer to the drop zone. Three minutes flying time, came the reply. The plane began to list as the fire spread. Over the intercom, Lord told his crew, They need the stuff. We'll go in and bail out afterwards. Get your chutes on. He told his navigator to go back and help the four Royal Army Service Corps soldiers who would be pushing out the baskets. The mechanism was broken, so they had to manhandle each container of ammunition out of the door. They managed only six out of eight, so Lord insisted on going round again to drop the last two. As soon as they were gone, Lord shouted, Bail out! Bail out! Lord kept the aircraft steady long enough for them to jump, but it was not long enough for him, and he was killed. Flying officer Henry King, his navigator, had no idea after parachuting whether Lord had died or had managed to crash land the plane. Lord was a strange fellow, he observed later, he had studied for the ministry, but left a seminary to join the RAF in 1936. He was rather a grimly determined chap. King encountered some members of the 10th Battalion. They offered him a cup of tea and some chocolate. That's all we've got, one of them said. What do you mean, that's all you've got? King replied. We just dropped supplies to you. Sure, you dropped our tins of sardines, but the Huns got them. We got nothing. Many if not most of the containers, drifted towards German positions to the frustration of the paratroopers. Now we too smoked English cigarettes and ate English chocolate, SS Hauptsturmführer Miller exulted. Miller's divisional commander, Standartenführer Harzer of the Hohenstaufen, described how Model visited his command post daily. He arrived with a small escort and demanded a short, sharp situation report as soon as he stepped in the door. 
Whenever there was a problem, the commander on the spot had to offer three different solutions. Once that was over, Hartzer was allowed to request more men, vehicles, weapons, ammunition, and supplies. Modell would then make his decision and telephone his chief of staff, General Krebs. And a few hours later, transport columns and troops were redirected towards Arnhem. Since the Hohenstaufen lacked transport, the Wehrmacht trucks would deliver the shells straight to the gun lines. When flamethrowers were requested for street fighting, Modell had them flown to the division from an ordnance department in central Germany. The German army was based on a ruthless prioritization, which the British army manifestly failed to match. Once Modell had finished with Harzer, he then went forward to visit the command post of each Kampfgruppe, where he would question officers and soldiers alike on the progress of the attack and on morale. As Muller indicated, morale was high not just because of their certainty of winning this battle after the defeat in Normandy, but because of the cornucopia of Allied parachute containers raining down on them. Having captured the orders which revealed the signals and identification panels for guiding the Allied supply drops, further generous supplies could be expected. The panels were quickly manufactured and distributed the next day. In addition, the British, in their retreat, were losing control of their drop zones and lacked radio contact to warn the RAF. Allied aircraft would soon be at even greater risk. Hartzer's strength was about to be increased by the arrival of a flak brigade, commanded by Oberstleutnant Hubert von Svoboda of the Luftwaffe, an Austrian. This consisted of five flak battalions from the Ruhr, with a mixture of 20 mm, 47 mm, 88 mm, and even 105 mm anti-aircraft guns. Most of the guns had to be towed by farm tractors or even wood-burning trucks, but the two SS Panzerkorps were still able to assemble nearly 200 anti-aircraft guns west of Arnhem, positioned to support the ground troops as well as engage Allied aircraft. And yet, according to Major Knaust, Petrick was still anxious about the outcome of the battle. When he visited Knaust at his command post just east of the ramp that day, he said, Knaust, can we hold out here another twenty-four hours? We've got to gain time to allow the divisions from Germany to arrive. Both Knausts and Heinrich Brinkmann's Kampfgruppen had suffered heavy casualties in the house-to-house -house fighting north of the bridge. Knausts' well-worn tanks either broke down or were knocked out rapidly by the British six-pounder anti-tank guns. It would seem a miracle how they manhandled heavy guns up onto the upper floors, Arthur commented later. The heavy infantry weapons fire from basements or withdrawn from windows so they cannot be spotted. In Arnhem, during the previous night, the Germans had forcibly evacuated any remaining Dutch civilians from houses near the northern end of the road bridge. One of the last sounds that Gunrad Hulemann remembered before leaving his home was the unearthly racket of an upright piano upstairs being riddled with bullets. As expected, the German attack came at dawn. The defenders of the bridge had already heard all the firing to the west, where the other battalions around the St. Elizabeth Hospital were trying to fight through to them. Hamel's Frunsberg seemed to be concentrating its efforts on finishing off the school on the east side of the ramp, using Naust's Kampfgruppe and his few remaining panzers. On Tuesday morning, Lieutenant Donald Hindley recalled, the tanks came back and they started shelling this house very heavily. Three of the airborne sappers managed to stalk one of the tanks and knock it out. The crew got out and crept along the wall of the house till they came to rest beneath the window where I was sitting. I dropped a grenade on them, and that was that. I held it for two seconds before I let it drop. Sapper John Bretherton was shot through the forehead. Bretherton, for a split second, looked surprised. Then he dropped to the ground without a cry. Another sapper suddenly gripped Sergeant Norman Swift's arm and asked him if he was all right. Swift could not understand, since he felt fine. He followed the soldier's gaze and saw a large pool of what looked like blood by his feet, and then realized it was rusty water which had seeped from one of the bullet-ridden radiators. Another sapper, who was badly shell-shocked, walked out of the building. He was calling out, We're all going to die! Everyone yelled at him to come back but he was too far gone to understand, and walked straight into the line of German fire. In a house opposite the school, the Panzergrenadier Rottenführer Alfred Ringsdorf was exasperated by the way its defenders, 
were shooting through the windows in the stairwell so that we could not use the stairs. The only way of dealing with its defenders, he argued, was to fire a panzerfaust to explode just below the windowsill. That would kill any rifleman waiting to pop up for another shot. Along with the rest of Obersturmfuhrer Vogel's company, he had no cigarettes, and they were desperate to capture some prisoners in order to take theirs. Captain Mackay had issued the stimulant benzedrine to his men, which caused double vision in some, and occasionally provoked hallucinations, of which the most common was that thirty corps had arrived on the other side of the bridge. Some men became obsessed with this vision. Others, without the influence of benzedrine, were eagerly awaiting the drop of the Polish parachute brigade on the polderland near the southern end of the bridge. Frost, knowing that the Poles would face a desperate battle there, had assembled a suicide squad, led by Freddy Goff, to fight across the bridge to join them. He was not to know that Sosobowski himself was fuming, because he had been told at the last moment that only his anti-tank squadron was going in on that day. With German snipers focusing on the windows of the school, the sappers and paratroopers from the 3rd Battalion had to be silent as well as invisible. We bound up our feet with strips of rags, Mackay wrote, to make our movements through the house silent. The stone floors were covered with glass, plaster, and were slippery with blood, especially the stairs. German marksmanship had improved. We were now getting a considerable number of sniper bullets entering our houses, another paratrooper wrote in a diary, and needless to say suffering considerable casualties, although it seemed to us that we had inflicted at least double the amount on the enemy. We were still unable to contact the divisional commander, although the wireless team had received the Second Army quite clearly, but unfortunately they were not receiving us. The American OSS Lieutenant Harvey Todd recorded with satisfaction three more kills during the Germans' dawn attack. He left his perch in the roof of brigade headquarters a little later. Around midday, the enemy launched another counterattack, a much more serious one. Todd recorded five more kills from his position in the roof, but then had to get out rapidly when a German machine gunner zeroed in on him. A Bren gunner in the building was killed, so Todd took over his weapon. He spotted a twenty-millimeter flak gun being used against another house and managed to shoot the crew. Great joy all round broke out when a Fokker Wolf 190 roared in from the south over the bridge to drop a bomb, which proved a dud as it bounced up the main concourse of the Eusebius Binnensingel towards the town center. Sappers in the school fired Bren guns at the plane. The pilot banked to escape their bursts, but his port wing caught the church steeple to the west and the plane crashed with a massive explosion. This produced another roar of War Mahomet from all the buildings around the bridge. The defiance belied the fact that Frost's force was suffering badly. We now had over fifty casualties in our building alone, Lieutenant Todd reported. The battalion doctor, Captain Jimmy Logan, and his orderlies won universal praise for accomplishing what they did without running water and when they were almost out of clean bandages, morphine, and the other medical necessities of war. Patients had to use empty wine bottles and fruit jars to urinate in. The Reverend Father Bernard Egan had worked well with Logan ever since the battalion's battles in North Africa. Logan knew by then which of his patients were Catholic, and he would warn Father Egan as soon as one of them needed the last rites. One man, just before dying of his wounds, said, And to think, I was worried that my chute wouldn't open. Captain Jacobus Grunewald, the Dutch leader of the Jedburgh team, tried to ring the St. Elizabeth Hospital, but the line was dead. Grunewald and Todd decided to run to a doctor's house nearby to ring the hospital from there. When about halfway, and just as they were stealing themselves for the next dash across the street, Captain Grunewald was killed by a sniper. The bullet went in his forehead and out the back of his head, Todd wrote. Todd ducked into a doorway and found a man who spoke a little English. They managed to sneak to the next-door house, where there was a telephone which worked. He called the hospital, but the doctor he spoke to explained it would be impossible to send an ambulance. They had tried already, but the Germans warned that any ambulance sent out would be fired on. The doctor also explained that as the Germans controlled the hospital approaches, where a considerable battle was going on, they wanted the British wounded moved, so there was more space for their own casualties. When Todd managed to return to brigade headquarters, 
The news was equally bad there. In one of the few radio transmissions to work, they had learned that Thirty Corps had still not captured the bridge at Nijmegen, but were about to make an attempt that evening. Later that morning, the Germans bombarded the school with Panzerfausts. Thinking that they had silenced the defenders, they surrounded the school. Mackay told his men to prepare two grenades each, and on his command they dropped them from the upper windows. They grabbed their weapons and finished off any who had not been blasted by the grenades. It was all over in a matter of minutes, leaving a carpet of field grey around the house. Mackay was recognized by his men as being one of those rare beings who were virtually fearless. Another was Major Digby Tatham Water. He inspired everyone, almost playing the fool, by walking up and down in the open, swirling an umbrella he had found in one of the houses, and putting on a bowler hat like Charlie Chaplin. When Freddy Garth pointed this out to Colonel Frost, he simply said, Oh, yes, Digby's quite a leader. Lieutenant Patrick Barnett, who commanded the Brigade Defence Platoon, saw Tatham Water walking along the street in a heavy mortar barrage with his umbrella up. Barnett stared at him in astonishment and asked him where he was going. I thought I'd go and see some of the chaps over there. Barnett laughed and pointed at the umbrella as German mortars kept firing. That won't do you much good. Tatham Water looked at him. Eyes wide open in mock surprise. Oh, my goodness, but what if it rains? Some soldiers became fired up with bloodlust. Private Watson was sent to replace a Scot, predictably known as Jock. He told me to get the bloody hell out. He said he had ten notches on his rifle butt already, and he planned to get ten more of the bastards before they got him. He looked like the kind of crazy bastard who'd do it. Watson went back a couple of hours later. Jock was sprawled on the floor. He'd taken a bullet right through the mouth. Freddy Goff remembered that one of their best snipers was Corporal Bolton, one of the few black soldiers in the division. Bolton, a tall, languid man, took great satisfaction in his work, crawling all over the place, sniping, and would grin widely after each victory. Brigadier Führer Hamel ordered his men to cease fire while he sent a captured British soldier to Colonel Frost to suggest they meet to discuss surrender. The Panzer Grenadier seized the opportunity to eat or sleep. After a pause, wrote Horst Weber, the English paratroopers suddenly let out a terrific yell. Wo Mohammed! We all sprang up, wondering what was happening. We were frightened at first by this terrible yell. Then the shooting began again. Frost was determined to fight on, yet because they were so short of ammunition, he felt compelled to issue an order to shoot only when repelling German attacks. During the next onslaught, a voice was heard to shout at the enemy, Stand still, you sods! These bullets cost money! Now pushed back well to the west of the bridge, the remnants of the four battalions which had tried to break through were in full retreat, harried by their German pursuers. At every house we passed was a man or a woman with a pail of water and several cups. We needed those drinks wrote Major Blackwood in the 11th Parachute Battalion. The people flocked round us, smiling, laughing, offering us fruit and drink. But when we told them the Bosch was coming, their laughter turned to tears. As we dug our slit trenches in the gardens, the melancholy procession of blanket-carrying refugees began to move past. Blackwood's men cannot have occupied those trenches for long, because the retreat gathered pace and became even more chaotic. Most platoons and companies had lost their officers in the fighting. A sergeant whose boots were squelching blood from his wounds, recorded a soldier from the South Staffords, gave us the order to try to get out of it and make our way back to the first organized unit we came to. Everyone still alive seemed to be wounded somewhere, or deeply shocked. The other retreat westwards, that of the 4th Parachute Brigade, was to escape being caught against the steep railway embankment. There were only two ways to get through— the level crossing at Wolfhäuser, and a culvert under the railway through which a jeep could just be driven, providing the windscreen was folded flat and the driver lay almost sideways. The six- and seventeen-pounder anti-tank guns were too large. Using all their remaining strength, some anti-tank crews tried to manhandle their guns up the vertiginous slope of the embankment. The Germans, seizing the opportunity, sent machine-gun groups up onto the embankment to fire along the railway tracks. 
when self-propelled assault guns appeared, even the bravest paratroopers were shaken, knowing how ill-armed they were. A chief clerk of the 4th Parachute Brigade recounted how a major shouted, You white-livered bastards! Come and get them! He did not last long, brought down by German fire as he charged forwards. A pathfinder sergeant near Wolfheser saw hundreds of airborne running in panic. They were pouring back, some of them without arms. We went along the railway line, and I remember seeing a pole up on top of the embankment trying to fire a six-pounder anti-tank gun. He was shouting in Polish. We saw that the breech block of the gun had been removed. We tried to make him understand the gun wouldn't fire, but it was no use. We left him. He was out of his mind, and I felt terribly sorry for him. The King's Own Scottish Borderers also took part in the disastrous withdrawal from the landing zone and the adjoining farm of Johanna Hoover. Colonel Peyton Reed, his commanding officer, described how his battalion which at four o'clock in the afternoon was a full-strength unit, with its weapons, transport and organization complete, whose high morale had been further boosted by a successful action against attacking enemy, and which was prepared to meet anything coming at it, was reduced within the hour to a third of its strength, with much of its transport and many of its heavy weapons lost, one company completely missing, and two more reduced to half-strength. Payden Reed led the remainder all the way round and back to North Osterbeek, to a small hotel called the Dreanurt, which the regiment would always know as the White House. Peyton Reed knocked on its door at 2100 to be greeted as a liberator, but he felt a hypocrite. He knew he was bringing them only danger and destruction. By the next night, the building was reduced to a shell. Caring for the wounded in such a retreat became doubly difficult. With the advance of General von Tittau's forces from the west, Colonel Warwick had to organize the rapid evacuation of patients from the dressing station at Wolfhäuser. Most were moved to the Hotel Schornort. Warwick visited it at 1100 and found that casualties were coming in fast. In fact, the total had passed 300, and they had taken over nearby buildings to house the overflow. Hendrika van der Flist, the daughter of the owner, had put on her girl guide uniform because it was made of tough material. Along with other young women volunteers, they started by washing the faces of the wounded and their hands to reduce the dangers of infection. They also had to act as interpreters. Both British and German wounded were brought in, and at first it was too complicated to keep them apart. Even though the Germans were prisoners, their attitude had not changed. One of them summoned her. Nurse, cold towel, I have a headache. She observed that the Heron folk has become so used to commanding that they do not know how to behave differently. On the other hand, a German who had never wanted to be in the army soon made friends with the British soldiers either side of him. They started teaching each other words and phrases in their own language. She then found a Dutch boy in German uniform who had been shot through the jaw. He was a traitor, but she could not help feeling pity. Later in the week, she discovered that he was mentally defective. She was surprised to find how quickly she adapted to dealing with horrible wounds. A week ago I would have been frightened at the sight of such a horribly injured face. Now I am used to it. It is nothing but wounds that I see here, and the heavy, sickly smell of blood hanging all over the place. Urquhart went to the Schulnort to visit the wounded that afternoon. Soon afterwards the rest of the 131st Parachute Field Ambulance arrived from Wolfheser, having just got out in time as Heller's SS Wachbataillon approached. To help feed such a crowd, farmers brought in livestock killed in the fighting, and locals arrived with produce from their gardens and orchards, especially tomatoes, apples, and pears. The wounded were not very hungry, but they badly needed water, the hospital's greatest problem. The bathtubs in the hotel had fortunately all been filled on Sunday as a precaution just after the airborne landings. Volunteers now started to drain the central heating system and radiators to replace what was being used from the baths. Other civilians turned up at the show note, particularly divers who had emerged from hiding, including former political prisoners and several Jews. They had come because they thought they must be safe there. The general impression that the Allies had as good as won the war was already proving very dangerous for many in occupied Europe. With German losses mounting at the bridge that day, Brigadefuhrer Hamel 
welcomed the arrival of the 280th Assault Gun Brigade from Denmark, which had been diverted to Arnhem instead of Aachen. One of their men later recounted that they lost 80% of their vehicles in the fighting in and around Arnhem, which he described as far more savage than anything he had witnessed in Russia. British paratroopers would hold their fire and let the assault guns pass, then shoot them from behind because the armor was so much thinner there. The close-quarter fighting wrecked the nerves of the crews, he added. They were terrified of being burned alive by phosphorus grenades. Above all, Harmel eagerly awaited the arrival of Compagnie Hummel from the 506th Heavy Panzer Battalion, with its Tiger tanks. They had been unloaded earlier that morning in Bocholt, close to the Dutch border, after their blitz transport across Germany. But only two of the Tiger tanks survived the 80-kilometer road march. The rest were rendered useless along the way, mostly from broken tracks and sprockets. The two serviceable tanks went into action that evening, guarded by panzer grenadiers from the SS Frunsberg. Their armor-piercing rounds went right through a house, leaving a hole each side. They looked incredibly menacing and sinister in the half-light, Colonel Frost recounted, like some prehistoric monster as their great guns swung from side to side, breathing flame. When the ammunition was switched to high explosive, their 88mm guns began to smash the houses around the heads of the defenders. At times it was hard to breathe, so thick was the dust of pulverized masonry. The building which housed battalion headquarters was hit, and Digby Tatham Water and Father Egan were both wounded. In the school, Major Lewis ordered his men into the cellars, since the Tigers could not depress their guns far enough to shoot so low. Once they withdrew, the defenders reoccupied the first floor. A brave anti-tank gunner took on one of the Tigers single-handed. He ran out, loaded his gun and fired, then ran back behind the house. Fortunately, he was under cover when the tank destroyed the gun, yet one of the two Tigers was knocked out that very evening. A round from a different six-pounder hit the turret, badly wounding the commander and another member of the crew, while a second round jammed the main armament. The second Tiger then developed mechanical problems and also had to be withdrawn for major repairs at Duttinschum. Thus ended the first day's engagement in a fiasco, wrote a member of the Compagnie Hummel. Harmel ordered heavy howitzers and more assault guns to be brought in to take over the task of blasting British strongpoints at close range. To the British defenders, this suggested that the Germans were not in a hurry, which meant that thirty corps had still not crossed the bridge at Nijmegen. In fact, Hamel was under great pressure. General Feldmarschall Model wanted the first airborne destroyed and the Arnhem Bridge opened quickly so that they could speed reinforcements to Nijmegen, having heard that thirty corps had reached the edge of the city. That evening, Model put the so-called Division von Tetal, which had just occupied Wolfhäuser, under the command of two SS Panzerkorps, for the complete destruction of the enemy west of Arnhem. The Germans could not help exaggerating their already considerable successes that day. Beatrich claimed seventeen hundred prisoners taken, four British tanks and three armoured cars knocked out. It seems that Bren gun carriers now counted as tanks. The bombardment of the houses round the bridge was far worse than what the second battalion had endured in Sicily. It seemed impossible for the mortaring to get any heavier, but it did, wrote Private James Sims. Bomb after bomb rained down, the separate explosions now merging into one continuous rolling detonation. The ground shook and quivered as the detonations overlapped. He was curled up at the bottom of a trench out on the Eusebius Binnensinger. Alone there in that trench, it was like laying in a freshly dug grave, waiting to be buried alive. It was not just the shrapnel which killed. In brigade headquarters, Lieutenant Buchanan, the intelligence officer, dropped dead from bomb blast without a scratch on him. At one stage in the fighting that day, Lieutenant Barlett of the defense platoon saw two German medics dash out to tend to British wounded in the street until they were shot by a German MG-34 and fell across the bodies of those they were trying to help. They had been shot down by their own people. The artillery forward observation officer was badly wounded, so Lieutenant Todd took over, having served in the cannon company of his American division. To speed things up, Harmel sent in the newly arrived pioneers with flamethrowers to set fire to the houses. As night came, 
Rows and rows of houses stood in flames, Armour recorded, but still the British did not give up. As a house was set on fire, they mouse-holed through from one to another. There was no water to extinguish the blaze. Some of the fires had been started to make sure that the streets were constantly lit, as one panzer grenadier explained. Then, if they tried to run across, they made good targets. But now Harmel's own panzer grenadiers were also suffering from the fires. The houses were burning and it was terribly hot, Alfred Ringstorff recorded. I got cinders in my eyes more than once, and the smoke made them smart. It also made you cough. Ashes and soot from the rubble made things even worse. It was hell. He had still not entirely recovered from a close shave earlier in the day. I took a prisoner, quite a heavy, strong man. I had him stand up and raise his hands so that I could search him. I bent down in my search, and at that very moment he uttered an O, oh, and crumpled up dead. It was an English bullet, meant for me, which had killed him. For a second I was paralyzed. Then I broke out in a cold sweat, and, driven by habit, dived for cover. Ringsdorf hated close combat, because it was one man against another, face to face, and also you never knew when the enemy would pop up. He avoided the danger of moving around at night and stumbling into the enemy. The one thing he longed to do was to take off his helmet, because it was so heavy and his neck was so stiff. The English were very good sharpshooters. Most of the German soldiers, dead and wounded, were hit in the head. He thought that the only reason he survived the battle was because he was leading. The enemy rarely shoots at the first man, but wait to see if there are more soldiers coming. They let the first couple of men go by, then attack those coming up next. As well as the fires deliberately started, much of the city center was ablaze, including the towers of the two churches, the St. Eusebius and the St. Valpurgis. Their bells made strange noises when struck by bullets. Because of the conflagration, the prison director in Arnhem opened the cells of all but the most dangerous prisoners. The liberated inmates emerged with white faces and heads shaved in their prison clothes. The blaze continued to spread. You can read the newspaper by the light of the fires, an anonymous diarist wrote laconically. Civilians started to flee the burning city whenever there was a lull in the shelling. The old and the ill had to be transported on handcarts or even in wheelbarrows. The British at the bridge had no illusions about the danger. The crackle of burning buildings and the occasional crump as floors and facades collapsed gave an apocalyptic impression. Frost and Garth climbed to the attic to watch. If the wind changed direction, then they would be trapped in a conflagration which might turn into a firestorm. Chapter 16 Nijmegen and Einhoven, Tuesday the 19th of September After all the delays to 30 Corps, the 14th Field Squadron Royal Engineers worked through the night at Son. They excelled themselves by assembling a Bailey Bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal in less than eight hours, and by 0615 on Tuesday the armoured cars of the Household Cavalry were rattling across it. Making up for lost time, they were over the river Ah and through Vechel half an hour later. The grenadier group had taken over the lead from the Irish guards, and they drove steadily all morning on towards the bridge over the river Maas at Hrave. No sign of enemy, save prisoners, the Irish guards noted in their war diary. As the huge snake of thirty corps followed, a squadron of Cromwell tanks from the 15th-19th Hussars was diverted to support the embattled 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment at best. In the two battalions dug in on the edge of the Sonsha Forest, nobody yet knew that Wierzbowski's platoon was still resisting at dawn by the blown bridge, little more than a kilometre further on. Wierzbowski hoped that the message about their plight, sent via the household cavalry armoured car, would lead to their deliverance. The remnants of Wierzbowski's little force were now on their own, because Matala's platoon, dug in on their left, had disintegrated and disappeared during the night. Wierzbowski and his men were so exhausted that they could hardly stay awake, but they knew they could not abandon their wounded comrades. Dawn revealed a heavy mist over the canal. Suddenly figures loomed out of the haze on all sides. Wierzbowski shouted a warning, but the Germans had thrown their potato-masher grenades first. 
Some men were quick enough to throw them back out of their trenches before they exploded, but one blew up in a paratrooper's face, blinding him completely. Another fell in the trench next to Wierzbowski and just behind PFC Mann, who was propped against the back of the trench and who had both arms wrapped in slings from his previous wounds. Mann yelled, Grenade! And Wierzbowski saw him deliberately slide his back on the grenade, covering it. The grenade went off, muffled by his sacrifice. Wierzbowski caught him by the shoulders. Mann looked up at him and said, Lieutenant, my back's gone. Without another sound, he closed his eyes. Wierzbowski and two others in the trench were only slightly wounded as a result. Man was awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor. Soon, Wierzbowski's platoon had fired their last rounds. They had no option but to surrender. Two German medics, whom they had captured earlier, jumped up to beg their comrades not to kill anyone. Wierzbowski and half a dozen survivors were taken back to a German field hospital. Some time later, the Germans became very agitated when a thunderous vibration began. The tanks of the guard's armored division were approaching. Wierzbowski, working through one of his men who spoke German, persuaded the major in charge to lay down their weapons, which the Americans promptly seized. Their return next day to the 502nd caused astonishment, for everyone had assumed they were dead. The rapid advance of the guard's armored division against negligible opposition caused a good deal of false optimism. It was an express drive right across Holland, Frank Gillard reported for the BBC, linking up all the way with parachutists and airborne forces who prepared the ground and made the advance possible by seizing the bridges and road junctions. In five hours, five hours only, an advance of almost thirty miles had been made. It's an incredible achievement. On hearing that the Guards' Armoured Division had reached the Hrava Bridge, Browning told Colonel Chatterton to drive down with him to meet them and Brigadier General Gavin at Overassel. Browning, although outwardly calm, was deeply concerned at the lack of contact with the First Airborne at Arnhem. The congratulations he had received in a signal from Montgomery were turning bitter, but he could not admit it. A strange rumour had also emerged back in Britain. Browning's wife, the novelist Daphne du Maurier, was rung at three in the morning by a journalist, asking if it were true that my husband had been taken prisoner. Browning failed to recognize the grenadier officer who greeted him, because his face was caked with the dust and dirt thrown up by the armored vehicles. General Boy Browning, he wrote, accompanied by an escort of very tough-looking glider pilots, was as ever immaculately dressed, a contrast to our filthy appearance. Gavin exulted at the sight of the tanks. I was really living, he said later. The 82nd Airborne's isolation was over, and with the tanks of the Guards' Armoured Division, he was now confident that they could both seize the Nijmegen Bridge and fight off any attack from the Reichswald. Gavin and Browning met Major General Alan Adair, the commander of the Guards' Armoured Division, who was taken aback to hear that the Americans had not already captured the bridge. He had assumed that it had been the 82nd Airborne's first priority, and that his tanks would simply sweep through the city and on to Arnhem. Gavin, who had been keeping his best battalion in reserve, now proposed that it should ride the Sherman tanks of the Grenadier Guards and charge the bridge along with their infantry battalion. In return, he asked for a battalion of the Coldstream to replace it on the Rosbeck sector. All the British officers agreed, unaware of the Frunsberg reinforcements which had reached northern Nijmegen. In fact, it was suggested that the town was not strongly held, and that a display of force in the shape of tanks would probably cause the enemy to withdraw. The Grenadier Guards Group, with Captain the Duke of Rutland commanding the lead motor company, and Captain Alec Gregory Hood, the armoured squadron, had meanwhile been diverted east by Erchrusbeck. A party of Royal Engineers, after checking bridges, had decided that only the span at Hermann was sufficiently robust to bear tanks. The Grenadiers had been told to meet Captain Bestabrecher at the convent of Marienbaum, five kilometres south of Nijmegen. They parked their tanks outside, but then came under air attack. Lieutenant Colonel Rodney Moore, whose aircraft recognition skills were notoriously bad, became convinced that the plane attacking them was an Allied fighter. He started throwing yellow smoke grenades to identify themselves. This rather blinded his own adjutant, Captain Tony Haywood, 
who was frantically firing the Sherman's turret-mounted machine gun at the strafing Messerschmitt. Once the aircraft had departed, Bester Blöcher led the officers over to the Hotel Sionshof. Word had spread of the meeting, and almost every member of the different underground groups converged on the place, causing chaos. Major Henry Stanley of the Grenadiers described the scene. It was a lovely sunny day, and the café had already attracted the attention of the crowds. Groups of excited civilians were pushing their way in and talking to anyone prepared to listen. The underground supporters were being marshalled together in one room by the Dutch liaison officer, all talking at once. Dutch guards, obviously impressed by the importance of the occasion, were ineffectively trying to prevent anyone coming in or out. Outside, a battery of American 75s were firing away as hard as they could, and as our tanks began to arrive, still more excited and delighted spectators joined the crowds. Meanwhile, inside the café, the owners were doing a record business. In the midst of all this, we were trying to evolve a plan to capture two bridges over one of the largest rivers in Europe. Gavin and his most trusted battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin H. Vanderwood, also arrived, and the plan was rapidly agreed. Members of the Dutch underground insisted that the plunger to blow the main bridge was in the post office building held by the Germans. Gavin promised an extra platoon of his paratroopers to help take the place. He went out and grabbed the first platoon he came across. Bester Brecher had meanwhile selected four members of the underground to act as guides for the three combat teams and the post office group. Footnote One volunteer whose services were rejected was called Jan van Hoof, a lanky boy scout. Bester Brecher refused to use him, as he was very young and seemed very nervous. Yet after the war a legend emerged in Nijmegen, promoted by a Jesuit priest, that Jan van Hoof had cut all the wires to the explosive charges on the bridge, and thus saved it. This story is hard to credit. Jan van Hoof was killed very soon afterwards in the fighting, and would not have had a chance to get near to the bridge, which was by then heavily guarded and if he had cut the wires beforehand, why did he not tell Bester Brecher, which was surely his duty in the circumstances? Once again, the bridge's survival came back to Modell's categorical order that it was not to be blown. End footnote. Gavin left to meet General Horrocks, accompanied by Adair, in a schoolhouse near Malden. Gavin told Horrocks that he wanted boats to launch an attack on the northern end of the bridge in case they did not manage to seize it that evening. Oryx agreed, and Adair said that he could bring up about twenty-eight assault boats that night. Thus, contrary to the belief of many at the time, the plan to launch an opposed crossing of the Val was entirely Gavin's. The grenadiers mounted their tanks and began the advance into Nijmegen. Part of Van der Voort's 2nd Battalion of the 505th Parachute Infantry rode on the engine decks, and the rest ran from tree to tree on the flanks, up the broad avenue of the Rospeeksweg. According to an American source, as the grenadiers advanced towards the huge traffic circle of the Kaiser Karl plain, the column came to a halt. The sharp crack of 88's firing could be heard, and Tracer was flying overhead down the street. Captain Robert Franco, the surgeon of the 2nd Battalion, decided to leave his jeep and walk ahead with an aid man to see what was happening. Captain Franco, look, his aid man suddenly called out, pointing. The source of wonderment was a pair of tankers in their black berets, sitting in the middle of the street, making tea over the usual square oil can, half filled with sand and drenched with gasoline. I looked at my watch. It was 4 p.m. Even allowing for soldiers' tales, there are too many similar accounts to dismiss them. Major Dick Winters, of the 101st Airborne, recounted that the British custom of wanting, insisting on stopping to brew up a cup of tea, left us speechless. He concluded that the British, with the exception of their airborne units, were not aggressive. The Grenadier Group, consisted of the 1st Motor Battalion and the 2nd Armoured Battalion, now reinforced by Van der Voort's battalion, a battery of the 153rd Field Regiment, and Q Battery of the 21st Anti-Tank Regiment also supported it. While the British and American guns hammered away at the north end of the Great Road Bridge, the two main attacking columns advanced into the city. One headed for the railway bridge, and the other for the road bridge. 
but they came up against heavy resistance of the Kaiser Coral Plain. German 88mm guns, well dug in, were shielded by blazing buildings. Fire-raising groups increased the destruction begun the day before, and German artillery north of the River Val was also firing into the city. The only group to enjoy any success at this attempt was the smallest one. Captain George Thorne, commanding a troop of Shermans, a platoon of grenadiers, and a platoon of paratroopers, headed for the post office, where it was rumoured a horrible little man was sitting with a plunger, waiting to blow the bridge by remote control. As they entered the southern part of Nemegan, people emerged from their houses to wave and welcome them. According to Major Stanley, the guide who was with them showed a remarkable capacity for receiving the admiration of the crowd until the first shot was fired, whereupon he subsided to the bottom of the tank and refused to stir an inch. Finally, he was hoisted up by the scruff of the neck and forcibly asked the whereabouts of the post office. He gazed around and then pointed to the building alongside which the tank had pulled up. The post office was stormed and taken, but no horrible little man was found. The grenadiers were rightly sceptical of the whole story, since the logical place for any detonating device would be on the north bank of the River Val, not in the town. But although the Germans inside the post office surrendered immediately, eight guardsmen were killed by a shell fired from across the river, which exploded in the front of the building. Some SS soldiers, including an Obersturmführer, were captured totally drunk in business premises on von Welderinstraat. They were taken back to the post office to join the other prisoners. The Obersturmführer, finding that Gerardus Ruthhäuser was a member of the underground and now with the guardsmen, told him that when the Germans recaptured the city, he and all his fellow terrorists would be shot. A grenadier hauled the Obersturmführer off, shot him, and took his watch, which he proudly offered back to Ruthhäuser as a nice souvenir. From the post office, Thorne's force advanced towards the Kaiser Ludovic Plain, a smaller traffic circle close to the south end of the road bridge. But with the open area of Hunna Park in front, they came into plain view of the 88mm guns and had to beat a rapid retreat, suffering more casualties. The German defence system ahead was formidable. To the west of the bridge, on the edge of the escarpment, stood the Valkov, the Carolingian citadel, and the Belvedere, a sixteenth-century watchtower high above the Val. And the Kampfgruppe Reinhold, including the Euling Battalion of the SS Panzergrenadiers, reinforced by a mixed group under Major Bodo Alborn, had wasted no time since their arrival in digging foxholes and slit trenches. The bridge approach was also blocked by wrecked vehicles. The town was on fire, one of Van der Voort's officers reported, and the flames silhouetted the British tanks so they were good targets for the German 88s. The tanks had to pull out. I was trapped there by the bridge. I had two platoons reinforced with fifteen British Tommies. The Germans attempted to flank us. We gathered up our wounded, six American and British soldiers, and we carried them through a burning apartment building and to the backyard. They found it had a three-meter wall, so it was hard work passing the wounded over the top. German soldiers had also been spotted digging defenses on the north bank of the Val, so some of Van der Voort's paratroopers went up onto the rooftops opposite and picked them off as they dug. Even if the sally to the bridges failed, the arrival of the Grenadiers' tanks in Nijmegen seems to have saved a number of people. A party of German soldiers was chasing a policeman working with the underground who had tried to steal a German truck full of ammunition. He fled through the air raid precaution headquarters and out of a back door. The Germans charged in and leveled their rifles at everyone working there. All the staff, nearly forty strong, had to stand with their hands above their heads as the German officer ranted that fresh German troops were arriving from all sides. The town is surrounded, he shouted. He claimed that he and his men had been shot at from this building. We are burning the whole town to the ground. At that moment, one of the men with his hands up asked if he could stub out his cigarette as it was about to burn his fingers. This provoked an explosion of nervous laughter from the others, which did not improve the German's mood. The officer said that he would hand them all over to the Gestapo, but then the rolling thunder of approaching tanks made the Germans flee for their lives. It is only when one faces death, observed one of the men there, that one realizes the great value of life. 
This sentiment was reflected in much of the population. People showed a remarkable resignation when forced to abandon their houses and possessions to the flames. They were simply thankful that they and their family were at least still alive as they fled through showers of sparks from the burning buildings. Of course, a number broke down under the strain and horror of what they had seen. After the fires set by German soldiers and the teenagers of the Reichsarbeitsdienst the evening before, most families had prepared flight cases with essentials and valuables ready for a rapid departure. A diarist described their whole street burning, the blaze started by the Germans, the occupants having to escape over garden walls. Some Germans threw hand grenades behind them, he wrote, but one soldier helps to lift children and suitcases over the walls. One group of Germans even apologized to the inhabitants of the house they were about to set ablaze. We are very sorry, but we have to set light to it. In another of the houses, a drunken German soldier continued to play the piano. Just south of their Valkhof defenses, the SS were having a wild party, throwing beer bottles. A couple of them apparently danced with wooden mannequins seized from smashed shop windows. Fleeing inhabitants gave them a wide berth, fearing what they might do in their madness. A woman described how German youths from the RAD and the SS, some of them very drunk, went shouting and screaming through the streets. They shot left and right and doused houses in petrol. They torched our whole city. Another wrote, We hear that a middle-aged couple have been driven back into the flames by those bastards. Their name was Friedrichs and they were people whose son had been executed the year before, during the strikes in 1943. He had been caught distributing leaflets. The fighting amid the blazing buildings became savage that night. A lieutenant in Van der Voort's battalion described it as a fierce hand-to-hand -hand battle in which trench knives were the only weapons used. He added that the ceaseless hunt for snipers made psycho cases out of us. The director of the concert hall described the fighting around the Kaiser Karlplain, where the Germans had started so many fires. The racket of guns, mortars, and machine guns was terrible. Most of the buildings around the Kaiser Karlplain were ablaze, including the university building, the courthouse, and the houses near the St. Josef Kirk. Smoke made the air almost unbreathable. As evening falls over the town, the air is colored red from the countless fires. Many similar images of Nijmegen burning were recorded. The center of the town looks like hell. A red glow hangs against the black sky. The crackling of the fires can be heard from afar. An increasing number of the population began to flee the town in fearful despair. SS Brigada Führer Harmel of the Funsberg refused to acknowledge after the war that the fires had been started deliberately by his own men and tried to argue that it was simply an unfortunate consequence of battle. After the violent street fighting, the whole of the north part of Nijmegen was seen to be on fire. At 21.30 that evening, Harmel's superior, Obergruppenführer Bittrich, signaled to Modell's headquarters. Commanding General 2 SS Panzerkorps emphasizes that the Nijmegen garrison is very weak. To conceal comparative weakness with extreme violence was a standard SS response. Allied commanders at Nijmegen soon saw that their frontal attack on the bridges would fail. Different methods were needed. They would have to clear the town, sector by sector, and Gavin's idea of an assault crossing of the River Val became essential. Gavin had suddenly appeared at the command post of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. According to Captain Louis A. Hauptfleisch, Colonel Reuben Tucker's regimental adjutant, Gavin had been very apologetic about the plan for a river assault in broad daylight. Hauptfleisch assumed that the order had come from General Browning when the idea was entirely Gavin's. Tucker was stoical. Okay, we will do the best we can, was his response. He told Hauptfleisch to summon the three battalion commanders for an orders group to be held on his return from the conference at Gavin's headquarters in the forest near Berchendal. Browning, accompanied by Colonel George Chatterton of the Glider Pilot Regiment, was there along with senior officers from 30 Corps. Chatterton described a guard's brigadier, probably Gwatkin, wearing corduroys and suede desert boots, sitting on a shooting stick. Reuben Tucker wore a helmet, had a hefty pistol strapped under his left armpit, 
and a trench knife on his belt. Tucker was chewing a cigar, and occasionally he would remove it long enough to spit. Every time he did, I could see looks of faint surprise flicker over the faces of the guard's officers. The plan was that once the town had been secured, Tucker's 3rd Battalion, under cover of a smokescreen and with supporting fire from the Shermans of the 2nd Armoured Battalion of the Irish Guards, would paddle across the Val well to the west of the road and rail bridges. They would then swing right along the bank of the river, and as soon as they reached the north end of the road bridge, the tanks of the grenadiers would charge across. It sounded quite straightforward. The 3rd Battalion of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment was commanded by Major Julian Cook. He briefed his officers that night on the first airborne situation and the need to cross the Val to capture the Nijmegen Bridge. His officers were rather shaken to hear that things were not going well in Arnhem. A shot went off during the briefing. Private Gitman, who had been cleaning Captain T. Moffat Burris's pistol for him, had fired it accidentally, forgetting there was a round in the chamber. The bullet went through his hand. As soon as his comrades heard of their mission the next day, they teased Gitman with the suggestion that he had done it deliberately to avoid the mission. Gitman, furious at any suggestion of a self-inflicted wound, was determined to join them the next day, even heavily bandaged. Brigadier General Gavin's surge of confidence, prompted by the arrival of the Guards' Armoured Division, would not last long. That night a German counterattack on the 508th sector by the hill in the Den Hervel woods was beaten back with help from the armoured battalion of the Coldstream Guards. But the next morning the tanks had to move south rapidly as a far more dangerous situation developed near Mook, putting the vital bridge at Hermel under threat. German attacks in preparation up and down the 30 core lifeline would threaten the whole operation. Horrocks's cosy term, the club route, was rapidly forgotten. The American name of Hell's Highway was far more descriptive. St. Udenrode, which the Guards' Armoured Division had passed through that morning, was also under attack. Fortunately for Colonel Cassidy and the 1st Battalion of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, one of the Irish Guards' Shermans had suffered mechanical problems in the small town and remained behind for repairs to the engine. When Company C reported that Germans were approaching the town, Captain James J. Hatch ran over to the tank, commanded by Sergeant Paddy McCrory, to ask if he could help. Hell yes, came the reply. Capable of no more than five miles an hour, the tank clanked up another road to strengthen the defence. McCrory advanced with his head out of the turret, despite the hail of bullets. Then, spotting a track off to the left, he followed it. After about two hundred metres, he suddenly saw a battery of three German light flak twenty millimetre guns ahead, which were firing at Company C. They were concentrating so much on their work that they did not see the tank until McCrory's gunner opened fire, putting them out of action. McCrory pushed on across to the Schindel Road. An American paratrooper, helping out in the tank, spotted a camouflaged gun ahead. He yelled at McCrory, and the turret traversed onto the target. A few moments later, the gunner also hit a German truck, which, to judge by the explosion, turned out to be full of ammunition. Some thirty German dead were counted, and fifty-three prisoners taken. When Colonel Cassidy thanked Paddy McCrory for his contribution afterwards, saying that his tank had changed the whole course of the engagement, the Irish Guard sergeant replied simply, When in doubt, lash out. Cassidy decided to make it his motto, too. His men would have little rest. Another advance on St. Udenrode took place that afternoon, as Modell's headquarters reported. 1600, counter-attack by 59th Infanterie Division, slowly winning ground on western edges of Udenrode. British tanks made a vital contribution to a much larger battle further south at best. Here the other two battalions of the 502nd were launching a counter-attack by the Sonsia Forest supported by two battalions of the 327th Glider Infantry Regiment. One report also mentions the presence of nearly a hundred armed members of the Dutch underground group PAN. The squadron of the 15th-19th Hussars in Cromwell tanks was greeted enthusiastically by the paratroopers. Their squadron leader asked the Americans to stand back as they lined up on the edge of the forest. The Cromwells opened fire together, and maintained a rapid rate of reloading. 
The tanks turned the tide of battle, Lieutenant John L. Cronin reported. The Germans saw the tanks, and they started to wave handkerchiefs and white paper. Some of the bitter end chaps shot the Germans who were offering to surrender. German officers appeared to have ordered machine gunners to shoot them down. Our men wanted to kill off the Germans, Cronin continued, but the battalion, commanding officer, said we must take prisoner every German who wanted to surrender. Then we saw them standing there, cowering before our weapons. They looked like broken men. Even the kids looked broken. They were asked why they had not surrendered sooner. Officers wouldn't let us, was the answer. Lieutenant Colonel Chapuis agreed that the tanks were the decisive factor. Reports vary, some claiming 2,600 prisoners and 600 bodies counted. Captain Legrand K. Johnson called it one of the worst massacres that I have ever seen. The firing was so heavy that most of the Germans were surrendering and quite a few of them did not have a chance and just had to stand there and take it. Another officer simply said, the operation was hardly more than a mop-up. Within two hours, the 2nd Battalion captured 700 prisoners. Chapuis had to radio for more military police, as they had so many prisoners. The 3rd Battalion's executive officer got together a group of cooks, messengers, and oddments, and took over the guard detail until the MPs arrived. By 1415, the 502nd, still supported by the Cromwell tanks, had captured Best and routed the remnants of the garrison there, which had already been savaged by Lieutenant Wierzbowski and his men. Towards the end of the afternoon, the squadron of the 15th-19th Hussars had to leave in a hurry, trundling due east towards Son. They had just received a message saying that the headquarters of the 101st was under attack from part of Mario von Maltzahn's 107th Panzerbrigade. Hartmann Wedemeyer had found a crossing over the Dommel, a massive culvert which separated the river from the Wilhelmina Canal. With a group of Mark V panther tanks, Wedemeyer surprised Major General Taylor in his command post at Sun, where he had no more than a platoon to defend the new Bailey Bridge. Shells started to explode in the small town, and a British truck on the bridge was set on fire. Taylor sent some men off to stalk the Panthers with bazookas, while he drove straight to the nearby landing ground. He rounded up some men and a 57mm anti-tank gun from the 327th Glider Infantry, and brought them back in a hurry. A hit from a bazooka and another from the anti-tank gun convinced Wedemeyer that the bridge was more heavily defended than they had thought, and he withdrew his force just before the squadron of the 15th-19th Hussars arrived. General Taylor, now fully aware of how vulnerable Hell's Highway really was, brought back a battalion of the 506th from Eindhoven to ensure the safety of the Bailey Bridge. The attack of the 107th Panzerbrigade from the east was supposed to have been coordinated with the attack of the 59th Division from the west, so the Allies had been lucky that this had not worked but it underlined the fact that the Germans could strike at will almost anywhere along the route and cut it. General Sir Miles Dempsey's other two corps in the Second Army, Eight and Twelve Corps, which should have been flanking the Thirty Corps advance, had been delayed, Twelve Corps by heavy resistance, and Eight Corps on the right by the fuel crisis. Eindhoven had enjoyed another day of celebration, singing and dancing in the streets. Girls dressed themselves in orange, with big orange bows in their hair, and horizontal red, white, and blue flags could be seen everywhere. A dummy in the uniform of a Dutch Nazi was hung from a lamppost, and streets returned to their original names. We are free, thank God, another diarist wrote. In the morning all the flags were out. The city is full of troops, mostly Americans. A never-ending line of vehicles, the English Second Army, is coming from the south, and going north, the PAN, or Netherlands partisans, hundreds of armed men, are guarding public buildings and collecting NSBers, whom they keep under guard. Women and girls who are fraternized with the Germans are being shorn of their hair. In Streep, this work is being done by an NSB hairdresser in a convent in the Bisimstraat. Dr. Boyans saw a group on the edge of the town surrounding two attractive women. They were about to have their heads shorn. The shearer was clicking his scissors when two American paratroopers from the 101st Airborne with Thompson machine guns broke the circle. 
They aimed their weapons at the self-appointed hairdressers. Stop that nonsense, they ordered. Then each one took a woman by the arm and led them off through the throng and into town. The frustrated Avengers could do little but mutter. An elderly man, standing next to Dr. Boyans, remarked quietly, They're no fools, these Americans. They're looking for women with experience of life. And if you ask me, they've picked the right ones. Both General Brereton, the commander of the 1st Allied Airborne Army, and Major General Matthew Ridgway, the commander of 18 Airborne Corps, arrived that evening in Eindhoven. Brereton was staying at Dempsey's headquarters because he knew Browning would not welcome his presence, and Ridgway was naturally still sore that his two American Airborne divisions had been put under Browning instead of himself. In any case, the two generals could not have picked a worse moment to visit Eindhoven. Ridgway later claimed that he was bombed every time he goes anywhere with Brereton. First of all, word spread of the 107th Panzer Brigade rampaging to the north of the town. We will never forget that evening and night of terror, a woman diarist wrote. About seven o'clock we heard the rumour that the Germans would re-enter Eindhoven, and that there would be a great battle with tanks. We all had to quickly get back into our houses. Just when we had done so, we were warned to take all our flags back inside, the flags that we had raised so full of pride and hope that morning. We were told the Germans would shoot at those houses, showing them. But the real danger came from the skies. Earlier in the day, two squadrons of the Household Cavalry Regiment had begun escorting more than 800 vehicles north from Leopoldsburg, heading for Nijmegen. Night had just fallen as the head of this interminable column passed through Eindhoven. Parachute flares were dropped, lighting up the whole city in a deathly glare. This signaled the start of an extended raid by Luftwaffe bombers. Eighteen ammunition trucks and petrol buzzers of the Royal Army Service Corps went up in flames, causing huge explosions. As the fires reached the small arms ammunition and shells, it sounded as if a major battle had started. Captain John Profumo, the second in command of A Squadron, and many years later Britain's Secretary of State for War, organized civilian working parties with great speed to clear the debris and allow the column to continue. If it remained blocked in Eindhoven, then the bombers would keep coming back. The fire brigade could do little, as bombs had also smashed the water mains, although British and American troops did what they could to fight the fires and rescue people. A dreadful night! an inhabitant wrote, a bombing of half an hour. Storm winds howl through the basements and cellars where people shelter. A latecomer is hurled inside by the blast. After the bombardment, there remains a huge roar, as if from cannon fire, but later we heard it was the noise from the burning trucks loaded with munitions. The woman diarist was deeply shaken, too. We all knew what fear was that night. People were killed in their cellars, and we who did not have a cellar were standing in our kitchen and prayed without stop and prayed again. We were even given absolution, as we had a priest visiting us at that time, and that made us calmer. It was as if it would never end. Roof tiles came down, all sorts of things came down, and always everything was accompanied by the ceaseless howling of shells overhead. Altogether, 227 civilians were killed, and another eight hundred wounded. With Arnhem and Nijmegen ablaze, and the centre of Eindhoven blasted by explosions, the joy of liberation had been cut short with brutality. Chapter 17 Nijmegen, Crossing the Val Wednesday, the 20th of September After the failure to get to the Nijmegen road bridge the evening before, the two very dissimilar divisional commanders, the lanky Jim Gavin and the guards Major General Alan Adair, with his First World War moustache, were in complete agreement. Their only hope now was to clear the northern part of the city block by block. Each infantry company, whether Van der Voort's paratroopers or grenadiers, was to be supported by a troop of tanks. Major Stanley waited with his company of grenadiers for dawn in the Juliana Park, with much of the city ablaze around them. It was a pretty tense business, he wrote, just waiting, 
houses on fire and the fire coming our way, driving before it various bands of homeless natives. It was heartbreaking to see their helplessness. The huge numbers rendered homeless congregated in the St. Canisius Hospital, which was experienced in dealing with disasters after the mistaken bombing of Nijmegen by American aircraft seven months before. The staff were having to feed up to 4,000 people a day. The task facing the combat teams involved in each phase was made doubly dangerous, with German assault guns moving around and suddenly opening fire. Adair therefore ordered that each street, once it had been cleared, should be blocked by an M-10 Achilles from Q Battery, 21st Anti-Tank Regiment. This tank destroyer's powerful 17-pounder gun could even knock out a Tiger tank. But, with most of the houses on fire, clearing block by block was going to be hard when faced with determined SS Panzergrenadiers. The fire raising continued during the gradual German withdrawal towards the Valkhof. Pioneers with flamethrowers smashed a window in each house then blasted a stream of blazing fuel inside. From the first five minutes the fighting did not conform in the slightest to my original plan, Stanley confessed. They were suffering heavy casualties out in the street, so they needed to go through the houses and over garden walls, although the fires were spreading rapidly. Stanley saw a German throw a stick grenade which exploded at the feet of a fellow officer and Sergeant Partridge. There was a hell of a bang— but the amazing thing was the only damage sustained was to Sergeant Partridge, who took the full blast right in his face, and was then only dazed for a few minutes, after which he got really angry and fairly set about the Hun. A very large house still lay ahead, and we had not enough men to clear it, Stanley continued. As we were having a bit of impertinence from them, we decided to cover the exits with brens and to cook them. Phosphorus grenades and a borrowed incendiary from the Americans did the trick. The house caught fire and later began to explode. The Frunsberg had used it as their ammunition dump. Prisoners interrogated later claimed that there had still been many SS troopers trapped inside. Eventually Stanley was able to report that his area had been cleared. Charlie Rotland was then unleashed. Having seen No. 2 Company on their way, I went back to see the commander— who had set up his HQ in the post office. He had a quick sleep there after a long night. But one's peace of mind, Stanley noted, with the slightly flippant hauteur of the footguards, was constantly and rudely jolted by a large and exceedingly rude enemy gun, either 150 mm or 210 mm, which intermittently plastered the whole area and made an awful mess of anything it hit. The third phase turned out to be the most bitter. With the thick smoke, Tank commanders had to stick their heads out of the turret hatch if they were to see anything at all. German snipers and machine gunners in the tops of buildings managed to kill or seriously wound four tank commanders in Major James Bowes Lyon's squadron, Major Gregory Hood's squadron, working in from the east with Van der Voort's paratroopers, experienced a savage battle with the SS Panzergrenadiers defending the Kaiser Ludwig Plain traffic circle by the Hunna Park. Out to the west, Colonel Reuben Tucker's paratroopers and Lieutenant Colonel Giles Vandeleur Shermans cleared the area behind the huge PGM power station on the southern bank of the Val. The two men had met at the 30 Corps command post early in the morning and had left together in a scout car. The power station was close to where Major Julian Cook's battalion was to launch its boats. Unfortunately, the trucks bringing the boats were slowed at Sonne, where the 107th Panzer Brigada was attacking again. A German shell reduced the number of serviceable boats from thirty-two to twenty-six. A most unenviable task later that day awaited the King's Company of the Grenadiers. Their objective was the Carolingian fortress, the Valkhof. The King's Company, first of all, seized the police station, which had a commanding position. The attached machine-gun platoon found that it provided a wonderful shoot. The King's Company went on to seize the port, and from there they could pour flanking fire onto the Valkhof. All we knew was that it was going to take everything we had got to make headway towards that bloody bridge. While his division fought with Gavin's paratroopers to clear the approaches to the southern end of the bridge, Major General Sir Alan Adair expected the Germans to blow the whole structure at any moment. I sat there gritting my teeth, dreading the sound of an explosion. One troop of grenadier tanks had been left out of battle. 
the troop leader, Sergeant Peter Robinson, a tough and experienced regular soldier, knew that in the army there was no such thing as a free rest during a battle, and he wondered what their task would be. Just after midday he received the order from his squadron commander, Major John Trotter, to go forward with him in a scout car to reconnoiter the road bridge. Trotter briefed him to have his troop of Shermans ready to charge it as soon as he received the signal. You've got to get across at all costs. Trotter then tried to make reassuring comments about contacting Robinson's wife if anything happens to you. At the end of the morning, once the northwestern section had been cleared, Major Cook, his company commanders, and Captain Henry Keep, the battalion operations officer, drove in jeeps to the power plant on the banks of the Val, close to where they were to make the assault crossing. They climbed to the ninth floor, where they had a clear view right across the river to the German positions on the far side. They were joined by their regimental commander, Colonel Tucker, and Giles van der Leer, but also by Browning, Horrocks, and Gavin. Through their binoculars the officers studied the far bank of the River Val, which was some three hundred meters wide at that point. We saw green, grassy flatlands that ran for about nine hundred yards, wrote Henry Keep, then rose to form a dike with the two-lane road on it. This was the route we would follow to the railroad and highway bridges. We could see enemy machine-gun positions along the dike and also on the flat terrain. We observed mortar and artillery units behind the dike and twenty-millimeter guns on the railroad bridge. I felt rather funny inside. I think everyone else did, too, although no one said a word. We just looked. While they were studying the lie of the land, Allied supply aircraft flying north to Arnhem were greeted by a veritable wall of small arms and flak from the positions across the river. Horrocks told Gavin how impressed he was that his paratroopers were able to sleep before such an ordeal. Fortunately, none of them had seen what we had, Henry Keep observed. The original idea was for the assault companies to get into their boats in the Marsval Canal, just to the west of the PGM building, as they would be out of sight. But the current was too swift where the canal entered the river, so they had to launch the boats from the bank just upriver from the power station. Vandeleur, whose tanks were to provide fire support for the crossing, had also brought Major Edward Tyler to discuss details with Colonel Tucker. The plan to cross the river put the fear of God in me, Tyler said. He asked Tucker if his paratroopers were trained in assault crossings. Tucker replied that it would be a case of on-the-job training. He added, just stop the crowd shooting at us and we'll do the rest. Tyler was concerned about his tanks hitting the paratroopers, but Tucker told him to keep firing. If they were too close, then his men would fire flares or wave banners. Tyler was concerned that his sixteen tanks, silhouetted on the skyline, would be vulnerable, so he spaced them out as much as he could, with twenty meters between them. There was a tall wire fence in front, which the Shermans would push flat by advancing slowly. Tyler was dismayed to find that at ground level it was impossible to identify the well-camouflaged German gun positions, which had been quite easy to spot from the top of the power station. Tucker's second battalion, with every machine gun they could lay their hands on, also took up position to increase the volume of fire. Well to their rear, the Leicestershire Yeomanry, with their sextant self-propelled twenty-five-pounder guns, would be providing the smokescreen. The delay to the trucks bringing the boats did not help Cook's battalion to relax. As the hour of three o'clock approached, Lieutenant Virgil F. Carmichael observed, the men became more nervous and tense. I clearly remember one man taking out a camel cigarette, lighting it with a valued Zippo lighter, and throwing the pack away and throwing the Zippo away, saying that he would have no need of them no more. As it turned out, he did not. Major Cook, tried to lighten the atmosphere by joking that he was going to imitate George Washington in the well-known picture crossing the Delaware. He was going to stand erect in the boat, and with clenched right fist pushed forward overhead, he was going to shout, Onward, men, onward! Purely because another officer had been expected to take command of the battalion, Cook had not been well received when he arrived, but that was about to change dramatically with the bravery and leadership he would show that day. 
Behind the embankment and the tanks, Cook's officers split their platoons, allocating thirteen men to each assault boat. When the trucks eventually arrived, just before 1500, the paratroopers were appalled to find that the twenty-six boats were just canvas on a flat-bottomed wooden frame. Two companies, H and I, were to form the first wave. G Company would follow as soon as the three men of the 307th Airborne Engineers, who were to crew each boat, managed to bring them back. As many recognized, the engineers had the most terrifying job of all. The Leicestershire Yeomanry opened fire with smoke shells at exactly 1500. When the order was given at 1515, the paratroopers and engineers shouldered the boats like coffins with their outside hand carrying weapons and ran over the top of the dike, then down the slope. They slipped and slid in the mud, struggling to get their boats straight in the water as they clambered aboard. As soon as the assault boats were in the water, the Irish guards and the Shermans opened up with their thirty-two Browning machine guns, and so did Tucker's second battalion with theirs. The 376th Parachute Field Artillery Battalion took on targets further to the rear. At first the smokescreen provided by the Leicestershire Yeomanry worked quite well, but soon large gaps started to appear. Tucker asked Giles Vandeleur if his tanks could help. Each Sherman had only a dozen smoke shells, so they did not last long. The Irish guards also found that their Browning machine guns had got so hot from firing that they ran away, which meant that even when the trigger was released they carried on firing until the belt was finished. Lieutenant Carmichael, who was in the first boat with Major Cook, a devout Catholic, heard him saying his rosary, and as he struck the water with his paddle you could hear him say, Hail Mary, full of grace, on through the rosary, repeating it over and over again as he paddled as hard as he could toward the other bank. There was no question of standing in the prow like Washington. Everyone paddled as hard as they could, some even using their rifle butts or hands. Henry Keep, who had been an oarsman at Princeton, was counting one, two, three, four, but their efforts were all over the place. Keep had a rather incongruous vision of our coxswain at Princeton on Lake Carnegie, pounding rhythmically on the sides of the flimsy shell, and of our rowing in unison, pulling to the time of his beats. Then the Germans began firing in earnest, with small arms and machine-gun fire from the positions in front, and machine-gun and twenty-millimeter fire from the small nineteenth-century Hof von Holland fortress, slightly to their right, and even from the railway bridge a whole kilometer beyond that. At first the fire was erratic, but then the Germans started to get the range, and it increased greatly in intensity. There was smoke on the water, Lieutenant John Gorman of the Irish Guards noted. You could see the splashes as the bullets hit, and the Americans sitting in the boat suddenly slump over. Some compared the effect of bullets on the water's surface to a hailstorm. It was a horrible, horrible sight, Giles Vandeleur recorded. Boats were literally being blown out of the water. I could see huge geysers of water shooting up as the shells hit the water, and the small arms fire coming from the northern bank made the river look like some sort of seething cauldron. If one of the engineers steering a boat was hit, then it circled aimlessly until someone else took over. In everyone's ears, wrote Henry Keep, was the constant roar of bursting artillery shells, the dull wham of a twenty millimeter, or the disconcerting ping of rifle bullets. There was also the unmistakable thwack whenever a bullet struck a body. One boat had so many holes in it that men were bailing water with their helmets. The arm muscles of those paddling screamed with the strain. Lieutenant Hyman de Shapiro, the assistant medical officer, recognized that in such a battle all he could do was bring extra dressings and morphine. Doctors were little more than glorified aid men, he said. I looked up at the man sitting beside me and saw his head disappear presumably the result of a direct hit from a twenty-millimeter shell. Like the Protestant chaplain who sat just behind him, Shapiro's main purpose was to provide moral support. The chaplain, Captain Delbert Cool, a rough, tough Alaska sardo who saw the light really saw it, in Shapiro's words, was exhausted from paddling. Shapiro did not notice him hand his paddle to someone else, so on seeing that Cool's hands were empty, he handed him his. Every man on that crossing had a sensation of utter vulnerability. I felt as naked as the day I was born, Henry Keep wrote. 
We were soaked, gasping for breath, dead tired, and constantly expecting to feel that searing sensation as the bullet tears through you. I wanted to vomit. Many did. Somehow or other, we were three-quarters of the way across. Everyone was yelling to keep it up, but there was little strength left in anyone. But at last, we reached the other side. We climbed over the wounded and dead in the bottom of the boat, and up to our knees in water waded to shore, where behind a small embankment we flopped down, gasping for breath, safe for the moment from the incessant firing. Out of the twenty-six boats that made the initial crossing, only eleven returned to collect the second wave. Some had sunk, others drifted with the strong current, with their cargo of dead and men so badly wounded that they could do nothing. Dutch civilians further downstream, having seen what was happening, waded out to pull the casualties into shore. Lieutenant Gorman of the Irish Guards watched the first wave reach the bank. I was horrified by the smallness of their numbers. I didn't see how they could possibly get a foothold with so few men. Along with Browning, Horrocks, and Tucker, Giles Vandeleur had a grandstand view from the top of the power station. My God! What a courageous sight it was. They just moved across that field steadily. I never saw a single man lie down until he was hid. Yet from across the river, the effect of distance made it look as if the paratroopers were just strolling about. Once the first wave was on the far bank, Major Tyler ordered his sixteen tanks to lift their machine gun fire and to start hammering the Hof van Holland with their seventy-five millimeter guns. They began with armor-piercing, then switched to high explosive. That prompted the crews of the two twenty millimeter guns on the fort to switch their fire to the Shermans, and they killed one of Tyler's tank commanders. At one point, Tyler saw a grey horse towing an anti tank gun on its own towards the railway bridge. The crew must have been killed. He gave the order to fire at it, and one of the tank gunners, a former groom who loved horses, managed to hit the weapon with a solid armor piercing round, destroying it utterly without harming the grey. The range was almost a kilometer. The horse walked on, as unconcerned as if he had been out making the morning milk deliveries. The tanks started to run short of ammunition, and a haze from the fighting made it extremely hard to distinguish American soldiers from German. But by then there was no doubt who was winning. All along the shoreline now, our troops were appearing deployed as skirmishers. Keep's account continued. They were running into murderous fire from the embankment eight hundred yards away, but they continued to move forward across the plain in a long single line many hundreds of yards wide. They cursed and yelled at each other as they advanced, non-coms and officers giving directions, the men firing from the hip their BARs, Browning automatic rifles, machine guns and rifles. Steadily they moved forward. All this time the second battalion and the tanks on the other side of the river were giving us marvelous support. Many times I have seen troops who are driven to a fever pitch, troops who, for a brief interval of combat, are lifted out of themselves, fanatics rendered crazy by rage and the lust for killing, men who forget temporarily the meaning of fear. It is then that the great military feats of history occur, which are commemorated so gloriously in our textbooks. It is an awe-inspiring sight, but not a pretty one. Staff Sergeant Clark Fuller described his own experience of this sudden metamorphosis from fear to fearlessness. When we finally got to the opposite shore, I experienced a feeling I never felt before. All the fear of the past fifteen or twenty minutes seemed to leave me, to be replaced by a surge of reckless abandon that threw caution to the winds. I felt as though I could lick the whole German army. The courage and aggression of the American paratroopers prompted one guard's officer to observe, I think these paratroopers must be fed on dynamite or raw meat. Any notion of belonging to a particular platoon or company had disappeared in the confusion. Officers collected whatever men were near them and charged off in small groups to attack the isolated strong points on the way to the bridge. Most of the German troops defending this sector of the Val came from a replacement battalion which had arrived from Herford the day before. SS Untersturmführer Gernot Traupel Reinhold's adjutant, had been shaken to see them when they arrived. The soldiers were very young, about seventeen years of age, and they looked to me like children, even though I was only twenty-one years old. When paratroopers killed them in their foxholes, 
They hauled the bodies out and, using them as sandbags, fired from behind them until they had caught their breath again. Colonel Tucker, catching up with his men, pulled one of the boys out of his foxhole by the scruff of his nag. They were all quivering in fear. He told them in German that they were prisoners of war and would not be shot. As soon as Tucker loosened his grip, the boy jumped back into his hole to cower there. As Cook's men moved east along the embankment towards the railway bridge, they first had to deal with the Hof von Holland fort, surrounded by its stagnant moat. According to Lieutenant Carmichael, one man managed, through some vigorous action, by swimming the moat and climbing the wall, to get on top of Fort von Holland, and while there, our men would toss live hand grenades up to him, and he would pull the pin and drop them into the portholes from his protected position on top of the fort. At the same time, a small group of men charged over the wooden bridge and into the tunnel which led to the open courtyard within. Those inside surrendered quickly. Bill Downs of CBS reported that seventy-five German bodies were dumped in the algae-covered moat. Pushing on towards the railway bridge, Lieutenant Richard G. La Riviere, always known as Rivers, reported that they ran into a bunch of German soldiers who wanted to surrender. He estimated that there were thirty or forty of them, ordinary run-of-the-mill soldiers. But as there were only fifteen to twenty paratroopers, they shot the Germans on the spot. In the chaos of the fight, Paratroopers found money scattered along the road after a German paymaster had abandoned his case in flight. They grabbed just a few banknotes as souvenirs, not imagining that they were valid currency. By this time it was almost dusk. Anyone who looked back across the river would have seen the dreadful sight of Nemigen on fire, with the flames reflected on the water. As Captain Carl W. Capel's group came to the railway bridge, they saw Germans jumping in panic from the side nearly a hundred feet above the water. Some were so scared that they leaped, even though they were still over the river bank. According to some accounts, they had tried to surrender and been told to give themselves up to the paratroopers on the south side. There was confusion, a captain reported, and at that point several Germans threw grenades on our men, who opened fire with rifles and machine guns. Once firing started, there was no stopping it. Some of the paratroopers tried to shoot the Germans jumping from the bridge in mid-air, but Cabell ordered them to stop as they were running short of ammunition. They swung German machine guns, mounted to cover the bridge, and opened fire with them instead. Trapped by men from the 2nd Battalion on the southern side, the Germans suffered a fearful massacre. I did see old German men grab our M1s and beg for mercy, Corporal Jack Bomber recounted. They were shot point-blank. Such as war. He remembered an officer saying before they climbed into the boats, No prisoners, just shoot them, there's no time. Captain Capel spoke to the company commander from the 1st Battalion, which had followed them. This officer boasted that they had taken many more prisoners than Cook's battalion. You captured yours, Capel retorted. We shot ours. Without counting those who jumped, 267 bodies were retrieved from the railway bridge alone but one report states that 175 prisoners were taken there. There were apparently also cases of paratroopers removing gold wedding rings from dead Germans, which usually required cutting off the finger. A number of their comrades strongly disapproved, but it did little good in the savage atmosphere of victory. Word spread in the German army about the massacre. Oberst Fulrida wrote in his diary a week later, The Americans behaved, as always, in a contemptible fashion. They threw our wounded from the bridge into the Val and shot the few home guard they took prisoner. The throwing of wounded into the river was almost certainly not true, yet it reflected the fear and hatred which German troops felt for the American airborne, having been told by Nazi propaganda that they were all recruited from the toughest jails. The Irish guards passed back a radio message to announce that the 3rd Battalion had reached the railway bridge, but the guards' armoured division understood that they had reached the great road bridge a kilometre further on. Major Trotter gave the word to Sergeant Robinson to prepare. The Grenadiers, however, were still fighting against Eiling's battalion of SS Panzergrenadiers in and around the Valkhof, and the rest of Trotter's Shermans were firing rapidly in support. Eiling's command post was in the 16th century brick tower, the Belvedere, between the Valkhof and the bridge. A German artillery observation officer, after his radio set had been destroyed, had managed to continue obtaining fire support from across the river 
by shooting flares at the intended target. The King's Company of the Grenadiers, with the tallest man in the regiment, wrote Major Stanley, stormed the fort after breaking in through an unguarded alley. Their commander was killed with a bullet through the head. Oiling's panzer grenadiers claimed to have shot eighteen grenadiers in the head. Captain Bestabrecha later saw the slogans Oiling's men had painted on walls in the Valkov. We black ones trust the Fuhrer. Our faith is loyalty, which was the SS motto. Rather death than tyranny. The coward is a scoundrel. Death to the murderers of the homeland. And we believe in Adolf Hitler and our victory. Robinson commanded his troop from a Firefly Sherman with the powerful 17-pounder gun. He was given absolute radio priority so that he could keep in constant touch with divisional headquarters. It seemed the whole town was burning, Robinson remembered, as the four tanks charged towards the ramp. His tank was hit just as they got to the bridge, and his radio was knocked out, so he took over the next Sherman, much to the anger of the sergeant who commanded it. Captain Lord Carrington, the second in command of Number One Squadron, and much later Margaret Thatcher's foreign secretary, stood in the turret of his tank, knowing that he was next to go. Close by, Lieutenant Tony Jones of the 14th Field Squadron Royal Engineers was also ready. His task was to deal with any wires and explosive charges as soon as the tanks crossed over. The sight of Tracer flashing down the centre of the huge road bridge really made me feel we had a chance of capturing it intact he recorded. I can still see Peter Carrington's face as he looked down from the turret of his tank before going over. He looked thoughtful, to say the least of it. Colonel van der Voort later recalled that it was pretty spectacular. When the lead tank reached the crest of the bridge, it came under fire from an 88mm gun, sandbagged into the side of the highway about a hundred or so yards from the north end of the bridge. The tank and the 88 exchanged about six rounds apiece, with the tank spitting point thirty tracers all the while. Quite a show in the gathering dusk. The tank was not hit, and the 88 ceased fire. Sergeant Robinson thought that his tank had knocked it out with a direct hit from their main armament. During the dash across the bridge, Robinson had not realized that a German rifleman, high in the superstructure of the bridge, had been shooting at him. He was too busy directing his own tank's fire and operating the turret-mounted Browning to gun down fleeing German infantrymen. Robinson and his crew could feel their tank bumping over the bodies of those they had killed, and later found their tank tracks covered in blood. The scene was also observed from the village of Lent by Brigade Führer Hamel, who said, I always had a cigar in my mouth, and in critical moments I would light it. When I first saw the British tanks, I lit the cigar. Robinson and his tanks carried on for a little way through Lent to where the road goes under the railway line. Paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne opened fire at them and they fired back, but fortunately both sides realized their mistake before anyone was hurt. In their relief, the paratroopers jumped on the tank, kissing it and, it seems, the tank commander. But from then on, accounts diverge wildly. The guards refusing to advance without orders and the paratroopers accusing them of cowardice and abandoning their airborne comrades. Carrington arrived some time afterwards, and a defensive perimeter was formed, with the four tanks facing outwards. Robinson, Carrington, and their crews stayed awake, either by walking around or by sitting against one of the tanks. They shared a bottle of whiskey which Carrington had brought with him, while they waited for a company of the Irish guards to join them. Some highly coloured American accounts describe officers from the 82nd Airborne berating Carrington for his refusal to advance because he had been ordered to await infantry support. One even claimed that he had put his Thompson submachine gun to Carrington's head. It is rather more likely that the righteous indignation of the Americans was so intense that they convinced themselves in hindsight that they really had told the British what they thought of them. Footnote Eisenhower's chief of staff, General Walter Beadle Smith, said, after the war, I doubted that the British armour could get up there, to Arnhem. Ours might have. Brigadier Führer Hamel, on the other hand, insisted that they would have stood no chance once they got there, because by this time Arnhem was in German hands. End of footnote. Just behind Robinson's tanks, Lieutenant Jones of the 14th Field Squadron had begun cutting wires as soon as they were on the road bridge. 
a troop of his royal engineers arrived immediately afterwards and began removing the explosive charges. It proved anxious work, as officers from Cook's battalion also found. Countless crowds who had been trapped in the middle of the bridge, when both ends had been secured, had sought temporary refuge high up in the steel girders. From these vantage points, they continued to fire at us, and also at the vehicles, as they passed beneath them. In spite of the darkness, we constantly sprayed them with automatic fire. As dawn broke, a gruesome sight greeted the eyes. Intertwined grotesquely throughout the massive steel girders were the bodies of dead crowds, looking for all the world like a group of gargoyles leering hideously at the passers-by, hundreds of feet below. Both grenadiers and Cook's paratroopers were convinced that they had taken the Nijmegen Road Bridge first. Perhaps, inevitably, in the circumstances, few accounts tally, even on the same side. Several American versions indicate that the tanks were across first, and a few British ones that American paratroopers were there already. Such a debate, however, is futile. It is far more important to understand the reasons for the British failure to advance on to Arnhem that night. Tucker and his paratroopers were understandably furious. Cook's battalion and the engineers manning the boats had suffered eighty-nine dead and one hundred and fifty-one wounded. They naturally believed that the only reason for their semi-suicidal crossing of the Val in full daylight was because every hour counted if thirty corps was to save the first airborne at Arnhem. Otherwise the attack could have waited until after dark. Horrocks must shoulder most of the blame for the resulting damage to Anglo-American relations. He had supported Gavin's plan for the assault crossing of the Val. To underline the urgency, he had emphasized to Tucker's officers the desperate situation which the 1st Airborne Division faced, and the American paratroopers were better able than most to imagine what it would be like for their British counterparts. Then, as soon as they had achieved their objective with heavy losses and almost unbelievable courage, nothing happened. Horrocks even wrote in his memoirs, Another hurdle had been overcome, and I went to bed a happy man. There were many good reasons why the Guards' Armoured Division, and especially the Grenadiers, could not push on that night. For a start, the Grenadier Group had suffered heavy casualties in Nijmegen, and they were still fighting Erling's Panzer Grenadiers until after 2200, so they could not disengage. And apart from Robinson's troop, all their tanks were low on ammunition and fuel. This was why Brigadier Quatkin and Major General Adair decided to switch back to having the Irish Guards in the lead, but due to the chaos in the burning city of Nijmegen, the Irish Guards' tanks had not yet been resupplied with ammunition after their massive expenditure in support of the crossing. Horrocks, on the other hand, should have foreseen these problems and ensured that some well-prepared battle group was waiting and ready to advance rapidly north towards Arnhem through the night. He was not one of those fixated by the doctrine that armor should operate only in daylight. I was a great believer in using tanks at night, he wrote. I tried it on three occasions and was successful each time. It has a shattering effect on the morale of the enemy. Horrocks may have been exhausted once again from his injuries, but this was not the moment to go to bed a happy man. Whether or not the road to Arnhem was wide open that night has been another area of debate, but even the strongest and freshest battle group, with General George Patton lashing them on, would have been lucky to get through. That afternoon the Germans had retaken the Arnhem Road Bridge and were sending Panzer Grenadiers and Tiger tanks south to Nijmegen. The simple truth is that 30 Corps was too late, and so was the capture of the Nijmegen Bridge as a result of defending the Hrosbeek Heights. On the German side there was fury, frustration, and bewilderment. As soon as Robinson's tanks had crossed, Brigade Führer Hamel, who was watching from the village of Lent, went straight to Reinhold's command tank. He radioed Bittrich to warn him that the Allies were over the Val. Teleprinters began chattering and telephones ringing in various headquarters with a good deal of shouting. Modell's chief of staff, General Leutnant Hans Krebs, was having to field a lot of difficult calls, sometimes by pretending that nothing had changed. At 1835, on being asked by the chief of staff of the Wehrmacht Bewehrshaber Niederland about the blowing up of the bridges over the Val, the chief of staff of the army group explained that the Nijmegen bridges should not be blown up for the time being. In another communication at the same time, he insisted that, with the forces rapidly dispatched from Arnhem, including two Panzergrenadier battalions, several Tigers and assault guns, 
the breakthrough onto the north bank of the Val should be sealed off. Less than an hour later, the operations officer at two SS Panzerkorps rang Modell's headquarters to report that the enemy was now definitely established across the Val. The situation is extraordinarily tense. Some German officers, including Brigade Führer Hamel of the SS Frunzberg, tried to claim that, despite Modell's order not to blow the bridge, the plunger had been pushed, but nothing happened. Hamel even said that he gave the order as the Grenadier tanks were crossing, but this version of events was presumably the reaction of an officer hoping to protect himself from Hitler's fury. Others maintain even less convincingly that its demolition was delayed so that the remnants of Eulings' battalion could escape. Modell was angry and embarrassed. That morning he had again refused Bittrich's request to blow the two bridges and withdraw to the north bank. He had insisted that the bridgehead be maintained. He had been convinced that Reinholz and Eulings' SS Panzergrenadiers would be able to hold on, so when he heard about the Allied crossing, he made noises about putting both men in front of a court-martial. In fact, both Reinhold and Euling instead received the Knight's Cross for their leadership and bravery. Modell could hardly deny the existence of his own order. SS Obergubenschirer Rauter stated, The Commander-in-Chief of the Army Group, General Feldmarschall Modell, informed me personally that he reserved for himself the decision to blow the Nijmegen Bridge. He wanted the bridge to be left intact in all circumstances. Modell may have been a brutal Commander-in-Chief, but he was not one to try to pass the blame on to a subordinate. When the frantic telephone calls came from the Wolfschanze in East Prussia, Beatrix's headquarters described the outcome simply. The question from the Wehrmacht command staff about the responsibility for the failure to blow the bridges was answered by Army Group. At that stage of the war, only Modell could have faced Hitler's fury and got away with it. Brigadier General Gavin had not been able to see his men's feet of arms crossing the Val. At about 13.30, when still at the power station, he had received an urgent call over the radio from his chief of staff, who had been calling him without success for nearly an hour and a half. General, you better get the hell back here, or you won't have any division left. Major attacks had developed in the north against Weiler and Beek, against Hrusbeek in the center, and in the south against Mook. They consisted of Kampfgruppe Becker in the north, Kampfgruppe Greschik in the center from the 406th Division, and Kampfgruppe Hermann in the south, with the first six battalions from Mindel's two Fallschirmjäger Corps, supported by some Mark V Panther tanks. Gavin drove off rapidly in his jeep back to the divisional command post. He felt bitter that bad weather in England and a shortage of aircraft had yet again delayed the arrival of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment. His forces were far too stretched to defend a sector some fifty kilometers long. The greatest danger was in the south, where the attack on Mook threatened the Hermann Bridge and the Thirty Corps supply line. Gavin's insistence on bringing in airborne artillery early paid off when the 456th Parachute Field Artillery managed to slow the German advance with help from a squadron of tanks from the Coldstream Guards. There was fighting in the streets of Mook and in the houses. Gavin, on reaching his command post, was surprised to see Major General Matthew Ridgway, the commander of 18 Airborne Corps, talking to members of his staff. Gavin concentrated on studying the situation map, rather than on the courtesies of briefing his superior officer. Things looked so dire that he felt he had to leave for Moke straight away, and did so without acknowledging Ridgway's presence. Ridgway did not forgive Gavin's behavior for some time. He was already in a foul mood after the bombing in Eindhoven, where he had become separated from General Brierton, but above all because Browning was commanding the Corps in action and not him. The bad British planning and their lack of drive exasperated him and seemed to confirm his worst prejudices. When Gavin reached the edge of Mook, he found a paratrooper with a bazooka shaking visibly and a Coldstream guard's tank on fire which had run over an American mine. He told the sergeant and lieutenant who were with him to go up onto the embankment with their rifles and start firing as fast as they could to give the impression of a strong defense. A paratrooper from the 505th then appeared with a prisoner, a real apple-cheeked kid about eighteen, a fine, tough-looking kid. He was in Falschirm Jäger uniform. Gavin went forward, squirming on his belly across a road and then onto the line of foxholes ahead to reassure his men that reinforcements were coming. 
This was doubly impressive, considering that the young commander was in such pain from his back that he found his hands were becoming numb. During a lull a few days later, he visited the doctor, who, unaware of the cracked spine, said it was just part of the nervous system reacting to the stress of battle. Gavin carried on. Physical damage to you doesn't mean much in battle if you're really into the battle, he observed later. If you're so excited and carried away, you don't know things like that. You can get shot without knowing what's happening to you. Gavin made a habit of deliberate understatement. Horrocks was tickled by his casual remark, We're just having a bit of a patrol, when his men were launching a major raid or attack. Moak was retaken in a counterattack, but by then Gavin had moved north. Kampfgruppe Becker had advanced through Weiler to take Beek, and was pushing towards Berchendal. Brigadier Gwatkin, having heard of the threat, sent a troop of Q Battery, 21st Anti-Tank Regiment, in their M10 Achilles tank destroyers to Beek, which certainly helped. Gavin arrived to encourage the men in the front line, and was relieved to find their battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Louis Mendez, appeared well in control. The Kampfgruppe Grischik, attacking Krusbeck, proved to be the least of Gavin's worries. German riflemen had infiltrated the small town the previous night, through a culvert underneath the railway track, and in this way managed to reach the centre. They stood little chance against the better-trained and better-armed American paratroopers. Father Hook recounted that they dug a large grave for seven German soldiers that day, but left it open in case there were any more, and there certainly were. Prosbeckers greatly admired the relaxed way American paratroopers set off to fight, a gun in one hand and an apple in the other. Further south, the 101st were also under pressure as the Germans tried to cut Hell's Highway in two places. At dawn, Panzerbrigada 107, with a motorized battalion of Falschimjäger, attacked Son again. They drove their tanks up to the canal bank, Lieutenant Colonel Hanna reported, and pinned down most of the personnel in one of our battalions. Major General Taylor found his command post in a school under direct fire. A thirty-corps convoy rolling north was under threat, but fortunately the 15th-19th Hussars were still in the area and counterattacked with the 1st Battalion of the 506th. They were then supported by part of the 44th Royal Tank Regiment, which had been heading towards Helmond with the 2nd Battalion. There were anxious moments for the 101st Airborne Military Police Platoon guarding nearly 2,000 prisoners in a cage little more than 400 metres away from the Panthers. Our own command post and supporting troops pulled out and left us sitting practically on the front lines, wrote a sergeant. We had our interpreters tell the prisoners to lie down and be quiet. There was also a Luftwaffe attack, but fortunately no prisoners were hit. Panzerbrigada 107 withdrew, somewhat battered by the British armoured squadrons. That evening it reported the loss of seven tanks and twelve half-tracks. Even so, Colonel Hanna was struck by how badly Allied intelligence had underestimated the enemy's strength and degree of organisation from the beginning of the operation. In every case, the Germans far exceeded the expected rate of reorganisation and were able to launch a coordinated attack with infantry and armour by D plus two, the 19th of September, which was entirely unexpected. With none of the 101st Airborne supply trucks getting through the congestion on Hell's Highway, the paratroopers were on short rations. Having used up their initial three days' supply, they had to live off turnips as well as food captured from the Germans or donated by ever-generous Dutch civilians. Fortunately for the Allies, B Squadron of the Household Cavalry Regiment discovered that day a vast German food store at Us. It also engaged a steamer flying the Nazi flag and three barges sailing along the Waal, which prompted regimental headquarters to reply to its report. Congratulations on brilliant naval action. Splice main brace. General Taylor reinforced the Son crossing with a battalion and decided to move his headquarters to Kastel Henkenshagen, on the western edge of St. Udenrode. An advance detail then returned to say that German tanks were attacking the new command post. Taylor called Lieutenant Colonel Cassidy at St. Udenrode and said to him, Can you clear them out? I don't like tanks round me. Cassidy, who had six tanks from the 44th Royal Tank Regiment attached to his battalion, took them up the road to sort out the situation. That day, one of Cassidy's platoons captured a prisoner from Heiter's 6th Falschimjäger Regiment after an engagement. 
He told them that his patrol had been sent out specially to destroy Sergeant McCrory's tank. The Irish Guard Sergeant, meanwhile, had been asked by Cassidy to see if he could help evacuate any survivors from two British tanks knocked out by Panzerfaust on the road to Kuvering. If all they have up there is a bazooka, McCrory replied, we shall knock it out. The American who wrote the report for Britain's headquarters was clearly mesmerized by the larger-than-life Sergeant McCrory. When they reached the two damaged Shermans, McCrory climbed down from his tank and went to the first one. The commander was very badly wounded. He saw that he was still breathing, but that his skull was laid back and his brains hanging out, and that another shard had ripped his abdomen open and bared his intestines. He was beyond help. An American soldier then witnessed McCrory suddenly sprang from the tank and run forward rapidly about twenty yards towards the right-hand ditch, pulling out his revolver as he ran. As he came to it, he fired down and a little forward four or five times. McCrory returned to the tank with a dead, suckling piglet in his hand. He threw it to the American, saying, "'Tonight we'll eat.' McCrory continued the advance, taking the place of the two knocked-out tanks. He carried on in his slowly grinding vehicle— even when they came under fire from a German 88mm gun concealed in a house. He fired three rounds of 75mm into the house. Then Skip fired three more rounds into the garden, getting the 88. Six dead Germans were found inside. By now the Sherman tank was almost level with the monastery. McCrory figured the steeple was being used for an observation post, and said to his gunner, Aim right for the cross. The gunner hesitated. McCrory told him again, I said aim for the cross. So he fired and ruined whatever usefulness the steeple might have had. A German armored reconnaissance vehicle appeared, and the gunner hit that with his first round. The Bailey Bridge at Sohn had been an obvious choke point on the 30 core supply route, but in General Oberst's student's view, the most sensitive spot was Wichel, the wasp waste of the enemy corridor. Wichel, in the words of Captain Lawrence Critchell, was a neat, cheerful, and homey little town, with plain trees and a village square. Although disappointed not to find any tulips or windmills, the captain relished the fact that Colonel Johnson found himself in the sort of setting he liked best. It was bristling with comic opera war. So many people wanted to provide information on the Germans that Johnson's staff had to post reliable members of the underground outside their headquarters to filter all those demanding an audience. The collaborators were routed out of their homes for a long, delayed retribution. The girls were mostly rather young and sensual-featured, and they went undemonstrably to have their hair shorn. They seemed to accept it as an expected fate, and the Dutch crowds who watched the tonsorial administration of justice displayed none of the sickening and almost animal glee that French crowds showed on similar occasions. They were amused, that was all. The gaiety of the young in the streets was infectious when they sang and danced in clothes of symbolic orange and scarves made from parachute silk, and their parents never complained when soldiers dug foxholes and slit trenches in their lawns and rosebeds. But the idyll of liberation came to an abrupt end during the afternoon of Tuesday, the 19th of September, when German artillery began to bombard the town. Paratroopers in their foxholes dropped out of sight, like prairie dogs. The 59th Infanterie Division attacked Wechel from Schendel. Student himself went to observe. I watched a flak platoon from the Reichsarbeitsdienst, which, with its two large 88mm guns, was shooting at American snipers, who sat in the tall trees and hindered our attack from the flank. Meanwhile, east of the canal, around Dinter, in the marshy and difficult forest and scrub terrain, the Falschirm Marsch Battalion, under Major Jungwirth, was fighting its own small war but with their light weapons they could not prevent the reinforced 1st Battalion of the 501st from taking Dinter and Heiswijk on the 20th of September. The battalion was hardly reinforced. It was just superbly led and executed a brilliant encircling maneuver. Colonel Johnson had finally given in to the pleading of Lieutenant Colonel Harry Kennard that he might a sweep along the canal to the northwest towards Heiswijk, where all their jump casualties had been captured by the Germans in the castle there. Kinnart had argued that because the corridor was so narrow, their only hope of holding off the Germans was by offensive action. Kinnart's operation that day was hugely successful, netting 480 prisoners for the cost of two men wounded. 
Some of the prisoners were so young that they had not even started shaving. If Kinnard's battalion had been reinforced, a student tried to claim, then its auxiliaries had consisted of Dutch volunteers on bicycles acting as unarmed scouts, pedalling ahead and off to the flanks. Johnson, impressed by Kinnard's results, decided to repeat the exercise next day with two battalions this time. They would mount a night attack due west to Shindel. The battle for Hell's Highway was about to escalate rapidly. Although finally free of German occupation, the citizens of Nijmegen were in no mood to celebrate. The carnage from the battle for the bridge shocked all those who saw it. It was there that I saw precisely what war really signifies, wrote Father Wilhelmus Petersen, whom the Americans named the priest on the bridge after his ministrations in the wake of the fighting. Mutilated bodies, severely wounded and dying soldiers. The road was littered with hand grenades. The casualties were all German, but that did not, of course, stop Father Petersen from kneeling to comfort the dying and help the wounded, while captured German medics worked on their fellow countrymen under the eye of an American officer. German soldiers concealed in cavities below the bridges emerged to surrender. Lieutenant Jones, the Royal Engineer, was assisted by a prisoner with excellent English, but without any boots, who showed him where the explosives were concealed. The prisoners, who included some Marines and a few Russian heavies in Wehrmacht uniform, were marched to the southern end. Suddenly a shot rang out, and an American airborne officer fell dead. The SS officer responsible, who had concealed himself in the girders, was riddled with bullets. When German prisoners from the bridge were escorted into the town, their reception by the civilian population was none too friendly, observed Father Petersen. But wars aren't won that way. Albertus Oyen also witnessed their reception. There is whistling and jeering at German prisoners of war. They walk with their arms raised. One of them cannot keep this up. One hand is practically gone, just a lump of raw flesh. Blood is pouring down. Their appearance is awful, black as soot or sallow, sweaty, torn uniforms, no more helmets or belts, no more badges, no more buttons even. It is a dreadful sight. Suddenly I am struck again by the beastliness, the absurdity of war. The American paratroopers escorting them tell the Dutch, who are hooting and hissing, to stay calm. The inner town was one great heap of ruins, Father Petersen recorded. On Boerstraat, an enormous tank was buried under the rubble of houses that had collapsed. Occasional shots were heard among the ruins. No doubt some foolish Germans who wanted to vent their rage. Volunteers in overalls and gloves were already collecting the dead from the streets on horse-drawn wagons and recording unexploded shells for disposal later. In a less damaged southern part of Nijmegen, an American paratrooper, Noted that there were lots of mounds of earth and wooden crosses stuck in the narrow grassy area between street and sidewalk. The local people had gathered up the German corpses and buried them. But the fighting and terrible fires had been too much for many people, not just the homeless. They trekked out to neighboring villages, where they were touched by the generosity of strangers, welcoming them into their homes. The flames and smoke from the city could be seen from a great distance. That night... Field Marshal Montgomery sent a characteristically confident signal to General Eisenhower. My appreciation of the situation in the market area is that things are going to work out all right. The British Airborne Division at Arnhem has been having a bad time, but their situation should be eased now that we can advance northwards from Nijmegen to their support. There is a sporting chance that we should capture the bridge at Arnhem, which is at present held by the Germans, and is intact. Chapter 18 Arnhem Bridge and Osterbeek, Wednesday, the 20th of September Wednesday dawned with light rain, which did little to dampen the flames around the north end of Arnhem Bridge and the town centre. One of the few civilians left in the area gazed in horror at the church of St. Falburgis and noted that the towers looked like great columns of fire. Frost force suspected that they did not have what Monty considered a sporting chance of holding the bridge, yet they also guessed that their presence had more than inconvenienced the Germans. Brigadier Führer Hamel, while directing operations in Nijmegen from the north bank of the Val, 
longed to hear that the British First Airborne had been crushed. Damn them, but they're stubborn, he cursed. He desperately needed the road bridge opened, because the improvised ferry system at Panaden simply could not cope with reinforcements and supply. Bittrich's headquarters felt obliged to explain to higher command that the delay in eliminating Frost's battalion was due to their fanatical doggedness. Frost and his men would never have accepted the word fanatical, but they would have acknowledged a thoroughly British bloody-mindedness. Ammunition was almost totally exhausted. Not a single Piat round remained to deal with armoured vehicles. Although Frost was no longer optimistic about their chances, a belief had taken hold that this is our bridge and you not set one foot on it. A signaller had told him that they had made contact with divisional headquarters. Frost had his first chance to talk to Urquhart, who told him that things were very difficult for them, too. Frost assured him that they would hold on as long as possible, but ammunition was the problem, along with medical supplies and water. He then asked about Thirty Corps. Urquhart knew little more than he did, and Frost sensed that he and his men would not be relieved. Jokes about the guards' armoured division stopping to blank over their belts and polish their boots were no longer funny. The day before, he had discussed with Freddy Goff of the reconnaissance squadron what they should do if they had to break out. The obvious direction was due west to Osterbeek, but Frost thought it might be better to slip out in groups towards the north, through the back gardens. The desire to know the whereabouts of Thirty Corps continued to preoccupy everyone. Captain Bill Marquand, in brigade headquarters, sent a signalman up into the attic with a thirty-eight set. Desperate to make contact, he was broadcasting in clear, over and over again. This is the first para brigade calling Second Army. There was still no response. More and more buildings had been destroyed by fire or shelling. Often the two were linked, as the Germans used phosphorus shells to accelerate the process. After capturing the second last house on the eastern side, the Germans sent in pioneers to fix charges to the underside of the bridge so that it could be blown if British tanks did break through from Nijmegen. A counterattack led by Lieutenant Jack Greyburn forced them back, and sappers removed the charges. The Germans attacked again, and Greyburn, wounded twice already, was killed with a burst of machine-gun fire from a tank. He was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. Accompanied by Panzer Grenadiers in their camouflage smocks, a battalion of Royal Tiger tanks reached Arnhem that morning, making a terrible noise as it crossed the Willems Plain from the direction of Philp. However, a sixty-ton Panzer Colossus, General Oberst student acknowledged, could not be very effective in the narrow streets and the house-to-house -house fighting. They at least did not run the risk of crushing gun crews. Artillery pieces fired on a smooth asphalt surface meant that the gun could run back up to ten meters each shot, and it was not easy to jump clear in time. Kampfgruppe Brinkmann, meanwhile, passed from a period of exceptionally savage night fighting, Brigade Führer Hamel wrote, to a technique of smoking out individual pockets of resistance with Panzerfausts and flamethrowers. With the British blinded by smoke, Brinkmann's force advanced. A great many prisoners, mostly wounded, were taken. In the school, Captain Eric Mackay issued two pills of benzedrine to each of his sappers, but took none himself. The men were exhausted and filthy, Mackay recorded. I was sick to my stomach every time I looked at them, haggard and filthy with bloodshot red-rimmed eyes. Almost everyone had had some sort of dirty fuel dressing and blood was everywhere. Their faces, with three days' growth of beard, were blackened from fighting fires. Parachute smocks and battle dress trousers had been cut away by medics to tend their wounds. Everyone suffered from a terrible thirst. They had been drinking the rusty water from those radiators which had not been hid. The Van Limburg's Durham School now looked like a sieve. Wherever you looked, you could see daylight. It was the last British redoubt holding out on the east side of the bridge, which is why the Germans again concentrated such firepower upon it. Mackay was concerned that it might collapse on top of them, as Harmel had hoped, with his tactic of blasting the building systematically from the top. Shells from one of the newly arrived Mark VI Tigers set fire to it once more early in the afternoon. Mackay recognized that they urgently needed to do something for the thirty-five wounded men in the cellars. Major Lewis had himself just been hit in an explosion. There were only fourteen able-bodied men left, 
So if the fires in the building intensified, or if the floors began to collapse, they would not have time to get them out. They decided to break out so that the school could be surrendered and the remaining wounded in the cellars left to be cared for by the Germans. With six men acting as vanguard with their remaining Bren guns and eight acting as stretcher bearers for four of the wounded, they made their move. But the break for freedom was short-lived. Almost all were captured. Ringsdorf from the Kampfgruppe Brinkmann recorded seeing someone look out from a cellar aperture. My immediate reaction was to toss a hand grenade through the cellar window. Then I heard a voice shouting, No, no, and the sound of moans. I had already pulled the pin on my grenade, so I tossed it in the direction of another building. Then I went down into this cellar, alert for any trap, and entered, saying, Hands up. The cellar was full of wounded English soldiers. They were very frightened, so I said, It's okay. It's good. I took them prisoner and had them taken back to be tended. These wounded men were quite hopeless, and many had to be carried away. They looked terrible. Ringsdorf showed impressive restraint, because his company commander, Obersturmführer Vogel, whom he had greatly liked, had just been cut almost in half by British machine gun fire. Frost was discussing the situation with Major Douglas Crawley, one of his company commanders, when they were both badly wounded by a mortar bomb. Captain Jimmy Logan, the medical officer, suggested morphine, but Frost refused, as he needed to keep his wits about him. He fought the pain and nausea as long as he could, but could not even face drinking whiskey. He told Major Freddy Goff to take over command, but to check all major decisions with him first. Eventually he accepted morphine, and was carried down to the cellar of the brigade headquarters on a stretcher. Although Frost still wanted to hold on to their positions, they had lost the houses closest to the bridge. The Germans were soon on the ramp. Using tanks, they shunted the burned-out carcasses of Gribner's reconnaissance vehicles to one side. So just before Tucker's paratroopers and the grenadiers secured the road bridge at Nijmegen, the Frunsberg was already sending through those first reinforcements of panzer grenadiers and tiger tanks. When Frost awoke that evening, it was dark. He heard some shell-shock cases gibbering. Many more started shaking uncontrollably every time there was an explosion. Apparently there was one soldier whose black hair went white in the course of less than a week from stress. The doctor, Captain Logan, warned that the building was on fire, so Frost sent for Goff and told him to take over command in full. First they would move those fit to fight and the walking wounded. Only around a hundred remained. Then Goff was to arrange a truce to hand the wounded over to the Germans. One paratrooper wrote, It was undoubtedly the right decision, but some men who were in a bad state felt aggrieved at being abandoned even though the battalion doctor and medical orderlies were staying with them. As soon as the truce began, the Germans tightened the ring. They then insisted that they must take the British jeeps to evacuate the wounded. By that stage, Goff was in no position to refuse such a condition. When the truce to remove the wounded began in earnest, Lieutenant Colonel Frost removed his badges of rank. Captain Logan went out with a Red Cross flag. There was a shot, and he yelled back, "'Cease fire!' Only wounded in here, he added. The shooting died away. Outside, he explained to a German officer that they needed to get everyone out before the building burned down or collapsed. The officer agreed and gave his orders. As German soldiers came down the stairs, a badly wounded paratrooper brought out a Sten gun from under his equipment, complete with full magazine, with every intention of giving the Germans a fitting reception. But luckily he was overpowered and the gun taken from him. A German officer entered the cellar in great coat and steel helmet, carrying an MP-40 submachine gun. He looked around at the dreadful sight, and told the men following to help the wounded out. Both Germans and British carried them out before they could be burned to death. Frost was taken out on a stretcher and laid on the embankment next to the bridge. He found himself next to Crawley, with whom he had been wounded. Well, he remarked, it looks as though we haven't got away with it this time. No, Crawley replied, but we've given them a damn good run for their money. But Frost felt anguished at leaving his battalion in such a state. I had been with the second battalion for three years. I had commanded it in every battle it had fought, and I felt a grievous loss at leaving it now. 
Lance bombardier John Krug, when told to surrender, found it harshly ironic to be surrounded by the German prisoners he had been guarding. He smashed his rifle, a forlorn action in the circumstances. A big SS panzer grenadier pointed a submachine gun at him, shouting, Hände hoch! Then some of their German prisoners tried to console him and his comrades by patting them on the back, saying, Kamerad! There were altogether some 150 German prisoners, many of them wounded. In the courtyard, wounded British paratroopers were greeted by the sight of a six-pounder anti-tank gun on its side, with the rubber tire still burning and the crew dead around it. Some of their guards, from the army and not the Waffen-SS, allowed them some food and something to drink before moving them on. The paratroopers were both shaken and secretly gratified to see the numbers of German dead lying around. But the sight hardened the mood of some SS panzergrenadiers. After a thorough search for hidden weapons, half a dozen paratroopers and sappers were forced to stand against a wall. The SS panzergrenadiers formed a semicircle facing them, and they were joined by a very young soldier with a flamethrower in the middle. One of them gave the order to prepare to fire. Say your prayers, boys, a paratrooper said out loud, and another began to recite, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Suddenly an SS officer ran up, shouting, Das ist verboten! Nein, nein, nein! The Panzergrenadiers lowered their weapons with obvious reluctance. A member of the underground who had been fighting with the paratroopers was identified by the Germans because both his hands were bandaged from terrible burns. He had tried to pick up a phosphorus bomb to throw it away. He was forced to his knees and shot through the back of the head by a German officer. As the truce came to an end, Major Digby Tatham Water took charge of some of the survivors who had left the buildings where wounded were being evacuated. They took up new positions in a garden area behind brigade headquarters and the ruins of a few houses, but their perimeter was now tiny and almost every building was on fire. Others tried to escape during the night through the German cordon, hoping to get through to the 1st Division at Osterbeck. Very few made it. Most of the wounded were taken off in the captured jeeps to a church where a British doctor treated their wounds. The more serious cases were taken directly to the St. Elizabeth Hospital. The surgeon, Dr. Peter de Graaf, who had ordered the wounded to be moved back from the windows because of all the shooting in the area, was struck by how little shouting there was in the British Army. When a group of SS came in to round up malingerers among the German patients, the SS doctor started shouting orders in all directions. Nobody really cared, de Graaf noted. The man yelled because there was nothing he could do but make a noise. The British and Dutch doctors just went about their business, pretending he wasn't there. There had been only one civilian casualty in the last two days. An elderly patient had stuck his head out of an upstairs window to see what was going on, and was shot by a sniper. He was buried in the hospital grounds, along with the bodies of British soldiers. Although the fighting around the hospital was over, the Germans were still nervous. A tank rumbled down the road towards the St. Elizabeth Hospital, its tracks making a metallic screeching sound. The turret traversed round to the right, with the gun pointing at the main entrance of the hospital. The hatch opened, and a German officer in black panzer uniform appeared. He shouted that he wanted to see the director, claiming that he had been shot at from the hospital building, and unless he appeared immediately he would open fire with his tank. The German surgeon came out instead. Originally captured by the British, he had in theory assumed control when the Germans retook the hospital, but he continued to work with Dutch and British doctors as before. He told the panzer officer that he had been very well treated, and he was sure nobody had fired from the hospital. The tank commander calmed down and carried on along the road towards Osterbeek, where the next battle was about to take place. On the previous afternoon, stragglers from those other battalions which had tried to reach the bridge had started to appear in Osterbeek. They had presented a sorry sight. A heavy officer and NCO casualty rate over the last two days meant that most men were leaderless. The disaster they had experienced attempting to fight into Arnhem had risked undermining good order and military discipline. A company sergeant major in the 11th Battalion recounted that during the retreat a staff sergeant whom he had charged with an offence in the past, drew his revolver to scare him, saying, Now we're all equal. Nobody will know. And yet, reassuringly, 
The sergeant major had also overheard a private say to his companion, clearly another Londoner and fellow fancier, I'll be glad to get back to my pigeons. The commanding officer of the light regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Sheriff Thompson, was alarmed to find that there was no covering force in front of his pack howitzers just below Osterbeck Church. Some troops of 11th Para Battalion were very shaky, he noted. Thompson began to organize the remnants of the four battalions into a defense line facing east to protect his guns. Having lost at least three-quarters of their strength, the 1st, 3rd, and 11th Parachute Battalions, as well as the South Staffords, were now reduced to less than 450 men combined. They became known for the time being as Thompson Force. Under the command of the redoubtable Major Robert Kane, the South Staffords placed themselves near Osterbeck Church in the laundry. The old rectory of the Terhorst family, already the aid station for the Light Regiment, would also become an improvised hospital for the southeastern sector of the perimeter. Private William O'Brien in the 11th Parachute Battalion limped into the church and lay down on one of the pews for a sleep. The church had been badly battered, and he could see the sky overhead through the shell damage to the roof. I began to think of my own skin now, O'Brien admitted. It seemed to me they had got us into something they had no business getting us in. But according to his account, an unnamed Dutch lady, who was probably Kate Torhorst, came to encourage the wounded, saying, Have courage, God is with you. A number were not convinced that he was, but they were impressed by her bravery during bombardments, and the occasional malingerer was shamed into returning to his post. The 4th Parachute Brigade under Hackett had still not yet managed to reach any form of safety after their bruising battle the day before against the Hohenstaufen blocking line along the Dreyensweg. The survivors of the 10th and 156th Parachute Battalions were at less than half their strength. With Brigade Headquarters, they prepared defensive positions south of the railway line. Hackett wanted to push on east to Osterbeek during the hours of darkness, leaving before midnight, but General Urquhart told him to stay where he was and make his move after dawn. Hackett was right to be concerned. Urquhart evidently had not known that the Border Regiment had pulled back its company from the key crossroads to the south, which Hackett's force would need to use. During the night, the Germans moved in and took up positions in that area, both on the Wolfheser Road and around where the Bredelan reached the Utrechtsweg. So when the 156th Battalion led off next morning, it had a fearful fight against infantry and assault guns to clear a way through. From 270 men, the battalion was reduced to just 120 men still capable of fighting. With pressure building up from the Kampfgruppe Kraft to the north and from Kampfgruppe Lippert's SS Unteroffizier Schuler Arnheim to the west, Hackett's force was almost surrounded. He ordered the 10th Battalion to strike off to the northeast, which seemed the only way out. But in the woods, contact was lost and Hackett found himself moving with just the remnants of the 156th Battalion, his headquarters, and a sapper squadron. Sheltering in a ditch, Major Geoffrey Powell saw Hackett run through enemy fire to where three jeeps stood. One was ablaze, another next to it was packed with ammunition, and the third had a trailer with the badly wounded Lieutenant Colonel Derek Heathcote Amory strapped to a stretcher. Hackett leaped into the driver's seat, shielding his face from the flames, started the jeep, and drove it out of range, thus saving the wounded man's life. Powell thought Hackett deserved a VC. Heathcote Amory, the head of the Phantom Detachment, with the direct radio link to the War Office, was later Harold Macmillan's Chancellor of the Exchequer. Further on, the enemy fire was so strong that when Powell and the remnants of the 156th Battalion found a large crater in the woods, they slipped into it and took up all-round defence. With the other brigade personnel, they were about 150 strong. It was less than a thousand metres from the Hartenstein and safety, but German strength was increasing. Staff Sergeant Dudley Pearson, who was Hackett's chief clerk, found himself next to a terrified young soldier who just fired his rifle vertically in the air. Exposed to mortar fire, their losses were heavy, especially among officers. Pearson also saw one collapse beside him, shot with a bullet through the throat. The commanding officer of the 156th, Lieutenant Colonel Sir Richard de Vaux, was killed. So was his second-in-command, Major Ernest Britson, and Hackett's brigade major. After the defenders had held off German attacks for most of the afternoon, 
Hackett announced that they were going to break out by charging straight through the German line towards British positions some four hundred metres away. Powell agreed that, however suicidal it might appear, it was certainly better than staying there to be picked off as their ammunition ran out. So we lined up on the rim of the hollow and waited for Hackett to water us forward. Hackett first went to say goodbye to the wounded, whom they had to leave behind. A corporal refused to come. He insisted on remaining so that he could give them covering fire. When their cavalry brigadier shouted, Charge! The paratroopers burst out screaming and shouting and firing their sten guns. Pearson saw Hackett, also armed with rifle and bayonet, pause above one cowering young German soldier, change his mind and push on. The astonished Germans in front of them scattered and, with the loss of half a dozen men, the remaining ninety broke through to positions held by the border battalion from the air landing brigade. The tenth battalion, bringing their wounded commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, also reached the Hartenstein perimeter. But they too were down to about seventy men, close to a tenth of their original strength. The twenty-first independent parachute company, reinforced by sixty glider pilots and a troop of airborne sappers, fought back against the Luftwaffe Kampfgruppe from Dillen, backed by assault guns. They were a kilometre due north of the Hartenstein, and based themselves on a large house called Omershof. The Germans had crossed the railway line during the night and were hoping to slip through to cut them off. The inexperienced Luftwaffe conscripts were facing some formidable fighters, including the German-speaking Jewish pathfinders who had no intention of giving ground. A German officer approached, shouting, Hinder hoch! demanding their surrender. The commander of the sapper detachment told his men to hold their fire, but then hurled back abuse when the German continued to demand their submission. A burst of Bren gun fire made the irritating man dive for cover, and the battle continued. Late in the afternoon, during a slight lull after another attack, the defenders were surprised to hear music through the trees. A German loudspeaker van was playing Glenn Miller's In the Mood. The paratroopers were even more amused when it was replaced by a voice calling to them in English. Gentlemen of the 1st Airborne Division, remember your wives and sweethearts at home. It then tried to claim that many of their senior officers, including General Urquhart, had been captured, so it was perfectly honourable for them to surrender. This provoked catcalls and insults and whistling, then firing. Stayed in position all day, wrote a paratrooper called Mollet. Plenty of mortaring and sniper fire, so made myself a humdinger of a little trench. Got another cert when a bunch of jerrys came right out into the open in front of us, also several possibles. Heard a mobile speaker in the distance. Funny shooting jerrys to dance music. A little further down the railway track towards Arnhem, with the King's Own Scottish borderers, minus two companies cut off during the retreat from the landing zone. They were dug in around the White House, the small Hotel Dreerort. Colonel Peyton Reed, who had felt so embarrassed on being welcomed there as a liberator, could only prepare for one of the most devastating battles in the regiment's history. They were facing a reinforced Kampfgruppe craft, backed by tanks and assault guns. On Wednesday the 20th of September, the borderers held off the probing attacks without too much difficulty. But the real fight would come on the morrow. On the western side, the border regiment, which up until now had not seen heavy fighting, became involved in several different battles as the SS Kampfgruppe Iberwein advanced. The withdrawal in front of Division von Tetau had meant abandoning the Wolfheser Institute, where an SS Hauptsturmführer was convinced that a British general was being secretly treated. When Dr. von der Beek denied this, a gun was thrust into his back. If you are lying, it will cost you your neck. Still at gunpoint, Dr. van der Beek had to give the SS a guided tour of every room in the Institute. No general was found, so the Germans took away a British military chaplain who had been helping tend the wounded. The companies of the Border Regiment were clearly too spread out as the retreat gathered speed on the Tuesday. Three of them were pulled back and brought closer together over a front not much more than a kilometre and a half wide, running south from the Utrechtsevich. But as the woods were quite dense, there was little communication. The borders had to dig in well, because the mortar stonks came in suddenly to catch men out in the open. 
and because there were gaps between the three companies, small groups of SS and even a tank managed to filter through. One of the few remaining 17-pounder anti-tank guns, directed in person by Colonel Loder Simmons, destroyed it conclusively. D Company had been reinforced with some RAF radar operators who had never fired a rifle before. So, our RSM walked up and down the parapet of their trench, wrote the company commander, giving them weapon training instruction during the battle. A Company was on its own, between the railway line and the Utrechtsevich. With a platoon of glider pilots on its right, it faced Lippert's SS Unteroffizier Schuller Arnheim, probably the best unit in the Division von Tittau. A glider pilot lieutenant called Michael Long bumped into a German soldier at close quarters in dense undergrowth. They both shot at each other at point-blank range, the German with the submachine gun and Long with his Smith & Wesson revolver. Long, shot through the thigh, was the more badly wounded. He had only managed to hit the German's ear, so the immobilized lieutenant became the prisoner. The German bandaged his leg, and Long bandaged his head. Then the German's platoon commander, Oberleutnant Engelstadt, arrived. He and Long chatted pleasantly about where they had fought in the war. Engelstadt had been in Italy, Russia, and the Western Front. Long asked which he had preferred. Engelstadt glanced round at his men, then bent down with a grin on his face. The West! he replied, anything's better than Russia. While the perimeter was starting to close during the latter part of Wednesday, many inhabitants of Osterbeek tried to escape. They took what they could carry and fashioned crude white flags, often just a handkerchief or napkin tied to a stick. A Polish war correspondent in the woods south of the Amsterdamsevich was approached by women in tears, asking where they could possibly go to escape the fighting. We heard a great scream above the thunder of the artillery, he wrote. A large group of children came running through the trees and tried to make their way across the uneven terrain, falling and getting up again. There were more than ten of them, led by a girl of about sixteen, the eldest of the children, no more than ten years old, and all running after her. Those civilians who decided to stay either moved mattresses down into their cellar if they thought it strong enough, or sought shelter with neighbors. Many found that the Tommies wanted to come in for a wash and a cup of tea and a little rest. But even those who had filled their baths to the brim feared that water might soon be a major problem. In the middle of the northern part of the perimeter, the Hotel Hartenstein was losing its elegance by the hour. Paratroopers ripped the shutters off to provide covering for their trenches. German shells had already started to break open the roof, and smoke from burning jeeps blackened the white walls. The large and solid figure of General Urquhart brought reassurance to many, but there was not very much he could do, now that they were trapped. The sad remnants of his division would hold on in the hope that if they maintained their bridgehead north of the Rhine, then the Second Army could use it as soon as they had cleared their way from Nijmegen through the Polderland of the Bekuwe, or the island. The American forward air controller with the First Airborne, Lieutenant Paul Johnson, reported how they came under heavy mortar fire. An RAF sergeant helping the team was killed. He and his men were well dug in, but their vehicles and equipment remained exposed. As the shelling grew heavier, the rest of them practically lived in their slit trenches. He thought the radio operators behaved bravely under fire, considering it was the first time they had been in combat. Since there was little he could do outside the Hartenstein, the other American lieutenant, Bruce Davis, went out on patrol at night. Three of us went after a machine-gun nest and found it about four hundred yards from divisional headquarters. There were six men sitting by it, doing nothing. We threw two grenades and then went back. On the way back I shot a sniper, who fell about twenty feet out of a tree, hit in the head. I think that was one of the most satisfying sights I have ever seen. He was either careless or overconfident, for he had chosen a tree higher than the others and not very thick with foliage, and making a beautiful target. He did not even see me. Encirclement at Osterbeek by SS forces represented an even greater danger to the many Dutch volunteers assisting the British. One of the most remarkable was Charles Dahl van der Krupp, a naval officer who had fought in the defense of Rotterdam against the German invasion in 1940. He had been imprisoned by the Germans in a camp in Poland from which he had recently escaped to take part in the early phase of the Warsaw Uprising. Reaching Arnhem just before the airborne landings, 
Van der Krapp was ready to offer his services at the Hartenstein. Lieutenant Commander Arnoldus Wolters, a Dutch liaison officer who knew of him by reputation, asked him to turn some forty Dutch volunteers into a company. But, because of the shortage of weapons and ammunition, their main task was to retrieve supplies parachuted behind German lines. Dal von der Krapp longed to hit back at the Germans, but he did not believe that the British could win, and that would mean the sacrifice of these brave young men for little advantage. The British would be taken prisoner, the Dutch boys would be shot on the spot, he explained to Urquhart's intelligence officer, Major Hugh Maguire. Maguire listened carefully and had to agree with his pessimistic assessment. The young volunteers were told to disband and go home. The majority left with great reluctance, yet a number insisted on fighting to the end, while several more went to work in one of the improvised hospitals. While the British were surrounded, they also held a considerable number of German prisoners who were placed in the hotel tennis courts under guard. The regimental sergeant major in charge of them was astonished to see how few of them were wounded, which annoyed me at the time, as we were getting it outside the courts. It was perhaps confirmation of the renowned accuracy of German mortar teams. The prisoners' rations handed to a German officer were exactly the same as those the British were receiving. The portion worked out to half a biscuit and about a sixth of a sardine per man. This was done with great care, and each German filed by to collect some. They were very sullen about it. When the Hartnerstein came under heavy mortar fire that day, one of Bruce Davis's American radio operators was hit. Colonel Warwick drove him in a jeep straight to the dressing station at the Hotel Schonot. But while he was still there, the Germans overran the hospital. To avoid becoming a prisoner, Warwick hurriedly removed his tabs and badges of rank and worked as a private. Warwick, a large, cheerful man, was not easy to conceal, but he got away with it. The southern road to Osterbeek Church was not the only route left open following the retreat from the battle round the St. Elizabeth Hospital. A kilometre or so to the north, a group of South Staffords arrived out of breath at the crossroads in Osterbeek by the Schonot. Many stragglers claimed to have panzers right behind them to justify their panic, but the appearance of three German tanks proved they were not exaggerating. A troop from the 2nd Air Landing Anti-Tank Battery was fortunately present, and managed to fight them off. The attackers came from Kampfgruppe Müller. According to Hans Müller, the British six-pounder anti-tank gun they came up against also killed Oberstumbannführer Ingel at the head of his company. There was little left of him from the direct hit. Müller's pioneers from the Hohenstaufen now had some twenty-millimeter light flat guns, two tanks, and an assault gun supporting them. These vehicles quickened their advance around the Utrechtsweg by flattening garden fences. The Kampfgruppe had also been reinforced with RAD, Kriegsmarine, and Luftwaffe personnel. They had no training in street fighting, but those that survived soon learned. Demands to surrender were ignored, Miller wrote later, or answered with caustic remarks such as fucking Germans. He claimed that the British also gave more humorous answers over loudspeakers by playing Lili Malin or We'll hang out our washing on the Siegfried line. But there was no doubt about the intensity of the fighting. Anyone who was rash enough to venture to look out of a window would be found with a hole in his head. Despite the heavy gunfire outside the Schonot, the volunteers carried on washing patients using a bucket and soap. Kneeling by their patient, they threw themselves flat at each explosion. The wounded, who were not completely incapacitated, put on their netted parachute helmets, which looked incongruous in bed. According to Hendrika von der Flist, one of the British doctors announced that patients must take care of the medical cards attached to their battle dress, because all their medical details were recorded there. You mustn't lose it, he joked, otherwise the wrong arm or leg might be amputated. This apparently raised a big laugh. Suddenly shouts came from the hotel kitchens, some of the Jews, who had been released from the prison in Arnhem, had been in the hotel kitchens chatting with a few of the walking wounded and orderlies. Being unaware of the Nazi racial persecution, the British soldiers could not understand why they had been locked up just for being Jewish. They knew astonishingly little of the Nazis' racial policies. In the middle of this conversation, a Waffen-SS officer appeared. He pointed his gun at one of the British medical orderlies and shouted, 
Weapons! Do you have weapons? He then pushed open the swing doors, threw to what had been the dining room, and was now another ward. This huge officer appeared in the doorway in full combat kit. He had black stubble, an unwashed face, and a buff and SS camouflage jacket. According to Hendrik von der Fliest, he looked around with glittering eyes. Other Germans followed. All the British medical orderlies raised their hands in the air. None of them were armed. While this was happening, the Jews escaped from the house through a back door. Sister Seuss entered the dining room and took the threatening German by the arm. She said very calmly, This hospital has just been shot at. No, sister, no, he replied. We are not like the Americans. We don't shoot at a hospital. She pointed to the bullet holes in the wall. He quickly insisted on seeing his wounded compatriots. A British doctor came over, and Hendrika von der Flist accompanied them to translate. The British doctor pointed out the German wounded. The German officer shook the hand of the first one and congratulated him on being free again. He asked how he had been treated. There was a note of challenge in his voice. Hendrika did not think that the wounded German looked delighted at the announcement of his liberty. He just replied that he had been very well looked after. According to Colonel Warwick, who was watching incognito, there could have been one exception, through no fault of the medical staff. An ardent young Nazi had refused morphia and any help for four hours. He had a shattered knee joint and must have been suffering considerably. Eventually he gave in, shouting, Kamerad, and allowed himself to be treated. The officer also insisted on seeing the operating theatre where a German soldier was undergoing minor surgery. On looking at his compatriot, he suddenly said, Mustas sein. Does this have to be? As if the war was simply an unfortunate misunderstanding with tragic consequences. German officers often tried to claim that they had never wanted the war. Wir haben es nicht gewünscht. It had been forced on them. The commanding officer of the field ambulance, the imperturbable Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Marable, still puffing gently on his pipe, said to his staff, Good show, chaps. Don't take any notice of the Jerry's. Carry on as if nothing has happened. The sudden German advance in eastern Osterbeck posed another serious problem. It made it much more dangerous to transport the wounded from the Schonort to the surgical department in the Hotel Tafelberg, though such transfers were still possible when the firing was less intense. As a result, one of Marable's doctors had to take off a soldier's shattered foot with an escape file for sawing through prison bars as all the amputation saws were in the Tafelberg, on the other side of the front line. The Hotel Frebeck, just across the road from the Schonort, had been turned into a post-operative centre, but soon it was much more. A courageous young woman called Janne von Leuven arrived with a horse and cart loaded with wounded men, whom she had collected and then driven through firefights. Her clothes were so soaked with the blood of the wounded she had cared for that she was given battle dress, which she wore until they were all captured later. Although the show note was clearly marked with many Red Cross symbols, the machine gun fire continued, and an assault gun fired four rounds into the building. The wide windows at the front of the hotel were gaping holes bordered by wicked glass stilettos. The utterly vulnerable wounded could do little but pull their blankets over their faces as a defense against flying glass, which made them look a little like children trying to hide under the bedclothes. Mortaring was constant, and several men were rewounded by shrapnel. Plaster dust covered the faces and heads of the staff, as if they had been in a fight with flower bombs. Both Dutch volunteers and Royal Army Medical Corps personnel were astonished at how uncomplaining their patients were, showing little more than the mirthless grin of pain. The fighting in both Arnhem and Osterbeek caused deep mental wounds as well. Psychological breakdown from combat fatigue could produce many strange forms of behavior. One man, although hardly wounded physically, would take off all his clothes and walk round the room, pumping his arms and making noises like a locomotive. From time to time, he would utter a string of curses and say, Blast this fireman! He was never any good! Another casualty would wake people at night, bend over them and stare into their eyes to ask, Have you got faith? At the St. Elizabeth Hospital, Sister Stransky had a strange encounter with a case of German combat fatigue. A Wehrmacht soldier appeared armed with a pistol. Sister Stransky, a Viennese, 
refused to allow him to come in. He kept repeating to her, I have come all the way from Siberia with a new weapon to rescue the Führer. When still refused entry, he sat down on the steps of the hospital entrance and began sobbing. Some died with great calm. The sergeant, who knew he was dying, said to a medic, I know I'm not going to live. Would you please just hold my hand? The main German attack that day was aimed against the southeast corner on the lower road towards Osterbeck Church. Colonel Thompson had asked for some more officers to help get the sector organized for defense, and he was sent Major Richard Lonsdale, the second in command of the 11th Parachute Battalion. Lonsdale, an Irishman, who had won the Distinguished Service Order in Sicily, was the officer who had been wounded in the hand by flak shrapnel just before jumping. He went forward to sort out the defence line, about a kilometre in front of Colonel Thompson's howitzers. Suddenly a soldier shouted, Look out! They're coming! Lonsdale saw three German tanks coming out of the woods onto the road some three hundred metres away. Infantry were also advancing behind a self-propelled assault gun. Lance Sergeant John Baskerfield, of the South Staffords, was in command of a six-pounder anti-tank gun. He and his crew destroyed two tanks, in each case by waiting until they were within a hundred yards. Baskerfield, although badly wounded in the leg and alone after the other crew members had been killed or wounded, carried on loading and firing. In a renewed German attack, his six-pounder was knocked out, so he crawled across to another, the crew of which had all been killed. Baskerfield manned it single-handed, and firing two shots, knocked out another self-propelled assault gun. Whilst preparing to fire a third shot, however, he was killed by a shell from a supporting enemy tank. Baskerfield was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. A little later, flamethrowers set off a panic, and one group of South Staffords, who broke and ran, had to be rounded up by an officer and ordered back into the line. The Germans renewed their attack several times that afternoon. At one point, a German self-propelled assault gun was tucked in on the far side of one house, so Major Robert Kane spent a considerable time playing a form of deadly pétanque, firing piat bombs over the top of the roof on high elevation as if it were a mortar. A gunner officer, Lieutenant Ian Meikle, bravely clung on behind the chimney above, trying to guide him onto his target. It cost Meikle his life when a German shell hit the chimney, while the constant firing of the piat perforated Kane's eardrums. Two tanks appeared, and Kane engaged them too with his piat. Wanting to make sure that the one he had hit was properly knocked out, he fired again, but this time the Piat bomb exploded in the launcher. There was a flash, and the Major threw the Piat in the air and fell backwards, a glider pilot sergeant reported. Everyone thought he had been hit by a shell from the tank exploding. He was lying with his hands over his eyes. His face was blackened and swollen. I think I'm blinded, he said. His face was riddled with tiny metal fragments. They lifted him onto a stretcher, and he was carried away. At the aid station, his sight returned, so after a short rest, he discharged himself and went back. He soon heard a cry of, Tigers! So he ran to the six-pounder anti-tank gun. Kane called to another soldier to help him, and they achieved a first-round hit, which brought the tank to a halt. Reload! Kane shouted. Can't, sir, came the reply. Recoil mechanism's gone. She'll have to go into the workshops. Kane clearly appreciated the calm and professional answer. Footnote. Kane, the only winner of a Victoria Cross at Arnhem to survive the battle, was the father-in-law of Jeremy Clarkson. End of footnote. Towards evening, Lonsdale was given permission to pull back to the church with the remnants of the three battalions. As most of them recovered in the battered church, Lonsdale, head bandaged and arm in sling, went up into the pulpit and addressed them in stirring style. Thompson Force was officially redesignated Lonsdale Force the next day. The first and third battalion men were positioned south of the church on the polder land stretching down to the river, with the South Staffords around the church and the eleventh north of the road. Company Sergeant Major Dave Morris of the eleventh moved into the Friedhof, or Peace House. The door was barricaded with two pianos, so they climbed in through a window. In the cellar they found fifteen civilians, including three children and a month-old baby. Rather surprisingly, the owner of the peace house, Franz de Soot, begged a rifle off the paratroopers, 
and he joined CSM Morris in the attic next day, sniping from a skylight. Back in England, Major General Sosobowski's Polish Independent Parachute Brigade suffered agonies of impatience and frustration. They had watched the first wave take off on the Sunday. Lieutenant Stefan Kaczmarek thought it looked so powerful that he felt a joy that almost hurt at the idea that the war would soon be over. But then, after two days of cancellations, Sosobowski and his officers became understandably angry at the lack of information. They had already been to the airfield once and been sent back. At 08.45 on Wednesday morning, Lieutenant Colonel George Stevens, the first Airborne Corps liaison officer with the Poles, brought a new order. They were not to land near the Arnhem Road Bridge, but to the west, near the village of Drill. If the Arnhem Bridge was still in airborne hands, they wondered, then why were they being dropped well to the west? They began to suspect that things had gone badly wrong. All Colonel Stevens would say was that the brigade was to be dropped south of the Nidorain and was to cross by means of the ferry. Sosobowski briefed the battalion and company commanders on the new plan, and the brigade emplaned for a 12.30 takeoff. This was delayed another hour. But, after having started engines, takeoff was again postponed for 24 hours because of bad weather. A report from the 1st Allied Airborne Army implied, however, that the real reason for this cancellation was to give priority to supply drops, but in the event, most of the supplies dropped to the 1st Airborne Division fell into enemy hands. The soldiers, exhausted by a whole day of tense anticipation, returned to the camp embittered, a Polish paratrooper wrote. In the evening they gather around radio receivers to hear news from Warsaw, now dying which had awaited their help. That evening, at 2200, Colonel Stevens returned to say that the position was desperate. The 1st Airborne Division urgently needed reinforcements as it was surrounded. Communications with the continent had clearly not improved, as Stevens thought that the northern part of Nijmegen and the bridges there were still in German hands. He admitted that the present state of affairs was entirely different from the one anticipated. He did not need to add that the role of the Polish brigade was now simply to help pull British chestnuts out of the fire. That was all too plain. Sosobowski, who had never had any confidence in the whole plan for Market Garden, now lost his temper. He had consistently objected to the fact that his anti-tank guns would be landed by glider with the British on the north side. Now that the Germans held the Arnhem Bridge, it meant that his brigade would be dropped on the south bank without any anti-tank defence. Sosobowski told Stevens to inform 1st Allied Airborne Army Headquarters that if he did not receive a proper briefing on what was happening at Arnhem, he would not go. He said that General Brierton should be asked to make a decision. He, Sosobowski, maintained that the former task being cancelled, the introduction of the brigade group into battle, should be preceded by adequate information regarding own troops and enemy position. An hour later, Colonel Stevens discovered that General Brierton was somewhere on the continent, but even his own headquarters did not know where, and General Browning had not been in touch for more than twenty-four hours. It was hardly surprising that Sosobowski despaired of his superior officers. Chapter 19 Nijmegen and Hell's Highway Thursday, the 21st of September on the German side, confusion continued all through the night over whether German troops were still fighting in Nijmegen, south of the Val Road Bridge. Beatrick reported to Modell's headquarters, No further report has been received from the bridgehead. For the last two hours, garrison appears to be destroyed. Hauptsturmführer Karl Heinz Eiling had commanded the defense of the Valkhof and Hunna Park, partly from the Belvedere Tower and partly from a house nearby. The fighting had carried on well after Sergeant Robinson's troop had charged across. And yet around midnight, Oiling had somehow managed to escape with almost sixty of his men, as well as with a small group of Fallschirmjäger under Major Alborn. Oiling claimed that the collapse of buildings in the raging fires gave the impression that he and his men had perished. In fact, they had climbed down the steep hill of the Valkov and gone under the bridge while more British tanks thundered across above them. They were in darkness down below because the Falkhof Bluff shielded them from the fires in the town above. 
Oiling had then led his men in single file down the street in a casual manner, as if they were Americans. Oiling asserts that he and his men pushed along the river bank to the east of Nijmegen, where they found boats and crossed over to the north bank of the Vaal. Since both the Americans and the underground had searched and found none, this seems unusually fortunate. While Oiling and his SS Panzer Grenadiers were greatly admired for their bravery, a reserve unit under Major Hartung on the north bank had apparently dispersed without orders on the appearance of the British tanks. They had run back to Bimmel and even as far as Elst, where they were rounded up by part of the 10th SS Panzer Regiment and brought back into line, no doubt at gunpoint. By dawn on the 21st of September, two Panzer Corps reported that a defence line had been established running from Osterhout to Ressen and on to Bemmel, blocking the Allied advance less than four kilometres north of the road bridge. This line was stiffened with some Mark IV tanks which had been ferried across at Panaden. These forces were supported by the Funsberg Artillery Regiment, also at Panaden. Armel transferred his command post to the ferry point because supplies were not getting across in sufficient quantities. Despite General Feldmarschall Model accepting responsibility for the failure to blow the bridge, General Oberst Jodl noted that Hitler was still raging about the idiocy of allowing undemolished bridges to fall into enemy hands. General Major Horst Freiherr von Butler Brandenfels of the Wehrmacht High Command continued to demand more details to account for why the Nijmegen Bridge was not destroyed in time. Model's chief of staff had to explain that the order had been given immediately after the first Allied landings. The situation at Arnhem had shown that this order was entirely justifiable. If the bridge at Arnhem had been blown, it would have been impossible to reinforce Nijmegen. And as for the bridge at Nijmegen, that could always be recaptured with an attack from the east by the two Fashim Jäger Corps. Both British and American commanders were conscious of the danger. On Brigadier Guatkin's orders, M-10 tank destroyers from the 21st Anti-Tank Regiment followed on in the early hours just behind the 1st Company of the 3rd Battalion Irish Guards. Captain Roland Langton, with a squadron of their tank battalion, was also on the way, but in the dark they had trouble finding the infantry from their 3rd Battalion. Despite their casualties from the day before, Major Julian Cook's battalion pushed forward at dawn with the tank destroyers in support for another kilometre. Every inch of this advance was hotly contested, Cook wrote. The crowds had all the advantages. They controlled the orchard, the ditches, the farmhouses, etc. Cook and his men had hit Harmel's defence line. They could do little more until the Irish Guards group was ready to deploy. With the fighting across the Val and the counterattacks from the Reichswald, the 82nd Airborne's casualty rate over the last 24 hours rose to more than 600 men in need of hospital treatment. The 307th Airborne Medical Company had just created a casualty clearing station out of a former monastery in a southern suburb of Nijmegen. The paratroopers called it the Baby Factory because SS soldiers were thought to have mated there with racially selected young women. Footnote. In 1942, on Himmler's orders, the SS took over this monastery, called the Birch Manianum, for his Lebensborn project. An SS-4 commando from Munich adapted the monks' cells and living space so that sixty Aryan women and a hundred race-pure children could be housed there in Lebensborn Gelderland. No children were born there in the end because the place had not been finished until late 1943. End of footnote. Locals joked that this strength-through-joy centre should be called the Lust Waffe. The American doctors and medics were greatly assisted by large numbers of women volunteers. They had to cope with one aid man drinking the surgical spirit used for sterilizing medical instruments, and American paratroopers desperate for souvenirs to send home. One GI kept offering a Dutch nurse more and more money for her Red Cross brooch. She was, however, shocked by the racial tensions in the U.S. Army. Whenever she looked after black soldiers from a quartermaster battalion, a white soldier would make a snide comment. Is that your new boyfriend? That day, the 307th was able to send some casualties back by road to the 24th Evacuation Hospital at Leopoldsburg, over the Belgian frontier. 
This solution did not last once the Germans started attacking Hell's Highway in earnest. The company, which had been reinforced with an extra group of surgeons, was certainly hard-worked. It carried out 284 major operations and 523 ordinary operations. As one might expect, 78% were extremity cases, hands, arms, feet, and legs. The 307th's mortality rate in the circumstances was impressively low at just 2.5%. Military medicine had made huge advances since the First World War, with penicillin, glucose drips, oxygen, anti-tetanus, sulfur powder, and improved anaesthetics. Rapid evacuation by jeep also made a difference. The company's doctors encountered only a single case of gas gangrene, a casualty who did not arrive until thirty hours after his injury. The old triage system from the previous war, which left those with major head and stomach wounds to die, was largely replaced. The usual procedure followed was to admit seriously wounded to the shock room directly from the admitting room. The use of a total of 10,000 gallons of oxygen and 45 million units of penicillin sodium made an enormous difference. So did blood transfusions. Blood was a major factor in saving the shock cases, and most of the ones with massive hemorrhages, the 307th report stated. As well as using 1,500 units of plasma, the team supplemented their blood bank by calling on lightly wounded patients to act as blood donors. Sergeant Otis L. Sampson, who had been badly hit by 88 millimeter shrapnel, was taken to the baby factory by jeep. I was carried into the hospital on a low-legged stretcher, he recorded, and deposited on the floor in the hallway. Here I was given two quarts of blood. I could feel life flow back into my body. A major looked me over and told an attendant to take my clothes off and turn me on my back. I informed him, Major, I'm hit in the back. I know, he said, but your stomach is where the shrapnel is. If this was World War I, with the wound you have, you wouldn't survive. You can have a drink of water if you care to. It won't do you any harm. The attendant tried to walk off with his paratrooper jump boots, saying, Where are you going? You won't need them. An outraged Samson tried to crawl off the stretcher to stop him, so the Major ordered the attendant to bring them back. In the ward, Samson watched the doctors draw the sheet over the faces of those who had died. But not all patients were badly hit. A German pilot had parachuted from his plane, and he came down in sight of their window. His chute had been caught on some object, and he was left dangling. Two paratroopers, both walking wounded, immediately went out to relieve the pilot of his watch and pistol. The German pilot was from one of the fighters which had attacked Nijmegen in the early afternoon, causing a sudden panic. The remaining population thought that the city was about to be bombed, like Eindhoven, and crammed into the closest air raid shelter. The fighters also machine-gunned the baby factory. When Captain Bestebrecher went there to have his wounds dressed, the doctor said to him, Do you know what those German bastards did? They flew over and strafed the hospital, in spite of the fact that we have a big red cross on it. And do you know what I was doing when they came over? I was saving the life of a German, and I happened to be a Jew. After the Battle of the Nijmegen Bridges, there was a great deal of clearing up to do. Many were struck by one image. On the road bridge on the Nijmegen side, a dead German in rigor mortis had an arm outstretched, which appeared to be pointing across the river. Altogether, eighty dead Germans were found on the bridge, and, during the morning, wrote Lieutenant Tony Jones of the Royal Engineers, a great many more prisoners were winkled out, an extraordinary assortment, old and young, SS, police, Wehrmacht, marines, some temporarily arrogant, but only for a short time, but most completely dazed and bewildered. The equipment captured and lying about was even more varied. Eighty-eight millimeter guns, fifty millimeter, thirty-seven millimeter, a baby French tank, Spandau's, Hotchkiss machine guns, new rifles, and old 1916 long barrel and long bayonet rifles, mines and bazookas, grenades of every sort, size and description. It was almost a foundation for a war museum. In Nijmegen itself, the conditions were far worse, with much of the northern part of the town burned out. The city looks awful and is heavily damaged, the director of the concert hall wrote. Many burned blocks of houses, craters in the roads, mountains of glass and rubble, uprooted trees. 
a terribly sad sight. The great De Frenigen concert hall itself had more than a thousand window panes broken. All around the Valkov, the destruction was, of course, even more terrible. A chaos of shelled trenches, bits of uniform, dried pools of blood, shot up vehicles and weapons. German bodies were still lying in the street, some covered with coats. According to one eyewitness, Americans were wandering laconically amid the scene. One American paratrooper was eating his lunch out of a tin next to the body of a German soldier. Wounded civilians were taken to St. Canisius Hospital, where they were being operated on eight or ten at a time. People in villages, having heard of the destruction inflicted on Nemegen, immediately donated what they could, especially food, to help those who had lost everything. Out of 540 Jews in Nemegen in 1940, only sixty or so were left four years later. Simon von Prach had been hidden by a Catholic priest and had to spend much of the time in the dark to evade discovery or denunciation. To remain concealed while the battle raged and houses were set on fire must have been terrifying. There was little relief when the ordeal ended and he emerged into daylight to see the city half destroyed from the fighting. Although artillery shells were still landing in Nijmegen, the final departure of the Germans meant that the Dutch red, white, and blue flag came out again, and the purges recommenced. Prostitutes who served members of the German occupation forces, wrote Cornelis Ruijens, have their hair cut off with big shears and are wrapped in pictures of prominent Nazis at the hands of the city rabble and professional idlers. When Martin Louis Denham also saw captured members of the NSB paraded, including a woman with a portrait of Hitler hanging round her neck and with a completely shaven head. Many disliked these forms of revenge, while others rather resented the way that British soldiers tried to interfere. Generally speaking, they don't have the same hatred of the Germans as we have, a woman wrote. I told them that they could not imagine what these years had been like for us. They think that the shearing of the heads of those who have had relations with the Germans is so awful that whenever they have a chance, they will try and stop it. By 1100 that morning, Model's headquarters heard that, so far, 45 enemy tanks have crossed the bridge towards the north. These presumably were a mixture of Q-battery tank destroyers and Irish Guards Shermans. Brigadier Gwatkin had told the Vandeleur cousins that they were to advance at the normal speed of an approach march, 15 miles in two hours. But they could see immediately that the dike embankment with the road along the top and flanked by boggy polderland, was a ridiculous place to operate tanks. An advance on a one-tank front, with no chance of manoeuvring off the road, would be suicidal. But of course they had no option but to follow orders. Montgomery's refusal to listen to Prince Bernhardt's advice, and the failure of planners to consult army officers from the Netherlands army, had been a major mistake. At 10.40, Captain Langton was ordered to advance twenty minutes later, although the Irish Guards' war diary indicates that finally they did not advance until 13.30. Langton thought at first that Lieutenant Colonel Giles Vandeleur was joking. All they had was a road map. The order came, don't stop for anything. Langton was furious when the typhoons he had been promised failed to appear. In fact, they had come, but communications had broken down. The typhoons had begun arriving, a squadron at a time, the forward air controller, Flight Lieutenant Donald Love, recounted. Squadron leader Sutherland tried to contact them, but the VHF set in the contact car had gone dead. It was absolutely horrible. The typhoons were milling around overhead, and on the ground shelling and mortaring was going on. I felt frustrated and exasperated. There was nothing to be done. The typhoons had strict instructions not to attack anything on speculation. Love's mood was not improved when their RAF radio operator suffered a nervous collapse. The four leading Shermans were knocked out, one after another. The first three, within a minute. As another guards officer put it, they were lined up like metal ducks in a fairground booth waiting to be shot down. The defense line contained 88mm guns, self-propelled assault guns, and at least two royal tigers hidden in the woods. Charles Vandeleur shouted across to his cousin that if they sent any more tanks up the road, 
It would be bloody murder. Langton, left with just four Shermans in the squadron, was joined a few minutes later by Colonel Joe Vandeleur, who arrived with his cousin Giles. Langton asked whether they could get air support. Vandeleur shook his head and told him quite inaccurately that all aircraft were being tasked to support the drop of the Polish parachute brigade. But we could get there if we had the support, Langton persisted. Vandeleur again shook his head and said that he was sorry. He ordered Langton to stay where he was until further orders. According to Flight Lieutenant Love, Colonel Joe Vandeleur then went off on foot into the woods with a drawn surface revolver, looking like something out of a Wild West film, to carry out his own reconnaissance on foot. Langton was furious, and he became even more bitter that afternoon when he watched over to their left German fighters attacking the Polish drop near Drill without any Allied aircraft coming to their aid. When I saw that island, my heart sank, said the guard's armoured division commander. The island was the name given to the flat, wet, polder land of the Bitova, between the Val and the Nigger Rhine. You can't imagine anything more unsuitable for tanks. Adair was short of infantry, when the task ahead was clearly a job for infantry, so he persuaded Horrocks to push the 43rd Infantry Division through instead. It faced a hard fight. With the Arnhem Bridge now open, Hamel's defence line was strengthened by the first part of Kampfgruppe Brinkmann, with Bataillon Knaust, and a company of Mark V Panther tanks reaching Elst. At first light that morning, the Household Cavalry Regiment sent two troops of T-Squadron over the Val to reconnoitre to the west. They came under heavy shelling, and three white scout cars were damaged, but they managed to slip through Hamel's defence line in the mist. They headed for Driel, where the Polish parachute brigade was due to drop. Stranded in England by one delay after another, Major General Sosobowski and his men were living in a state of unbearable tension. They longed to get into battle in the Netherlands, and yet their thoughts were in Warsaw with the Home Army's desperate defence. At 0300 on the 21st of September, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens received a signal from 1st Allied Airborne Army confirming the new drop zone near Drill and stating that the ferry was still in British hands. It also said that the bridge at Nijmegen had been taken, and British artillery would soon be within range to support the airborne division at Osterbeek. Later in the morning, Brigadier General Floyd L. Parks, the Chief of Staff, 1st Allied Airborne Army, again assured Sosobowski that the ferry was in the hands of 1st Airborne Division. This was true at the time, but a German attack later that morning would push back the company of the Border Regiment guarding it and enable the Wehrmacht to destroy it. At 0700, the men of the Polish Parachute Brigade reached their three airfields. The fog lingered so thickly that the outlines of hangars, aircraft and buildings could scarcely be made out. But as it was warmer than on previous days, the Poles were determined to believe that this time they would take off. A young Polish officer described the scene. A bustle of paratroopers can be seen around, before and behind the Dakotas, their equipment and personal kits carelessly scattered about on the cement runway. Some, in groups, are engaged in discussions. Some take their time to rest. Others visit their friends from neighboring Dakotas. No one goes off too far, though, to be ready to load up at a moment's notice. The men look for signs that might tell them that this time liftoff will not be cancelled. But it is delayed again, hour after hour. Soon after fourteen hundred hours, the mist had cleared just enough, so the signal was given. Seventy-two aircraft took off from Saltby and Cotsmoor, and another forty-six from Spanho. The larger group managed to find a window in the weather over the North Sea, but the troop carriers from Spanho were ordered to return, to the furious disbelief of their passengers. After they had landed and heard that the other group had carried on, their feelings of uselessness, though it is not of our doing, throws us into despair, awakens feelings of helpless rage and a sort of envy towards our comrades on the ground. At sixteen or five hours, a German signaller in the Dunkirk pocket reported a large number of Allied aircraft. Standardenführer Harzer ordered Oberstleutnant von Svoboda's flak brigade to stand by in its new position southwest of the Arnhem Road Bridge. Sixty fighters on nearby airfields were ordered to take off. German accounts at this point became carried away with excitement. 
the concentrated fire of the flak hit them like a burning fist, was just one exultant phrase. The Germans claimed that they had shot down forty-three Allied planes. One German eyewitness estimated a sixty percent casualty rate among the paratroopers. But Polish accounts show such ideas to be wildly optimistic. German flak was certainly heavy. Polish paratroopers, ardent Catholics for the most part, described the tracer arcing up towards them as a rosary of sparks. Five C-47 troop carriers were shot down, and another sixteen damaged. German troops in about company strength were on or near the drop zone. There was intense shooting aimed at the aircraft and also at the descending force of paratroopers, the brigade war diary stated. Only a handful of men were shot as they came down. Those who've been found by a bullet also land, ran one Pole's romantic view of death in battle. Their bodies float down under the white canopy slowly, majestically, as if they too were about to go into battle. Yet out of Sosobovsky's reduced force of 957 men, no more than four were killed and twenty-five wounded or injured. Some close-quarter combat with knives and hand grenades followed. Enemy resistance was soon overcome and eleven prisoners taken. Their greatest anxiety was the inexplicable absence of the 1st Battalion and half the 3rd Battalion. They had no idea that they had been ordered back, and feared that they had been shot down. Their chaplain, Father Alfred Bednorz, saw the steeple of Driel Church and went immediately to pay a visit on the local priest, presumably conversing in Latin. I introduced myself as a Polish army chaplain. The vicar is surprised. How did a Polish priest get here? I smile and point to the sky. He understands that the paratroopers who have just dropped here are Poles. We embrace each other like brothers. The vicar runs to his desk and hands me a lovely antique cross. May this cross be a remembrance of our liberation from the Hitlerites. Soon after landing, Sosobowski was greeted by Cora Baltusen, a member of the underground, who arrived on a bicycle. She warned him that the ferry had been destroyed, and the Germans now held that stretch of the north bank. While setting up his command post in a farmhouse on the edge of Drill, Sosobowski sent off a reconnaissance patrol to the bank of the Niederrhein to check on the ferry. But the patrol returned to confirm what Cora Baltusen had told him. The first airborne across the river was under machine gun and mortar fire, and the remains of the railway bridge were also in German hands. There was no sign of any boats. At 22.30 that evening, Captain Ludwig Zwolanski, the Polish liaison officer from Erkut's headquarters, appeared, still wet and muddy in his shirt and undershorts, from having swum the river. He was known as the Black Bandit because of his swarthy features. Not knowing the password, he cursed loud enough for a fellow officer to recognize his voice and clear him with the sentries. He pointed out Sosobowski's command post, and Zwolanski entered and announced himself, saluting smartly. Captain Zwolanski reporting, sir. Sosobowski, who had been bent over a table studying the map, turned and stared at him in amazement. What the hell are you doing here, Zwolanski? he demanded. Zvolansky explained that Urquhart had sent him to say that rafts would be provided to bring his men across the river that night. The fact that Zvolansky himself had had to swim was hardly encouraging. Sosobowski, nevertheless, moved both battalions down towards the river. No rafts had appeared by 0300 hours, so Sosobowski brought the bulk of his men back to Drill to dig in. The river bank would be far too exposed in daylight. Zvolansky had also brought an order from Urquhart that Sosobowski himself should cross the river at the first opportunity to report to First Airborne Headquarters. Sosobowski had no intention of doing anything of the sort. He considered it madness for a commander to leave his troops in such a way, and when he later heard what had happened to the British, with the divisional commander, one brigadier, and the commander of the recce squadron all separated from their men, he considered his decision even more justified. While Browning wanted the Polish brigade to cross the river to reinforce the 1st Airborne Division and stave off disaster, Obergruppenführer Bittrich and Model's headquarters believed that the new landings in the Bitova, south of the Nederrhein, were intended to establish the link with advancing enemy forces coming north from Nijmegen. Bittrich's defence line, around Ressen, was managing to block the road running north towards Elst and Arnhem. 
the 4th, 7th Dragoon Guards had more luck to the west, round Wusterhout. British tanks moving in column, the 1st Battalion of the 504th reported, came to the area in front of the company about 1730. They cleaned out German strong points, scared off a Mark IV tank coming out of Oosterhout, knocked out two tanks and a half-track on the road leading to Oosterhout, and wiped out a German mortar position. Bren gun carriers killed, wounded, or drove out about fifty Germans in the orchard. This was the correctly chosen route if you were to pass the exam for the Netherlands Staff College. As it happened, that was the day the Dutch troops of the Princess Irena Brigade passed through Einhoven and Nijmegen to an emotional welcome from their fellow citizens. They were lucky to get through, because the Thirty Corps route was about to earn its nickname of Hell's Highway. On the 21st of September, Colonel Johnson of the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, building on Gennard's offensive strategy to defend Wechel, launched a regimental night attack towards Schindel. General Oberst Student went to see General Lieutenant Popper in the school which he had made his command post at the southern edge of the town. Student asked how things were. Popper replied dryly, The situation is somewhat spreckled. By that he meant that they were under attack in Schindel and would have to get out, but the Americans were about to get a nasty shock when attacked from the east by the 107th Panzerbrigade reinforced with paratroopers and an SS battalion under Oberst Walter. Kinnard's 1st Battalion was advancing when a 20 millimeter gun mounted on a truck opened up on them. Kinnard saw his men throwing themselves into the ditches on either side of the road. The Germans were deliberately firing high with the 20 millimeter using tracer, while at the same time another machine gun using ordinary ball ammunition was scything away at knee height. Not realizing that the Germans were up to their old tricks, Kinnard ran up the road, ordering his men to get up and push on. Keep moving, he shouted. That fire's going way high. Maybe it is, Colonel, a private answered him out of the darkness, but we already have eight men hit in the legs. Others went forward in the ditches at a crouching run until they could engage the crew of the twenty-millimeter gun and force them to flee. Entering Schindel, they found that a number of the houses contained German soldiers fast asleep. By the early hours, the town had been secured. Kinnard was contacted by the local priest, who was also an organizer in the underground. Keep your people off the streets, he begged him. Tell them not to get out their bunting and to act as if we're unwelcome. Get that word out to them tonight. There would probably be a counterattack, and they might not be able to hold the town. The priest agreed, and also promised to send off scouts on bicycles to see where German forces might be concentrating. The people of Schindel fortunately did what they were asked, and stayed inside their houses, even after dawn had come. One paratrooper in the street was slightly startled when a shutter suddenly opened beside him, and a hand appeared, offering him a cup of Ersatz coffee. The German tactic of perpetual attacks against the length of Hell's Highway also affected St. Udenrode. Lieutenant Colonel Cassidy's battalion prepared to counterattack at 0630 on the 21st of September, but supporting artillery fire in the preceding moments fell short, killing three and wounding another five of his men. The attack against the monastery, which the Germans had occupied, still went ahead. Each platoon had two British tanks in support. They faced heavy German fire, but it was very inaccurate, as if the enemy was firing without aiming at all. By the time Cassidy's men had seized and searched the buildings, all the Germans had slipped away. But a sudden German artillery bombardment at around ten hundred hours hit the 502nd's regimental command post, wounding Colonel Michaelis and most of his staff in a tree burst. Cassidy, walking back towards the command post, was blown into a ditch and lightly wounded. He had to take command of the regiment, and decided to move the command post temporarily to the monastery, where it would enjoy slightly better protection. The bitter fighting continued. Mortar Sergeant James A. Colon was killed by a sniper. PFC Robert L. Deckard was killed by a German shooting from nearby cover, while Deckard was trying to help a wounded German. Lieutenant Larson, covered by the fire of several of his men, crawled up to the covert and dispatched the Germans with two grenades and a round from his forty-five. The second platoon leader, Lieutenant Wall, a squad sergeant, and four others were badly wounded. 
Things improved only when a British tank, well over to the left flank and about a hundred and fifty yards in front of the paratroopers, traversed its turret. It fired on an eighty-eight directly confronting the infantry and knocked it out. Then it scored a direct hit on a self-propelled gun near the eighty-eight. This seemed to pop the cork out of the bottle. Germans began to spring up like mushrooms from the field in front, ready to surrender. The officers were neatly groomed, as if they had been planning a capitulation. One German soldier insisted that he had to retrieve his soap and toilet articles from his kit bag. Someone booted his pants and he moved along. At sixteen hundred hours, a tank crossed the company front about six hundred yards out. A six-pounder anti-tank gun, which was attached, gave it a round, which hit just behind the tank and caused it to spin round with its tail towards C Company. A Sherman tank then poured three rounds into the Tiger, and it exploded and went up in flames. Cassidy received orders to fall back on St. Odenroda. But that night the Germans reoccupied the monastery. Two days later it cost a British armoured regiment and an infantry battalion heavy losses to retake it. Horrocks's club route was far too narrow to defend effectively because of the delays to the two British formations flanking his thirty corps. American parachute battalions and British armoured squadrons were having to dash up and down and back and forth like firefighters. General Taylor compared their role to that of U.S. cavalry troops defending railroad lines, outposts and settler trails from attacks by Native American tribes. Constant interruptions caused by German artillery shooting up convoys meant that most American units were receiving only about a third of the K rations they were due. The great German ration store at Urs, discovered by the Household Cavalry Regiment, was used to supplement diets. But because neither side could spare sufficient troops to secure the town, a strange situation developed. Each side sent armed parties to take supplies. At this time, what was apt to happen, the Household Cavalry Regiment stated in its war diary, was that the British drew rations in the morning, Germans in the afternoon. What a wonderful nation we are for standing in queues. A British officer observed that the German supplies from us were forcing his guardsmen to admit that perhaps their ration packs of compo were not the worst in the world after all. German rations are not delectable, an American officer emphasized. With dry sausage made out of horse meat and the rock-hard bread called Daubrot, American paratroopers found them even worse than the British compo variety, which they received from time to time. In compo packs, they liked only the treacle pudding. As for players' cigarettes, they tasted like warm wind and were hard to draw. Another paratrooper said that smoking British cigarettes was like sucking cotton through a straw. For Gavin's 82nd Airborne, the attacks were coming not from both sides of the highway, but from the Reichswald still. Meindl's two Fallschirmjäger corps had taken Feltz's Kampfgruppen under command because his forces were not equal to meeting a serious, systematic attack, and still less so to carrying out an attack themselves. Some of the most intense fighting was for a commanding feature, Den Hervil, which predictably became known as Devil's Hill. Kampfgruppe Becker from the 3rd Fallschirmjäger Division attacked relentlessly. At one point, Company A of the 508th ran out of machine-gun ammunition, with most riflemen down to five rounds each. An NCO who had been back to battalion headquarters appeared with four bandoliers just in time. They were also short of food. Constant attacks, especially at night, left the company exhausted. They tied empty canvas bandoliers together to run from foxhole to foxhole, so that they could jerk each other awake whenever there was an enemy incursion. Company A managed to hold on until they were finally relieved on the night of the 23rd of September. The 3rd Battalion in Big was hit by a sudden onslaught before dawn on the 21st of September. One company was virtually surrounded, but the others launched a fierce counterattack, and the young Fauciemiego were forced out of the town for good shortly before dusk. Once darkness fell, the paratroopers of the 508th could see searchlights over to the left probing the night sky from Nijmegen. Anti-aircraft batteries were firing away at German night bombers attempting to destroy the Waal Bridge, which General Feldmarschall Model had so obstinately refused to demolish. 
Chapter 20 Osterbeek, Thursday, the 21st of September Although resistance at the road bridge in Arnhem had come to an end the evening before, some groups had still not given in. Lieutenant Barnett's defence platoon was determined to fight on. Trapped in a burning building, they knew that their only chance was to break out through the back where Germans were waiting for them. I took a dozen or so men, Barnett recounted, and told them to fix their bayonets, and we charged them. They were in a back garden, and they got up and ran before we reached them. We were shouting, Whoa, Mohammed, and I think we scared more of them to death than we actually killed with bullets. They made their way down towards the river to pass under the bridge, but suddenly they saw the unmistakable silhouette of a tiger tank. They froze at the sight, and it took them a little time before they worked out that it had been knocked out and abandoned. It was the one from Panzer Compagnie Hummel. They spent the rest of the night concealed under the bridge as German patrols searched for survivors. On hearing Major Goff's order to break out towards Osterbeek, the American OSS officer, Lieutenant Todd, had made a run for it with a small group. In the confusion and smoke, he managed to get out of the battle area. On finding himself alone, he climbed a tree, which had somehow escaped the conflagration, and strapped himself to a branch. A very uncomfortable night did little more than preserve his freedom until the next morning, when he was spotted. Panzer Grenadiers combed the battlefield. It was terrible, wrote Horst Weber. The trenches were full of bodies. There were bodies everywhere. Weber then discovered two British paratroopers playing dead. Going past two bodies, I turned around to glance at them casually, and I met their eyes. I covered them with my pistol, and smiling, I said to them, Good morning, gentlemen. Shall I bring you your breakfast now? He escorted them up to the church. Outside, weapons had been dropped in a pile. He watched his prisoners carefully, because after the ferocious defence, he could not rule out the possibility that they might grab one. Lance Corporal John Smith, a brigade signaller, had been in another group trying to break out, but they ran into a group of SS and were marched off. They were held in something like a church hall, which had a piano on the stage. One of the paratroopers could not resist going up and started playing jazz on it. The German guards, in a good mood after their victory, roared with laughter. One paratrooper, who had remained in the slit trenches behind brigade headquarters during the night, recorded how they were mortared and had to fight off several counter-attacks. We had by late morning been reduced to small groups and had been given orders by one of our officers that it was now every man for himself. He and three others decided to head for the St. Elizabeth Hospital, dodging from house to house. They had two sten guns and a handful of bullets left between them. They hid in an office, but were soon discovered by one of the many German patrols searching for survivors. Within half an hour we were rejoining a considerable number of our compatriots, having our hands shaken by SS troops and sharing their cigarettes. Many of these SS men, we found, we had fought in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. I myself was most surprised to find that they were still under the impression that they would win the war. How can one argue with a fanatic? A number of SS also adopted what one paratrooper called their usual We should be on the same side, Gambit, arguing that the British should join them in the fight against the Soviet hordes. A paratrooper from Lewis's company of the 3rd Battalion was surprised to find that the young German soldier searching him was trembling. Many more panzer grenadiers, however, were in an expansive mood. Some handed out the chocolate taken from British parachute containers, which they had collected. Occasionally one would stop and pat a British soldier on the shoulder and offer his congratulations. Nice fight, Tommy. A German officer asked a sapper where he had been fighting before. Following regulations, he refused to answer. In a perfect English accent, the officer replied, Never mind, you are a very brave man, but also very foolish. Another German officer hit one of his soldiers for sneering at the British prisoners. Victory at Arnhem gave the Waffen-SS the opportunity to show how rittelig, how chivalrous they could be. At the collecting point, after they had dropped their weapons, Major Goff passed the word that all prisoners were to put on a good show when they set off. 
So they fell in smartly, dressed by the right, and marched with their heads high. One group let rip with a final, Whoa, Mohammed! The Panzergrenadier Rottenführer, Alfred Ringsdorf, reflected on what they had just been through. No one who has lived through such a terrible experience, whose life has hung by a thread, can tell me that he was not afraid. I don't care if he has the knight's cross with diamonds. I am sure he was afraid. After the battle at the bridge, those in the company who had survived were assembled in a park on the edge of Arnhem. It was when we were gathered all together that I consciously heard a bird singing. It was like coming back to life, as if during the battle I had been living in suspension. I was suddenly alive again, and realized that I had come through it alive. Horst Weber, from the same 21st SS Panzergrenadier Regiment, wrote, When the English came out after having surrendered, they came out holding their heads high. They looked proud and not at all defeated. But I felt sorry for them, because they looked so worn, haggard, and exhausted. When it was clear that we had defeated the English, the first thing we thought about was getting hold of their food supplies and cigarettes. I was so intent on getting a share of the loot that I refused to help an English soldier whose legs had been shot away. He was propped against a wall and helpless to do anything. Weber described how, as seventeen- and eighteen-year-olds who were always hungry, he and his comrades could not believe the rations, the first aid kits, the instant coffee, and all the luxuries which they found in parachute containers. And there was soap, Weber recorded, something we had not seen for years. We had been washing with sand. We all wanted to grab these things and take some home with us. We were war children, only interested in what we could get. They were particularly impressed by sulfur powder. In our army, many soldiers died of gangrene because we had no penicillin. Some of Weber's comrades were not above taking items of enemy uniform from the dead. Even in the usually well-equipped Waffen-SS, there could be a mixture of uniforms. Some wore the tiger camouflage smocks, some field grey, and many wore British or American trousers because they were far more resilient than the German issue, which fell to pieces. American paratrooper boots were the most highly prized, but any German captured wearing a pair was likely to be shot on the spot. Allied material had become such a preoccupation, even at the highest levels, that Modell's chief of staff soon issued an order forbidding troops in a strong position to shoot down gliders. They carry valuable booty, especially heavy weapons, motor vehicles, and motorcycles. As soon as the resistance from Frost's men had ceased, the Kampfgrubach Naust and the Panzergrenadiers from the 10th SS Frunsberg were ordered south to strengthen the line around Elst. According to Naust, some of Gribner's men from the Hohenstaufen Reconnaissance Battalion were found badly wounded, but still just alive, in the half-tracks which had been shot up on the bridge three days before. Several suffered from terrible burns. Ringsdorf also described going to Elst that morning in half-tracks. We went over the bridge, on which lay burned-out vehicles. The drivers were still inside. They were burned and charred black. Naust's reaction on seeing the terrain of the Bituva or the island was the same as General Adair's. It was impossible country for tanks, with water-logged polder on either side of the raised road. His Kampfgruppe's panzer company was soon greatly strengthened with royal tigers and some panthers. Naust estimated some forty-five altogether. His battalion was also reinforced by a naval battalion of sailors from cruisers and U-boats. They were terrific men, most of them NCOs, but unfortunately had absolutely no idea how to fight on land. As for the so-called Luftwaffe Field Battalion, it reported to me in Elst at twilight. It was my first and only glimpse of this battalion. By dawn it had disappeared. Naust stayed awake on Pervitin, the German army's methamphetamine pills. Petrich visited Naust that day. Another twenty-four hours, Petrich said to him. We need another twenty-four hours. He emphasized that they must not let the British through, as he had yet to eliminate the first airborne at Osterbeek. Only then could they switch the bulk of two panzer corps south. Naust, the experienced panzer commander, sighted each tank himself. Instead of stomping around on his crutches, the one-legged commander traveled around in a motorcycle sidecar 
which was far more maneuverable and presented a smaller target in the event of air attack. Petrick had placed the newly arrived SS Nederland Battalion between the bridge and Arnhem Railway Station as a backstop behind the Gnaust Kampfgruppe. Führer headquarters in East Prussia still feared that Montgomery might break through with sheer weight of tank numbers. Petrick was under pressure from the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, OKW, to eliminate the remains of the first airborne at Osterbeek as rapidly as possible. Hitler demanded a swift conclusion to that battle so that a major counterattack could be launched towards Nijmegen. They believed that the British at Osterbeek must be almost out of ammunition, and since there is no doubt that the German Luftwaffe controls the airspace over Arnhem, supplies were not getting through. Resistance, they deduced, would therefore be very short-lived. Petrick had reported the night before that they had already taken 2,800 prisoners north of the Niederrhein, and that General von Tettau's left flank on the railway line east of Wolfhizer had made contact with the right flank of Harzer's Hohenstaufen, so the British were entirely surrounded. But all was not well within the so-called Division von Tittau. Because of the furious rows its commander was having with SS Obersturmbahnführer Lipper, Petrick therefore decided to give the Hohenstaufen command over all forces surrounding the 1st Airborne Division. An hour before first light, British officers in the Osterbeek perimeter blew whistles to wake men in their slit trenches, ready for dawn stand to. Some wag shouted out, Offside! A weak joke, which still produced some much needed laughter. A couple of glider pilots who had slept through the whistle awoke later with a shock to find a German lying by their trench. He had waited for them to wake so that he could give himself up. He was in his forties and simply did not want to fight any more. Considering the perilous situation of those to whom he was surrendering, he must have been either uninformed or desperate. A private from the 1st Parabattalion was so exhausted that he fell asleep later during the battle. When he woke up, he astonished one of his comrades, who had assumed he was dead. The attack did not develop until 0800, with half an hour of heavy shelling and a mortar stonk, before the infantry came in, supported with direct fire from flak batteries. The noise was overwhelming. The only way Taffy and I could converse, a private in the South Staffords recorded, was to shout in each other's ear. The machine gun fire was so intense that Major Lonsdale had to visit his sector's positions north of Osterbeek Church in a Bren gun carrier. Lonsdale, according to Hackett's chief clerk, was a figure to inspire terror, with one arm in a blood-soaked sling, another blood-stained bandage wrapped around his head, and another large bandage around his leg. Usual morning hate shortly after first light, Major Blackwood of the 11th Parachute Battalion wrote in his diary that day. John Douglas and a mortar bomb reached the same spot simultaneously. Bunny Speak received the larger portion of a shell in his stomach and chest. This left Guy Blackledge and myself as the only officers. An interesting day, mortared and shelled continually, and the tanks gave us no respite. Our gun crews were magnificent and brewed up at least two tigers. It was my misfortune to inhabit a trench some twenty yards to the flank of our seventeen-pounder, which almost concussed my head off at every shot. Major Robert Kane of the South Staffords also distinguished himself again, having recovered overnight from the piat round which blew up in his face. The next morning, the citation for his Victoria Cross continued, this officer drove off three more tanks by the fearless use of his piat, on each occasion leaving cover and taking up positions in open ground with complete disregard for his personal safety. Afterwards, Kane had to pull back to Osterbeek Church with most of his men in the nearby laundry, which its owner refused to leave. The defenders were soon going to need every round of anti-tank ammunition. In the middle of the day, the 503rd Heavy Panzer Battalion reached Arnhem with 45 Royal Tigers, along with another Panzer Grenadier Battalion the 171st Artillery Regiment von Zutphen, and the SS Landsturm Niederland of Dutch Nazi volunteers, which Petrick placed behind the Arnhem Bridge. The southwestern part of the perimeter, manned by the Border Regiment, was the principal objective for General von Tettau's forces. Three platoons had been sent forward to defend the steep hill at Westerbowing, which overlooked the Niederrhein 
and the ferry across to Driel. It had a café on its summit to enjoy the scenic view over the river and the Betuwe beyond. The hill was of great importance, but the border battalion could spare no more men to defend it. At 0800 that morning, the Vodovsky battalion of the Hermann Göring Division's Unteroffizier Schuler attacked, supported by a few antiquated Renault tanks captured in 1940. The battle was fierce. The platoons were pushed off. B Company then counterattacked, but suffered such losses that it had to pull back to the gasworks along the riverbank. One private, with a beard, managed to knock out three of the four tanks. B Company had clearly put up a courageous fight against a greatly superior force. There seemed to be hundreds of them, a Lance Corporal recorded, like a football crowd. We opened up with everything. Obes Leutnant Fulrida recorded in his diary that the Varovsky Battalion during the attack on Osterbeek lost all its officers except for a lieutenant and half of its men. Full reader, who belonged to the Hermann Göring Division, was appalled by the casualties caused when sending barely trained scratch units into action. Despite the OKH's ban, he wrote of the Army High Command, some sixteen hundred recruits were sent back to Germany as their deployment would simply turn into child murder. The remnants of B Company retreated to the large white house of Denenord, which belonged to Junkir Bonifacius de Jung, a former governor-general of the Dutch East Indies who had retired to Osterbeek for its famed peace and quiet. He tried to be philosophical when his tennis court was ruined by shell fire and the whole house shook, and the water shortage meant that they had to fill buckets at a well in the neighboring farm, which was extremely dangerous. He recorded in his diary that day how twelve wounded men appeared and were given something to eat in the kitchen. They wanted to give themselves up, as they had hardly any ammunition left. I then told them that this was impossible for as long as they had even one round left. An officer came to see what was happening, and, thank God, took them with him. But an hour later they were back again. There is no leadership and cohesion. The situation is more than precarious. Parachutists are being dropped with the idea that they can look after themselves for three days, but then the army has to come to relieve them, and that army has not come. The house is still standing, but that is all one can say. The lawns around the house were then ruined with slit trenches and weapons pits, and the wounded were moved into Jonkir de Jonger's wine cellar. D Company of the Border Regiment, halfway between the river and the Utrecht was also hard hit during that first major attack on the perimeter. It was heavily mortared throughout the day, causing many casualties from tree bursts. And in the fairly dense woods around, troops from SS Kampfgruppe Eberwein managed to infiltrate this extended line without too much difficulty. It was one thing to fight off troops attacking head-on, but constant harassing fire from behind as well was not good for morale. Since the company was close to a small group of houses, and unable to send back wounded for treatment, the medical orderly and some courageous local inhabitants cared for them in their houses. The 7th King's Own Scottish Borderers, another battalion from Hicks's Air Landing Brigade, also prepared to defend their White House on the northern tip of the perimeter, the Hotel Dreorot. The commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Peyton Reed, described the eerie atmosphere of a haunted house, the moon shone through shot holes in the walls, casting weird shadows. Prowling footsteps could be heard on every enemy side, and one felt that faces were peering through every window. Trees all around had been shredded by shrapnel. A huge chestnut tree had been brought down, and the hotel was surrounded by shattered roof tiles from the firing. Shredded curtains flapped in the wind, like ghosts. The Battle of the White House began at dawn with German snipers who had tied themselves to trunks of trees high in the branches. All positions came under heavy Nebelwerfer fire, the six-barreled mortar, sometimes known by the British as the Moaning Mini, because the noise it made was like a braying scream. Loudspeaker vans broadcast messages claiming that Montgomery had forgotten them and that, as they were surrounded, they should surrender. The main attack began that afternoon. The Kampfgruppe craft advanced behind an intense mortar barrage. But when the moment came for them to charge, everything opened up, Colonel Peyton Reed recorded, 
Riflemen and Bren gunners vied with each other in production of rapid fire. Mortars, their barrels practically vertical, lobbed bombs over our heads at the minimum possible range, anti-tank guns defended our flanks, and Vickers machine guns belched forth streams of bullets, as only Vickers can. The consequent din was reinforced by a stream of vindictive utterances in a predominantly Scottish accent. German survivors went to ground, but they were cleared when we went for them with a bayonet in the good old-fashioned style, with more blood-curdling yells. The borderers, although reduced to just 270 men, managed to inflict massive casualties on their attackers. Their regimental history records how headquarters company and D company were hotly engaged. Major Cochrane and Drum Major Tate with Bren guns and Provost Sergeant Graham with a Vickers machine gun killed dozens of Germans. Little quarter was given or expected. Apparently, Major Gordon Sheriff, when accompanying the commanding officer on a tour of the 7th KOSB positions, met a German and killed him with his hands. A company was overrun, and the rest of the battalion was forced back, but the ground was retaken in a wild bayonet charge. By then no company commanders were left, and only a single wounded sergeant major remained on his feet. That night Major General Urquhart ordered the borderers back to a block of houses just a few hundred metres north of the Hartenstein. The new positions turned into a suburban battlefield in which self-propelled assault guns would dominate the street and house-to-house -house fighting became savagely intimate. British soldiers claimed that they could tell if Germans were present purely from the smell of stale tobacco. Part of the reconnaissance squadron, attached to the remnants of the 156th Parabattalion, came under pressure around midday. We got our first sight of Jerry Infantry on the move, Lieutenant John Stevenson wrote in his diary. They were going in and out of the houses on the other side of the crossroads, towards a bakery, which was the largest house in our...